Chapter 21 A Bargain with the Ozzy You're young and healthy. I paused to study the wounded face turned toward the floor, the jaw set hard. This will heal, the bone will knit. In a year or three it will be a lot easier to forget than that puckering scar on your cheek. Manny sat motionless, save for his tail, which switched and curled and straightened again. I sensed that Manny, too, was waiting for Taug to speak, but Taug did not speak. The broken ends didn't go through the skin, I said. Sometimes they do, and that can be bad, fatal too often. When they don't, the break nearly always heals. I wound another strip of rag around Taug's shoulder, pulling it tight and knotting it more tightly still. Atella said, He can't die. Don't die, Taug. Do you hear us? Slowly Taug nodded. Good. You have to understand the point of all this bandaging. Why am I doing it when you're not bleeding? He is, Atella exclaimed. I nodded. A child at the edge of womanhood, I decided, and wondered whether Taug knew it, or knew what it portended. Manny said, The bleeding's not severe or serious, just skin lacerations and a little from the old wound, because the bandage was torn away. Cats can't talk, that was Atala. This is actually the knight speaking, Manny declared smoothly. The knight can throw his voice. I don't believe you, Atella jumped to her feet. But you must, Manny told her. Cats can't talk. I watched Taug's lips, hoping for a smile. Manny's right, I said. The salve would be enough if the bleeding bruise were the only problem, perhaps a pad to hold the blood. All these bandages, with the stick, are to keep the ends of the break from moving. If they move, they won't heal, or won't heal right. Let them stay where they are, and don't assume they've healed, because the pain is not as bad as it was. What's the moon, Manny? Almost gone. I nodded. Let it go, Taug. Let it come back and go again. Then we'll see. There was moonlight in the eyes of the strange woman Atella called Mama, I wondered what those eyes would be like when the moon was full, and found myself hoping I would never see them by moonlight. Atella said, He can't fight, can he? They're going to come in here after us, but Taug can't fight them. He can fight, I said carefully. He simply can't fight with his left arm. He can't hold a shield or fight with a big sword like the one he used today. He's a knight, save for being knighted and knights often fight in spite of their wounds. Taug could do that. Almost imperceptibly, Taug shook his head. If you and your mama were threatened, he may think he wouldn't. When the swords were out, it would be different. To my surprise, Gil flicked Taug's hand. They know the king's dead, Atella continued hopelessly, and they'll come, too many to fight, too many for anybody and we'll scream and run and hide, only they'll find us. One, and then another one, and kill us. Taug raised his head. Too many for Sir Svan and Sir Garvion and Miatella. Maybe too many for Shieldstar, too. But not too many for Sir Abel. You'll see. Well said, Manny declared. But I wish Baki was here, Taug's voice had dropped. There's something I've got to tell her. I stepped back. It's a good thing she's not. You may want to think your declaration over before you make it. No, I know what I'm going to say. I just want to say it. I want to say you've got to stay here, stay with us. Baki wants you to go off someplace and fight somebody. Elfris, I supplied the words. Garseg. But you're here and we need you. If you're not here, we'll all die. You're both wrong. I seated myself on the rung of a chair. You take too dark a view, and so does this girl. Atella, sir. I nodded and smiled at her. Atella. I don't blame either of you, but you're wrong just the same. Speaking for the first time, the strange woman said, I will not run or hide. Correct, I nodded. 
You were slaves here before. Why shouldn't you be slaves again? The Angerborn would kill Sir Garvayon, Sir Svon, and me, if they could. They might kill our men-at-arms and archers, too, or most of them. They might even kill Taug, Sir Garvayon's squire, Lord Theazi, and Lord Beal. But why kill slaves? Slaves are loot, not foes. Nor am I a foe, Manny remarked. Or at least they won't think so. Do you think they'll kill Queen Idden? I shook my head. Neither do I. Manny considered his sleek head to one side. I'll do what I can for her, and I feel sure she'll do what she can for me. We'll come through all right. She'll want to save her father, too, and perhaps we can. I grinned at him, then at Atella. So you see, Taug, Gilf, and I are the only ones present who are in real danger, and only Gilf and I are in much. Gilf's growl was loud and very deep. He says they are in danger from him, I interpreted, and no doubt he's right. Is it all right if I pet him? Attila asked. Unless he moves his head away. Gilf did not. Let's get to the other things you and Taug said. Taug wants to notify Baki that he'll no longer honor his promise to persuade me to go to Aelfris. He feels I'm needed here to protect you and your mama. And me, Taug said. I ignored it. He's wrong because there's no reason for him to sully his honor. I won't go to Aelfris or any place else as long as you need me. You have my word. Atella smiled and thanked me, but neither her mother nor Taug gave any indication of having heard. I want to go to Aelfris. I'm... The oaken door, one of five doors of various woods and sizes, opened, and Theazi stepped into the room. I rose. Your pardon, my lord. This chamber wasn't locked, and I thought we might wait for you here. Theazi went to the largest chair. You think I leave it unlocked so that my visitors may wait in comfort? A slight smile played about his mouth. I shook my head. I thought nothing of the kind, my lord. Only that since your door wasn't locked, you wouldn't object to my bandaging Taug here if we did no harm. I keep it unlocked as a boast. It has been my boast that there was no one in Utgard so bold as to come in without my invitation. These two slaves, the Aussie indicated Atella and her mother, presumably know nothing of me. Even if they knew, they can't have known this apartment was mine unless you told them, did you? No, my lord. If I had, I would have had to explain why I wanted them with me when we talked, and I wanted to bandage Taug instead. That was far more urgent. You have bandaged him now, the Aussie pointed out. I have, my lord. This girl is Atella. I turned to Taug. Is that right? Atella herself said, Yes, sir. And this woman is her mother. I think I know her name, but it would be better if she were to introduce herself. Atella's mother seemed not to have heard. Atella said, She don't talk a lot except just to me. Sometimes not even to me. The Aussie made a steeple of his fingers and smiled above it. An exemplary woman. Too much so, I told him. Your art is famous. King Gilling was very near death. Yet you would have saved him. The Aussie's glance darkened. I could not discern the identity of his assassin, thus I could not. I didn't mean that. He's under a spell of protection. There can be no other explanation. I safeguarded our king, but he left his bed. The steeple vanished, and the great hands clenched. He heard that woman and rushed from his bed. Pa! Taug thinks our situation grave, don't you, Taug? Taug lifted his head. I guess I do. They hate us. I don't know what we did, but they do. The Angerborn are descendants of those giants of winter and old night who had to leave Sky, I told him. Those who forced them to go are our overkinds. Mythgarther was made from the body and blood of Ymir, the Aussie added. It's ours by right. Manny lifted an admonitory paw. Gentlemen, gentlemen, surely you see that this quarrel is not in the best interest of either side. 
The giants of winter and old night, I said levelly, take whatever they can by force and keep it. The sons of anger behave in precisely the same fashion. You wish to quarrel with me, the Aussie muttered. Why no, I smiled. Taug reminded us of our ancient enmity. Can we agree to set it aside for the present? The Aussie started to speak, but fell silent. Taug believes that thousands of Angerborn will storm Utgard, butcher everyone, and burn it to the ground. Atella touched my arm. It's rocks, mostly. So it is. Nothing of the sort will happen, of course. Those who would have set up a new king attacked Sir Svan and Taug, whose force consisted of themselves and seven slaves, three of them women and one a child. All fought like men from what I saw. Shieldstar and a few followers joined them, and the mob couldn't overcome them. Hundreds against one knight, a squire, some slaves, and twelve or fourteen of their own people. Sir Garvayan arrived with a few men-at-arms, and the hundreds who would have overthrown King Gilling couldn't keep his supporters. Atella's mother said, Fewer than fifty. Right. They couldn't keep a scant fifty from reaching the gate. Queen Idden appealed for peace, and by then they were eager to agree. Anybody who thinks they'll go to work tomorrow on a ramp knows nothing about war. I never said I knew a lot, Taug declared. I nodded. You fought to exhaustion and were wounded. Both have colored your thinking. You need to realize that. It was Queen Idden that got you to come back? Manny's voice was smooth. Indirectly, it was I. I moved my royal mistress and she, Sir Abel. Tauk nodded. I think I see. I said, then we don't have to talk about it. The Aussie shrugged. I won't try to plumb your secret. I can do it easily any time I think it important. You've told us what won't happen, and I agree. What will? Will you seek the throne for yourself? He smiled bitterly. Would you support me if I did? That would depend. I will not. It is a dangerous seat, and I am by no means popular. Someone will. Someone popular, or at least plausible. Probably not one of those who instigated the attack. Taug said, the first one got killed. Then I'm right. I spread my hands. Somebody else. If we're lucky, he won't surface before his grace arrives. If we're not, our position will be weaker. In either case, we'll offer our friendship and our kings and ask him to let us leave Jotunland in peace. Since he'll have everything to gain and nothing to lose by that, I think he will. What of me? the Yasi asked. You'll serve your new king, loyally and ably, just as you served King Gelling. He may have scores to settle. If he does, he won't settle them, though he may think he has. Every king requires a sorcerer, and somebody who will take the blame for unpopular decisions. You're both. He'll ask himself why he shouldn't make use of you, at least at first, and congratulate himself on his cleverness. I congratulate you on yours, Sir Abel. You make your speculations sound very plausible. That's because they are. Have I earned a boon? The Aussie nodded. Several, if you want them. Swell, I need three. First, the division of slaves. You wish to claim some for yourself or for our queen. You must speak to Sir Svan now. Tag looked up. You've divided them already? The Aussie shrugged. You were wounded, and we saw no need of your presence. I acted for you in your interests. Taug started to speak, but the Aussie silenced him with a gesture. First you should know that there were but six to divide, one having perished in the fighting, another has an injured arm. Sir Svan got first choice, you'll remember. Mutely Taug nodded. He chose the sound man, naturally. I, acting for you, choose the other man. His name is Vil. Atella gasped. A strong slave and a skilled one, from what I gather. When his arm heals, he should be a valuable possession. Sir Svan then chose one of the women, not this one. I, knowing your fondness for this child, chose her. I was his already, Atella exclaimed. The Aussie shook his head. You were not, but you are now. Sir Svan took the other woman, understandably, I'd say. 
and I was left with your mother for this squire. Thus you and your mother belong to him together with the Smithville. Tog said, That's good. I, I never really liked you much. I was wrong. You failed to understand me, the Aussie told him. As you fail now, I do my duty as I see it. Will you give a slave to Sir Abel? If you do, Sir Svon will surely give one of his to the queen. All of them, perhaps, but we'll have to see. I don't want any, I declared. I do want boons. This woman, what's her name, Taug? I don't know. What is it, Atella? Linnet. I say mama. Only it's Linnet, really. The strange woman whispered. Marigolds and manticores. That's something she says, Attila explained. I told Taug, and he said marigolds were flowers. The Aussie added, Symbolizing wealth or the sun? Attila nodded gratefully. I said, Manticores are beasts the size of Gilfir. Their heads are like the heads of men or women, but they have the teeth and claws of lions. Their tails are like the tails of scorpions, though much larger, and their sting is fatal. Why does she say it, Atella? Taug asked. I don't know. Why do you say why? The Aussie snorted. I've a better question. What's the second boon you crave, Sir Abel? I may grant it if I can. Can you heal this woman, Taug's slave? As I spoke, Gilf looked up at me. From Gilf's look, I knew, Gilf knew I could have healed her myself, that such acts violated my oath, and that he was far from sure my oath had been wise. I can try, the Aussie said, and perhaps I will. Whether I will or not depends on your answers to some questions. Can you tell me who stabbed his majesty the night of the combat and who took his life? And what is the third boon you ask? I sighed. May I sit, my lord? The Aussie nodded, and I resumed my seat on the rung. I can't answer your first question. If you want my opinion, the assassin was the same both times, though I'm not sure even of that. Is my final boon, I didn't get the first, to be withheld? You may not get the second either, the Aussie rose to pace the room, looking as tall as a tower. His voice boomed from the walls. I will not believe that a man of your penetration cannot offer a guess. I could offer a guess. I paused, sorting swirling thoughts. I won't. I'm a knight, and a knight doesn't put the honor of others at risk. Suppose I did. Suppose I said that though I couldn't know, I felt it likely that the guilty party was a foreign knight, Sir Abel of the High Heart. The accusation would spread, as such accusations always do, and my reputation would never recover. Even if somebody confessed, people would say my character made the charge plausible. The Aussie paused in his pacing to say dryly, you were absent, I believe, upon both occasions? I was. That's why I accuse myself. Shieldstar has a friend with two heads. I don't know his name. Orgelmir is the left, and Borgelmir the right? Thanks. I don't say this, but suppose I did. I guess that Orgelmir wounded the king, and Borgelmir killed him. Absurd! No more so than lots of other guesses. You wanted a guess? Okay, you've got one. You risk your boons, both of them, Atella said. My mama isn't, isn't always like I would like her to be. She was taken from her home, I made my voice gentle, and enslaved here. She's an attractive woman, and she may have been used in ways you can't understand. The shock disordered her mind. Soon we'll go back to Celadon, your mother and you, Taug and Gilf and Manny and me, and even this Ville. Your mother will return home, and though the change may be slow, I think you'll find she gets better. The Aussie, who had gone to the window, turned back to us. I have not said I would not treat her. One of you, you there, sick woman, put more wood on the fire. Atella did it. Taug says there isn't much more, and we got to be careful. Lord, the Aussie believes things will return to normal soon, I explained. So do I. Your boons, the Aussie's voice filled the room. Your boons depend on your answering three questions. Questions I will put here and now. Answer and I'll grant them. 
Refuse as you've refused already, and I'll grant neither. You want me to talk, I said. Okay, before I hear your other questions, I'll say three things. My first is that I didn't refuse to answer your question. I don't know the answer, and I told you so. My guess if I made one might be more valuable than this girl's, but would it be worth as much as yours? You know it wouldn't. You were here both times. Your opinion deserves far more respect. Do you accuse me? Of course not. I won't accuse anybody. That's what you're mad about. I'm just saying you're bound to know more. What are the questions you mentioned? I ask for your second and third remarks. Okay. I remark that you've bound yourself to grant both my remaining boons, though you don't know the last. If you answer my questions, speaking out without quibbling about what your honor requires, I'll grant it. Assuming I can, for a second or two, the Aussie's huge hands appeared to wash each other. Whatever it is, Taug said, I have an idea. The Aussie nodded. We need some, let us hear it. Like Sir Abel said, he wasn't there when the king got stabbed the first time. He was down south in the mountains, fighting anybody who tried to come through a pass. This morning when the king got killed, he was pretty close, riding on the air with Queen Idden. But all of us thought he was way far away, so maybe the person's afraid of him and wouldn't do anything except when he was gone. Possible, but unlikely. The Aussie paced the room again, an austere gray eminence and his steps sounded even through the ankle-deep carpet. Until today he was here for no more than an hour or two. Sir Abel, what is your third remark? That though I lose my boons, you could lose more. Your foes and even your friends will accuse you of ingratitude. My friends accuse me of nothing since I have none. Attila said, We'll be your friends if you'll let us. My foes accuse me of ingratitude already and worse. Here is my first question. I warn you that you must answer all three. I nodded. I understand. Did King Arnthor send Lord Beale with instructions to assassinate King Gilling? No. The Aussie paused in his pacing to glare at me. A simple yes or no will not be sufficient. Explain yourself. Certainly, my lord. I'm not King Arnthor's counselor, nor have I ever been. His reputation, however is that of a hard but honorable man. The Aussie snorted. My second question, in what ways will King Arnthor benefit by King Gilling's death? In none, my lord. A king in Utgard could forbid the raids that lay waste to the north. No king can't. Besides, King Gilling took a share of the proceeds, which discouraged raiding. As long as there's no king, the raiders can keep whatever they get, and they'll raid more. While we war among ourselves, we'll have neither time nor strength to spare for raiding. I nodded. My lord's wiser than I am, though many may prefer profit to killing their relatives, still more to being killed by them. My final question. You're to imagine that I am King Arnthor. I have explained to you my reasons for wishing King Gilling dead, and although they may not satisfy you, they satisfy me. I then confide that I've chosen Lord Beale to act for me. Would you approve my choice? Absolutely, my lord. When failure is preferable to success, the course of true wisdom is to choose the man most apt to fail. May I speak freely? You may. In fact, I desire it. As I told you, I know nothing directly of King Arnthor. I've never seen him. But I traveled with Lord Beale through Celadon and the Mountains of the Mice, and some way across the plain of Jotunland. I feel I know him well. For diplomacy, he's the man, level-headed, courteous, and tactful, with few passions beyond family pride and a father's natural love for his daughter. If I were a king who wanted peace with my neighbor, I'd look for somebody just like Lord Beale, but for an assassination. I shook my head. Atella said, Doesn't Lord Beale know magic, too? That's what Taug said. If he does and wanted to kill somebody, he'd do it like that. The Aussie sat down and stared at Atella, who met his gaze boldly. At length he said, Would I be a fool to treat a child's counsel as serious? I smiled. A fourth question, my lord? Let us make it so. Manny cleared his throat, 
a soft and almost apologetic sound. You limited yourself to three questions, my lord Theazi. Allow me to answer that, and so preserve your honor. Wisdom is wisdom, and doesn't become foolishness in the mouth of another speaker. A child's counsel should be heeded if it is wise, but not otherwise. Could not the same be said of a cat's? It would take a wise man, my lord Theazi, to discover foolishness in a cat's counsel. Just so, Theazi bent toward Atala. My child, we do not know that magic was not employed. It may have been used to render the assassin invisible, for example. I didn't know that, Atala said. Naturally not. You have a lively intelligence, but little experience of the world and less learning. You must take both into account. Yes, sir. I mean, my lord. Would you laugh if I were to tell you that an invisible creature has been seen in this keep? No, sir, I wouldn't. Only I wouldn't understand, cause you just said invisible. Invisibility is never complete, the Aussie told her, as every grimoire dealing with topic asserts. Beings rendered invisible by magic are partially or entirely visible under certain circumstances. These circumstances vary with the spell employed. Rain and strong and direct sunlight are perhaps the most common. Clearly impressed, Attila said, Oh! Invisible entities sometimes cast shadows more or less distinct, by which their presence may be detected. They also leave footprints in mud or snow, though that does not really represent a loss of invisibility. Invisible cats, many added, are completely invisible, only at night. I did not know that, the Aussie said, and am pleased to have learned it. I repeat, would you be surprised to learn that an invisible being has been glimpsed in this keep? After a glance at Lennet, Atella nodded. One has been, and the first glimpses followed Lord Beale's arrival. I would suspect this being of having stabbed our king, were it not that it seems to fracture the cervical vertebrae. For obvious reasons, invisible beings rarely bear arms. When our king was stabbed, five others had their necks broken. The fact has been lost to sight in our distress over the wounding of our king, yet it remains. I snorted. Is this supposed to implicate Lord Beale? It seems to me it makes him less likely than ever. If the being is his, I don't think it is, and he wanted to harm King Gilling, wouldn't he use it? If it isn't, and it didn't stab the king, why are we talking about it? Manny raised a paw. Well said. May I add that in my opinion you've answered Lord Theazi's questions as required? Theazi nodded. You'll receive the boon you've asked. I'll do what I can for this slave, although I can't promise great improvement. What is your final boon? I had to think about things then. It was my last chance to turn back. When I looked up, I said, I love a certain lady. Who she is doesn't matter. She's real, and I can't be happy without her. I've returned here to Jotunland for her sake, from a far country. The Aussie nodded. I've been told the sons of anger never love. If that's right, why did King Gilling rise from his bed and rush out to his death at the sound of Queen Idden's voice? You have been misinformed. The Aussie's words might have been the wind moaning through a skull. We love. Shall I supply the fact which misled your informant? I shrugged. If you please, my lord. We are never loved. Not even by each other? No. Your final boon? All my life I've been aware of, of an emptiness in me, my lord. There was a time when I acquired a new shield, and my servant, who's my friend too, suggested that it be painted with a heart. I hesitated. I'm called Sir Abel of the High Heart, my lord. I am aware of it, though I have never known why. My friend suggested that a heart might be painted on that shield. I was very proud of it. Of the shield, I mean. 
Tog looked away. And it came to me that if a heart were painted on it, it would have to be an empty one, thin lines of red dividing, curving upward and coming together at the bottom. I said no. I felt, you see, that my heart was filled with love for the lady whose love brought me here. Just the same, a heart on my shield would need to be empty, and I knew it. You've got a room, a famous room since I heard of it long ago, with Herobide's lost love carved in the door. Is that true? Slowly Thiazi nodded. From what you said, I understand why you've got it, and why you value it. It can't be one of these doors. There's nothing carved on them. Another door in this suite? The Aussie said nothing. May I, only once and as a great favor, go in? It's the third boon I ask. You will have to come out again. Every word seemed weighted with double significance. I never thought I could stay there. I will grant you both boons. For a moment it seemed the Aussie would rise from his seat. He stayed where he was, his face gray, his huge hands grasping the arms of his chair. But you must do something for me. You must take the slave woman with you. Will you do that? Linnet? Where's the door? By a slight motion of his head, the Aussie indicated one of the five doors, the narrowest, a door of wood so pale that it looked almost white. Through there? I stood and took Lynette's hand. Come with me, my lady. Manticores and marigolds. She rose, and her rising was neither awkward nor graceful, and neither swift nor slow. I said, She's sleepwalking. The Aussie shook his head. A terrible rage burns in her. I looked at him. I'm still a kid, a boy still, in a lot of things. We envy your good fortune. Is she really angry at this moment? Attila said, Mama never gets mad. I would not advise you to look into her eyes. Taug cleared his throat. I told you a little about the battle, Sir April. She was... was fighting then. With the whip that came with the wagon we bought. I guess I didn't say the frost giants were scared of her, but they were. She was blinding giants with it. I said, I didn't know that. I know I didn't say I was scared of her, too. She was on our side, but I was scared anyhow. Yet you fought on, Taug shrugged. Then Sir Garvayon came with men-at-arms, and they were scared about having to fight, and I could see it. I saw how scared they were, and I thought you tough men. You don't know half. Not even half, the Aussie said softly. Anger was our mother's name, Sir Abel. We are descended from her, all of us. Thus we know something of anger. I tell you that this woman must control hers or destroy everything in her path. She seems a woman of wax to you. Something like that, yes. You will have seen a candle stub thrown into a fire. Remember it. I'll try. Come, lady, I'll open the door for you. Thirty steps took us to the door the Aussie had indicated, and although it was narrowest of all, it was wide and high for me. I had to reach over my head to lift the latch. When I touched it, I saw the graceful script of Aelfris in the pallid wood, where lost love lives. The door seemed to weigh nothing, and it may be that we stepped through without opening it. Chapter 22 Lost Loves Night, blacker than the blackest night of storm, enveloped us. I heard the rush of waters, as I had when I had breasted tides and dark uncharted currents with Garseg. There was a great pounding, swift and very deep. I tried to imagine what sort of creature might make such a noise, and the image that leaped into my mind was that of Org, green as leaves and brown as bark, alone in a forest clearing and pounding the trunk of a hollow tree with a broken limb. Under my breath I murmured, What's that? And Linnet heard me and said, It is my heart. As soon as she spoke, and I knew she was right and wrong, that it was my own heart, not hers. For a long time we walked through that dark, 
and I timed my steps and my movements to the thuddings of my heart. The darkness parted, as at the word of the Most High God. What had been dark was pearly mist, and I saw that there was grass, such lush grass as horses love, underfoot. The mist spangled it with dew. This is a better place, when it told me. Perhaps I did not speak, but I agreed. Sunbeams lanced the mist, and as it had made the dew, so it now made a colonnade of mighty oaks. She began to run. Golden lawn! She turned to look back as she spoke, and I have on my honor never seen more joy than I saw in that wasted face. Beside sheer wall, the castle would have been an outwork, such a gray wall as a strong boy might fling stones over, a round keep prettily made, and a square stone house of four stories and an attic. It was, in short, such a castle as a knight with a dozen stout men-at-arms might have held against fifty or a hundred outlaws, nothing more. Yet it was a place very easy to love, and made me think all the while that I was there, of the ladies' hall in sky. The ladies' folkvanger stands to it as a blossoming tree to a single violet, but they breathed the same air. On its gates stood painted manticores, their jaws held marigolds as the jaws of cows sometimes hold buttercups, and there were marigolds at their feet, and to the left and right of them more marigolds, not painted but real, for the moat was as dry as Utgard's and had been planted as one plants a garden, while manticores of stone stood before the gates. There were servants and maiden sisters, fair young women, who might have married in an instant, and any one they chose. All were filled with wonder that Linnet, whom they thought never to see again, should unexpectedly return, and after them a grave old nobleman with a white moustache and the scars of many battles, and a gay grey lady like a wild dove, who fluttered all the while and moaned for joy. This is Kirsten, Linnet told me. Dear, dear Kirsten, who died when I was fourteen, and my own dear sister Leisha, who died in childbirth. Father, may I present Sir Abel of the High Heart? Sir Abel, this is my father, Lord Lifer. Slain by the frost giants who stormed Golden Lawn, Lord Lifer told me, smiling, and offered his hand. My mother, Lady Lys. She took my hand in both of hers, and the love in those fluttering hands and her small, shy face would have won me at once, even if I had been ill-disposed to her and her husband. May you stay with us a long, long while, Sir Abel, and may every moment of your stay be happy. Soon came a banquet. It was night outside and snowing, and when we had eaten and drunk our fill, and sung old songs and played games, we walked in a garden, bright with light and summer flowers. This is Mother's Grotto, Linnet explained, a sort of pretty cave made by our gardeners. The fashion at court was to have a grotto when my parents married, a place where lovers could kiss and hold hands out of sight, and out of sun too on hot days. My father had it built to please my mother before he brought her here. It made me think of the cave in which I had lain on moss with desiree, but I said nothing of that. Only I'm afraid of it and I didn't know I was until I started talking about it, I suppose because my sisters and I weren't allowed in there when we were children. So I'm not going to go in, but you can if you'd like to see it. She plainly expected me to go, so I did. It was not that I imagined I might actually find Desiree there, I knew I would not, but the memory the grotto evoked was strong and sweet, and I hoped that if I went in it might be stronger still. Filled with that hope, I descended the little stone stair, stepped across a tiny rivulet, and entered the grotto. There could be no dragon here, I knew, nor any well, reaching the Sea of Alfris, nor was I wrong about those things. In their places I found a floor of clean sand, and a rough tunnel that seemed to plumb the secrets of the hill, and then a familiar voice that mewed, Sir Abel, Sir Abel? It's you I know. I smell your dog on your clothes. Is this the way out? 
Manny? I stopped and felt him rub my leg. I didn't know you were in here. This is a strange place. I know, Manny told me. And then, pick me up. Some of these people are dead, and it doesn't seem to make any difference. He only mewed in response to that. When I picked him up and carried him, he was trembling. I will not speak of the time I spent in the grotto. The time of Sky is not the time of Mithgarther, nor is the time of Alfris. The time of the Room of Lost Loves is different again, and perhaps not time at all, but merely the reflection of time. Atella said none of us had stayed inside long. Manny raised his head and sniffed. Hearing him, he was cradled in my arms, I sniffed too. I smell the sea. Is that what it is? I've never been there. Your dog talks about it. I don't think he liked it much. I said, he was chained in Garseg's cave under the sea. I'm sure he didn't like that. That's all right, Manny told me. It's only wrong to confine cats. He leaped from my arms. Soon I heard him ahead of me. There's light this way and water noise. Before long I could see it for myself and hear the surge and crash of waves. I felt that I was coming home. The grey stones of the grotto appeared to either hand, and I, recalling its mouth and the rivulet across which I had stepped, paused to look behind me, for it seemed possible at that moment that I had become confused and was walking back the way I had come. Faint and far was the mouth behind me. Faint and far, but not nearly as faint or as far as it ought to have been. I had walked the better part of a league, and yet I could see the rough circle still and glimpse rocks and ferns beyond it. There's a woman here, Manny called. I knew then, and holding up Eterni, I ran. Parka sat spinning as before, but her eyes left the thread she spun for a moment to look up at me as she said, Sir Abel of the High Heart. I felt that I had never known what that phrase meant until I heard it in her mouth. I knelt and bowed my head and muttered, Your servant always, my lady. Do you need another string? No, I said. The one you gave has served me well, though it disturbs my sleep and colors my dreams. You must put it from you when you sleep, Sir Abel. I would not treat them so, my lady. They tell me of the lives they had, and hearing them I love my own more. Why have you come? she asked. I explained as well as I could, not helped by Manny, who interrupted and commented more often than I liked. When I had finished, Parka pointed beyond the breakers. It is out there. What I seek? She nodded. I can swim, I told Manny, but I can't take you, nor can I take my sword or my clothes. He said, That mail would sink you in a minute. It was not true, but I agreed. Will you remain here with Parka and watch my things till I return? Your possessions, Parka told me, are not here. Nevertheless, I stripped and laid my mail, my leather jerkin, my trousers, and so forth, on a flat stone and put my boots beside them. Parka spun on, making lives for we who think we make them for ourselves. How good it was to swim in the sea! I knew then that much of my sea strength had left me, for I felt it returning, and although I knew Garseg for a demon, I wished that he were swimming at my side, as he had in days irrecoverable. It is well, I think, for us to learn to tell evil from good, but it has its price, as everything does. We leave our evil friend behind. To what I swam I did not know. Seeing nothing ahead, I swam a long way under water, then breached the surface and swam on, still seeing nothing. The bones of Grengarm lay in this sea, and somewhere in it dwelt Kulili, for the bottom of the Sea of Mithgarther, and I felt I was in Mithgarther still, lies in Aelfris. I resolved to go to the bottom before I was done, and come to land in Aelfris, and search there for desiree, for I did not know then that one finds none but lost loves in the room of lost love, 
and my love for her, love fiery as the blood of the angerborn, yet pure, could not be lost, not in the Valkyrie's kiss or the Valfather's mead. Surfacing again, I saw the Isle of Glass. What love, I asked myself, did I lose here? None, surely. For a time I was filled with thoughts of Garseg and Uri and Baki. At last it came to me that had I been able to recall that love, it would not be lost. Lady Linnet, in her madness, had forgotten her parents, her sisters, and her home, had remembered only marigolds and manticores, and the fighting tradition of her family, which had been in her blood, not in her wounded mind. Thus it was that although her mind had failed, her hand had itched for a sword, and found one in the whip. It is not the weapon that wins, no, not even eternity. The beaches of the Isle of Glass are like no other. Perhaps they are gems ground fine, certainly that is how they appear. Nor are its stones as other stones. Its grass is fine, soft, short, and of a green no man can describe, and I believe that Gilf, who could not see colors well, could have seen that one. I have seen no other trees like those along its beaches. Their leaves are of a green so dark as to appear black, but silver beneath so that a breath of wind changes them to silver in an instant. Their bark appears to be naked wood, though it is not. When I think back upon the moments I came ashore, it seems to me I cannot have had long to admire the beach or grass or trees, yet it seemed long then. The sun stood fixed, half visible, half veiled by cloud, and I, with all eternity at my disposal, marveled at the grass. Oh, son, it was a peasant woman. I had seen many fairer, though she was fair. You are my son. I knew that she was wrong, and it came to me that if I were to lie upon the ground and she to bend above me, I would see her in the way I had just recalled her. Then I understood that she was the fairest of women. You and Berthold suckled these breasts, Abel. I said he was not here, and tried to explain that he would not have forgotten her, that he had been old enough to walk and speak when she vanished. Read this, she held out the tube of green glass. Shamefaced, I admitted that I could not read the runes of Mythgarther, only the script of Aelfris. This is not Mythgarther, she said. It is the country of the heart. I unrolled the scroll and read it. I set it down here, as I recollect it. You will wonder, Ben, as I wondered, whether she was not our mother as well as Berthold's and his brother's. I think that she was both. Mag is my name here, and here I was wife to Berthold the Black. My husband was headman of our village. The elf cast their spell on it. Our cows birthed fawns. Our gardens died in a night. Mist hid us always, and Griffinsford was accursed. An old man came, he was a demon. I know it now, but we did not know then. I was big with child when he came. He said our overkinds would not help us, and to lift the curse we must offer to the gods of the elf. Snari fed him. Berthold said we would not, that we must offer to our right overkinds. He built an altar of stones and turf, with none but our little son to help. On it he offered our cow, and sang to the overkinds of sky, and clee and ware with him. A turtle with two heads crawled out of the river and bit Dife and Grumma. Strangers were on the road by night, and there were howlings at our windows. The old man said we must give seven wives to the gods of Aelfris. Berthold would not hear of it. The old man said I would never give birth until the gods of Aelfris allowed it. Two days I labored with none but Berthold to attend me. Then I begged the Lady of Skye to take my life if only she would spare my child. I was able to bear him, and I named him Abel because of it. The old man came to our door. Grengarm, he said, demanded seven fair virgins. 
There were not seven fair virgins in Griffinsford, and soon he would demand fair women, whether virgins or not, and children too, whom he would eat. I do not know that he told the truth, though I believed him. He told me he would take me to a place where Grengarm would not find me. I said I would go if I might take my children. I might take Abel, he said, but Berthold was perhaps too big, and he offered to show the place to me, so that I might judge if it was a fit place for them. It was not far, and we would return long before either woke. May the lady and every lady forgive me. I went, thinking Berthold would rock Abel if he woke. We went to the edge of the barley, and there the old man cautioned me that I must not be afraid, but climb on his back. He went on all four like a beast as he said it. I mounted and he flew. I saw that he was a terrible lizard, that he had always been, and the kind face he showed was a mask. I believed him Grengarm and believed he would eat me. He carried me to this island and stripped me naked. Here I remain, so the seamen I tempt may feed Cedar and the Chimeri. There are other women, stolen as I was. We tempt seamen, so the Chimeri will not eat us. But we hide when the old man walks out of the waves, and do not worship him as the Chimeri do. Groa carved an image of the lady for us, but another came by night and broke it, leaving an image of herself by the pool. Beautiful beyond women. Groa can write. She has taught me to write as we write here, tracing letters in the sand. This vase I found in the wreck, with the paper and the rest. O lady of the overkinds, lady of sky, you spared my life. Grant that these writings of mine will come to the eyes of my sons. Years have passed. I am no longer beautiful. And soon the Chimeri will eat me. I have caught Cetar's poison in a cup. I write with it, and with a feather of the great bird. When I have written to the end, I will put this scroll in the vase, and stop it and drink. None will touch my poisoned flesh for fear. I asked whether I might take her scroll to read to my brother. She said that nothing I took from this place would remain when I left it, and cast her scroll into the waves. After that we sat long on the beach, naked together, and talked of the lives we had led, what it was to live and what it was to die. I was taken by the elf, I told her, to be playmate to the queen, for the elf live on, but few children come to them, and any child born to them is a queen or king, as if every elf of the clan were mother or father. You were a king to me, she said, and to your father and your brother also. We played games in a garden wider than the world, and I sat at lessons with her, and talked of love and magic and a thousand other things, for she was very wise and her advisers wiser. At last they sent me into Mithgarther. All memory of Desiree and her garden left me. Only now has it returned. You loved them? I nodded. Mother, you are wise. I knew I would not find Desiree here, for my love for her has not been lost. But those were lost, as lost as your scroll. Which is not lost. It remains on the isle where you found it. She took up the green glass tube that had held it as she spoke, and removed the stopper. Do you want to see it again? It is in here. The tube was empty, and yet it seemed to me that there remained something at its bottom, some scrap, perhaps, of paper, a pebble, or a shell. I tried to reach in, although it was large enough to admit only two fingers. My whole hand entered, and as it sought the bottom, my arm. I found myself drawn into a tunnel whose sides were green glass. At once I turned and began to run back the way I had come, troubled, until I caught and held her, by Eterni, whose weighty scabbard slapped my leg. Soon I found a pale door. I opened it and had no more stepped through than I was followed by Linnet and Manny. "'I thought you would stay in there a while, Mama. Atella said. Linnet only smiled and stroked her hair. Beyazi said, "'None of you need tell me what you saw. Should you wish to, however, you will find me an attentive listener.' None of us spoke. 
Taug said. Everybody got to ask questions before you went in, or anyhow, that was what it seemed like. Now I'd like to ask one, and all of you have got to answer just this one question. There isn't one of you that doesn't owe me. Linnet nodded and took his hand, at which Attila looked astonished. Here it is. Did it work? Did you really find love you had lost in there? I told him I had, that I had found a mother whom I had forgotten utterly. To myself I added that her bones lay on the Isle of Glass, and I would not rest until I had interred them and raised a monument, as I now have. What about Atella's mother? I nodded, and was about to explain, but Linnet herself spoke. I did, and saw women dead and men who fell when the anger-born came to Golden Lawn. I celebrated the winter feast and danced the May dance and cut flowers in our garden. She turned to Theasi, who sat huge as a carven image in his chair. Your folk destroy so much to gain so little. He nodded, but did not speak. What about Manny? Taug looked around for him. I saw him come out, Atella pointed. He went out the window. That's too bad, Taug said. I'd like to know if he found love he'd lost, too. Theasi's voice was as dull and distant as the beating of the monstrous drums outside. If he had lost love, squire, he found it there. I said, of course he had love to find, and of course he found it. If he hadn't, he would be here telling us so. He left because he's not ready to talk about it. There was a frantic pounding at the door, and the Aussie roared, Come in! It was Pauk, and though he did not look around, I saw his living eye rest on me. Lord the Aussie, sir, he began. Is my old master Sir Abel in here, sir? I thought I heard him. He is your new master as well, the Aussie told him. I give you to him now. Pauk pulled his forelock. Thank you, sir, and I hope it sticks. I'm here, Pauk, I said. What do you want? Nothing, sir. Only I got news you ought to know. That Shield Star, sir. He's got the crown, sir, and says he's king. He's fixin' to go out in the town, sir, with all his men, and trim in his guards. The Aussie rose. Then I must go with him. I nodded. First, Pauk, you mustn't talk of his majesty King Shield Star as you just did. If you're disrespectful, I may not be able to protect you. Aye, aye, sir. Second, you're to go to the stable at once and saddle Cloud and bring her to the entrance as quick as you can. Puck hesitated. I ain't no hand for horses, sir, and that and don't know me. Do what she tells you, I said, and all will be well. After that I sent Taug to notify Svan and Beale and armed myself. Of Shieldstar's parade through the town I will say little. We human beings were kept to the rear, no doubt wisely. Garveon, Svan, and I rode three abreast, with Beale and Idden before us and Garveon's men-at-arms and archers behind. The castle of Utgard might have been taken, for there was no one to guard it save Taug and Gilf and a few slaves, but there was no reason to fear it would be taken, though the crowding frost giants who cheered so wildly for their new king eyed us with hostility that was almost open. When I saw their faces, I knew we would have to go, and go soon, I told Beale when we returned to Utgard. He agreed, but reminded me that he would need the king's permission. A dark and silent figure waited outside the chamber Theosi had assigned to me. They're in there. Recognizing her voice, I bowed. Who is Lady Linnet? My daughter. Another girl? For a moment it seemed to me that a frown of concentration crossed her face, that face which so seldom wore any expression. The cat and a man? They wanted me to— You would be welcome, I told her. I know. It seemed that she would go. Though I stood aside, she remained where she was, her head erect, her hands at her sides, her lank black hair falling to her waist. I will return south with you. Golden Lawn will be mine. I hope so, my lady. Shall I have a husband, then? Someone to help build? I'm sure you will have your choice among a score. 
They are so eager for a little land. Five farms, our meadows. I nodded. There are many men who are hungry for land, though many have land already. Others hunger for love. If you marry again, my lady, you would be well advised to marry a man whose desire is for you. She did not speak. There are many women, my lady, who feel that a man who greatly desires them can't be good enough for them. That they prove their mettle by winning one who could couple with a lady more beautiful or more accomplished, winning him with land or gold or by trickery. I don't pretend to be wise, but another lady whose name may not be spoken told me once how foolish that is, and how much of her time and strength was spent striving against it. You? No, my lady. If I'd been speaking for myself, I would have spoken less boldly. She passed me without a nod or glance. I watched her erect back and slow, smooth steps until she vanished in the darkness at the end of the corridor. There are ghosts and worse in Utgard, as I knew very well, but no one was less apt to be affrighted than she, and it is possible that they, like us, thought her one of themselves. Two girls, Lynette had said, a cat, Manny clearly, and a man. Little Atella would be one of the girls. The other seemed likely to be one of the slave women somebody Taug had found to care for her. The man was presumably Taug himself, though I hoped for Garveon. Shrugging, I opened the door and stepped in, and saw that I had been right in some regards and wrong in others. The second girl was Uri, and not in human form, but clearly a woman of the Fire Elf. The man was neither Taug nor Garvayon, but a blind slave, muscular and nearly naked, with one arm supported by a sling. Atella said politely, Hello, Sir Knight. We came to see you. Only I was here the first. Uri rose and bowed, saying, Lord? Manny coughed as cats do. She is afraid I will slip ahead of her, as I easily could, dear owner. I won't. I want to talk to you alone, after these others have gone. The blind slave stroked Manny's back with a hand thick with muscle. This is him? Yes, Manny said. This is he, my owner, Sir Abel of the High Heart. The slave knelt and bowed his head. It means he wants something, Atella explained. That's how they have to do. We all want something, I told her, and when I do, I kneel in just the same way. What's his name? It's Vil, and he was my old master's just like me, only now we're Taugs. I nodded. Stand up, Vil. He rose. Atella said, Can I still go first? Sure, it's your right, and I have another question. Well, I got a bunch. You can be first if you want to. No. I took off my helmet and laid it in the armoire in which I would hang my mail. You were here first, as you said, and I came in last. The truth was that I hoped her questions would make my own unnecessary. I don't know where to start. In that case, it probably doesn't matter. I unbuckled my sword belt, took my place on the hassock, the only seat of merely human size, and laid Eternia across my knees. Aren't you going to put that away, too? I shook my head. I'll hang it by my bed. Something may happen during the night, though I hope it won't. Uri murmured, I have often watched over you, Lord. I remembered then that seamen lured to the Isle of Glass had fed the Chimeri, but I said nothing. Is the new king going to hurt us, Mama and me? I shook my head again. I would not let you be hurt, but I doubt that he intends you any harm. Taug doesn't want to be a knight, not any more. I know. Only I want him to be one, and he'd be a real good one, wouldn't he? This was addressed to Uri, who said, I think so, too. See, we're going to get married, Mama said, and we slept in the same bed already and everything. Uri said, I don't believe so, Lord. Yes, we did. We're going to do it again tonight, and I'm all washed and everything. So he has to be a knight. I nodded, which he is. Atella's voice rose to a wail. 
You said he wasn't. I said nothing of the kind. You said that he didn't want to be one, and I told you I knew it. When I was tending his wound, I did my best to keep him from saying what none of us wanted to hear. I may also have said he was a knight already, though no one calls him Sir Taug. I think I did, and if I didn't, I might easily have done so. She tried to speak, but I silenced her. If Duke Marta were here, I wish he was, he'd tell you there's no magic in the sword with which he taps a knight's shoulders. Queen Desiree, who knighted me, might tell you anything, and she commands more magic than Lord Theozzi and Lord Beale combined. But no magic can make a knight. Not even the overkinds can. A knight makes himself. That's the only way. Come closer. She did, and I put my arm around her. Many people know what I told you. I learned it from a good and brave knight when I was a boy. Fewer know this, a thing I learned for myself in a far country. Manny asked, Where there are talking cats? I nodded. Talking cats who draw a chariot. What I learned, Atella, is that a knight cannot unmake himself. A knight can be unmade. It's difficult, and is seldom done, but it can be done. Atella said nothing. Her eyes were bright with tears. It cannot be done by the knight himself, however. If Taug ever ceases to be a knight, it will be because you've done it, I think, though there are other ways. I never would. I told her very sincerely that I hoped she would not. But he doesn't want to, and what can I do? What you're doing. Be good, take care of your mother, and show Taug you love him. Well, I want him to ride a white horse with a sword, she sobbed, and one of those long spears and a shield. I hope we'll leave this castle tomorrow. I'm going to ask the new king's permission, and do all I can to set Lord Beale and his folk in motion. If we go, you'll see Taug on a horse with a sword. His arm can't bear a shield, but the shield Queen Itten gave him, the one that you saved from the fight in the marketplace, will hang from his saddle. Will you help? I nodded. All I can. Mom is better. I know. She may never be entirely well, Atella. You must do whatever you can to help every day, you and Taug. I'll try. I know. You must get Taug to help you. After all, she's his as long as we're here. Is there anything else? No. Atella wiped her eyes with her ragged sleeve. Only this girl is going to talk about me. She said so. Then go, I told Atella. See to your mother and get Taug to help if you can. She would have remained, but I made her leave. As soon as the door had shut, Uri said, You might marry her, lord. Do you think Queen Desiree would object? I returned to my seat. Of course. You know her less well than you believe. Do I? I shrugged. Or you might wed the mother. I sighed. When I refuse to consider that as well, will you suggest I wed them both? You may go. I may go whenever I wish, Lord, but I will not go yet. If you do not want to see me, that is easily arranged. Vil, the male slave, grunted in surprise. I suppose he thought she might be threatening to blind me. When you speak foolishness, Uri, I don't want to hear you. Should I quiz you about the diet of the Chimeri? That would be foolishness indeed, Lord. When I was a Chimera, I ate Chimera food. Let us leave it so. You dined upon strange fare once, when you were sore wounded. I yield. You told Poratella you were going to talk to me about her. Did you tell her what you meant to say? No. Nor was I talking of her and her mother so much as of you, Lord. Would you not like a fair estate? To be got by marriage? No. I laid attorney on the hassock and went to the window to stroke Manny. A crown? That lout shilled star got himself a crown and easily. So that I might sit a golden chair and send other men to their deaths? No. Or he rose to stand beside me. I speak for all the fire elf, Lord, not for myself alone. 
If you kill Kulili, we will serve you, not just Baki or I, but all of us. If you wish King Arnthor's crown, we will help you get it. I shook my head. I have to get these people and more to safety, Uri. I have to do a lot of other things, too. In Alfris, all these things will take only a few minutes. You want me to go back? In a year, Lord, you might be King of Celadon. In ten, Emperor of Mythgarther. Or dead. You are dead, Uri's eyes were yellow fireworks. You know that, and so do I. But Vil doesn't. I pitched my voice as low as I dared, or at least he didn't, which reminds me I'd planned to ask Atella why she feared him. Why does she, Vil? What made her start when she heard your name? She ain't feared, sir, not really. She is. Before His Majesty's parade, Lord Theazi told us about the distribution of slaves. You went to Taug like Atella and her mother, and I saw her face when she heard it. I'm a conjurer, sir Abel, or used to was. I do things for her, just little things, you know, and tell her twas real magic. I guess she believed me or sometimes. To test him, I asked whether he had conjured up Uri. That's the girl talking, I know. I listen, even these days when I can't see. More never these days, really. No, master, I didn't. I heard her and sounds like she's crazy. But I didn't have to do with that neither. Uri grinned like a wolf. I am afraid I smiled, too, but I told him that he was not to call me master, that Taug was his master, not I. I'm ain't sorry, Sir Abel, it slipped out. It's square on my tongue. But you've the right of it, I belong to Master Taug now, only he don't seem to have much use for me. I told him that would change. That's so, Sir Abel. Can I ask now? No. When I've finished with Uri here, perhaps, but before I go back to her, what was it you did for Atel that frightened her? Nothing, Sir Abel, just little things, you know. Took a coin out of her ear and egg once, things like that. Uri sniffed. Could you take a coin out of my ear? Not now, Sir Abel, because I don't have one. Maybe you could lend me, just for a moment, you know. Gold's best if you got gold. Chapter 23 The Battle of Utgard I did, of course, in the purse Duke Martyr had given me. Nevertheless, I turned to Uri. Bring us a gold coin and promptly. Any minting will do, whatever you can find. For this? She sounded angry. Are you my slave, or have you dropped that pretense? She knelt as Vil had. There is no pretense, Lord. Then do as you're told, and quickly. When she was gone, Manny muttered, She'll steal it. Of course she will. Vil cleared his throat, his homely, sightless face not quite turned to mine. Maybe now my arms got wrenched in the fight at the marketplace. Right, one hit me, maybe. I never done much. A blind man fighting giants. I can hear, and I can feel. I'm strong, too, I always was. In my trade it helps, but smithing got me stronger than I was when I come. Hammering, you know, and all that. So I thought maybe I could help, so I got one by the leg and threw him. Only the next one hit me or fetched me a kick, and after that I couldn't do much. What it is, Sir Abel? Uri returned, proudly holding a gold coin stamped with the features of King Gilling. Here is a gold coin. I handed it to Vil. Now take it from my ear if you can. Ain't easy, Sir Abel, conjuring when you can't see. I never supposed it was easy, even for the sighted. Is it real gold? He bit the coin and swallowed it. Not bad, about twelve carat, from the taste, you know. Want me to try to get it out of my belly? Though he could not see me, I nodded. If you can. I'll try. His hands groped for me. I got to touch your ears, Sir Abel. Main sorry for that, but I got to, so's to know where they is. Hope my hands ain't too dirty. I told him to go ahead. Taller than I thought. It was somehow disquieting to have a face that showed evidence of many beatings this close to mine. You can hear me, can't you? I said I could. 
Ought to hear better in a minute. Where's that Uri? She said nothing until I told her she must answer. Come here, Uri. I can't see, so you got to be eyes for me. Look in his ear, will you? You see that gold in there? Only his thoughts, Uri said, looking into my ear. Why, you're blind as me. Watch sharp, he displayed a coin. Where'd that come from, Uri? Tell Sir Abel here. From your ear, lord, she grimaced. So it appeared. I said, may I see the coin again, Vil? He handed me a large coin, much worn and tarnished. This is a brass cup of Celadon, I told him. The coin you had just now was gold. No, it warn't, Sir Abel. I know I said, but I didn't want you show you up in front of this girl and the boy that makes his cat talk. You see, Sir Abel, I do, and I saw it was gold. Produce it. He knelt again, his blind eyes upturned, his hands outspread. Am I a man would lie to you, not never truthful vills what they call me, master, you ask anybody. And you, truthful vill, say the coin wasn't gold? I do, master, look here. He held out an empty hand. Uri said, The coin I brought was gold, lord. I nodded. I'm looking as you asked, truthful vill, but there's no gold in your hand. There ain't? He seemed genuinely puzzled. No, none. I can't see myself, Sir Abel, being blind, you know, only I feel it this minute, feel the weight. He clenched his fist. There I got it. He opened his hand once more, and a shining coin lay in the palm. I took it. This is a brass farthing, polished bright. I know, Sir Abel, t'was the coin I showed you, master, a brass one, only I rubbed it clean. I had heard of conjurers, but until now I had never seen one. You must be one of the best. He bowed and thanked me. Now I must require that gold piece of you. Ori and I will be through in a few minutes. When we are, she will have to return it to its owner. Do you know where it is, Ori? She shook her head. You must beat him, Lord. Bill raised his hands as if to fend off a blow. You wouldn't hit a man what can't see, Sir Abel, not you. You're right, I told him. I wouldn't. But I'd cut one open to see whether he'd really swallowed my gold. I drew my dagger so that he might hear the blade leaving the scabbard. No one calls me truthful Abel, but I'm truthful in this. What I say I'll do, I'll do. Produce that coin. I hid it under the cat, Sir Abel. Manny rose and took two steps to his left, and the big gold coin of Jotunland Uri had brought lay on the window sill. She picked it up. Do you want to examine it, Lord? I shook my head. If you're satisfied, I'm satisfied. Bill said, That's how we do, Sir Abel. Only what we do is tell them it's a good ways away. Under that wagon over there, we'll say, or in the shoe of that man with the red hair. Him being, you know, the one that looks like he can run fast. If you've done everything right, why they believe it and look, and while they're doing it, you run. Hide if you can. I used to be good at it. Of course, I couldn't now. But it's how I used to do any time somebody fetched gold. Or he said, Surely you have seen enough now, Lord, to understand why the child fears him. Seen enough, but not heard enough. I'll do that later. You want me to come to Alfris at once? She nodded. To fight Kalili for you. Not long ago, Baki wanted me to come to Alfris to fight Garseg. I won't do either one till I finish here. You say years would pass here, Lord, but the difference is not as great as you suppose. You may take a year here. Ten. I'll come when I'm ready. When I do, I'll fight Kulili as I promised. If I live, I may or may not lead you against Garseg. No promises. Now take that coin back. She faded as I spoke and was gone. Manny said, just between the three of us, and before she comes back to spy, do you think you can beat this Garseg? I shrugged. I killed Grengarm. And he killed you, dear owner. I could not help smiling. You see, you know more about it than I do, Manny. I don't even know who Kulili is. You won't learn it from me today. Do you know who Garseg is? Manny looked smug, as only a cat can. He's a dragon. 
Who told you? You did, dear owner. I asked if you could beat Garseg, and you replied that you had killed Grengarm. Grengarm was a dragon. Taug told me about your battle with him. Therefore Garseg is another dragon. Elementary. You know who stabbed King Gilling, too, don't you? I shook my head. Of course you do. I heard what you told Lord Theasi. You know you just can't prove it. I don't want to, I told him, and turned to Vil. Manny here wanted to be the last to talk to me, and both girls have had their shot. What do you want to talk about? Help, sir, that's all. Can I say, first off, nothing I heard will go farther. I don't think you'd like me blabbing it, and I won't. I thanked him. Master Taug's talked to me, sir. He says I'm his, only I'll be free once we get south. That true, sir Abel? Seemed like he believed it. As far as I know, I don't know much more about our country than your master does, less perhaps. Well, sir Abel, I'm blind. You wonder why I fought him, why we all did. I can't ever forgive it. Never. I wish I could, only I can't. Once I dreamed of returning here with an army and driving them out, I told him, I doubt that I ever will. So the thing is, Sir Abel, he groped for me, and I gave him my hand. The thing is, how am I going to eat when we get south? I know the conjuring trade and can still do it some. You see how I worked them coins? No, I said. I watched you closely, but I did not. Only I can't live like that no more. If I was to take their gold boy and run, he laughed bitterly. How far would I get, you think? Manny murmured. You told us you could hide. I do that at times myself. You got eyes. A man that can't see can't keep out of sight. If I was to try now, you'd laugh. Vil's face had never turned from mine. He seemed to collect himself and said, I got my new master, Sir Abel. Only he wants to be a farmer like his pa. People like that, they don't have enough to eat. That's why I left to start with. What are they going to do with a slave that can't see? I would hope them too kind to drive him out, I said. So I thought I might ask him to sell me while he's still here. Vil drew a deep breath. The others, they went to Sir Svan. And he's going to is what I think. That's Roud and Gif and Alka. He'll let him go cheap and raise what he can. The women ain't worth much, but Roud ought to fetch a bit. Only there's the girl and her mother, Sir Abel. Matella and Lady Lennet. I don't think you have to worry about Taug's selling them. How it was at Master Logie, Sir Abel, was a woman for each man. Gif for Roud, you know, and Alka for Skeef. So lend it for me, it was supposed to be. Only she wasn't right, Sir Abel, not right. Maybe I ought not say. Sometimes we did, you know. Only not often, and I never did feel right about it. But I tried to keep track of the girl. You won't trust nothing I say. I know that, and don't blame you. That depends on what it is, truthful, Vil. Wearied by the hassock, which afforded no rest for my back, I climbed into the chair it served. I didn't touch her nor let anybody. You take my meaning. It was getting worse as she got older. There's them that'll hump a pig. Maybe you think I'm joking. No. Making monsters for what's born of such you wouldn't like to meet, and they live sometimes. So there's them that would have jumped her in a minute. I took care and kept her close and spanked her too, if she talked back a run off said I'd turn her into a doll to keep her close by. So she's feared, Sir Abel, like you said, only I... love her. He coughed. Yes, sir, and her mama too. Her mama's a fine, fine woman. A high-class woman. A noble woman. The daughter of a baronet. Is she, Sir Abel? I didn't know. You said I loved Atella, and you weren't wrong, neither. Only... I understand. What do you want of me? Help, Sir Abel, that's all. Atella, she'll stay with Master Taug if she can, but her mama can't look out for her, nor for herself neither. I would if I could, but... 
but... My owner is a kind and a chivalrous knight, Manny said. There was a note in his voice I had not heard before. If I could work for you, Sir Abel, after we get south, I mean, I wouldn't ask no pay, not a farthing, only that you'd help with Linnet and to tell it to her if she needs it. Lady Linnet may not want your help, I told him. I know it's her Abel, only that's not to say she don't need it. She ain't right, and many's the time I've took care when she didn't want me and to tell her the same. You ask her, and if you get truth out of her, you'll hear it. No doubt. Only she'll cry. It'll be a while, you know, before she gets over that. Will you help me, sir? All right, I'm blind, but you ain't. You can see these arms, he flexed his muscles, which were impressive. I'll work hard. If you don't think I'm working enough, you tell me, master. Manny muttered, work hard and steal. You tell that boy to swallow it, master. Not from you, nor from Master Taug, nor any other friends you got I won't. All right, I told him. You may serve me in the south, provided we can find nothing better. He surprised me, not for the last time. Groping toward the sound of my voice, he found my feet, which reached the edge of the chair, and kissed them. Before I could recover, he was at the door. He turned, and where his empty eye sockets had been, there were two staring, in fact glaring, eyes of bright blue. Then the door shut behind him. That was a trick, Manny said. I know, I wish it hadn't been. Pauk's was better. Manny sprang from his window sill to the floor, trotted over to my chair, and with an astonishing leap caught the upholstery of the seat and pulled himself up. Pauk made them think he was blind when he wasn't. He was already blind in one eye, I said. He has been as long as I've known him. Was that what you wanted to talk about, Manny? The thing so private you wanted to speak last? No, he settled into my lap. If you'd rather not say it or prefer to wait, I've helped you. Haven't I earned a few minutes? I agreed and sat stroking him for some while. Gilf, who had gone to the stable, scratched at the door. Manny asked me not to admit him. I called to him through the door, asking him to look in on Taug. I ducked into that place with you, Manny began. The Room of Lost Love? I know. You went with the madwoman, but I wasn't interested in whatever love she might have lost. I went looking for my own. That was a mistake. I continued to stroke him and said nothing. Once I was a free spirit. Once I was a normal cat, not troubled by lies. Manny spoke slowly, and as it seemed mostly to himself, the first is the finest of existences, the second the finest of lives. I have lost both. He looked up at me, and there was far too much sorrow in his forlorn black face for me to find it amusing. Chilled Star sat the throne that had been Gillings as if he had been there all his life, and the Aussie stood beside him with his golden staff as if he had served Shield Star's father before him. It was one of the times when I could see that the Angerborn were foreign, not just to us, but to everything. The Valfather was not foreign to us at all. He was ours, as we were his. Your Majesty, Beale bowed almost to the stone floor. I congratulate you, not on my own behalf alone, but on my king's, upon your ascension to the throne of your ancestors. Nor, I decided, were Uri, Baki, and the other elf, alien in the same way. Kulili had modeled them on us. Hail, King Shieldstar! Hail! Garvey and Svon and I, standing behind Beale and Idden, pounded the floor with the butts of our lances. Neither was Michael alien like that. He was, I think, what the Valfather himself might aspire to become, somebody good, the way that a good blade is good, and one who saw the face of the Most High God. 
Idden's lovely voice rang even among the cloudy rafters of that hideous hall. Your Majesty, we Idden, a queen of Jotunland, most humbly beg a boon. Even the dragons of Muspel belong to Muspel. They are demons to us, but not to themselves. Speak, Queen Idden. Those oversized eyes, bigger than the eyes of owls, were made to see through the freezing black of old night. And old night, I have been there, although only on its edges, is not any of the seven worlds. It is not that the angerborn always seem horrible. You get used to them. It is that they really are. That being horrible is being like the angerborn. Our king is dead. Our husband is dead as well, for they were one and the same. It is the custom of our people, of the people of the south, your majesty, to mourn a husband for a year, a king for ten. Thus you see us in black, and in black we shall go for eleven years. Far to the south, your majesty, stands the castle of our girlhood. It is nothing compared to this Utgard of yours, yet it is dear to us, for it holds the room in which we slept as a child. With your majesty's most generous, most compassionate leave, we would go to that room, bar its door, and weep. To be at your court is glorious, but glory has no savor for widows' weeds and tears. May we go, and with your majesty's leave, may our father and his retainers give us escort? Deal bowed again. My heart implores me to accompany my grieving daughter, your majesty. Equally my duty demands it. Our king dispatched me to King Gilling. I must apprise him of King Gilling's death and of the dawn of your splendid reign. Thus on my own behalf, may we depart. Wiston and Taug had gone to ready our horses for a quick getaway, and to tell Master Eager to see to the baggage. While Beale talked, I could not help wondering how they were coming. Before you go, Shieldstar said slowly, we might give you gifts for your king. How say you, Thiazi? He bowed. I shall attend to it, your majesty. Then we have your leave, Beale took a short step back. Words cannot express our gratitude, your majesty. May peace reign forever between these realms. Thiazi's staff thumped the floor the signal that the interview had ended. At a whispered order from Garveon, we knights faced about. When walking with lances, you have to keep step. Otherwise the lance heads hit each other, and the pennants get fouled. We had practiced half the morning, and did well enough. In the courtyard I found Wiston, Taug, and Eager ready to depart. There'll be gifts, I told them. Gifts for King Arnthor, and we must wait till they're presented. Get those saddles off the horses, and get them back into their stalls. Wiston looked dismayed. Taug fatalistic. Don't feel that you've wasted your effort. You've located everything and cleaned it up. We should be able to leave tomorrow with little delay, and that's good. Now step closer. I don't like having to shout at you. They gathered around me, even Linnet. You're to stay with the horses, I said, all of you. You must be here to take charge of the gifts. Lord Thiazi will present them to Lord Beale, and Sir Garveon and Sir Svan will bring them to you. You have to stow them and protect them once they've been stowed. Except for Lady Linnet and her daughter, not one of you is to leave without permission. Everybody understand? They nodded. Atella, you and your mother sleep in Taug's room with Manny. If you're not there when we leave, you may be left behind. Is that understood? Atella nodded solemnly. If your mother insists on leaving, Linnet said, I won't. Good. Thank you, my lady. Atella, I was about to say that if she goes, if someone comes and takes her away, for example, tell me no matter how late it is or how early. Yes, sir, Sir Abel, I will. Vil, is Vil here? Right here, Sir Abel, he raised his hand. Fine. If you can't find me, Atella, tell Squire Taug or Vil. Is there anyone who doesn't know what he's to do? No one spoke. Good. Queen Idden has a diamond diadem given her by her husband. King Shildstar's gifts to King Arnthor will have to equal or exceed that, I think. The danger of theft will be very great, and if anything is stolen, it will go hard with all of you. And very hard with the thief. Master Eager asked, 
We leave in the morning, Sir Abel? I have to talk with you about that. I drew him aside. Here I am going to have write more about things I did not see. Wadit and Gila told me most of it. Daybreak had found Martyr's party in the saddle. The warway lay broad before them, nearly straight and spangled with frost. A league ahead it passed between boulders and heaped stones where it looked as if a rocky hill had been leveled. Beyond this low defile they saw the towers of Utgard, towers so big you might think them shorter than they were, if it were not that their tops were so near sky. We will eat our next meal in that castle, Martyr told Waddit, and Waddit said, Yes, Your Grace, if those who are there already do not make a meal of us. Hela, loping beside him, pointed with the short spear she had made for herself from a broken lance. Seeing that, admit that my father's is no mean race. I have never thought it was, Waddit told her. Though I have never fought the sons of anger, I'm eager to. I'm told that in all Mythgarther there are no foes more fell. Wounded as you are, dear lord? Wounded as I am, Waddit replied stoutly. Now have you your wish, Hela pointed again. See you those stones, do you Duke Martyr and you Sir Liart? The Knight of the Leopards said sharply. They're in plain view, surely. Why, no, Hela grinned, showing big yellow teeth like knives. Not so plain, Sir Knight. There is not a stone to be found there, for I have been this near Utgard and nearer. What you see are the sons of anger, crouching or sitting, with their heads covered by their cloaks, all sprinkled over with dust from the road. Martyr reined up, his hand lifted, so those behind him would stop as well. They are waiting for us, Hela made him a bow. So does it appear, your grace, the knight of the leopard said. I will ride forward and see how these matters lie, your grace, and perish if Hela is speaking truth. Martyr shook his head. Do you serve Sir Abel or Sir Wadat, Hela? Sir Abel formerly, Hela replied, and Sir Wadat presently by Sir Abel's leave. Sir Wadat, is she to be trusted? Wadat smiled at her. I would trust her with my life. Then let us not distrust her to Sir Liart's death. Wheeling his mount, Martyr gave orders, and when his archers had ridden within bowshot of the stones, they spread over the fields beside the warway, dismounted, and let fly. Roaring, the anger-born rose, and we, their intended prey, who had left Utgard before dawn at my urging, heard the sound of battle, and riding with all haste, took them from behind. Not since I left Skye had I fought as I fought then charging down screes of air to drive lance or sword into the upturned faces of the sons of the giants of winter and old night. The blows before Utgard, if I described them all, would fill a hundred pages. I will say only that once Eterni clove the skull of a frost giant to the jaw, and that though I tried to sweep the heads of Orgelmir and Borgelmir from their necks with a single blow, I failed, and that giant, who had been two-headed, fought on with one, though blood spurted from the severed neck as though to die Mithgarther. Upon that and other blood the grim ghosts brought by Eterni's bearing feasted, so that in the level rays of the morning sun they seemed no less than men, and their spectral blades rent palpable wounds, at which their owners grinned that cheerful grin we see in skulls, and slew again. I have been writing too much about myself. Let me write about others. First, Martyr. No one who saw him could have guessed there was white hair and a white beard under his helm. A lance and horse, better managed, I have never seen. Beale fought too, and we who thought him dead found him under the corpse of Thrym, and gloried, laughed, and shouted to see him blink and gasp for air. Taug, who had sworn never to fight again, fought and fell, and what I think have died that day were it not for Gilf bigger than any lion and more fierce, who stood over him until Wiston dragged him to safety. As for the knight of the leopards, a leopard from his shield might have sprung to life. 
Lance broken and helm gone, he fought on, and I have rarely seen a brand fly that fast or cut that deep. Wounded more sorely even than Taug, Wadit fought with Hymer to his left and Tila on his right. Three Angerborn fell to them, which should be one for each, but someone who swears that he knows, and should since he watched from my saddlebag, said one was Wadit's and two were Hela's. That I can well believe. The lady stands shield-maid to the Valfather, and I cannot compare Hela to her. But think of the goddess of a ruder nation, thick-limbed, tall as any rearing mare, with ravening mouth, flying hair, and blood-drenched spear. If I met Hela in battle, I might turn aside. Martyr and the Knight of the Leopards surprised me. I hope I have made that plain. Idden surprised me, too, plying her bow like the best, and taking cool aim when the battle was hottest. But no one surprised me that day more than Garveon. I knew him for an able swordsman. I had thought him a prudent knight, careful and perhaps a bit cautious. He fought as furiously as Hela, with helmet and no helm, as he and Svan had fought King Gilling's champions. Unhorsed he fought all the harder, caught a horse whose rider had fallen and charged into the thick of the fight once more. So we had our furious fighters. No doubt I was one. We had our rocks as well. The Angerborn would have killed Idden and scattered her bow-women a dozen times had it not been for Svan and the serving-men he led, and in all honesty I doubt that Taug would have gone into the fight without his example. It was, in short, one of those rare battles in which nearly every one fought, although Berthold and Gerda did not, nor did the blind slaves, Atella and Linnet and the slave-women, and in which every one who fought fought well. That said, it seemed to me that without Garveon and the Knight of the Leopards we could not have won, and it was only through the Valfather's grace that we won with them. After the battle I took the rear guard, the Knight of the Leopards and his men, and ten of martyrs, thus I had no chance to speak with the rest until we camped. It was late black night, for we had ridden far, fearing pursuit. Talc helped me out of my armor and began to clean and polish everything, while Uns, returned by Idden as she had promised, cooked for us. Persuaded by Berthold and Gerda, I lay down, and half asleep heard the whisperings of my bowstring, the lives and deaths of many men and women, and children too, lives of toil mostly, of poverty and hunger. Perhaps I had just closed my eyes. Equally, I may have closed them an hour before. In any case, I was roused by Beale's valet, who shook my shoulder, calling, Sir Abel, Sir Abel, sir? I sat up and asked what he wanted. It's his lordship, Sir Abel. He's... His lordship would speak with you. His lordship is far from well. Still half asleep, I stood. Dying? Oh, no, sir. I hope not, sir. But he... He cannot walk far, Sir Abel. I mean, he would try, but we won't let him. They won't, sir. He wanted to come here, sir. He wanted me to support him so he wouldn't fall. They wouldn't allow it, Sir Abel. The Queen, Sir Abel, and His Grace. And I had to agree, so I came. He paused and cleared his throat. If I give offense, sir, the fault is mine. Hans was trying to give me a bowl of stew and a spoon. The stew smelled delicious, and to silence him I accepted both and began to eat. If you would come, Sir Abel, I... I am aware you owe me nothing, but— Nonsense, you spoke boldly in my defense, Swart. Do you think I've forgotten that? You recall my name, Sir Abel? That is, is— Well, sir, I—I I confess— Have you eaten? I, why, ah, uh, I don't think so, Sir Abel. Not since we left that horrid castle, sir. I've—we've been caring for his lordship, and there's been no time. I gave him my spoon and what remained in the bowl, a bit more than half, and munched the piece of coarse bread quickly offered by Uns. Thus, both of us eating, and eating as fast as we could, Swart and I made our way through the discomfort and disorder of the camp to Beale's pavilion. I had hoped to find him asleep, but he was awake and propped in his folding bed, with Idden on a stool at his bedside and Martyr in a chair-eating porridge. Sir Abel... Beale managed to smile, although I could see he was in a lot of pain. Be seated, please. You must be tired. All of us are. I looked to Idden, and received a glittering nod. Martyr nodded as well. 
Swert brought in a folding chair, and I sat down. To see you sitting up and smiling is worth hours of rest to me, my lord. I imagine Her Majesty and His Grace might say the same. I killed Thrym, the captain of the King's Guard. So I heard. I congratulate you, my lord. I don't congratulate myself. Beale was silent for a moment, adjusting his position in his bed, his mouth twisted with pain. You weren't present when he halted us outside Utgard, Sir Abel, neither was his grace, but you may have heard of it. King Gilling had been told, though I can't imagine who his informant may have been, of Her Majesty's cat. You gave her that cat, I believe. Hidden said, We asked for Manny Father, and he gave him to us. Exactly, exactly. He wanted to see the cat, and keep us waiting outside. I stood there in the road, in the wind, and talked with Thrym for an hour, trying to get us in, you know. He was a monster, the largest of them all. I was terrified of him and tried not to show it. Hidden said, Father, you weren't. Yes, I was, shaking in my boots. He smiled. If you had told me I'd have to fight him, I would have slashed my wrists. If you'd told me I would win, I'd have said that all prophecy is moonshine, even mine. You know me, Your Majesty. I bounced you on my knee and played hide-and-seek. Am I a man of war? A knight or anything like one? Hidden shook her head. Now I've killed the captain of King Shieldstar's guard. That wasn't what we wanted to talk to you about, Sir Abel, though it may bear upon it. But I did it, and I can't keep quiet about it. Killing one giant, even the captain of the guard, can't mean much to you. How many did you kill this morning, a score? I shook my head. I don't know, my lord, I didn't count, not as many as that. Martyr said, You rode through the air. I'd heard about that from some of my men, but I didn't believe them. Today I saw it myself. You galloped on air as though it were a range of hills and your arrows. I've never seen so strong a bow. Never. It's my bowstring, Your Grace. I've had it since I was a boy, but I hope not to need it before long. No one spoke, so I added, As for riding on air, please don't fall prey to the idea that I do it. It is my mount who does it. I have a good mount. Manny bounded into Idden's lap, and she smiled. And a good cat. A very good cat, whenever he's not your majesty's cat. Martyr dropped his spoon into his empty bowl. I need to sleep. So does Sir Abel, we all do. The first thing we wanted to say, Sir Abel, was that after what happened this morning, Celadon and Jotunland are at war. Border raids can be blamed on unruly vassals. This can't. I nodded. Idden said, And we wanted to ask you why. Why King Shieldstar laid an ambush for his grace's party? She gave me her old impish grin. Knights aren't supposed to know much. You're to be fighters and leave the thinking to us. We were teasing Sir Svan about it as we rode. Your Majesty is as wise as she is beautiful. Thank you, sir. She made me a mock bow. We are Queen of Jotunland. Some sound outside the pavilion told me we were overheard. But a queen without power is a queen without wisdom, we're afraid. Wise enough, however, to know who has it. Why did King Shieldstar want to kill his grace and his knights? I said, I don't think he did, Your Majesty. The ambush wasn't intended for them. They came on it from the rear and were wise enough to detect it. Martyr said, Sir Waddit's giantess did. I would have ridden straight into it. Hila? He nodded. We were traveling without an advance guard. In retrospect, that was foolish. Hidden's eyes had never left my face. If the ambush was not meant for his grace's party, for whom was it meant? Us? I can only speculate, but yes, I think it was. We don't. We were bearing Shieldstar's gifts to King Arnthor. Why would he? To get them back. To begin with, I glanced at Martyr and Beale. Do you want to hear this, my lords? Her Majesty and I can speak privately if you want to rest. Beale said, I do, very much, and Martyr nodded. As you wish. Second, we aren't popular in Jotunland. 
Before he got the crown, we were an asset to Shield Star, fighters he couldn't afford to lose. That's why he helped rescue Sir Svan and his party when they were attacked in the market. Once he was king, we were a liability. His people despise us, and he was associated with us. Fiel nodded. It was one reason I was eager to go. So was I, and I hoped that if we left at the earliest possible moment, there wouldn't be time to arrange something like we saw today. I was wrong, of course. He waited until his ambush was ready before turning the gifts he was sending King Arnthor over to you. Manny rose and appeared to lick Iden's ear, and she said, Wouldn't it have been better to attack us piecemeal, while we're still in Utgard? We wouldn't have had our horses, and some of us wouldn't have had weapons. I shook my head. It would have been a violation of the laws of hospitality. We know, but frost giants? I believe so, your majesty. While I was traveling with a certain friend not so long ago, we were attacked on our way to a castle belonging to giants. We fought them off, reached the castle, and asked for lodging. They lodged and fed us, and entertained us for that matter. While we stayed there, it became obvious that they had been our attackers. We left stealthily, and so avoided the second attack they planned. Slowly, it nodded. We see. It would have given Shieldstar an ill name among his people, something he can't afford. He was trying to wipe out the one he'd gotten already by associating with us. Martyr added, From what you've said, he'd have wanted to do it in public anyway. Kill you in a place where his people could know of it. I agree, Your Grace, but by waiting until his ambush was ready, he ran an awful risk. You might arrive, tripling our strength. He gambled and lost only by a hair. Iden sighed. To get back a few trinkets? Not really, Your Majesty. To humble the small folk who had beaten his more than once. Pygmies, they thought, should be slaves or dead. Also to reclaim that diadem you wear. Gold plates, cups, and amber may seem like trinkets to you, though there are bold men and virtuous women who own nothing half so fine. But there's not a king in Mythgarther who would think the diadem King Gilling gave you a trinket. Beale murmured. He's right, Your Majesty. You must be very careful of it. He loved us, didn't he? I nodded, and Martyr said, He surely must have. We didn't love him. We... We tried to do our duty. She pulled a handkerchief from her sleeve and wiped away her tears. Be a good ruler to our people. For those few short, short days, we believe we were. Gently I said, He knew you couldn't love him. What he got from you was as near to love as anger born can ever come. Thus he loved you and tried to show it. Martyr cleared his throat. You yourself are not one of those bold men who own nothing as fine as a gold plate or an amber necklace, Sir Abel. You have a good horse, as you say, and a good sword. I would have said I had those two if I hadn't seen yours this morning. His bowstring, Iden whispered. I said, yes, your majesty, my bowstring, as you say, and though no one would count my bow as valuable, I made it myself, and I treasure it. I have the Queen of Seven Worlds' swords as well and the best of all dogs. Manny made a sound of disparagement, which I ignored. But no squire, Martyr continued, now that Svan has become Sir Svan, and no land. No, oh, Your Grace. When Lord Beale wanted to see you, we discussed the advisability of rousing you from sleep, and missing some ourselves. You've heard the questions Her Majesty and Lord Beale had. I didn't have any so urgent that I felt justified in keeping you up. I'm always at your service, Your Grace. Yes, I've noticed. Ahem. I can't offer you a new squire, not here and now. I brought no boys, save my own squire. As for lands, well, the deed's at home locked in a drawer. But the place is yours, and I'll give you the deed as soon as I can. Redhall's one of the best manners in my dukedom. Quite fertile and nicely situated on the road to King's Doom. I see you've heard of it. It... I could scarcely speak. It was Sir Ravd's, reverted to me at his death, of course. I've a steward taking care of things. 
You may want to keep him on, or not, up to you. I doubt that I managed to nod. I'll let him know you're coming naturally and give you a letter for him. Eden spoke for me, prompted perhaps by Manny. This is most generous of your grace. Not at all. For a moment Martyr seemed embarrassed. I wish I could do more. No, I will do more. But I can't do it now, not in this wilderness. Later, though, you'll see. I left soon after that, and left abruptly enough to see a tall figure steal off into the shadows. The next day we decided that the Knight of the Leopards should take the rear guard. We all agreed it was the post of greatest danger, and Svan, Garveon, and he were all eager to command there. Garveon led the advance guard, however, and Svan was wounded. That day I rode with the advance guard, and Sir Waddit with me. The plain of Jotunland is a strange and unsettling place, as I have tried to make clear. One sees phantoms, at dawn and twilight particularly. One hears strange sounds and finds inexplicable things, paths going nowhere, and sometimes broken pieces of earthenware pots that were once crudely beautiful. Gila found such a pot about noon, running some distance from the warway to pick it up, and exhibiting it to Waddit and me when she came trotting back. It had been broken at the lip, losing a segment of clay the size of my hand. The rest was complete. Is it not lovely, good Sir Abel? I agreed it was, but explained that I dared not burden Cloud with anything beyond the most necessary. Hymer said that it recalled Idden, which surprised me. It's red and something like... Blue. Waddit took it from him and turned it so its winding stripe took the bleared light of the winter sun, azure, aquamarine, and royal. I'd have said that Her Majesty's white and black mostly, except for the diamonds. I said, I suppose so, or something of the sort. The truth was that I was scanning the road ahead and had stopped paying much attention to Gila's find. Red lips, of course, Waddit finished lamely. But her eyes are dark, not blue. Do you count her friend? Gila asked him. He grinned at her. I don't like her like I like you. That's Sir Svan. And do you care for him, dearest lord? Waddit looked to me baffled, and I said, He does, but not in the sense you mean. I meant what I said, no with the more. Gila tossed the pot aside. Do you count him friend, dearest lord? More than that, Waddit cleared his throat. He's someone I've wronged, Gila, or I think he is. I said, so do I. There were rumors. I didn't like him, so I found it easy to believe them. If Gila understood, nothing in her broad, coarse face showed it. Easy and a lot too convenient. It's wrong. It's something a knight shouldn't do. A man's honor is sacred even if he's not a knight. You believe the best until you see for yourself it's not right. On that morning, the morning of the day after we had left Utgard, this talk of ours seemed no more significant than Gila's broken pot. I have recreated it, however, as well as I can, reading it over, it seems clear that I ought to have realized that Gila was planning to do Idden and Svan some favor, and that her favor would prove no small thing. Chapter 24 A Ride After Supper We traveled all that day, the warmest any of us had enjoyed in some time. There was no sign of pursuit, but we agreed that there were surely Angerborn behind us, a war band formed around the survivors of the battle, strengthened from Utgard and gathering more from each of the lonely farms we had passed. These Angerborn would, we thought, trail us like hounds until we reached the marches of Jotunland, then fall upon us. If we ran, only the best mounted would escape, and perhaps not even they. If we fought, we might prevail, but a ruinous defeat was more likely. If we scattered, we would be hunted down, and those who escaped the true Angerborn would almost certainly fall to the outcasts the Angerborn called mice. 
We decided to fight, of course, if we could not out-travel them, but I privately resolved to ride back that night, not to see whether the Angerborn did in fact pursue us, but to hinder their march if I could. The day grew warmer still, the sort of winter day one gets occasionally in Celadon, when it seems spring cannot be far behind, though spring is months away. The snow on the warway softened to slush, and the horse's legs were muddy to the knees. Gilf panted as he trotted beside me. "'This will slow them, dear lord,' Hela said. "'It turns me sluggard even now.' Her face was streaming sweat. Wadit reined up. "'If you cannot keep the pace—' "'By all that I hold dear, Sir Wadit, I will never leave you.' There was steel in her voice. He seemed taken aback. "'I wasn't going to suggest it. I was going to say that you and I, your brother too—' Might go more slowly and join Sir Leort. I do not weary, Hela insisted. It was clear she did. I told her such weather could not last. Nor can I, Sir Abel? Discomfited, I said nothing. No, you, Hela was panting in a way that recalled Gilf, her tongue lolling from her mouth. Why you name my sire's folk frost giants? Certainly, I said. It's because their raids begin at the first frost. Would they not? War, rather, in fair summer? I tried to explain that we supposed they could not leave their own land until their crops were in. I'd thought, might teach you better. I slowed Cloud's pace, telling Waddit we gained too much on Garveon. He agreed, though he must have known it false. They swelter. I considered that for a time. Old Night, the darkness beyond the sun, is the realm of the giants of winter and old night, and it is ever winter there, as their name implies. Winter and ill-lit, for them, the sun is but another star, though brighter than most. Thus huge eyes, which like the eyes of owls, let them see in darkness, and huge bodies, too, hairy and thick-skinned, to guard against the cold. Telling Waddit to go slow, I went to speak to Martyr. We needn't fear the Angerborn's pursuit in such weather as this, Your Grace. Hela and Hymir can hardly keep up with us, though they're of our blood as well. The greater danger is that we'll tire our horses. We used them hard yesterday. I was thinking the same. If they overtake us with our chargers blown, they'll slaughter us like rabbits. I agree, Your Grace, wholeheartedly. Then stop wherever you find water and grass, he said. We did, and quickly, although we would not have found the spot at all if it had not been for Gila, who told us of it. It was some distance from the warway, which was an added point in its favor. It is difficult for any but a hound to track by night, and if our pursuers were not sharp-eyed, they might pass us by. If that happened, we would take them from behind the next day, while our mounts were still fresh. Unz and Pauk made our camp while I sought a cloud, and Manny offered to climb a tree. Tall ones are rare in Jotunland, but there were a few there, and keep watch. For cats, as he said, see by dark nearly as well as Angerborn. What its camp he and his men made for themselves, while Hymer and Hela stretched sweating on the clean soft grass. We had camped so early that the pavilions were up and every rope tight while the sun was still a hand's breadth above the horizon. Unz had gone to Svan's fire to borrow a light for ours, for it seemed that Vil was uncommonly clever at fire-making, which I thought extraordinary in a blind man. "'Tain't no trick, master,' Unz explained. "'You look for smoke, so do I. That Vil smells it and blows and feels for it. Iden came, with Berthold, to carry her chair. I taught Unz and Pauk to drop to one knee, as one does for a queen, and bow their heads in the proper style. Gilf made his own bow, the dog bow we are too quick to call groveling, when it is in fact simple canine courtesy. Arise, good people, Iden smiled on all of us. Will you dine with us tonight, Sir Abel? His grace will not be there, nor Sir Waddit, nor Sir Leort. Our noble father may attend, though we'll discourage it if we can. I had planned to be off as soon as I had eaten, and muttered something stupid about honor and my allegiance to martyr. 
That's what we thought you'd say. We'll dine with you instead. Have you royal fare, Uns? Answer us honestly. Uns bowed again. You knows me, ma'am. I does what I can, saw, and little enough to do wed. He doesn't, I said. None of us do. Then there's no shame in providing a queen with what you have, Uns. Whatever you'd eat yourself, we assure you we're hungry enough to dine upon the bats of Utgard. She turned to Berthold. You may go. Go back to our pavilion and get what food and rest you can. He bowed and turned away, feeling his way with a stick. Uns is to serve us, Sir Abel? He does normally, Your Majesty, but I would have the honor of serving you myself if I could. It would not prevent you from eating. You're three times our size. If we're famished, you must be starving. If I may serve myself, too, I'll eat with a will. Good. We ask that Uns and Pauk, though we feel certain they're both good men, be kept out of earshot. I told them to remain on the other side of the fire, and, there being small need of warmth on such an evening, to stay well back from it unless Uns' cooking required him to come closer. After that I fetched two wooden trenchers and two jacks of wine that Uns had mixed with water. They'll tell you when the meat's ready? I nodded. Yes, Your Majesty. We'd like bread. Don't tell us it's hard, we know. I brought her half of one of the twice-baked loaves Svan had secured for us before war broke out in the marketplace. One needs a frost giant's teeth to bite this, Idden said, chipping off a piece with her dagger. They have massive jaws, all of them. Did you notice? I nodded and said I had. We asked our husband about it. We were telling him how handsome he was. You understand, we're sure. He said they most enjoy the bones. It was a pity, he said, that we didn't eat them. He explained that we eat the bones of larks and thrushes, and he smiled. We felt so sorry for him. We ought to have asked whether the jaws of the daughters of anger were as strong as those of her sons, but it didn't occur to us at the time. Nor would it have been politic, perhaps. Do you know, Sir Abel, you must have seen a few since we told you of them. No, but I've seen giantesses of the giants of winter and old night, Your Majesty. Have you really? What were they like? In appearance? They change their appearance readily, Your Majesty, just as the men do. The men of the giants of winter and old night, you mean? They must be fabulous creatures. Uns called that our soup was done, and I fetched it. When I had given Idden hers, I said, They are indeed, Your Majesty. You said you'd seen them. The giantesses, at any rate. I've seen the men, too, Your Majesty, and killed a few. Of the women, Scothy is beautiful and kind, though so big in her natural state that feasts are held upon her belly. Idden laughed. You set your table there? Many tables, Your Majesty, and when we sing, she sings along with us, and when we eat, opens her mouth so we can cast dainties into it. Yet at other times she seems only a tall lady, with strong arms and many plates of golden hair, her husband's shield-bearer. We think you mad, though there may be more wisdom in it than in the sanity of other men. What of the rest? Angerboda is a daughter of Anger, Your Majesty, though she wasn't banished from Sky like so many of Anger's brood. I have seen her many times, though only at a distance. Iden smiled. Do you fear her? Yes, because her husband is Lothar, the youngest and worst of the Valfather's sons. If she attacked me, it said she attacks all who come near, I would have to defend myself or perish. We understand. She's hideous, and they say that the time of her womb is a thousand years. When it's complete, she bears a monster and couples with her lord again. It may not be true. Yet you think it may be. You were long in sky? Twenty years, Your Majesty, or about that. But you saw no more than those two? One other, Your Majesty. The memory darkened my mind, as it does even now. Maud Good guards the Bridge of Swords. If it were destroyed, no ghost could visit us, and there are those who'd destroy it. Thus Modgood, a giantess, protects it night and day. Because she does, the ghosts may come forth when Hellgate stands wide. 
Idden spooned up a little soup. We take it she's fierce and well-armed? I don't know what weapons she may have, Your Majesty. She bore none when I saw her. Is she very large? I saw then that Idden would question me until I told her everything, yet I hoped that by telling her much I might hold something back. It's hard to judge the natural size of any of the giants of winter and old night, I said. When one has seen them but once, when I saw her Modgood was no larger than many Angerborn. And in form? A maiden, fair-haired and slighter of limb than any Angerborn I've seen, small at the waist and not wide at hips, though womanly, barefoot and dressed as the poor dress. Yet she frightened you. Say that she impressed me, Your Majesty. In justice to her I must add that she didn't oppose our coming in or our going out. Thunor blessed her and praised her for her care of the bridge, and she received his blessing and his praises graciously and seemed glad of them. Thunor was our leader. I cleared my throat. Many think the Overkinds are always at war with the giants, but that isn't true. There is friendship at times, as well as strife. It nodded solemnly. We know of that. Won't you tell us what we want to hear, the thing you're holding back? Modgood's face is that of death, its naked bone, save for a maiden's eyes. Perhaps it's just a mask. I hope so. Idden stirred her soup and sipped a spoonful. We are glad it was you and not we who saw her, Sir Abel. You will see her, Your Majesty, when you cross the Bridge of Swords. We hope for better. Again Idden sipped, spilling soup from her spoon. We didn't examine you to pass the time. I never thought you did, Your Majesty. Will you stand a few more questions? What think you of Hela? She was your servant once. Only briefly. My own soup was cooling. I tasted it while I considered. She's an outcast, and knows she must always be one. Her brother's an outcast, but not sensible of it. Hela is, and there's poetry in her because of that, and sorrow. In the warm Congress, she's a slattern, and yet I believe she truly loves Sir Waddit. Idden nodded, her dark eyes on the glowing embers of our little fire, or perhaps on Uns and Pauk, who sat eating and talking beyond it. Go on. He doesn't love her as I love Queen Desiree, yet his tenderness is real. And she warms her hands before it. Indeed, Your Majesty, like every poet, she's a clever liar, but too clever a liar to lie much or often. I wouldn't trust her the way I would Pauker Uns but maybe I'm being too hard on her. It may be that we are as well. She came to us tonight, calling us queen, and asked what we knew of our subjects. About the anger born, Your Majesty? So we thought. We told her we had no subjects, that the anger born follow King Shieldstar, that though a queen we do not rule. You're anxious to be off, to ride your wondrous steed among the stars. So would we in your place. She had seen through me like glass. I pretended not to be surprised, and said, The stars are too far for cloud and me, Your Majesty, nor am I as eager to depart as I was. You may go soon. Where are the Angerborn women, Sir Abel? The women who named us queen when we wed? Your Majesty must know better than I do. Idden shook her head. We stayed in a farmhouse on our way to Utgard. Our servant Berthold had been a slave there. You'll recall it, we're sure. I do, Your Majesty, though it seems very long ago. It wasn't. There were slave women, too, as Gerda was on another farm. But of the owner's own women, none. No wife, no sister, no mother. Hela says the women folk of the Angerborn remain our subjects. I asked whether Idden hoped that I could add to what she already knew about them. When she did not reply, I assured her that I could not. She said she'd bring some of our subjects here, and so saying went into the night. Do you think us in danger? From your subjects, I can't say. We're all in danger from the Angerborn, Your Majesty. Of course. When Hela left, we called for Gerda. She's lived among them most of her life, and she kept her eyes. We asked where the women were, the wives of the Angerborn we see. We won't tell you all, she said. Much of it was foolish. She said she'd seen them from a distance, and they frightened her. 
that they have their own land, far away. No doubt I looked incredulous. Your Majesty once said the same, I believe. We did not, for that was not what they had told us. Our race would die out if we women lived in one nation and you men in another, and I know of no beast that lives so. Besides, if the females were so far away, how was it Gerda had seen some? So we popped her into the fire, you know what we mean, and wouldn't let her out till she'd told us everything. You see them early in the morning mostly, very early, before the sun is up, or before moonrise. For more than our lifetime, Gerda had to rise and dress by firelight, milk four cows, and turn them out to pasture. Do you know what frightened us when we were at Utgard? The place itself, I imagine, and the Angerborn. Only some of them, the ones with two heads or four arms. We don't know why. They were no worse than the others, but they did. For half a minute, perhaps, Idden gave her attention to her soup. Then she said, Who killed our husband, Sir Abel? I told her I did not know. We feel it was one of those monsters. There was one with a lot of legs. Did you see him? Like a spider. A big eye and two small ones. Idden shuddered. There was one covered with hair as well. We hated him. Hated the sight of him, we mean. He may have been a perfectly worthy subject for all we know, and he was a member of our husband's guard. But when you rode over them on your wonderful horse and slew a score... Not as many as that, Your Majesty. A score at least with your arrows, and we were shooting arrows too, with the maids we'd taught to shoot, or anyway, with the ones who had stomach enough for it. We kept hoping that one would be him, and we'd see him and put an arrow into his eye. It didn't happen, but that was what we hoped. I've wondered about these things, I told her. The Angerborn were cast out of sky because they were inferior, not because they were evil. Many of the giants of winter and old night were as bad or worse, because they didn't measure up in some fashion. It may have been because they had lost the ability, which the giants of winter and old night certainly have, to change size and shape. Having lost it, they may have been judged unfit for sky. You were there? Seeing what was coming, I did not nod. Could you do that, then? Turn into an eagle or a bull? Or... Or be smaller than Manny. I smiled. Who'd catch and eat me, and serve me right too. Can't you see how foolish this is, Your Majesty? You were a very poor liar before you went to Skye. You aren't much better now. I explained that nothing I had said had been a lie, that it would indeed be foolish to make myself smaller than Manny. Can you do it? I shook my head. No, no, Your Majesty, I cannot. Am I lying now? Setting my soup bowl in my lap, I raised both hands to sky. Volfather, be my witness. I cannot do either of those things. You're not lying, but you're holding something back. No doubt I sighed. When I came back, the Volfather required an oath, one I dare not break. I had to swear I'd use none of the abilities I'd been given there. I gave it. Do you think that was cruel of him? We doubt that he is ever cruel, Idden said. But you must think him so. I don't. He's wiser than any mere man, wiser even than the lady, though she's wise beyond reckoning. He knows how much harm such powers can do here. Remember Taug? Of course. In his village people worship the elf. It's a false worship, and it does harm to them and their neighbors. Isn't the Most High God as high as the Valfather? Idden said, We'd always understood he was higher. That's right. But there are those who say he's lower, inflicting on the Valfather such humiliation as they cannot conceive. If I were to use the powers he gave, there might spring up a cult to rival his, with worshippers claiming I was his superior. He'd be humiliated, and they'd be as far from the truth as those people in Glenadam. As it was, his kindness to me exceeded all reason. He let me take Cloud. I set aside my bowl and rose. We've talked enough, Your Majesty, surely. May I go? Eat your meat, 
and let us eat ours, and you may go with our blessing if we may go too. I must have gawped at her like a jerk. Are we so weighty? Your arms and armor will outweigh us by a stone, and your saddle's big enough for two, when the second's our size. Besides, clouds carried us before. I fumbled for words, and at length managed to say, Your Majesty will be in some danger. She smiled. Eden had always had a charming smile with a hint of mockery in it. Our Majesty is in danger here, Sir Abel. Our Majesty will be in less on your wonderful horse's back, with you to protect us, than Our Majesty would be in here with Sir Abel and his wonderful horse gone. Sir Svan would not like to hear that. It nodded. Nor need he unless you tell him. But really, Sir Abel, he is wounded, and not such a fool as to rate himself with you if he weren't. Do you think he has spoken to the Valfather as a knight to his liege? Do— I hope he has, I told her. He should have. Out of my ignorance I neglected his training when he was my squire. I didn't realize at the time how badly I was neglecting it. But I can't believe Sir Ravd neglected it at all. If he didn't, Sir Svan has talked to the Valfather as his knight. Eden rose, and though she was small, she seemed tall at that moment. We are properly rebuked. Rebuked, we remain a queen. Take us with you. We ask a boon. I knelt. A boon that does me far too much honor, your majesty. I was... Your condescension stunned me. As your courtesy gratifies us, perhaps it would be best if we mounted first, then took our foot from the stirrup. But here's our meat. It was not quite as easy as that, of course. I had to call Cloud and saddle and bridle her with Pauk's help. She'll be tired, Idden said, and I thought that some small part of her regretted her decision. Not she, your majesty. She might be ridden in war a long day through, yet remain fresh enough for this. Cloud's thoughts had confirmed my words before I spoke them. May we stroke her? I nodded, and she caressed Cloud's muzzle very gently, as all who know horses do. Uns brought my saddlebags. I told him I would leave them with him, since we would be returning in an hour or two. They cannot have weighed as much as Idden, but they must have come near it, and I left my lance with Uns as well. If your majesty will do me the honor, I knelt with linked hands to help her. She did, but sprang up so lightly that I doubt she required the least assistance. Having mounted first, she sat before me. I would guess she had planned it, wishing me to ride as I did, with the perfume of her hair in my nostrils, embracing her when Cloud mounted that steep of air none but she could see. Might I have had her? Few men know less of human women than I do, and it may be she only wished for me to want to. She did not speak until the steep ended and we galloped at a level, with Gilf running ahead and wood and plain unrolling beneath us. Then she said, Oh, this is grand, and breathed again, as my sword arm told me. Of all the times I rode above Mithgarther, I recall that one best, the unnatural warmth of the wind and the glooming towers of the snow clouds to the west. Lesser clouds, with the moon behind them, filling sky with silvery light. A queen before me, and the Valfather's castle floating among the stars. Idden's black velvet gown, her diamond diadem and perfumed hair. The soft pliancy of her waist, which made me desire her so much I took my arm away. Why do you ride to Utgard, Sir Abel? I won't, Your Majesty, unless it happens so. We are retracing the warway in search of our pursuers. Shouldn't we have seen them by now? She pointed. On the horizon? Those are the battlements of Utgard, surely? I agreed and urged Cloud forward. Soon the wind grew chill. Idden drew her cloak about her, and Gilf stopped panting. Twice we circled Utgard, a few lonely lights still shone, but we rode so high that no one there could have seen us. A little snow fell, and Idden shivered and begged me to hold her again. I did, and drew my cloak around us both. 
We thought our velvet too warm all day, and too warm even by night, but wore it for its morning color. Now, why is your dog leaving us? Gilf's deep-throated bay had reached us, borne on the still air. He's scented something, I explained, and sent Cloud after him. From way up here? Idden sounded incredulous. He can't possibly sniff the ground. I don't know what is possible to him, Your Majesty, but you've hunted deer and the like. Haven't you ever seen your hounds course with their heads high? On a hot trail, yes. Yes, often. That's because the scent is in the air. It's not a man's feet that leave the scent. If they did, the best dog in Methgarther couldn't track a man in new boots. It comes from the groin and under the arms, mostly. Some settles and some hangs in the air and blows away or drifts, which is why even the best hounds put nose to the ground on a cold trail. He's lower than we are, but not much, because he has to go no lower to catch the scent. I doubt that he's following one man, or even two or three. They didn't go by the warway. No, I said, and it was my turn to point. See that lighter streak? That was the road they followed, I think. Then they can have nothing to do with us. I shrugged. She could not have seen it, but perhaps she felt it. We're not camped by the warway, Your Majesty. No. In the place Hela told us about. Iden was silent a moment. We see what you mean. I meant no more than I said. There they are. Look under the trees. Far ahead, Gilf had halted, and it seemed to me that he was looking at me. I shook my head, hoping he could see it. Are we going back now? As soon as I get a closer look. You'd like to fight, wouldn't you? You'd surprise them while they slept if we weren't here. It was true, but I denied it. But we... we're glad we are. They're not our subjects, really. They won't obey us, but they were his, and we... You're their queen, whether they'll obey you or not. Yes, she sounded grateful. We can wake up a few and tell them so, Your Majesty. It'll be dangerous, but I'll do it if you want me to. She sighed. They will only say that they serve King Shieldstar. No. I think you're wise. The time may come, but this isn't it. I whistled for Gilf, and we rode away. Did you count them? Reminded of Sir Ravd, I shook my head. We did. More than two score. There were probably more among the trees we didn't see. I said, we won't fight them unless we have to. You and Sir Svan and Sir Garveon. Yes, your father too, and his grace. Sir Wadet and Sir Leort, with the archers and men-at-arms. Also Hymer and Hela, and the servants. Against fourscore Angerborn? Against whatever number we face. Gilf too. Gilf's worth a hundred good men, your majesty. We want you to promise us something, Sir Abel. We want you to promise you'll let us talk to them first. Will you? I will, Your Majesty. I felt my heart sink, although I knew that she was right. As you've helped us, we will help you. You're not the only one to give a pledge to the Wanderer. Remember what we told you about Hela? That she'd bring your subjects to do homage? Yes, Your Majesty, I haven't forgotten that. That the women are still my subjects. What you told me of the giants in the sky did nothing to allay my fears. I knew I could have said more and frightened her worse. Would Hela do it if she thought they might harm me? I laughed to think she expected me to fathom a woman's heart. I can't say. I'll stand by if you want. She shook her head. If they are ours, we are theirs, and we must trust them. Then I wished we were not in the saddle so that I could kneel to her. Chapter 25 Lost The unnatural warmth had left us, and the air lay so thick with freezing fog that I could not see my outstretched hand. Vil came, found wood for us, and rekindled the fire. Pauk asked whether he should saddle Cloud. I told him no, to wait until the fog lifted. Martyr and Beal came. I offered the same advice, and they agreed. Beale said he thought the fog more than natural, to which I said nothing. Martyr said, You don't think so, Sir Abel. Tell us. 
I consider the fog wholly natural. Beale shook his head. You know more of wizardry. No, my lord. Then I, but I can't agree. The Aussie's magic has created it. I've tried to counter it. I admit I've had no success. Martyr tugged his beard. I don't know you as well as I want to, but I know you well enough to feel sure you have a reason for saying what you do. What is it? I rode back to Utgard late last night, Your Grace. He nodded. Her Majesty told us. There was no fog, but there were a few lights high in the keep, and one a bit lower. We liked the warm weather. Recalling Hela and Hymir, I added, Or most of us did, but the warmth we liked too much to question was the Aussie's work, I would say. After Her Majesty and I returned, he ceased his effort, and winter closed its jaws on us again. Martyr nodded. Chilling the air. That would do it. Beale nodded, too, I think mostly to himself. No wonder I couldn't counter him. He wasn't doing anything. Can you raise a wind? Martyr asked. Yes, of course. That should clear it off. Martyr stood up. We'll wait here until it's gone, but we should be ready to leave as soon as we can see. Together they disappeared into the blank gray around us. I'll be here forever if they mean it, Vil whispered. I asked about Taug. Better than he was. You think them ladies Hela's fetchin' might help, master? They knows herbs men don't sometimes. I agree, and maybe they can. But how is it you know about Hela's errand, Phil? Did she tell you? No, sir. His empty socket stared into an obscurity no adept could lift. I wasn't listening in, I swear. You would never do such a thing, I hope. Well, I might. Only I didn't. I was busy setting up for Master Taug. He's mending, like I said, only he's shamed, Master, to talk to you. He wants to come round, only he's that shamed. He won't hardly talk to Sir Svan, even. Pauk cleared his throat and spat. I been taken aback myself, Phil. Who ain't? We might rag him now and then. I mean, uns and me might, if we knew what twas, which I don't. Only we wouldn't mean no harm, would we, uns? I won't, no, sir. Him Squire Taug, Pauk. If he won't come to us, I said, we've got to go to him. But I doubt that it's kidding he's afraid of. Have you stolen while you were here with us, truthful Vil? No, sir. Vil held up his hands. Not nothing, sir. I wouldn't steal from you, master, ever. You can search me or have your men here do it. Whatever way you choose. I smiled. Much good that would do. If you've stolen and your conscience pains you, you've only to bring it back. You won't be punished. I wouldn't never steal from you, Sir Abel. You've my word on that. Then go, I said. When Vil had gone, Uns asked what he had taken. I don't know, but I could see Gilf didn't trust him, and he knew about Hela's errand. What's that, master? Pauk answered. Gone to fetch ladies, is what he said. I told them that I wanted my mail cleaned, and all the horse gear well washed with saddle soap, which put an end to their gossiping. When they were busy, I took Gilf aside and asked what Vil had taken, but he only said, Don't know, and don't see. This last meaning, I think, that his world was the world of smells and sounds. He did not say, Ears up, as he often did yet it seemed implied. Svan came asking to speak to me privately. There's no privacy here, I said, less even than there is at night. We can't tell when others may be listening. Then promise you won't repeat what I say, I refused. You are, he seemed to find his words difficult, the greatest knight of us all. I doubt it, but what of it? It's what everyone says, Sir Garveon and Lord Beale, Sir Wadded and His Grace the Duke, even Queen Idden. I thank the gracious overkinds for Sir Leart. Him too, I forgot him. I was your squire, not for long I know. Long enough for a journey that seemed long to us. I remember, for a moment it appeared he would say no more than that. I didn't like you, and you didn't like me, I agreed. 
You said once that you were the boy who threw my sword in the bushes. You can't have been, but you said you were. I am. But you're the greatest knight. In a month, my leg will heal. Will you fight when it does? I mean to challenge you. I'd rather you fought gladly, that we engaged as friends. I will, I promised, but not here in Jotunland. Svon rarely smiled, but he smiled then. It's settled, good. Will you give me your hand? We clasped hands as friends should. Why wouldn't you promise to keep my confidence? Because I had no idea what you might say. Suppose you said you intended to betray us. Or that I'd betrayed Sir Ravd, which is what everyone else says? The smile vanished. That would trouble me less, but if I'd given my word that I'd keep your secret, I'd keep it. If it were that you meant to betray us to the Angerborn, I'd fight you now and kill you if I could. But I'd never reveal what you told me. Svan nodded slowly. I understand. You really thought it might be something like that. I feared it. I didn't mean that your confidences or anyone's will be served at dinner like venison. But you don't have my word, I won't reveal them, nor will you get it. He seemed about to choke. I love Idden. Her Majesty. Is that another confidence? I knew it already, and there can't be many who don't. I think she... she... She does, I'm sure. But she's a queen, and I... My father was a baron. But you're not, or at least not at present. This is why you want to fight me, isn't it? It's part of it, yes. Would you like me to lose, to yield to you, after a considerable struggle, of course? Certainly not. What if I win? Svan held himself very straight. I'll live or die like other vanquished knights. If I die, in a way I hope I will, it will be with Her Majesty's favor on my helm. I congratulated him. Though I engage the greatest knight in Mythgarther, I won't be worthy of her. But I'll be more nearly worthy. Sir Waddit fought you, so did Sir Leort and his grace. You have given me part of your reason, I said. Will you give me the rest? Because you took my sword. It unmanned me, and you thought me a coward. If that was really you? It was. His hard, handsome face, made human by its broken nose, was entirely serious as he said, Then I must prove myself. You already have, I told him. He shook his head, and as if eager to talk of something else, said, This fog, isn't it ever going to lift? I mentioned my concern for Taug, and Svan shrugged. I said, If you could contrive some little errand and send him to me, I'd appreciate it. Certainly. As soon as I get back, he despairs. Svan seemed to expect a comment, so I said, I know. Atella helps him more than I've been able to. That's natural. Her mother, too, Linnet. And Vil does what he can, showing him his tricks and getting him to describe what he saw, then showing him, sometimes, how the trick was done. He'll get over it. Boys always do. I nodded, although I was not sure I agreed. Svan turned to go. I've been thinking, he turned back. I should tell you. All my life men have told me they were helped by this one or that one. No one ever helped me. Sir Ravd tried. Yes, but now someone has. You gave me the accolade, elevated me to knighthood. Were you really authorized to do it, by a ruler? I was and I am. By the queen you say knighted you? The queen of the Moss Elf? I shook my head. I won't ask any more. His grace was surprised to find me a knight. At first he thought Lord Beale had done it. I told him it was you and expected all sorts of objections, but I was wrong. He just congratulated me. Then he asked if I'd given allegiance to you. I said I hadn't. That I had given it to Lord Beale. You were there. I nodded again. It was very informal. I suppose we'll do it over when we get back if we do. I said we would, but that the ceremony would not take place. Not because his lordship will refuse, but because you'll ask to be released. Yours will be another liege. Idden. Her Majesty, I nodded. I've thought of that. I... She has no one, nothing, and I've land from her father, Swiftbrook, 
It's not much, I'm sure, but I might win more. You will. Thank you. Thank you for everything. You taught me more than you realize. He turned again and was lost in the fog after a step or two. When I could no longer see him, I heard him say, We'll engage when we get home. You agreed. Perhaps she'll accept me after that. From the sound of his voice, he was still quite near. An hour passed, or at least a time long enough to seem an hour. When the sun is invisible, it can be hard to judge. Manny joined me, saying, Do you like this? Our fire? I knew it was not what he meant. No, not much. The wood's wet. The fog? No, it's wet too. Neither do I. He jumped into my lap and made himself comfortable. You know, dear owner, I wish you'd taken me along when you and the queen went riding. You were in one of my saddlebags, I suppose. I should have thought of that. As if you didn't. But if I'd heard you, I might be able to offer advice. Don't tell me you're able. I know it. I don't make that sort of joke. Oh, no. No, really, you don't. Yours are better, but often you think no one understands. And you, I said, and stroked his back. You haven't told anyone about the... About that room? Lord Theozzi's room? About your experience there, you mean? No. Thank you. I think about it. I think about it a lot. I'm not usually that way. Introspective? No, you aren't. Will I really be free when the cat dies? You said something about that, or somebody did, and Hold says it too, that I'll be an elemental once more. I was not sure he wanted an answer, but he insisted he did. No, I told him. No, you won't. She says elementals aren't really alive, but just think they are, so they can't die. I told him she was correct. So I'll be free. That's what she says. The elemental will be free, no longer having any share in life. You're not the elemental, or the cat. You're both, and the cat will die like other cats. I'd like to think that I'm just the other thing. The thing that talks. Then I'll cut off your ear and we'll see if it hurts. You would, wouldn't you? Manny's voice, always fairly close to the mews and purrs of a common house cat, had become more so, though I could still understand him. No. I drew my dagger and he vanished into the night. Svan had promised to send Taug and I waited some time for him, warming my hands and thinking of desiree and the things I would have to do before I searched for her. I had promised to fight Svan, under the circumstances I could not do otherwise, and it was possible he might wound me badly, in which case my search would be further delayed. It was at least as possible I would kill him to prevent it. At length it seemed clear that he had neglected to send Taug, or that Taug had been unavailable for some reason, and I remembered what I had said to Uns, that we would have to go to Taug if Taug would not come to us. Motioning to Gilf, I rose. I knew which way Vil had gone, and made myself behave, as I picked my way through the fog, as a blind man would, walking in what I imagined to be the correct direction, groping the ground with my sheathed sword, and stopping every few steps to listen. Soon I heard voices, followed by a deep grinding or grating that I could not at once identify. Someone, I was nearly certain it was Fawn, spoke. Then someone else, who might perhaps have been Taug himself. The grinding came again, the sound one hears when one heavy stone slides on another, the sound that precedes an avalanche. Another step. I heard the voice I now felt certain was Taug say, if you said you killed him, that might do it. Never have I been so tempted to eavesdrop. I called, Taug, is that you? And nearly choked on my own words. Master. It was stone on stone. I knew then to whom it belonged. 
Yes, I said. I'm here, Org. He was not the most terrifying creature I have seen, for I have seen dragons, but he was terrifying, and never more so than on that blind gray morning. It was all I could do to keep from drawing eternity. He knelt and bowed his head, repeating, Master. I laid my hand on it, and it was hot as fever, like the stones that are heated to warm a bed. Sir Abel? That voice was Fawn's. I called, Yes. Less loudly, I spoke to the crouching monster before me. Have you been bad, Org? Many. He looked up as he spoke. There was unspeakable cruelty in his slitted eyes, but suffering too. Did you kill King Gilling? Answer honestly. I will not blame or punish you. No, master. I nodded. I never thought you did, Org. Svan emerged from the fog. He might easily have done it. Wouldn't you agree? So might I, I said. So might you or several others, but it's beside the point. He's an evil creature. We know it, and so does he. Confess to having betrayed Sir Ravd. Svan took a quick step back. No, I didn't. I shrugged. You see? You mean I'm an evil creature, too? So am I. Why do we fight, if not to purge our evil? We're afraid to die and afraid to live, afraid of what we may do. So we shout and charge. If we were good— Liston had come near enough for me to recognize him. Where's Taug? I asked him. Svan said, With you, I thought. You sent him to me? Yes, with Atella, her mother, and Vil. She insisted. When I said nothing, he added, I thought you'd send them away if you wanted to talk to Taug alone. Gilf whined, pressing his shoulder against my hip. I had not been aware that he had followed me. I said, Let's hope we find them when this clears. Has Org served you well? You overheard us. I heard your voices, nothing of what you said. Wiston started to speak, but Svan silenced him with a wave of his hand. Do you want him back? Org himself said, Yes. I should have thanked you for him. I mean, when— When you shared your confidence. Svan nodded. Yes, then. But I'm so used to hiding the fact that I have guardianship of him. You must find it a heavy responsibility. He nodded again. I've done my best for him, as well as for the rest of us. I've protected him from us and us from him, or tried to. I'm sure you have. Wiston said, This is my fault, Sir Abel. What is? I had guessed, but it seemed best to ask. Sir Svan was alone except for the madwoman. Lady Linnet. Her, and I didn't think she mattered. Her daughter had told me. Had told me enough, anyway. I said, I'm a friend of Taug's, and I think Atella thought Taug must have told me about Org. I saw him once or twice when we were in Utgard. Svan added, I suppose most of us did. I nodded, feeling Gilf press my leg. So I thought it might help Taug if Org were to say, not to everyone, just to the ones that matter, that he'd killed the king. This was an entirely new idea. I said, you think Taug did it and he's feeling guilty? I assure you he didn't. No, not at all. Svan cleared his throat. He was with Wiston the first time King Gilling was stabbed, isn't that correct, Wiston? Wiston nodded. And he was fighting beside me when the king was killed, so it's quite impossible, but Wiston thinks others believe him guilty. Her Majesty. Wiston added, His lordship, too, her father. He won't say it, but he does. And thinks he can't believe Sir Svan and me because we're his friends. I'm... I am his friend, so it's true. If I thought he'd done it, I'd lie to save him. Svan said, I wouldn't. Why are you looking around? The air stirred. It hasn't since this fog came. Gilf wanted to tell me something a minute ago, and I imagine that was what it was. My hand was on his head. I felt his nod. It wasn't a breeze, but on a ship sometimes when you're becalmed, a sail stirs and everyone looks and smiles. Soon it stirs again if you're lucky. The thing that stirs it isn't really a wind, only air that's been moved by a wind far away. But you're desperate for wind, and when the sail stirs, you know one's on the way. May your words reach the ears of other kinds, Svan said. 
I had not thought him religious, and I said so. I felt they'd betrayed Sir Roft and me. You're going to ask if I expected them to fight beside me. Yes, I suppose I did. I've outgrown that, or hope I have, he turned to Whiston. Becoming a knight, does it? That and wounds? Whiston said. He's trying to protect me, Sir Abel, so I'd better tell you. Squires have honor to uphold, too. Of course they do. I thought his ogre. Could you send him away now? He bothers you. Yes, sir, he does. Will you, Sir Abel? I shook my head. I'd sooner send you, Whiston. Say what you have to say and go. I thought Org had killed the king. He says he didn't. Weary with standing and weary with waiting, I leaned upon Eterney. Go on. Anyway, I thought he had, and Atella told me he belonged to Sir Svan. So, went to Sir Svan, and said if Org confessed to Queen Idden and her father, and of course to his grace, I didn't think they'd punish him, and Taug wouldn't think they thought he had done it any more. You should say Her Majesty, not Queen Idden. I will, Sir Abel. For a minute I forgot. Well, Sir Svan said he didn't think his ogre had done it, but we'd find him and ask him. So we went, you know, out here in the wood, and he called him, and... and... He came. Yes, sir, Whiston gulped. I mean, Sir Abel. I never had seen him up close, but he wouldn't say he did it even after Sir Svan explained. So I wanted him just to say it, to tell them he did even if he didn't. That's when you came. I understand, but I wish you were half as concerned for Taug's safety as you are for the state of his feelings. He's lost in this with Lady Linnet, Atella, and Vil, it seems, and the four of them may meet with something worse than Org. A nice, steep drop, for example. I hope not, Sir Abel. Or a bear, or any of a thousand other things. Would you like to meet Org when you were wandering in this? Whiston shook his head and backed away. Then return to the camp directly and quickly. Sir Svan and I are about to send him away as you asked. Whiston turned and ran. Svan gave me a tight-lipped smile. He requires a bit of seasoning. He does, but he's getting it. Taug requires rescuing, apparently, and he's not getting that. My mind touched clouds, but she had neither saddle nor bridle. Will you send Org to look for him, and Linnet and the rest? Svan nodded and told Org to stand. He rose and seemed larger than I had ever seen him. Uns had said he caught him young, but he had been so fearsome when I fought him that it had never occurred to me that he might not be full-grown. Org, Svan said, I know you were listening. I don't want you to harm any of our party, not if you understand. Org nodded. I want you to search this wood for Taug and for Atella, Linnet, and Vil. If you find them, bring them back unharmed. Do you understand? Org nodded again. He had been dark, doubtless because Svan had told him to make himself visible. He grew fog pale as Svan spoke. Go now. Org vanished much more swiftly than Whiston had. He won't harm them, Svan said, or I don't think he will. It may depend on how hungry he is. I remarked that he had rescued Taug and Atella in the town beyond the walls of Utgard. He fed well there, Svan told me. There was always killing, and he killed half a dozen Angerborn when Sir Garvayon and I fought their champions. Their friends buried them, but he robbed the graves. He says, Do you want to hear this? I told him to go ahead. He says there's no better eating than a corpse that's been dead a week in a cold climate. Do you want him back? I shook my head. He's a useful follower, but... I said I understood, and calling Gilf to me, asked him to cast about for Taug's scent. I should look for them myself, Svan said. That's an amazing dog you have. He used to irritate me almost as much as Pauk. But I'd love to have him, or one like him. I said, I hope that some day you will. I doubt it, but it's pleasant to think about. The handsome, tight-lipped smile came and went. Before I fetch my horse, will you answer one question, for old time's sake? I said that ignorance would prevent my answering many questions and honor many others, but I would not lie to him. Do you think I killed His Majesty? Certainly not. 
I was fighting, both times. Both times when he was stabbed, I was fighting. Had you thought of that? I shook my head. Well, I have. Swan looked troubled. I've thought about it often, and even talked about it with Her Majesty. I could have done it so easily. Yes, I said. I suppose you could. The first time particularly, the night we fought his champions. My sword was in my hand. It was dark, and there was a great deal of noise and confusion. Pandemonium. Iden has described it to you, I know. I nodded and added that Taug and others had as well. As I spoke, we heard Gilf give tongue. He had struck the scent. I listened for a moment, as did Svan, and said that if the fog had not deceived me, he was already some distance away. I'll get my horse, Svan said, and was soon lost to sight. Privately, I hoped he would not become lost, too. For an hour I did my best to follow Gilf's voice, a deep-throated bay when the trail was plain, small sounds when some vagary of terrain made it difficult. Just before I caught up with him, I heard the silver notes of a trumpet, faint and far through fog that swirled and thinned as the wind rose, telling martyrs' folk to put out their fires and saddle up. Overtaking Gilf, I warned him that we might have trouble catching up even if we found Taug. More distinctly than usual, he said, Not alone. Taug? No, of course not. Linnet, Atella, and Villa with him. Or at least I hope they're still with him. More. Gilf sniffed the ground again and growled. I cannot say there was fear in that growl, but he grew larger and darker as I watched, and when he spoke again, turning to repeat that Taug and the others were not alone, his head was as big as my war saddle and his fangs longer than my hand. Nor are you, a voice behind me said. Chapter 26 Sea Dragons The slope descended for whole leagues, so it seemed to me, and if it did not, if I am somehow mistaken, it is because I have made the distance less than it was. How far to Aelfris, no one asks, for all who know Aelfris, even by repute, know that no man has found the league that will measure the way. How far to summer, sir? How many steps? How far to the dream my mother had? The trees grew great and greater, until those of the wood we had left behind us in Mythgarther seemed shrubs. The fog, which had been thinning, darkened from white to yellow. Gilf sniffed the air, and I did the same, and said, The sea. Does it please you, lord? Uri grinned at me, and I recalled all the fires we had fed together, the flying horror she had been, and the moaning elf-maid who had trembled in the lush grass beside the durian tree, red as sunset and too weak to rise. I found I was smiling, it would, if I weren't needed in Mythgarther. How much time has passed while I idled here in Aelfris? A year? Not an hour, lord. You have only walked a few steps. But I'll walk many more before I find my friends. Not at all. Would you see them? Come with me. She led us through trees where no path ran, and out upon a point of naked rock, with swirling fog to either side. I protested that I could see nothing, and Gilf backed away to shelter among the trees again. You will in a moment, Lord, when the fog lifts. Uri linked her arm with mine, perhaps to assure me that I need not fear the height, and I found her no elf maid but a human woman, slender and naked, with a floating mass of hair like a smoky fire. A shower pelted us with rain, and was gone. The fog parted. Through the rent I glimpsed the stone-strewn beach below, the white-maned waves that pounded it with every beat of my heart, and beyond them, where the water was no longer clear or green but deepest blue, the head and shoulders, claws and wings of a snow-white dragon greater than Grengarm. There are no words for the way I felt. If I were to say here that my heart sunk, or that I felt I had been gutted like a deer, what would that mean to you? Nor would it be true, since I felt far worse. 
cold sweat ran down my face, and I leaned on my sword, fearful my knees would not support me. Uri spoke, but I did not reply, nor can I recall what she said. Her voice was lovely, but the singing of a bird would have conveyed as much or more. The fog closed, and the white dragon was lost to view. Bad, 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 that was Gilf barking from the shelter of the trees. Your master will not think so, Uri told him. He has built his fame on the slaying of these creatures. Think of the joy in the golden hall. Her arm held mine more tightly. I had not meant you to see Kulili so, Lord, and yet— You're glad I did, so you can bear witness to my fear and shame. I tried to turn to go, but she grappled my arm, and upon that narrow outcrop I did not wish to oppose her. Not glad, amused. Kulili has defied armies. You would frighten me more if you could. You are my lord. She turned to look me in the face, and her own held beauty beyond that of mortal women, though her eyes were yellow fire. If you fear her, you will not fight her, and if you do not fight her, you will live. I have bantered with you often, lord. Too often. I watched the swirling fog, fearful that it would part again. If I had seen the white dragon when it did, I might have thrown Uri from the precipice and fled. As you say, I am not bantering now. A second death for you, here, may mean oblivion. Do you think to ascend beyond your Valfather? I shook my head. Nor will you, Lord, if you die again, here or in Mythgarther, you may perish utterly. This I hold is that part of the Abel who was which survived. Sir Abel, I told her, you demean yourself. I watched the fog in silence. Garveon and Svan are knights. Sir Garveon, they say, and Sir Svan and bask in your reflected glory, as those who come after us will bask in ours. You're going to fight Kalili anyway, aren't you? You're going to fight her alone and perish from the world? I did not speak, but in my mind Gawain knelt again, baring his neck. Did you see Garseg and the rest? No, I said. The Isle of Glass? That surprised me. I confessed that I had not, but only the white dragon, nothing more. Then we must stay. Garseg and some sea-elf wait on the beach, but we must remain until you see the isle, so you will know that Garseg's words are true. He is a demon out of Muspel, I said. He was your friend, and would be your friend again if you would permit it. Baki wanted me to come here and kill him. I have seen, Lord, that you will not. I did not believe then, and do not believe now, that Uri had power over the fog which had been thinning as we spoke. Whether or not she possessed such power, the fog cleared a little. The white dragon had vanished beneath the waves. Far off I beheld the Tower of Glass, and its top, which had been lost in cloud when I had seen it in Garseg's company, was just visible where it rose into Mithgarther. At the sight I understood, as never before, that the land we walk on there, and the sea we sail on there, are in sober fact the heaven of Alfris. I saw the isle, the tops of a few trees, and its beach. Five tiny figures waited there, and though they were so small, I knew that they were Vil, Tau, Gatella, Linnet, and another. One waved to me. Perhaps I should write here of our descent of the cliffs to the beach below. I will not, because I recall so little. Desiree, Gawain, and Berthold swam through my mind, with the Valfather and many another, one of them a boy who had lain in the grass of the downs and seen a hundred strange things in clouds, a flying castle among them. Garseg greeted us, in form a venerable man of the sea-elf, as I had first seen him, and seen him most often. He embraced me as a father, and I him. 
They have slandered me to you, he said, and I dared not come to you. You would have slain me. I swore that I would not. Uri and Baki told you I was Cetar, and you believed it. They are your slaves, I said, though they pretend to be mine. How could I not believe it? Another man of the elf, as it appeared, came near. If he denied it, would you credit him? His eyes were endless night, his tongue aflame. If he is Cetar, I said, Cetar is not as I was told. Garseg nodded. I am Cetar. Let us leave these others and sit alone for a moment. I will explain everything. We left them, walking a hundred paces or so along the beach. When we had seated ourselves upon stones, I whistled Gilf to me. It would be better, Garseg said, if we were to. Cetar cannot fear a dog, he shrugged. Cetar fears interruption, as all do who must unravel complexities. It was I who taught you of the strength of the sea. Do you acknowledge that? I do, I have never denied it. Not even to the Val father? Least of all to him. I wished then and mightily that he stood at my side, not because I longed for his spear, but because I longed for his wisdom, which surpasses that of all other men. You have said you are my friend, Sir Abel, and those words I will treasure always. Garseg fell silent, staring out to sea, where mist mingled with white spume. Let me unravel what has occurred here. There is much that is wrong, and I am to blame for much of it. I had plans. They went awry. Such things I hope do not befall you. Only too often they do. My eyes had followed his, and I was looking at the Tower of Glass. It seemed far indeed, and I could no longer see the isle at its summit. I am of Muspel. So was Grengarm, whom you slew. I waited. You are a man of Mythgarther, and a good man. Are all the men of Mythgarther good? I do not ask whether they are all as good as you. I know they cannot be, only whether they are good at all. I would like to think there is some good in the worst of them, but on balance. I thought then of Master Thope. He had sought to save me when the Duke's knights would have killed me. For that effort to protect the Duke's honor, he had been stabbed in the back. On balance, I said, many who think themselves good are not. Just so. You have been to Sky. I have not. Let us leave aside the giants of winter and old night. They are for the most part evil as I understand it, and some say they are entirely so. We will not speak of them. Among the overkinds are there some in whom the worse part outweighs the better. I explained that there was said to be one at least, and that the rest, though they punished him, did not take his life for his brother's sake. Here in Aelfris. The elf are worse than we, if anything. So in Muspel. There are many who are strong and very wise, though not good. Grengarm was neither the strongest nor the worst. They plotted to seize this fair world and despoil it. I tried to dissuade them, for the elf should be the objects of our reverence, as the overkinds are yours. I tried, as I say. I failed. He sighed so that my heart went out to him. When I saw, at last, that it was no use, I determined to frustrate them. I came here. He spread his hands, mocking himself with a wry smile. Humbly I warned the elf of their danger. Some believed me, but most did not. They are divided into many clans, as you must know. I warned them that if they did not unite against us, they must fall to us one by one. Those who had refused to credit me refused to credit that as well. Among those who believed, some would not merge clans with the rest. 
Your queen Desiree was one of those. You see I am being completely honest with you. You are my friend, I told him, when I was wounded and needed one badly. Now I must ask about other friends, those upon the Isle of Glass. How did they get there? Garseg shrugged. They wandered into Aelfris. So you did as a boy. Not so long ago. I nodded. My friends and I would have sent them home, but the white dragon, perhaps you saw it, snatched them from us and carried them to the Isle of Glass. You want me to fight that thing? Certainly not. Did I say so? You would be killed. I looked at him sharply. You asked me how they got there. Garseg laid a hand on my shoulder, a firm touch and a friendly one. You should have asked how you yourself came here. I sent Uri to fetch you, realizing you would want to know of their plight. I intend to recapture my tower if I can, and if I can I will mount to its top and see to their welfare. But events here move slowly, while time flows swiftly in your Mythgarther. Which is where they are, exactly. For them decades may pass while I collect an army. You have influence in Mythgarther. You might collect a force there and sail to their rescue. Such was my thought. If you would prefer to join us here, we would be delighted to have you. I considered the matter for as long as it might take a man to pray, watching the farthest breakers so that I would not see Garseg's eyes. My whole life, it seemed to me, was wrapped up in this. My knighthood, the Valfather and the Lady, even Desiree. At last I said, you are a dragon of Muspel. Isn't that your true shape? Garseg nodded. It is, though my sire was a king in Mythgarther. And your friends, aren't they dragons of Muspel too? Some are. Some are of the sea elf as they appear. Cannot several dragons defeat one? We will try, leading an army of the elf. You have seen me as a dragon. Was I as large as the white dragon? Not nearly. That was your true shape? I took off my helmet as I spoke and laid it on the shingle. It was. I pulled my hauberk over my head. Its links were so fine that I could store the whole of it in my helmet. And that was what I did. Admiring it for what might well be the last time, and wondering whether it was the wearing that brought its blessing, or mere ownership. Grengarm had owned it after all. Are you going to swim out there? Garseg asked. You know I am. I have sworn to fight Kulili. I undressed and explained to Gilf that he would have to guard my armor and my clothing, and that he was to trust no one. He would not speak, but bared his teeth at Garseg to show he understood. No more than Sky is Aelfris like Mythgarther. I have tried to show you how different it is, but I know that I have failed. At this point in my story, Ben, I have to confess that even I had not known just how different it was until I drew Eterni. The sound of her blade leaving the scabbard became a wind. You cannot imagine this. That wind snatched away such fog as remained. In Alfris, one never sees the sun, but there is light, and as the fog vanished, that light waxed until the whole sea flashed like a mirror. Over it flew ships of the olden time, long ships with many oars like wings, and embroidered sails red and black and green and gold, and high prows and high sterns of painted wood. At stern and prow stood the knights of Eterni, real as I myself was real. Their armor, the blades of the swords they held, those were Eterni too, and their smiles gleamed and glinted in that light. Still grasping Eterni, I dove into the sea. It is no easy thing to swim while holding a heavy sword. I did my best, swimming mostly underwater with my legs and my left arm for oars. The advantage I had, and it was a great one, was that the water did not drown me, but received me graciously. I cannot say that I breathed it as I breathed air ashore. I was never conscious of breathing at all. Perhaps I drew breath through my skin, 
or perhaps breath was not necessary to me as long as I remained there. Sharks came like shadows, swift and silent, one, then two, then three. The third was of monstrous size. I knew that, though I might kill one, I could never kill all three if they attacked me together. Desperate, I slashed the nearest. Eterni's fabled blade severed head from tail, releasing a storm of dark blood and a dozen foulnesses. The remaining sharks fell upon it like hawks, and I swam for the surface as a dying man swims for sky. The ships of the Knights of the Sword were there and all about me, one not half a bowshot off. I had not thought them real, and had never supposed I might climb aboard one. But climb on board I did, and it was a wondrous thing to stand dripping upon the deck of such a ship, a ship rowed not by convicts, but by bearded warriors and leather burnies studded with bronze, men of mighty arms whose eyes flashed like ice. "'I am Sir Hunbalt, said the knight to me. "'I welcome you to our company.' We clasped hands and embraced. Soon the white dragon surfaced. We went for it with arrow and spear, though I could do nothing until we closed. There was a ram beyond the prow. I stood on it, holding the carven figurehead with my free hand, while the oars beat behind me like the white wings of the griffin, and churned the sea to foam. Desiree, I shouted, for desiree. It was by this, I would guess, that the white dragon knew me. The ship on which her jaws had closed fell from her mouth. Her eyes met, and I saw the battle rage die in them, as I felt it dying in my own. She sank beneath the sea, and I knew I must follow. In sky I saw grander sights than ever Mithgarther or Aelfris can offer, but none so strange as this. The dragon melted as I watched, so that I might almost have thought the sea dissolved it. It had been a dragon, great and terrible. It became a cloud, white, shimmering and ever-changing, and at last the face of Kulili. Will you spare me? I could not speak as men speak in air, but I formed my thought as I had so long ago when I was young. I will spare you if you yield. We have not engaged. First you must follow me, and see the thing that I will show you. I agreed, and in the dark abyss, we men call the bottom of the sea, I saw that of which I will not speak, though I shall speak of it in time, I hope, to one mightier than even the Valfather. Taug, young Atella, Linnet, and Vil stood waiting for me on the beach at the foot of the Tower of Glass. Though Taug's left arm was in the sling still, that sling was crimson with blood, and sword-breaker bright with blood to the hilt. Whom he had fought, when they descended the tower, I never inquired. But Atella let drop a hint now and again, as women will. It matters little to this tale of mine, and yet I shall never forget Taug's face the eyes that started from their sockets and the clenched teeth. They're coming, Atella called, pointing. We better hide. Seven dragons, black, gray, turquoise, blue, green, golden, and red, flew stark against the luminous sky. I shook my head and called the ship nearest us to shore. When its keel ground upon the beach, I lifted her into it, and put Linnet and Vil into it as well. Sir Hunbalt and I took Taug, who stood as if entranced, waiting to fight them all. When our words availed nothing, we lifted him bodily and carried him. The dragons flew low at times, and high at others, swooping and diving, but never closed with us. They would have slain us all if they could, or so I believe, but something restrained them, and if it was no more than fear, then fear proved restraint enough. They wanted to kill us before— Atella explained. Only the white one scared them. Are you scared of the white one? I shook my head. We were. I was terrible scared. And Taug, and I think Vil would have been more scared, too, only he couldn't see it, you know. But it got us, and it carried us way up where they couldn't get us. I shut my eyes. Only then it went away. The claws shut round me, Bill muttered. 
and there was nothing of the showman about him then. Sir Hunbald shook his head. He's blind, isn't he? Yes, sir, I am, Vil said, and it was better maybe to be blind just then. Little Atella was so affrighted me and her ma thought she'd die. It was a hour I'd swear for she stopped crying. Well, you were scared too, Atella said, and turning to me, holding on to me as the crew pushed our vessel free of the beach. I'm still scared. They wanted to kill us. The bad dragons up there did. And they bout killed Taug. The white one chased them and said, don't be scared. She hesitated, and I said, you couldn't really hear her, could you, Atella? No, sir, only she did. Then she grabbed me up, the first one, and she flew way up with me, and I thought she'd drop me, and when we got way up there she did, only not hard, and then Taug said we had to go down where you was, and there was big snakes, and Vil couldn't even see them, and a thing, I don't know. She had begun to sob again. Taug comforted her. And the nice one's gone, and the others are still here. She clasped Taug, trembling. Bill said, You're taking her someplace safe, ain't you, master? I'm trying to, I told him. Our ship was going about, the rowers on one side pulling, while those on the other backed water. Sir Hunbolt touched my arm and pointed. The dragons that Hella feared so much were coming to earth, and three had resumed elf form. I nodded. Taug said, I'll kill them. It was the first time he had spoken, and I was happy to hear his voice. Gilf, still guarding my clothing on the beach, clearly felt the same, standing and wagging his tail. I drew breath. If I fight beside you, Sir Hunbolt and I, and the other knights? Taug shook his head. I just wish I had my big sword. Alone? It doesn't matter. Sir Hunbolt nodded approvingly, but I said, They would kill you, Taug. Cedar alone would kill you. Taug only gripped Swordbreaker the tighter, freed himself from Atella, and went to the prow, looking out past the figurehead. He's a knight, Sir Hunbolt whispered. I said that Taug himself did not know it. A young one but a knight. Sir Hunbolt paused, and his voice, when it came again, seemed to issue from the grave. What a man knows hardly matters. It is what he does. He turned away and did not speak again. Vil whispered, Sick, ain't he? Dead, I told him. So am I. Not like him you ain't, sir. Atella clung to Linnet, no longer having Taug to cling to, and Linnet stroked her and calmed her. One of the crew brought a scrap of old sail brown and having worked on it in white thread, something that might once have been a feather. I tied it about my waist. Ashore, two knights came riding out of the wood, one leading a mount I knew at once. Gilf barked greeting. Garseg called across the water. Are these friends of yours? Atella wiped her eyes. That's Sir Svan, isn't it? And Sir Garveon. That was... And when we had come nearer the mainland, I jumped from the gunwale, greeted them, learned that they had been searching for me for hours, and reclaimed my clothes and armor. Garseg said, You will wish to take your friends back to Mithgarther. At a later time, Uri can bring you again. Then we shall discuss the crowns I plan to give you. I shook my head and spoke to Svan and Garvion. You come too late, both of you, for me to explain all that has happened here. Did you see dragons? One, Svan told me. A blue dragon, very large, but it's gone now. I don't know what became of it. It's here, Attila burst out, as she, Linnet, and Vil followed Taug and Gilf ashore. That's it? It is, I told Svan and Garveon. But certain other things, the ships and the knights you see, are not here. I sheathed Eterni as I spoke, and it was seen at once that the knights of the sword and the vessels that had borne them had been illusions born of the light that flashed from wave to wave. Sir Svan. He looked nervous and a little frightened, but he nodded to show I had his attention. You seek to prove yourself, because you do. I promised to fight you not long ago. Queen Idden is not here to watch. Do you want to prove yourself to her alone, or to yourself as well? The latter, 
Swan stood very straight as he spoke, and I could see his hand itched for his sword. Garseg turned to his followers. This has nothing to do with you. You may go. One dove into the sea, two flew, the rest sauntered away grumbling, still in elf form. You are courageous, I told Garseg. And hungry. His eyes were an emptiness into which whole worlds might vanish. I remarked to Svan that his wounds had not entirely healed. He said it did not matter. As you wish, Sir Garvayon, you looked for death when we fought the anger born outside Utgard. You need not confirm or deny that. You know what you did, and I know what I saw. Garvayon did not speak, but Atella said, He was really brave. Taug said so. So was Sir Taug. We'll get to him in a moment, Atella. Addressing Garvayon again, I said, In a way, we come to him now. He has told me that when you led your men-at-arms out to take part in the fight that began in the marketplace, they appeared badly frightened. He thought it was because they were leaving the protection of the walls to war upon Angerborn. Yet they are brave men. They were led by a great knight, and they had fought Angerborn before and beaten them. I think they looked frightened because of something they had seen only a moment before. Garveon still did not speak. I haven't questioned them, I told him, and I won't. What you did I judge to be no crime, neither the first time nor the second. Garveon did not speak, but there was hope in his eyes. I said, when you left Lord Beale, did you offer to help Sir Svan search for his squire and his squire's slaves? Yes. We went out to look for them, found your camp, and thought it would be well to bring your horse along in case we found you too. Your serving men were packing your things and did not object. Thank you, I said. I owe you a lot, and this is one thing more. I stopped to draw breath, not liking what I had to say next. I must tell you that this blue man who speaks with us is called Garseg. I dreamed of him, and you once. In my dream he killed you. So it appeared. Go on, Garvion told me. As you wish. If Sir Svan engages a dragon, and that dragon is Garseg also, will you stand beside Sir Svan? You will have no help from me. I will, Garvion declared. Atella whispered, they haven't seen them. They have, I told her. They saw Cedar as they rode up, and it is Cedar they must close with. What about you, Taug? I do not think he had expected to be asked. He looked surprised. As the law would have it, you are merely Svan's squire. You have no duty to fight, only to save Sir Svan if he falls. You're wounded already, and the bone can't have knit in so short a time. Will you engage? For the space of a breath, Taug's eyes met Garseg's. I won't fight, Taug said. Never again if I can help it. As you wish. I turned my back on him and pointed to Garseg. There is the dragon, Sir Garveon, Sir Svan. He has been a friend to me, and I will not— Garseg interrupted me. I think now that he spoke in order to have more time for the transformation, although I cannot be sure. Did you fight Kulili? The white dragon. You swore you would. I did. Did you kill her? I shook my head. I never swore to take her life, and I could not have if wished to. I yielded, and she spared me. Just then Atella shouted, Look out! Garseg had begun to change, his head lengthening and swelling. He dropped to all fours, and claws sprouted from his hands. He hissed, and fire and smoke wreathed his mouth, and great leathern wings rose from his back. So swiftly did he strike that Svan had scarcely time to raise his shield. Cedar's fangs pierced it even as his breath scorched it, and leather, wood, and iron were torn away. I held Gilf, who would have rushed into the fight if I had not. As if in a dream, I heard Vil demanding that Atella tell him what was happening, and she, with a trembling voice, struggling to comply. Had either knight had time to mount, things might have gone differently. As it was, Cedar went straight for Svan. Svan retreated, defending himself with his sword. As he did, Garveon attacked Cedar's left side, keeping his shield between Cedar's head and himself. 
Twice his sword rang on cedar's scales. A thrust found softer hide behind a leg, and Garveon drove the blade in. What welled forth might have been boiling pitch. Svan came straight for cedar then. I was proud of him, even as I knew his effort doomed. He thrust at cedar's eyes as cedar struck, his point missed by half a hand, slipping futilely along the bony plate that had been Garseg's face, and Svan went down. Garveon fought on as few men fight, cunning and bold. Cedar was compelled to keep a forefoot on Svan, who struggled against it and stabbed beneath its scales with his sacks. Cedar's weight was insufficient to crush him, and his hauberk saved him, largely though not entirely, from Cedar's claws. Cedar's jaws closed upon Garveon. That was a moment I would like to forget. At one instant, as brave a knight as woman has ever borne, darted in to stab and slash, and out again before the dragon stuck. At the next, those terrible jaws had raised him high. Only to open at once, so that he fell dying to the ground. A monstrous figure to which I could put no name rode Cedar's back. A moment more and that figure had broken, becoming Atella, who had slipped from Vil's broad shoulders and fled, and Vil with a thousand hands about Cedar's neck. No artist could paint it, but if one tried, he would show a chain of arms and hands, living and strong, that tightened until that scaly neck burst like a blasted tree. Cedar reared in his agony, and Svan rolled from beneath his claw. Cedar trembled and fell dead. It was over. Rapture held me while sorrow groaned in a place too deep for words. But not for tears. I did not know I wept until I saw them fall on Garveon's upturned face. You knew, he said. Tell her I loved her. Taug was bending over Garveon too, and Svan and Atella. Cloud came as well, and what she felt filled my mind, that a great and noble rider had passed, leaving all steeds the poorer. The air was as still as air can ever be. I heard a whistling wind, nevertheless. Garveon heard it too. I saw his eyes turn upward. He smiled that grim old knight. He smiled, and took the fair white hand that had reached for his and rose, leaving his stiffening corpse on the sand. Alvet helped him mount, for she had not yet kissed him, and his wounds troubled him sore. I wished them good speed. Alvet too smiled at that, while Garveon waved farewell. She mounted behind him, the white stallion leaped into the air, and in less than a breath, all three had vanished in that bright mist that is our own Mithgarther. He's dead, sir. Vil knelt beside the corpse, his fingers on its wrist. Atella laughed. There was hysteria in it, and I urged Taug to comfort her. Svan said, Sir Garveon is dead, Vil, as you say. So is the dragon. Vil said nothing. You went into battle with that child on your shoulders. You're a braver knight than I will ever be. So is she. I wouldn't have done what she did, not at her age or any age. Phil said, She told me it was like to kill you, sir. We had to do something. Without a sword and without armor. What I had was better. Phil held out his hand to me. It was empty, but when he had passed his other hand across it, my bowstring lay coiled in it. Here it is, Sir Abel. I know you must have seen it. I filched it. You know when. You want to sort me out, ask Master Taug. Only you got the right to do anything you want to, and I'll tell him so. I took the bowstring from him and ran it through my fingers, feeling the lives of many, so very many, who dwell in America. I had passed beyond them, above or below them, and as they plowed and coded and traded, swept their floors and minded their children, we said our farewells. For a moment, my hands embraced them, and they embraced my hands. Perhaps Phil sensed that in some unimaginable manner. Perhaps it only seemed so. However that may be, he said, There are tricks you can do with a string like that, Sir Abel. Lots of em. Making things that ain't there, soon's you move your hands, and letting em cut it, 
Only it's not really cut, you know. Only when you do em with that un, it's all different. Although the air was warm, he shivered. No, I said. Hold out your hand again, truthful Ville. He did, and I put the bowstring into it. This was a gift when I began from a very great lady. Men name her Parka, and she dwells in our own place. If you say it, sir. But she is of the world above sky, the second realm. She is thus higher than the Valfather who serves her. Do you understand? I hope. Attila exclaimed, Well, I don't understand at all. She was standing beside Taug, her arm about his waist. Seeing them, I understood that she was no longer little Attila, and that in sober fact she had never been, in the short time that I had known her. I said, Vil will explain it to you. We laid Garveon's body across his saddle. Uri, silent still, and I would guess very frightened, guided us back to our own world. Chapter 27 Red Hall We could not return Garveon to Finefield, however much we wished to, but a grave in Jotunland seemed a thing of horror. We resolved to carry him south so long as the cold weather held, and inter him as near his home as Parka decreed. The host of Jotunland held the pass against us, as is well known. Fewer know that we interred Garveon before the battle, fearing there would be too many to bury after it. We dug his grave and laid him in it, offered such sacrifices as we could make, and together sang our hopes for him. Hearing us, the Angerborn sent a flag of truce to inquire. Sir Garveon is no more, Beale told the giant who carried it. He was the bravest of my knights and the best. We sing for his spirit, for we are not as you, and we have raised the cairn you see for him. He looked for it, but could not discover it, till Martyr indicated it to him, for it rose higher than many a hill. You made that? I alone? Martyr shook his head. No, I could not. Nor could Lord Beale, nor Sir Abel, Sir Leort, nor Sir Waddit. We all did working together. The frost giant leaned upon his sword. I have to speak for those who sent me. We nodded and said we understood. We're going to kill you and tear it down. There won't be two stones together when we're through. You must beat us first, Svan declared and grinned. You know me, Svan indicated the giant's bandaged hand. You are Bitter Garm, and you were one of King Gilling's champions. That's my name, Bitter Garm told Beale. I fought them, him and Garveon, you were there. Beale said nothing. Idden told Bittergarm, So was I. I wanted to kill him myself. Bittergarm's deep rumble might have been a mountain's talking. He was tough as your hot lands grow. Svan and I agreed. So I'm sorry he's dead. That's for me. I'll tear it down along with the rest, only... He had caught sight of one of Idden's subjects. Idden herself advanced fearlessly and laid a hand on his arm. I am their queen, yours too, Bittergarm. Shield stars the king. A king who'd have you war on your queen, your mother, your wife, and your sisters. I don't order you to fight for us against King Shieldstar, but I ask you, what sort of king is it who makes the right arm smite the left? You're never loved, you frost giants, not even by your mothers, I know it and I pity you. But is the canard true? Is it true that you yourselves never love? He turned and left without another word. They attacked by night, as we had feared they would, but our elf raised the alarm long before they reached our camp, and the fire arrows turned them back with many dead, for all the elf see in darkness as well as many. We sent Org after them when they retreated, telling him to kill any who came to his hand, and to strike their rear when they fronted us once more. The next day they held the pass against us, six of their grimmest shield to shield across the warway, with a thousand more behind. There in the pass I had held against the black knight who was martyr, 
Those mice they had driven out rained stones and spears on them until the sun was high. Three times we charged them with the lance, and each time they threw us back and harvested their dead. At sunset I knelt for Idden's blessing, and on foot led their own women against them. Eterni drank their blood to the hilt, and the knights of the sword drank it too, some with two followers or three, and some with a hundred. Within an hour the snow began, and Baki's kin, with their bows and fresh fire arrows, joined the mice. The sons of anger broke and fled south into the mountains, where most who had not fallen fell. As for us, we struck off the heads of hundreds slain, and heaped them around Garveon's cairn, one on another until they covered it, and Beale and I, recalling his victory when he was young and how he had dragged a head behind two horses, wept. That night Idden sent Hela for me. In the pavilion that had been martyrs I sat with her, for she was gracious, and with Svan and Hela shared what little wine we had. "'You are an honorable knight,' she told me. "'Sir Svan is, we believe, the most honorable we have known. But when we charge him with it, he says he's but your image in that.' I did not know how to answer her, but Manny did it for me, saying, "'To sky the Smithgar that we cherish is only likenesses and wind, your majesty. But a likeness cherished is more.' His purling voice might have charmed a bird from its nest, I thought, yet I sensed that he meant all he said. Hela here and her brother have been of great service to us, Idden continued. To us all, your majesty. As have you. No man and no woman has been of greater service than you. Kneel, many whispered, but I did not kneel. We are a queen, Idden touched the diadem she wore. You have led our subjects against the foe. I remained silent, wishing that I might speak with Gilf. Cloud's mind touched mine. Although it was filled with love, she had no advice to give. You have not seen the lands we rule, Idden continued. No more have we. Yet there are such lands, and they have been described to us. Svan said, We're going there when we leave the court. Her Majesty, my liege, Lord Beale, and I. As a queen, we have power to give estates. As we have power to raise to the peerage, power we would have even if we had no lands to give. We will make you an earl, Sir Abel, if you'll have it. Hela murmured, Take the title and the lands refuse if you will. I will take neither, I told Idden. I know I can't refuse without insult, and I am loath to, but I must. Your liege consents. My liege in Mithgarther, you mean, your majesty. He's the best of men. But no. I insult you because I must. Sir Svan must be your champion. I've sworn to engage him when we reach the court. He'll avenge you. Idden glanced at Svan and shook her head, saying, We wish to honor you, not to quarrel with you, Sir Abel. I have wished to honor you always, your majesty. Suddenly she smiled. Do you remember when you came to my father to borrow a horse, you and Gilf and Manny? It was long ago, I told her, and I have forgotten it, once. I do not believe I will ever forget it again. It was in this present year, Idden told me. We don't think it's seen two moons. Certainly it hasn't seen three. But we want to say you've given Manny to us since, something we never dreamed would happen. Tonight we hoped to give you a great boon, for that and all your kindnesses, and for being an army on two legs. Instead we're going to ask more. You know what Hela and Hymer have done for all of us. You let Sir Wadet have Hela, and she wishes to remain with him. You retain her brother, so he says. I said I would not keep him against his will, and that I had seen little of him since Hela had gone to Sir Wadet. We'd like to reward Hela, and the boon she asks is that her brother be given to her. Hela herself said, He is my brother, and as a brother I love him, Sir Abel. I fear he would fare ill without me. If he will serve you, you may have him, I told her. If you have him, Sir Wadet will have him too. Though his tongue is lame, he's a first-class fighting man. She thanked me. 
when she had finished it and said, Since you will not leave your liege for us, you will not? Not for an earldom? We offer it again. I have to refuse it again. I beg you not to offer it a third time. Very well. We must have your liege here. Will you fetch him for us, Hela? And, Sir Wad, it's your majesty. You know that I must tell him all I hear, and he ask me. Would you send me out when I have brought the duke? Svan muttered. I am with Hela, your majesty. Sir Wad it too, Idden agreed, as quickly as may be. When Hela had gone, Idden said, We mean to examine you. Hela prompted it. The sister's mind is as sharp as the brother's is dull, we find. She's the edge of the blade. He's the back. We've given her mother to Wadit too, and he's loaned her to us. I smiled, and she graciously smiled in return. Sir Svan has told us of Aelfris, how he went there with Sir Garveon and found you with a fleet that vanished. About his squire as well. How Squire Taug had gone down a stair between worlds in a haunted spire, where fair women had been held to draw mariners to its summit. Sir Svan knows much of Aelfris, I said. Svan coughed. You must wonder how I learned it. From Taug? Slowly he shook his head. Taug will scarcely speak. When his grace comes, we'll ask about the matter you and I spoke of in the wood. I might as well tell you. It wouldn't be right for us to surprise you with it. I said that I had surmised as much. Idden said, We'd hoped to question you as a vassal. Your honor might not let you evade my questions then. It wouldn't, of course, your majesty, if they were questions yours let you ask me. Svan said, I've questions too about Elfris. You told me you'd been knighted by an elf queen, remember? I shrugged. It's true, though Shearwall mocked me. When we camped by the river. You went to the inn. Pauk and I camped there. He flushed. I saw that the boy still lived in him and liked him better for it. Idden said, Do you mean the ladies mocked you? It was to get your attention. You may trust me here. I shook my head. I don't believe they did. Perhaps they pitied me. The men mocked me, save for Sir Wadit. Who's here with me? Martyr said. Did I mock you? If I did, I was drunk. We'll engage again if you wish it. You did not, your grace. Svan yielded his chair, and Hela fetched a bench. Idden said, He will not answer us, your grace. You must ask him who killed our husband. We know he knows. Martyr frowned. Do you, Sir Abel, yes or no? Yes, your grace. He sat silent until Idden said, Will you not ask him? Perhaps not. If he will not speak, he may have a good reason. I'll ask that instead. Sir Abel, much as I respect you, I ask as your liege. Answer as you are a true knight. Why are you silent on this? I said, Because no good can come of it, your grace, only sorrow and wretchedness. At length Martyr said, We might punish him, might we not, or her, the guilty party? No, your grace. We could not? I shook my head. No, your grace, you could not. So softly that it seemed he wished no one to hear but me, Manny said, Wasn't it for love? I nodded. Idden made a sound, but did not speak, and Svan filled the silence. There's a question I've been eager to ask. I hope you'll answer. I never questioned you enough when I was your squire, and I hope you'll forgive that. I didn't talk with Sir Ravd as I should have either. I hated him for trying to teach me, and for that I will never forgive myself. I'd like not to feel as bad about you as I do about him. I told you Taug would hardly speak. This was before the fog lifted. I reminded him that he had just repeated it. Perhaps I did. It's like what you told us about the Elf Queen. It's true, so why shouldn't I say it? But, but it's not entirely true. He said that when Sir Garveon died, you saw something the rest of us didn't. He thought I might have, since I'm a knight too. He said, he said, Martyr saved him. That reminds me, Her Majesty's father is anxious to speak to you. It concerns young Whiston, Sir Garveon's armor, and so on. He asked me to mention it. I said that I would wait on him that night, if he were still up. 
and the next morning otherwise. Wadit coughed. I'm a knight, too, by the lady I wish to every overkind in sky that I'd been there with you. Iden said, Sir Garveon would have lived, we're sure. I said, Don't you want to ask me why I didn't fight Cedar, all of you? Go ahead. Hela said, Then I ask, it was not fear I know? Svan muttered, He'd been your friend, you said. He had been, but there was another reason. It was because I knew Cedar had to die. To change the subject, I added, When heroes die, they are carried to Sky to serve the Valfather, sometimes at least. That's what I saw, Sir Svan, what Taug saw I saw when he didn't and you didn't. I saw the Valfather's shield maiden descend and Sir Garveon rise and go with her. We humans, we knights, whether we're called knights or not, get to sky sometimes. Suppose that one of us, the best of us, tried to seize its crown. They did not understand. I waved sky and its crown aside. Cedar had to die. For him to die, my friend Garseg had to die too, because Garseg was Cedar by another name. Cedar feared me. He could have joined me here any time, but he'd shaped me like Desiree and knew I could kill him. Iden asked, Is that the elf queen who knighted you? What are you talking about, Sir Abel? I laughed and said I did not know myself. The ghost of something taken from my mind had returned to haunt it. Hela said, It troubles him. And Iden, Who is this queen? She's queen of the Moss Elf, Your Majesty and she educated and knighted me. She did what she did for a good purpose, though I don't know what it was. Garseg, who was Cedar, shaped me too, and thought his purpose good, perhaps. I was to fight Kulili, as I did, not long before he died. Hila and Wadit wanted to ask about her, but I cut them off. Having formed me nearly as much as Kulili had formed the elf, he knew I'd kill him if we fought. Because he knew it, he would never have fought me. He would have fled, and I don't believe even Cloud could have overtaken him before he got to Muspel. Grengarm was trying to get to Aelfris when Taug and I caught up with him, but I had no griffin to chase Cedar on. So I said I wouldn't engage him and set Sir Garveon and Sir Svan on him, hoping they would be enough. We weren't, Svan said. I rose. I should have entered the fight in time to save Sir Garveon. I thought he was about to rescue you. Before I could draw, he was in the dragon's jaws, the one I'd said I wouldn't fight. Every word of blame you lay on me I deserve. I'll redeem myself when I can. I had dressed in. Have I leave to go, your majesty? There will be no word of blame from us, Sir Abel. I bowed. May I go? I left the pavilion and wandered alone, thinking about a death I could have prevented, and forgetting that I was to see Beale. At last I went to the fires of the Daughters of Anger, supposing that the women would be as conscienceless and violent as their husbands. I would goad them, all would fight, and I would leave Eterni in her sheath. Larger even than their men, they teased instead like girls and women everywhere. Having heard me shout Desiree's name in battle, they wanted to know whether I had kissed her and a thousand other things. I ate with them and drank the strong ale they spice with willow bark. Martyr joined me there, speaking of wars fought before I was born and knights who had served his father. After a time he said, They wished to question you on a matter we both understand. I would ask about another matter, though it bears on the first. I ask no oath. You wouldn't lie to me. I confirmed that I would not. You know the elf better than almost any man. That much is plain. Was one present tonight when we spoke with that fair lady who rules these great ladies? I said, there may have been your grace, but if there was I wasn't aware of it. We sat sipping ale and staring into the fire, a fire too great for any human cook to roast meat on, until Martyr said, In speaking of that other matter, Someone whispered that it was done for love. The words were addressed to you, I think. Was it the queen who spoke so? I said it was not, and begged him not to examine me further, explaining that any answer would betray a friend. 
That being so, I will not, Sir Abel. I will ask one question more, however. I did not know this person present. Did Her Majesty, in whose pavilion we sat, know it? Yes, indeed, Your Grace. She was aware of it from the beginning, rest assured. Then Borda, a fair woman as tall as the mainmast of a caravel, said, The knight would leave our queen's matters to our queen. I know little of knights and nothing of dukes. Still it seems knights are wiser. When I returned to my own fire, Pauk and Duns lay asleep, and a woman sat warming her hands while Gilf dozed beside her. I asked how I might serve her, and when she turned I thought that it was Linnet. Sit with me she said, and her voice was not Lynette's. No, you're weary and fuddled. Lie here with your head in my lap and I'll talk to you. I did, and she told me many things. Her girlhood in America, how she met my father, and how they came to wed. The journey south was long and slow, and one day I asked leave to ride ahead, explaining that I wished to see Red Hall. South I galloped, down the warway, telling Whiston, Pauk, and Duns to join me when they could, and when Cloud and I were out of sight, we mounted into the air, higher and higher until the whole land spread below us like a map on a table, and we saw the warway as a thread, and the company, Beals and Martyrs and the Daughters of Anger whom Idden was leading to the south, like a worm crawling along that thread. Ulfa's Glenadam was a dot by a silver stream, while on the margins of the griffin I saw where Griffinsford had stood. Then the Uring, and ruined Uring's mouth, where it met the sea. Behind us the mountains rose, a mighty wall with parapets of snow and ice, but Cloud and Gilf, and I upon Cloud's back, rose higher than they. Until I saw a castle, like a star. The Valfather stood upon a battlement, tiny and far but clear, one hand was lost in his beard, the other gripped his spear. On his head, in place of the broad hat he wore when walking the little roads of Mithgarther, was the horned helmet that is his crown. Our eyes met, and Cloud rolled at his glance, her hooves to sky and her back to our world, so that the Valfather and his castle were far below us. Had he indicated that he wanted us to descend, we would have done it at once. As it was, we rose, although I felt that he wished, or at least invited, me to return to his hall. We climbed far before Mithgarther lay below us again. This I am tempted to omit, that I mistook another manor for Red Hall. Mistake it I did, and to its door came Cloud, Gilf, and I, and I hammered it with a great iron ring, and hammered again, for it was light. At last a serving man came. I asked if it was Red Hall, it was on the road to Kingstoom, and he assured me it was not, that Red Hall stood some way to the south. He supplied particulars of the manor house and its gate, and offered me a bed for the night. I thanked him, but explained that I was determined to sleep in Red Hall. Even then I knew I would not spend many nights there, and I wanted to make them as many as I could. Away we went, galloping hard, with Gilf running ahead, as if hot on some scent, until, long after any horse would have been exhausted, I turned aside to ask again, for we had come far, and I feared we had passed Red Hall in the dark. The gate was ruinous, the house beyond it more ruinous still. I was about to leave without knocking when I realized that the stone figure beside the entrance was a manticore. After that I knocked indeed, shouted, and beat the weather-worn panels with the hilt of my dagger. The woman who came bearing a candle was old, bent, and nearly toothless. Knowing she might be frightened to find an armed man at her door so late, I gave my name and assured her that I was only a lost traveler who meant no harm. More's the pity. I hoped you had come to kill me. Only to ask directions, I said, and bring good news. Is this Golden Lawn? She nodded in silence. And where stands Red Hall? A league and a half, she pointed south. It has no lord. I doubt they'll open for you, and we've little here. It has a lord again, I told her. I'm him, but I haven't seen it. At that she stood straighter, and although she did not smile, it seemed almost she did. 
The frost giants came at first frost, years and years ago. Yes, I said, so I understood. He was away, Sir Ravd was. She sucked her gums. Off to the wars. He would have helped us. You going to stay? In Red Hall? For a few days, perhaps. Here. No, I'll sleep in my own bed tonight, though it's a bed I've never seen. I said I was Sir Abel of the High Heart, I know. That's true enough, the name I've had for years. I have to learn to say Sir Abel of Red Hall, too. I wish you rest, Sir Abel. Her door began to close. Wait, I said. You haven't heard my good news. I thought that was it. What is it? Your mistress, Lady Linnet, is returning. She stared at me so long I thought that she would never stop, and I backed away. At that she said, You're an elf. No, sometimes I wish I were. Come to torment me. I would never do such a thing. Lady Linnet's coming to resume possession with Mistress Atella. You must sweep the house and make everything as presentable as you can. This is my house, the old woman said, and I am Lady Lys. With that she shut the door. I heard her sobbing on the other side for as long as I stayed there. No Angerborn had taken Red Hall, or it had been repaired. Stone pillars topped with lions marked an entrance road of half a league, narrow but in good repair. It led to a broad gate flanked with towers and a wall by no means contemptible. The gate was barred, but a blast on the horn hung from it, brought four sleepy men-at-arms. The eldest said, You come late, Sir Knight, early rather. This gate closes with the rising of the evening star and does not open again until a man can use the bow. Come back then. It opens when I want it to. I pushed him aside. The bailey was pounded earth, wide and overlooked by a manor too lofty to blush before castles. The mastiffs who guarded it were scarcely smaller than Gilf, broad of chest and great of head. How they knew me I cannot say, but they did, and stood in turn with their paws on my shoulders to look me in the face and fawned on me afterward. "'Who are you?' the oldest man-at-arms demanded. "'What's that shield you bear? I must have your name.' I turned on him. "'I'll have yours right now. Give it, or out sword and die.' To my surprise he drew. He was standing too near. I got his arm, wrenched his sword away, and laid him at my feet— with his own point to his throat. Prodded, he gasped, Cut! My name's Cut! From the south? My mother? Taken prisoner. Married and stayed. The others had stood gaping all this while. I told them they had to learn to fight if they were to be men-at-arms of mine, and offered to engage their best then and there with Cut's sword. They knelt instead, three bumpkins with not a leader among them. Taking my foot from Cut's chest, I said, I am the new owner, Sir Abel of Redhall. The three nodded. Cut scrambled up to one knee. You, I pointed. Take Cloud to the stable. Wake my grooms. She's been ridden hard. She's to be unsaddled and turned out to pasture. Tell them I'll know of any injury to her, however slight, and it'll be avenged in blood. He took her reins and hurried away. There's a steward here? Cut said there was, and that his name was Halweird. Good, wake him. Wake the cooks as well. It's barred, sir. I'll have to rouse somebody. A look and a gesture sent him. Our scuffle, brief as it had been, had ended any thought of sleep. I decided to eat. We had been on short rations, and I was ravenous, and stay up, retiring early the next night. Which is what I did. I inspected Red Hall, finding its barns, fields, and larders in good order, but its men-at-arms and archers undrilled and a little slovenly. Next day we began contests for the bow. I gave a ham to the winner. I had offered a piece of martyr's gold to any archer who outshot me. None did. The one whose score was next to worst was to strike the one with the worst smartly on the bottom with his bow. He struck soft, so I had the next worst hit him for it. That was a whack that made dust fly. My men-at-arms had been spectators to this and enjoyed it. Recalling the Angerborn, 
I decided to see whether they had profited as well. There were bows, as well as arrows by the hundred in our armory. I gave each man-at-arms a bow and arrows, and had each shoot at very moderate range. After that we held a contest, while the archers laughed and jeered, with the same prizes and punishment. That evening Cut confided that there was grumbling among those who had done badly. The sword, they said, was their weapon. Sword, partisan, and halberd. Thus, on the third day, we cut saplings for practice swords, as Garveon and I had, and I drilled them all morning, and fought them that afternoon, knocking them about. On the fourth day, we cut quarterstaves, I explaining that the man who knew the quarterstaff would be a fighter to be reckoned with when armed with partisan or halbert. When I had beaten a round dozen, one knocked me sprawling with such a blow as might have done me real hurt, had I not been helmeted. I gave him the promised gold, and engaged him again for another. The storm surge returned in that match, and it seemed almost that Garseg swam beside me. I broke his quarterstaff and knocked him to his knees when he tried to defend himself with the halves. After that, I had him teach them first, and afterward set them against one another, with us to judge between them. Balia was his name. That night I ate supper with Gilf. Halweird brought my bread and soup and ale, staying until I should dismiss him. "'Winter's blast tonight, Sir Abel,' he said. "'It was cold in the north, I'm sure.' I said it had been very cold at times. "'We haven't had it here, just a nip to ripen the apples. We'll get it good tonight. Hear the wind in the chimney?' I was on my feet in a moment, and back in my boots in two. Out the sally port we kept barred but unguarded, and across three meadows I found her in the wood, and our hugs were sweeter than any wine, and our kisses more intoxicating. She showed me a shelter her guards had woven for us, and in it we lay on moss and kissed a hundred times, and kept each other warm, my fur cloak for her and her great cloak of leaves over us both. We talked of love, and all we said would fill a book thicker than this. Yet all we said was only this, that I loved her and she loved me, and we had waited long and long, would be parted no longer. At last she told me, I took you for my instrument, and filled you with the words I'd have you say to Arnthor, and to every king of humankind through all the world, and made of you such a man as might speak to kings, and thought that I did well. It was foolishness, all of it, and there is only love. I'll be your wife this moment. As she spoke, she changed, her green skin white. No, I said, and made as if to rise. I'll be your wedded wife, or we'll tell men so, and live in shadowed rooms, and comb my hair by the pearl of your night, and perfume myself for you. No, I said again. I'll love you in any shape you choose, but I love you best as you were here. Do not speak to the king, promise me that, I laughed. I've faced an army of the Angerborn. Is there worse at Thor Tower? For you, yes. I thought about that, and at last I said, What about you? Are you afraid just for me? Would you be safe there? She wept. I returned to Red Hall with snow in my hair. Halweird had waited and brought me a pot of hot ale, which was kindly done. I told him I would leave in the morning for Thortower. Do you know it well, sir? I sat. Not at all, I've never been there. It might be wise to find a friend to introduce you, some unfamiliar with the court. I explained that until Beale came I had no such friend and sent him off to bed. That was where I should have gone myself. I did not, sipping ale that had been hot enough to hiss staring into the fire, and thinking of what Desiree had said. She had not made me as Kulili had made her race. My parents had done that. Still, she had made me in a sense, teaching me, and most of all teaching me what I was to say in Thor Tower. I shut my eyes and heard the cries of the gulls outside Parka's cave, the waves, the fluttering wings. What was I to say? It was no ordinary message, clearly, since I knew myself an ordinary man. 
I had burned for renown and skill at arms, and had not known I had burned for them so the king would listen. Taug had met Desiree as well as I, but she had no message for him, and he longed only for the plow, for the slow turn of the seasons and a life his father had, in which ambition was the wish for another cow. In Red Hall I could live for years, shaping my men and overseeing the fields and dairy. If Martyr called on me for night service, I would go, but if he did not, I would stay, visiting for Seti once a month and Shearwall three times a year. Desiree would come, and if it seemed to my maids that a woman not quite human frequented our corridors, why let them gossip? What was it Ulfa had called me? A wizard knight, though Gilf and Cloud were wizardry enough for any man. The darkest corner of the room, that point farthest from the fire, grew darker. I thought it no more than the failing of the fire, and told myself that there was small point in piling more wood on it. I would go to bed soon, and coals, and fire as well, would remain for morning. Darker and darker. The hearth rug, the horns of the noble stag on the wall, and the pot that held my ale were lit as before. Yet night had come in and waited in the corner. I called for Uri and for Baki, thinking it might be some trick of theirs, then to all the elf. Several clans were of that color, Manny had said, and they had often played tricks on bold Berthold. But if the scraps of darkness there were elf, they made no reply. At last I called for Org, although I thought him behind me with Svan and the rest. He answered from behind my chair. Good Lord! I exclaimed, and at that there was laughter from the corner, a laugh that made me think of ice in the northern caves, and the icicles that sang, as Borda had told Martyr and me, if a spearhead touched them in the dark. Chapter 28 More Cane and More Magic She stepped from the darkness as you might step from an unlit room into a well-lit one. A moment before, I would have said that no woman in Red Hall was taller than I, though Hela was, and the daughters of Anger were taller than her sons. This woman overtopped me, and her gold coronet made her look taller still. She was willow slender and willow lithe, long necked and long legged. So groomed was her jet black hair, and so lustrous, that for a second I thought she wore a velvet hood beneath the coronet. Don't you know me? She laughed again. There was no merriment in that laugh, then or ever. We've met, you and I, differently dressed. I bowed. I could never have forgotten such a lady. As stepped from a corner of your room? But you have. The laugh came again. You wore armor, I wore nothing. Now I come to grant a wish, yet fully dressed. Do you credit a most high god? The question caught me by surprise. I said, why, of course, stammering like the boy I pretended not to be. I do and don't. She smiled, and the smile became her laugh. It was music, but I never ached to hear it again as I did desires. Even then I thought her less than human, and that laugh was at the root of my opinion. I don't and do. She cocked her head like a bird. I bowed again. Just so, my lady. We can think only of creatures, of things he's made. Creatures are all we know, and can be all we know until we know him. When we think of him like that, we find we can't believe. He can't be like a creature any more than a carpenter is like a table. She nodded. Wisely spoken. When I see how the world goes, I know there cannot be a most high God. And yet that fiendish humor. Have you recognized me? No, my lady. Poor dear. If I took off my crown and gown, you'd know me on the instant. You speak of tables. She strode to the far end of the long serving table on which my ale rested. Her smooth oval face held no fear, but I sensed that she did not wish to come near Org. Suppose I lay here, naked. One long right hand caressed the wood. You were the sacrifice offered Grengarm. I was, and you my rescuer. Did you hope to enjoy me? I shook my head. 
there on his altar or in some pleasant glade. I was in no mood to be enjoyed. I thought he'd devour us. I explained that I did not blame her, and all the while Org whispered to me of stealth and broken necks. Gilf had appeared in a doorway and stood watching us, his eyes alert. I know your name, Sir Abel, much about you too. That you stabbed King Gilling. My shock must have appeared on my face. You didn't? Or are you startled that I divined it? I did not. That's well. I'd maintain that if I were you. Kings value themselves highly. Have you dredged up my name? I shook my head. Ah, such, such is fame. Suppose I had said that our king, my brother, values his blood far above that of the ruck of common men. Would you have known me then? I've searched my memory, my lady, but found nothing. What a pity! Well, well, where are we to begin? She removed her coronet, laughed, and put it on a stool. It's why they have those points, you see, so that no one will sit on them and bend the gold. My lady, she laughed. I'm not, you know, anyone's lady. I'm a princess. Didn't you hear me say so? King Arnthor is my brother. Don't stare. I am Princess Morcane, and the only princess our realm has, the only one it's liable to have since the queen keeps her legs crossed. Morcane shook out her hair, filling the air with musky perfume. Will you free me from this gown? It's too tight. Your Highness, I love a queen, not King Arnthor's, not Queen Idden of Jotunland either, another one. Morcane laughed again. They're as common as ditch water, these queens. They're not your highness, and she's like no other. Because she's the one you love. Haven't you wondered about my under things? I would have sworn I sensed that. Not knowing what to say, I said nothing. If you won't let me show you, I'll tell you. That below is invisible, a cobweb put there years ago. It serves its function still, or I hope it does, though when things are invisible it can be hard to tell. I'm forgetting my manners. My servants are asleep. Save these two, Arcane laughed. Yes, Your Highness, the rest are sleeping, but I can find a glass of good wine if you wish it. Some little cakes and dried fruits, too. A sip of your ale. May I have that? I presented the flagon that Halweird had brought me. She drained it and tossed it aside. Now you've done your duty as Master of Red Hall. We were discussing my underclothes, were we not? She laughed, belched, and laughed as before. Wouldn't you like to see what holds these up? I shook my head. I've imps of lace for them. They bear them up as the giant on a map bears the world, and they will offer them to you like apples. She paused, weighing the objects in question in her hands. No, they're bigger. Orbs. I like that. Orbs of ivory. Smooth, firm, ruby-tipped. The king's orb is gold, but I like mine better. So will you. No, your highness. Of course you will, if not now another time. For the dragon. I'm in your debt. Her face grew serious. I repay debts. My father was a king in Mithgarther, mother a dragon of Muspel. My nurses were elf. Do you credit all that? Yes, Your Highness, I said. I know it to be true. I'm a good friend, but a terrible enemy. You'll find that's true, too. I've been watching you whenever I could find the time. Are those women as big as they look? Bigger, Your Highness. When I learned that their women lived separately, I wondered why the Frost Giants permitted it. When I met those women, I understood— you never quailed before them, I shrugged. You're the greatest knight in Mythgarther. I couldn't watch you in Sky, but I know you went there. You came back, too. You're going to need a friend in Thor Tower. It's what you said and why I came. It's truer than you can know. After speaking with one of those who live there, as I have been just now, I'm sure you're right, Your Highness. Do you think I offer myself to anyone and everyone? You couldn't be more wrong. I struggled to explain that I thought nothing of the sort, but had to be true to desiree. Is she true to you? 
You needn't answer. I see it in your face. Morcane paused, and for the space of a breath, white teeth gnawed her full lower lip. I'm sorry. I never thought I'd say that to a man, but I am. Thank you, Your Highness. You're too kind. I've been accused of many failings, but never before of that one. Never again, I imagine. Sensing that she was about to go, Org stirred. Are you sure, Sir Abel? It doesn't have to be on the table. I merely thought we might like to pretend it was that altar. We can go to your bed. I'm tempted beyond endurance, but I can't. I won't. She laughed for perhaps the twentieth time and stepped backward until darkness lapped the edges of her gown. Her coronet rose as though it were painted wood and the air were water. It floated to her and settled upon her head. That impressed you, I see, she laughed. In payment for your astonishment, you have visitors. Better rouse a servant if you don't want to answer your own door. The knocker banged at the last word. When it stopped, I said, That will wake Halward if waking's needed. Smiling, she took another step back. Firelight returned, and I felt that the knocker had cut short a dream. Soon, the door rasped on its hinges. Hearing voices and the tread of booted feet, I told Org he was not to kill people or livestock without my leave, but that he might take game in the park, and sent him away. Gilf came to sit by me. I struck his head. Did you see her, Gilf? Did you see her eyes? Desire he has eyes of yellow fire, as all elf do. Her were black. But how they blazed! Ears up. Oh, yes, she's dangerous, I realize that. In the corridor I heard Halward say, Sir Abel's a bed, I'm sure. We'll find you a place to sleep, and... I called, In here! And they trooped in. Halweird, Cut, Wiston, Pauk, and Uns. Halward asked, Is this your squire, Sir Abel? That's what he says. Cut added, I thought it best to let him in, sir, but I come to the hall with him to make sure it was all right. We can put him out if you want. Ways his folk, Uns began, and Pauk, I signed on for anybody, and it ain't right if— I silenced them, affirmed that Wiston was my squire, and told him to speak. We rode after you, Sir Abel, that's all, he cleared his throat. I know you had to leave us behind. There wasn't any way you could have taken us with you, but you did. So I said we ought to ride ahead too, and maybe we could catch up. Lord Beale wanted us to stay, but Queen Idden, I mean Her Majesty, said we ought to go, and after that His Grace did too, and His Lordship said it was all right. I said for them to stay, but they wouldn't, so I took them with me. Pauk knuckled his forehead. Why well, has our duty, sir, I said, only Sir Abel's. You've got to tell them to obey me, Wiston finished. I explained that he would have to earn their respect. I'll earn it with my sword next time, Wiston looked grim. They insisted on coming and bringing two mules. I could see both wanted to talk, but I shook my head. It slowed us, but I kept driving them. I wanted to ride ahead. Yesterday I almost did. Only there might be bandits, and they wouldn't have had anyone to protect them. Pauk snorted. So I stayed, Sir Abel, because of the mules. I've few possessions. Are these things yours? No, sir, or not much. I— Uns interrupted. All yarn on a mules. Lutes are. Gleanings from the army of Jotunland, sir? Wiston looked apologetic. It hadn't been divided when you left, but we did it the next morning according to the rule. Not knowing the rule, I asked him to quote it. I think I can, sir. A quarter for the crown. Of what remains, one share for every person present, plus a share over for every gently born person not knighted. He touched his own chest. Five for a knight, plus one for each man-at-arms and archer he brought. Only the knight keeps those. Ten for each noble, plus five for each knight he brought. That meant fifteen for his grace, sir. Only they wouldn't hear of it, because you're really his grace's knight. It wasn't just Sir Waddit. And you did more than anybody, so they made him take twenty. And then— Enough, I said. I take it I got five shares, and of course you got two yourself, and Pauk and Dunn's one each. You got more than that, sir, Pauk told me proudly. When it were shared out Sir Waddit, said you ought to have more. 
Uns interrupted him. Unseedly arts are him ton the queen, a pacum. Wiston nodded. His grace said everyone who wanted to add to your share should line up, and we put yours on a blanket, and everyone passed by and added what they wanted. Her majesty was first, and she put down a big gold cup full of gold, and after that everyone put in a lot. Not you, I hope. Wiston looked embarrassed. It was a lot for me, Sir Abel, nothing in comparison to Her Majesty's gift. I understand, and I thank you. It's great to see you again, and Uns too, and Pauk, especially Pauk. You got permission to ride ahead, and you must have pressed hard to cover the distance as quickly as you did. What time did you set out this morning? Before Cockcrow? I nodded. It must be nearly midnight now, and I've ill news. We'll be leaving for Thor Tower in a day or two. I'd intended to go tomorrow, but you and your horses must rest. The mules and their loads can be left here. I sent them off to bed as quickly as I could and woke my grooms. The mules' packs I had carried up to my bedroom, where I glanced at a few things before I got ready for bed. I was nearly asleep when someone whispered, There is magic there, Lord. I feel it. If I had been awake, I would have questioned her about it, and about Morcane, about Morcane particularly. As it was, I told her to leave so I could sleep. In reading over this long letter, Ben, I see I have left out lots of things. One is how I have written it. I will not say much about that now, except that I have lots of free time, more than I want, because desire is gone so much, and that sometimes I walk all morning beside the sea, thinking about the facts I am going to write down, what other people said, and what I said. Manny's voice, purring one minute and mewing loudly the next, Garseg's glance, the soft warmth of Gilf's ears, and the deep love Cloud gave me. I would stroke her once I had unsaddled her in some lonely camp, and tell her that her horn was sprouting, and that we must find a frontal with a hole for it, so that others would believe it to be an ornament. This we did when we reached King's Doom but I am getting ahead of my story. It had snowed a hand's breadth during the night, and there was grumbling among my men-at-arms and archers when I turned them out. I told them we had slept outdoors in worse weather in Jotunland, and when Wiston joined us he related his experiences. I had him shoot with the archers afterward, knowing he would talk of our fights with the Angerborn. I myself endeavored to teach the men-at-arms the lance, the older ones I found proficient already, having been well schooled by Sir Ravd. The younger scarcely knew how a lance should be held, and though they knew the helm and chest were the best targets, they were more likely to stick the horse. Jousting had to be given up in favor of the dangling ring. When every one of them had ridden at it twice, and missed it in most cases, I called Wiston, and with Cloud's consent, mounted him on her, and had him ride at the ring. The wind came no swifter than Cloud with Wiston on her back, yet his lance took the ring both times. I was loud in my praise. The light had begun to fade, but we made the most of it, finishing with practice swords in the snow and calling no halt until peeled wood could no longer be seen. We ate then, not they in their place and I in mine, but together in the wide hall, I at the head of the table with Wiston on my right. Pauk and Duns sat at its foot, but were waited on by the servants, just as my fighting men were. There was ale, bread, and meat in plenty, and cheeses, apples, and nuts afterward. While we cracked nuts, Wiston asked whether we would bring men to Thor Tower. I said we would not, which proved a mistake, for we came without hostile intent and the road, which had proved safe for the three of them, would surely be safe for a knight, his squire, and two manservants. It was not until I made ready for bed that I recalled the whisper of the night before. Then I unpacked the loads and looked at every object with care. Eterni was just such an object, to be sure, and yet Eterni seemed but a lovely blade until she cleared the scabbard. There was a lot of coin to gold, and I hesitated to dismiss it. I examined each coin, but though they were of five realms, I found none that seemed different enough to arouse my interest. I dropped each into my burse and took it out again without result. 
How I puzzled over the remaining objects, turning each over and over, and wishing mightily that I had Manny to advise me. In the end I settled, with many a doubt, on three. The first was a cup in which you could have washed a baby. It was, I felt sure, the one Idden had given filled with gold. I thought it likely Gilling had given it to her, and since it was not unusual save for being red gold with good decoration, it seemed to me it might possess a secret virtue, that it might disarm poisons or some such. I drank water from it and a little wine, but felt nothing. The second was a helm, old and not in the best repair. It was iron like other helms, and lined with leather somewhat worn and cracked. I suspected it because it did not appear a rich gift, yet it might have been worn by a hero and so bring glory to its owner. It was without a crest and undecorated save for marks about the eyeslets. I put it on and looked about me, staring at the fire and peering out the window, but saw nothing unusual. After that I polished and oiled it, oiling its dry leather also. The last was a gold circle in serpent shape. It seemed to me it had been the finger ring of some fallen frost giant, although it would fit the arm of many a lady. It was too big for my fingers and too small for my arms. I looked through it and tossed it into the air without result. After wasting some breath calling for Uri and Baki, I went to bed sorely puzzled, dreamed of the Tower of Glass, and woke thinking of the woman I had seen there with Linnet and Atella. I built up the fire and slept again, dreaming of the raiders I faced long ago. We had captured their ship, which had something in its hold we dared not face. For one more day I drilled the men. On the day following we left, Gilf, Wiston, Pauguns, and I. I never saw Org on the road, but I heard him in the wood, although what I heard might have been no more than a branch snapping under the weight of the snow. We rode, slowly, stopping at inns, and took more than a week to reach Kingstone. Having traveled a distance, Cloud, Gilf, and I might have covered in an hour. Shearwall does not stand in for Seti, but in a stronger place a league from the city. Not so Thortower. Kingstone surrounds it on every side, as the town called Utgard did Gilling's castle, also called Utgard. But whereas the town of Utgard is a mere huddle of barn-like houses, the city of Kingsdoom boasts many noble buildings. It being late when we arrived, we found an inn near Thor Tower, and spent what light remained sightseeing around the harbor and along the broad thoroughfare from the quay to the castle. Here I have to go back to the objects I described. I had brought them with us. Once we were snug in our inn, I showed them one by one to Gilf, then called Whiston, Pauk, and Duns to me. They could make no more of them than I could. I called for Baki when they had gone, and she came. I hugged her, which I should not have. She gasped for breath when I released her. Lord, I came to say I would come no more. Now, well, who can say? Do you love me? I said I did, and I had missed her greatly. And I, you, Lord, always when I was away, and often when I was at your side. You have freed us, Uri and me. We are your slaves no longer. You never were. I freed you more than once. So you did, but called us at need and sent us off when that was convenient, rarely with thanks. May I sit? Of course. She did, seating herself in my little fire. We were yours because we were cedars. While cedar bound us, we could not go free. Cedar is dead, you're free, and it was none of my doing. Vil slew him, though he could not have without Spawn and Sir Garveon, who occupied him while Vil got my bowstring around his neck. Your debt's to them, not to me. Still, I'm glad you're free and hope we can be friends. Prettily spoken, Baki looked at me sidelong. You should do well at court. I must do better than that, I told her. If you've ever wished me well, you must wish me well there. Have you really come to say goodbye? I have. Soon. Soon I will go, dear lord, and you will never see me more. Nor I you. 
The parting is upon us, and that parting will be forever. She spoke so dramatically I knew she was lying, but I feigned belief for fear our parting would become real. Will you not bed me, lord? Warm the lonely elf-maid who served you so long in this cold world. Chilled though I am, we shall be fire and flame in bed. You shall see. I shook my head. Then kiss me, she said, and stepped from the fire. I kissed her, held her, and kissed her again. When we parted, I said, I won't try to keep you, Baki. But before you go, I'll ask a question and a small service. In less time than it would take me to explain, you can do both. Then I will, for another kiss. Good. A few days ago, someone whispered in my ear that there was magic among the gifts Wiston brought. Was it you? She shook her head. Not I, Lord. Do you know who it was? Two questions, so I earn two kisses. It was surely Uri, Lord. She is in terror of you, and does whatever she believes may stay your wrath. I said I would not harm her. I know it, Lord. She thinks only of her long betrayal. I... they broke my back. You healed me. I cannot forget. I didn't, Baki Taug did. He would not have, Lord, had you not fetched him, and told him to, and told him what to do. So suddenly that I took a step backward, Baki abased herself. Lord, forgive me. I love you and would win you if I could. Would win you if I had to share you with a thousand desirees? I raised her. There's nothing to forgive, or if there is, I forgive it. Baki, I'm going to show you three objects. If one casts a spell, will you tell me? She nodded. I will, Lord, if I can divine it. I got out the gold serpent first. She took it, breathed on its ruby eyes, shrugged, and handed it back. Nothing? No magic? It may be too subtle for me, Lord, but if it is, it is too subtle for Uri also. Or so I think. I pulled out the old helm and held it up. Her jaw fell. For an instant, she stood like a statue of bright copper. Then she was gone. Knowing it would be useless to call to her again, I called Uri and then Desiree, begging her to come. Neither responded, and at last I went to bed, thinking a lot about the old helm, and King Arnthor and his court. Chapter 29 Lord Eskin Wiston and I rode to the castle the next day. To describe all the people who quizzed us, some because it was their duty, others out of curiosity, would take more time than I want to give it. There were more than a dozen. At length we were sent to a court I might have thought King Arnthor's if I had not been told otherwise. It was that of the Earl Marshal, a nobleman of many titles, who sat a throne a little smaller than Gillings on a dais, attended by perhaps a hundred, most of them supplicants of one stripe or another, and the rest servants and attendants. He was busy with a matter involving the king's stable when we arrived, the borrowing of a stallion from a duke who was not martyr, the lending of one of the kings in return, a colt from a mare of the king's to be given the duke, a colt from one of the duke's mares to be given the king, and so on. The stallion to be borrowed had already been decided when we came. The one to be loaned in return was under discussion. So-and-so was the best, but the duke's man did not like the color. Another, white, was beautiful but savage. It was not to be ill-treated, although it kicked and bit. It was not to be fought for sport. The duke's man would not guarantee on his master's behalf that it would not be fought. They had not considered that. Very well, if it was. And so on for an hour. I was impatient at first, but soon found much of interest in the Earl Marshal's questions, comments, offers, and suggestions. He was a formidable negotiator, who, if he had not been a nobleman, might have made his fortune as a trader, subtle, patient, and ingenious. He was portly and gained advantage from his size, more from his jowls, the great pale dome of his head, and his eyes, which were perhaps the shrewdest I have ever seen. 
At last, the stallions were settled. For a moment, those eyes were on me, and I expected him to talk to me or tell one of his bustling clerks to do it. An elderly woman was led before him instead. Seeing her infirmity, he asked whether she would not prefer to sit, and a chair was brought. Her first husband, it transpired, had been a knight. It meant that she was formally addressed as dame. He had died in some long-ago skirmish, and she had remarried, choosing a draper. Now he too was dead. She wished to resume her title, but her neighbors would not accord it to her. "'There is no question,' the Earl Marshal declared, "'that you ask no more than is yours by law. "'None but the king may expunge these honors, "'and I recall no case in which the loser was a lady. "'No doubt it has occurred, "'but the time would be prior to my birth and yours. "'If you require a declaration of your right, I make it, and publicly. "'If you ask a written one, a clerk can prepare it, and I'll sign it.' "'Humbly the old woman said, they know they wrong me, my lord, they delight in it. And you, the Earl Marshal inquired, do you yourself honor Sir Owen? In my heart, my lord, daily. Harumph! The Earl Marshal's eyes rolled. Hearts I leave to sky, Dame Elaned. I cannot look into them. You are of means. Your dress proclaims it. Are Sir Owen's arms displayed on your house? So soft was the old woman's reply that the Earl Marshal had to ask her to repeat it. No, my lord. On the liveries of your servants, your manservants, if not your women, there was no reply. The favorable ruling you ask of me lies in your power, Dame Elaned, not in mine. The Earl Marshal made a gesture of dismissal, and at once his servants helped the old woman to her feet and removed the chair. I will have the night next, said the Earl Marshal, indicating me. The crowd parted, and I came forward. Do I know your mail, or does that but imitate it? I replied, You know it, my lord. It has been said to lie no longer within this world. I made no answer, since no question had been asked. Was it in Mythgarther that you obtained it? No, my lord. For a moment his court was silent, a silence he himself broke by clearing his throat. Humph! I move too quickly for reason. Your name? I'm Sir Abel of Redhall. Your allegiance is to his grace, Duke Martyr, is that correct? It is, my lord. Yet you do not go to his grace for justice? The Earl Marshal raised a hand. Peace! We shall come to that by and by. You ride a fine barb, Sir Abel. One of my clerks called me to a window to see him. I will examine him more nearly when I have leisure. I will be honored to show her, my lord. The Earl of Marshal's eyes opened a little wider. Did I hear you say that animal is a mare? She is, my lord, though often taken for a stallion. I should like to see a stallion of her line. I've none to exhibit to you, my lord. Has she been bred? No, my lord, she's still young, nor would the coupling be easy. She has not attained full growth? He was skeptical. No, my lord. He passed a hand across his face. I should like to see her groan. I'd like to see that very much. We will speak of this after. I'm at my lord's command. You are one of his grace's knights. He bid you hold a mountain pass for some months. Such was the last I heard of you, Sir Abel. He has given you Red Hall since, and so thinks highly of you. You held the pass? I did, my lord. Against how many? Three, my lord. He chuckled. Your fellows think well of you too, or more would have come against you. You overthrew all three? Yes, my lord. Admirable. How may we serve you? I need an audience with his majesty, my lord. And have no friend at court, I see. You wish to be presented. We must talk, my lord. I have a message for him. I see. From? I'll keep silence on that, my lord. I see. The Earl Marshal motioned to one of his clerks. Take Sir Abel to the Red Room. Whiston hurried forward to join me. 
Make that my library. You wish your squire to remain in your company, Sir Abel? We will find entertainment for him elsewhere if you do not. I'd like him to stay, if it won't be too much trouble. Very well. You will desire a refreshment. Tell Payne. The Earl Marshal's library proved a snug room with a fire and a hundred books or more on shelves and tables. Payne, young and bald, with eyes nearly as shrewd as his master's, bid us sit and cautioned us about the books. All these are priceless, you understand, I hope? Whiston said we did. I was looking at them and took one from its shelf. Can you read Sir Abel? No, I said. No more can I read that one. It's of Aelfris, and the letters are very different from our own. Whiston asked how the Earl Marshal had gotten a book from Aelfris. The matter was complex, but Payne explained it at some length, ending with, It's a history of the place with an explanation of their laws. I had been reading while he spoke. They have none, and it's mostly a chronicle of the kings of the Stone Elf. But this, I showed him the place, is a spell to turn ghosts visible. By Mananan and Miter, by Brogi, Bow and Lyre, by all you hope from the Bridge of Swords, I conjure you appear. The hag at the fire laughed, and by her laugh I knew she had been there the entire time. I heard the door slam, but I thought Payne alone had fled. Greetings, mother, I said. I didn't really mean to conjure you. I'm sorry for my carelessness. You don't like having me around. She tittered. What have you done with my cat? Hearing that, I knew who she was and said, I left him behind me, mother, and I miss him a lot. As for you, you showed me hospitality once when I was in need of it. You're welcome to mine whenever you choose. She scooped coals from the fire, shook them together in her hands, and cast them onto the hearth. For a few seconds, she bent over them, blowing on them to brighten their glow. You fear the sister, she told me. Fear the brother. Garseg? He's dead. She laughed, and vanished as the door swung back and the Earl Marshal came in, followed reluctantly by Whiston. I was told there was a ghost here, the Earl Marshal smiled. I bowed. If there is, my lord, we cannot see her. Just so. He pulled out the largest chair. Won't you sit down, Sir Abel? This is no formal hearing. I thanked him, sat, and motioned for Whiston to sit. Payne rushed up to me with this young fellow. They said you had raised a spirit. I feared for my books and came. I said I felt sure she had taken none. You did call up a ghost, Sir Abel? Unintentionally, my lord. I closed the book, rose, and returned it to its place upon his shelves. Could you do it again? I don't think that would be wise, my lord. I went back to my chair. You're probably right, if you did as you say. I'd prefer, my lord, that you think me mendacious. It will save a thousand difficulties. Can you read the book you were looking at? No, my lord. This youth, your squire, by the lightest nod of his massive head, the Earl Marshal indicated Whiston, said you had found a spell in one of my books. That youth is no longer my squire, my lord, he sighed. I share your difficulty. I won't dismiss pain, but I should. You said you couldn't read that book. I did, my lord. Are you saying that you said it or that you read it? It would seem we have fallen among conundrums already. Both, my lord. Would you lie to me, Sir Abel? I mean in matters other than that of the ghost, in which we agree on your mendacity. No, my lord. So you read it, but can no longer read it? Why not? It's shut, my lord. I can't see the words. Tush! He raised a wide hand, damp with perspiration. You read the character of Elfris. You need not say it, I know it. No wonder his grace thinks highly of you. Whiston coughed. If I may, my lord, as I am no longer Sir Abel Squire, I may seek other service without dishonor, so it seems to me. And to me, young man, a slight smile played about the Earl Marshal's lips. I seek it with you, my lord. 
Take me at my word when I say I wouldn't betray Sir Abel's confidences. He's told me nothing in confidence, but I know more concerning him than most. I'll advise you in the matter, if you'll allow it. The Earl Marshal chuckled. You've need of an adviser, my lord. For years I served an ordinary knight-at-arms. He was as worthy a knight as ever drew sword, to which Sir Abel will attest, but a common knight, however staunch. Sir Abel is of another ilk. I do not require you to tell me that, young man. What is your name, by the way? Whiston, my lord. You may advise me in this matter, Whiston, if you will. Thank you, my lord. I am honored. The Earl Marshal made a tower of fingers and regarded Whiston over it. If your advice proves profitable, I'll take you into my service as you wish. If it does not, I will not. If I do, you must serve me better than you did, Sir Abel. If you do not... I'll dismiss you just as he did. He turned to me. Is he of good character, Sir Abel? Pretty much so, my lord, though I've been trying to improve it. No doubt. The Earl Marshal turned back to Whiston. You are my adviser, Whiston. This knight tells us that he bears a message to his majesty. An important message, Sir Abel? I believe it must be, my lord. He will not reveal its source. Do you know it? Whiston shook his head. Know it? Not I, my lord. Can you guess it? I can try, my lord. We were in the north when he left us, riding swiftly to Red Hall. I joined him, bringing his servants and much treasure. Queen Idden gave him that. The Earl Marshal's eyes narrowed. I mean, much of it was her gift, my lord, and she was the one who got the rest to give so much. So, if he wrote with a message, I think it must be hers. The Earl Marshal looked to me. Are we antagonists, Sir Abel? I hope otherwise. I bear you no ill will. I don't bear you any either, my lord. Until this moment, I'd have boasted that there was not a royal parsonage within a thousand leagues who was unknown to me. He laced hands on his belly, which was substantial. Almost I am tempted to make the boast still. Is this a true queen of whom this stripling speaks? If she favors you, you must know her. She is, my lord. She's queen of the Skjaldmajar, the daughters of Anger. By this you intend the wives of the Frost Giants. And their daughters, my lord. No man has seen them, Sir Abel. Whiston said, I have, my lord. So have I, I said. So has his grace and many others who are with us. This hidden is their queen. She is, my lord, a good queen and a brave woman. Whiston started talking, but the Earl Marshal silenced him, rose, paced the room, took down the book I had shelved and turned its pages, and at last sat again. This past summer His Majesty sent my old friend Lord Beale to Jotunland as his ambassador. Against my advice, for it seemed to me an errand too hazardous for any man. Lord Beale has a daughter, young and fair. These arms rocked her when she was still in swaddling clothes. I ask a plain answer. Is this the Queen Eden of whom you speak, yes or no? It is, my lord. You have been with Lord Beale in Jotunland? Whiston said hastily, We both have, my lord. He was Sir Garvayon's liege. I was Sir Garvayon's squire. Was his grace with Lord Beale as well? It was said a moment ago that he had seen the Frost Giant's women. Yes, my lord. Sir Abel brought him, my lord, while we were in Utgard. Before Lady Idden became Queen of Anger's women. Afterward, my lord. Only we didn't know it then. We didn't know if there were any till Hela brought them. Rumph. Hela's Sir Waddit's maidservant, my lord, only she used to be Sir Abel's. He gave her and her brother to Sir Waddit, my lord, because they're friends and he wanted them. Sir Garvayon said not to trust them, so I tried to stay away from them. Only the anger-born women are worse. They're bigger, and I never liked the way they looked at me. Only they helped us in the battle. There was a battle. That was directed to me. I said, Yes, my lord, King Shildstar's army tried to keep us from leaving Jotunland. By us you signify his grace and his lordship, Queen Idden as well? Yes, my lord. 
who naturally called upon her subjects. Did they fight with dashers and pestles, that sort of thing? No, my lord, with spears and swords. And they are of the size of the Angerborn? Larger, my lord, something larger. Lady Iden is their queen, Lord Beale's daughter. Right, my lord, Lady Iden married King Gilling. To be queen of Jotunland is to be queen of the Skjaldmaiar. A King Shildstar was mentioned not long ago. King Gilling's successor, my lord. I see. Did King Gilling fall in battle? No, my lord, he was murdered. This is ill news. The Earl Marshal sat with pursed lips. By some partisan of this Shildstar? I think so, my lord, Wiston put in. Some people thought Taug did it, but I know he didn't. The Earl Marshal blinked and asked me who Taug was. He's Sir Svon's squire, my lord, and Wiston's right. Taug's innocent of the murder of King Gilling. Is this Sir Svon the Svon I know? I believe so, my lord. Wiston said, He fought the dragon in Aelfris, my lord. Only he wasn't killed and Sir Garveon was. I didn't see it. I mean, I saw his body. The dragon bit him nearly through. The Earl Marshal rose. You offered to show me that, um, mare of yours, Sir Abel, let's look at her. We traversed a dozen corridors and passed through four courtyards. I recall thinking at the time that in spite of Thor Tower's many lofty walls, soaring towers, and circles of fortification, it could not be defended by anything less than an army. It was too big to be held by a few hundred men, or a thousand for that matter. At last we reached the stables, and by pretending to quiet clouds so the Earl Marshal could examine her, I was able to conceal the ivory dot that would become her horn. When he had stroked her muzzle, which she tolerated, he asked to ride her, and I was forced to say that he could not, that she would not permit it. I might tame her in time, I suppose, he said. No, my lord. No one but yourself, eh? Huh? I've ridden her, Wiston said. But Sir Abel's right. I wouldn't try it unless she likes you. My weight, perhaps. Well, she's a remarkable animal, Sir Abel. I won't ask whether you'll sell her. I know the answer. It wouldn't be just in any event when you hope for an audience with the king. I said, I do, my lord, very much. I must get one. I understand. Some things, anyway. You've no friends at court, none? Ah, your face says otherwise. Who is he? She, my lord, Princess Morcane. Anyway, I hope she's my friend, but I don't want to bother her unless I have to. The Earl Marshal wiped his face with his hand, then wiped his hand on his coat. That I ought to have guessed long ago. This isn't one of my brilliant days. As to her friendship, who knows? It's the wind. I myself, well, I hope you don't find her friendship worse than her enmity. It seemed a good time to say nothing, so I did. I ask you again, who sends your message to the king? We'll send the boy away if it suits you. I think it better not to talk about that, my lord. As you wish. The Earl Marshal gave Cloud a final pat and turned away. I like you, Sir Abel. I'll do what I can for you, but there are risks I cannot take. He's no common knight, my lord, as I told you. Wiston sounded older than his years. You're wise to go carefully. You'll be wiser still to make a friend of him if you can. The Earl Marshal nodded as though to himself. I will soon try. First, Sir Abel, I can't ask an audience with the king at which you'll deliver a message of which I'm ignorant. You will not so much as confide the name of the sender, will you? This is your final opportunity. I won't, my lord. It was not as cold as it had been in Jotunland, but the stable was unheeded and open in scores of places. I drew my cloak about me. As for confiding the message itself, I can't. It is not in my power to do it. You are bound by an oath, eh? No, my lord, I don't know what it is. Yet you could deliver it to the king. Yes, my lord. I'll know it, my lord, when we meet. Wiston said, There's but one way to discover it, my lord, and if the words are ungracious, you can't be blamed. 
You know little of the world. The Earl Marshal turned to me. I can't run the risk of begging an audience for you, not with the best of wills. I hope you understand. I'm grateful for your good wishes, my lord. I proffer two suggestions. The first depends on me, the second on you. Here's the first, if you wish it. When the time seems ripe, I will inform the king that a strange knight has come with news from the north, that he reports King Gilling fallen and a new king in Utgard, with many marvels. It isn't improbable the king will ask that you be brought before him. Shall I do it? The choice is yours. I beg you to. I'll be indebted forever, my lord. The second. You are a stout knight and overthrew all who challenged you in the north. There will be a tourney in three days, as always at your tide. You could enter those events at which you may excel. Those who greatly distinguish themselves will be entertained by the king and queen. I vowed that I would strive to be among them, and he dismissed me. Chapter 30 Morcane's Summons After taking my leave, I sought out the pursuivant of the Niker King of Arms, as King Arnthor's herald was styled, he being charged with enrolling those who would enter the lists. He was away in the town. I waited until the short day was ended and rode back to our inn. That I was out of sorts I will not deny. I was curt with Pauk and Uns, although less so when I considered that I had gone far toward making a friend of the Earl Marshal, a most influential official of the court, that he was to speak to the king about me, and that I might hope to win an audience in the tournament. I was making ready for bed when Whiston came. He bowed, apologized for his conduct, and declared I might beat him if I wished. I said, of course, that since he was no longer my squire, I had no business beating him, that squires were beaten, so they would be better knights by and by, and I was no longer concerned to make a knight of him. I pray you will reconsider, Sir Abel. I behaved badly. I acknowledge it. Sir Svan told me he behaved badly when he was your squire. You never dismissed him, and before you left us, united him. Sir Svan fought the dragon, Whiston. I made my tone as dry as I could. Only his eyes reminded me that I had not. Reason and honor forbade it. You know I bear a dragon on my shield. Perhaps you know also why it is there. He nodded. Taug told me. Is it really true? Since I don't know what he told you, I can't say. I yawned. You came so I could beat you? I won't. Now go. He shook his head. I came so you could take me back. I won't do that either. You involve me in great difficulty, Sir Abel. He looked frightened. Would you see me hung up and flogged? I shrugged. It'll kill my mother. She's proud of all of us. I've got two sisters, but proudest of me. They'll say the king did it. It won't be true, but they'll say it, and it'll kill her. I said I doubted that anyone would do it. Are you afraid, Whiston, that I'll tell the Earl Marshal you ought to be flogged? I won't. You have my word. He'll take me into his service, Sir Abel, he said so. I congratulate you. I... I'd have nice clothes, like pains. I'd live very comfortably, good food and money, a warm bed. Then take it. I want to be a knight. Like Sir Garveon, like you. It hung in the air between us until I hugged him. When I released him, he gasped like Baki. I... Does this mean I'm your squire again? If you wish it, yes. I do. I called Org, and he came forward to stand at my side. Is this to frighten me? I've seen him before, in the wood with Sir Svan. I know, I said. You were frightened just the same. Wiston nodded. I still am. Then you see that you may be afraid without dashing out of the room. He nodded. A knight's actions are governed by his honor, I said, not by his fear. You said something like that before. I'll say it again over and over, in as many ways as I can, knowing it isn't enough. It has to become part of you. Why were you afraid they'd flog you? They won't now. I'll tell you, but I need to tell you something else first. I told the Earl Marshal about going to Jotunland, how we set out and how you joined us, 
how you and Sir Garvayon rode down from the pass to fight when the giants attacked and Utgard. Everything I knew. Did you tell him who killed King Gilling? Wiston shook his head. No, I don't know. I said I thought it was Shieldstar or one of the giants with him, because I do. But I can't be sure. The important thing is that I told him about you. I told him Taug saw you die, but you came back to help us anyway. I told him everything I knew, and he made me swear to certain things. That was one, and Queen Idden's bringing a hundred giant women was another. I pointed my sword to Sky, and swore like he wanted, and he said the women would be the test, that when the women came he'd know I was telling the truth and take me. So he knows all that, everything I know about Jotunland. I nodded. He knows about Taug and Atella and Lady Linnet getting lost in Aelfris, and you coming there, and Sir Garveon and Sir Svan. He already knows you can read that book, Wiston gulped. Of course he does, but can he read it as well? That's an interesting point. I guess so. He wouldn't have it if he couldn't read it, would he? Of course he would. Books are extremely valuable. It takes a copyist years to copy one. And who know what errors he will introduce. Every book is valuable, and the older a copy is, the more valuable it is. If the Earl Marshal couldn't read it, he might hope to find someone who could. Wiston nodded again. I'll try to find out. He had suggested another test, and I called Uri. She stepped out of the fire, slender and quite naked. Wiston took it with more coolness than I expected, and strove to keep his eyes off her, or when she spoke, on her face. She, who had always been beautiful, this night seemed more lovely than ever, willow slender, graceful and glowing. I soon realized that having learned she could not seduce me, she was exerting herself on Wiston. I told him then that he must leave. He hesitated, his hand on the latch. There's something else. I'll tell you when I come back, all right? I'll be asleep. Tell me now. I had them put down your name for a lot of things in the tournament, Sir Abel. I knew you'd wanted to, so I found the Perswivant and told him I was your squire and he did it. That's why I said they'd flog me if you didn't take me back. As they would have, I'm sure. You did well, however. What events? Bo, Halbert, Joust, and Melee. You said there were many, only four. Bo is two, really. Dismounted and mounted. I nodded and waved him out. As soon as the door had shut, Uri abased herself and pleaded for mercy. I made her stand, adding that I had not decided whether I would spare her life. That was a lie. I had no intention of killing her, but I felt it might be good for her to keep her in suspense. I have always loved you, Lord, more than Baki, more than... than anyone. More than Queen Desiree of the Mossalf. Y yes Lord, more than sh... She? This, though, she never betrayed me. She was no slave to s Cetar, Lord. I was. Baki was Cetar's slave as well. Y yes She would not meet my eyes. When Baki's spine was broken, you would not bring me to her to heal her. She stood a trifle straighter. Another brought you, Lord, but you did not heal her. The boy did it. Not that boy, the other. Taug. I'm going to ask three things of you, Uri. If you do what I ask, I'll spare your life, not otherwise. Do you understand? Two are just questions, and none are hard. She bowed. I am your slave. The first. Why did you come when you knew I might kill you? You could have stayed in Aelfris. Because you will not always be here, Lord. In Aelfris you would have hunted me down. You with your hound? she gestured toward Gilf, and the queen with her pack. I hoped to save my life by obedience and contrition. You talk bravely, I told her, but your lip trembles. In fear of one it would p prefer to k kiss Lord. We'll let that go by, Uri. You came, I appreciate it. It's a point in your favor, undeniably. Org had edged nearer and I saw that he intended to catch her if she tried to flee. Here's the second. The Earl Marshal has a book written in Aelfris. I saw that I had surprised her. I want you to discover whether he can read it, and what his connection with Aelfris may be. I will try, Lord. 
I will learn all I can. Good. Here's the last and the other question. It's in two parts. As I was getting to sleep, someone warned me there was magic in the gifts Wiston brought. Was it you? She nodded. I will always seek to serve you, Lord. Why didn't you remain and tell me more? I was in fear. That, that has not changed, Lord. Of the magic? She shook her head. Of you, Lord. Is the magic in all my gifts, or in one alone? You ask what you already know, Lord. So you get an easy answer and save your life. Gilf raised his head and looked quizzically at me. In one, Lord, in the helm, you know it. But I do not know whose gift it was, do you? Yes, Lord, Borda gave it. I watched the giving. Have you any idea why she gave it? No, Lord. I studied Uri's face, although I could seldom pick up on her fabrications. None at all? None, Lord. Shall I try to find out? Not now. I've worn the helm. Nothing took place. Do you know its secret? Uri shook her head. I do not, Lord. If I discover it, I will tell you. Are you afraid of it? Yes, Lord. As of you. I glanced at Org, trying to tell him with my eyes that he was not to harm her. When it seemed he understood, I got out the old helm. When I straightened up, she was struggling in his grasp. I told her to be still and put on the helm. Org held a writhing thing, shaped of flame and offal, of dung and blazing straw, and such tripes as might be taken from a goat a week dead. Gilf snarled as if he saw it as I had, and he was a dog of gold with carnelian eyes. Several days intervened between the night I saw Uri writhing in the grip of a monster of swarming vermin and the opening of the tournament. They held little of interest. Uri I let flee as soon as I took off the helm. I did not put it back on in that time, nor did I call for her again. If I must refer to any of those days as my account goes on, I will describe it when I need it. The first day was for quarterstaff competition among churls. I could have entered, and I was tempted to. If I had, my participation in the joust and the melee would surely have been called into question. I watched with interest instead, as did some other knights. It was the custom of the castle to match the man thought most likely to win with the man thought least likely, number two in the standings, judged by the pursuivant, with the beginner, and so on. Thus the first round, in which everyone fought at the same time, was over quickly, and quicker because no armor was allowed except a jerkin and a leather cap. In the second each pair fought alone, the pairing determined by the order in which each man had won in the first. The one who had won first fought the one who had won last, and so on. Speed and agility count a lot with the quarterstaff, so none of the matches were long. Even so, some lasted longer than it might take to saddle a restive horse. In two, the fighters were slow to close. They were circled with a rope drawn tighter by the pursuivant's servants until one went down. The second day was archery on foot. If I had still had the bowstring parka cut for me, I would have won easily. I did not, and although my score was good, several others did better. One dined with King Arnthor and Queen Gaynor, but I did not. The third was the day for mounted archery. We shot at a false target of braided straw, which held the arrows well and did not damage the heads. Gilt stood for the boss in the middle, and to strike the gold, that was how they said it, scored highest of all. Each rider rode full tilt at the false target and shot when he wanted to. Those who did not spur their mounts got a penalty, but many chose slow horses. I rode Cloud and might have overtaken a swallow that flitted along the bailey. Fast though I rode, my first arrow hit the gold, and the onlookers cheered. As we trotted back to the starting line, I heard a dozen voices ask about the knight with a dragon on his shield, and Wiston's answer. He's his grace Duke Martyr, Sir Abel of Redhall, and I'm his squire. For the second shot I rode as hard as before, and that too hit the gold. No voices rose this time, but a silence louder than any applause. 
Of the third I was completely confident. My first and second shots had struck gold. I had the feel of the exercise now, and Cloud had it as well. A third gold seemed certain. That night I would eat at Arnthor's table, deliver Desiree's message, take leave of her, a year's long leave dotted with ten thousand kisses, and go to the Valfather to beg some occasion when I could return to her, knowing that if I were gone a century, it would seem to her an Alfris only a day or two. I rode, and my bowstring broke. I had given Vil the bowstring he had stolen from me, and had begged another from one of his grace's archers. Here I will spare the reproaches I heaped upon myself that day. I told myself a dozen times that I could easily have gotten a new string for the tourney, that I ought never to have been parted with Parker's string, and much, much more. None of it did any good. No one scored three golds, but three got two and a black. They dined with the king and queen, and I did not. The next day was devoted to foot races, climbing greased poles and catching greased pigs. Half crazy for something to do, I watched most of it. Whiston and I were leaving when we were stopped by a page who bowed prettily and informed us that the Countess of Chouse wished to speak with me. I said I was the Countess's to command, and we followed him through passages and up and down stairs to a little private garden, where a girl with hair like a bouquet of yellow roses waited in a snow-covered arbor. I knelt, and she invited me to sit across from her. Although at a distance I had seen the queen by then, and it seemed to me that this young noblewoman, with her high color and mixed air of boldness and timidity, resembled her closely. To tell you the truth, I thought she was probably a sister or a cousin. "'You are Sir Abel of the High Heart?' she cooed. It should have been annoying, but it was charming. "'I watched you yesterday. You're a wonderful bowman.' "'A careless bowman, my lady. I trusted my old string and lost.' "'Not my admiration,' she smiled. "'Will you wear my scarf for the rest of tournament?' She proffered it as she spoke, a white wisp of the finest silk. "'There's a dragon on my helm,' I told her, "'and they couch on treasures. Mine will couch on this.' When I had taken leave, and Whiston and I were making our way back, he whispered, "'That's the queen. Did you know?' I stared. "'Countess of Chouse will be one of her titles. They do that when they don't want to be too formal.' Ready to kick myself again, I shook my head. I would have begged her for an audience with the king if I'd known. "'You couldn't. That's one of the things it means. You have to pretend she's whoever she says she is. She would have been mad.' and her knights might have killed you. I didn't know she had her own knights. Well, she does. She has the titles and all that land. How many? I was still trying to digest the new fact. Ten or twenty, probably. When we had ridden across the moat, I asked, If she has her own knights, shouldn't she give her favor to one? Whiston spoke with the weary wisdom of a courtier. They want to give it to the one they think will win. In my room I consulted Gilf. First I told him what had passed between the Queen and me. When he understood, I said, One point has me guessing I should have told Whiston, but I doubt that he'd say anything helpful. Remember how the Queen addressed me? She said of the high heart, I've been calling myself Sir Abel of Redhall here. I may have said of the high heart once or twice, but I'm sure it wasn't more than that. Rolls? Whiston sighed. He would have written Red Hall, I know. Who wouldn't? Gilf asked. What do you mean? Gilf merely repeated his question, as he often did when he found me obtuse. It was Whiston who set my name down, so what does it matter who would have called me Sir Abel of the High Heart? Gilf sighed, closed his eyes, and rested his massive head on his forepaws. In bed I thought about Gilf's question. He was a dog of few words, but they were worth hearing. Gaynor had called me Abel of the High Heart, so she had spoken to somebody who called me that. It was possible more Cain would, although she had visited me at Red Hall. The Duchess, his grace's wife, could have mentioned me, but if she had known of me at all, it would have been while I was at Shearwall. Most people there had just called me Sir Abel. 
Although I had no reason to think her grace was at Thor Tower, she might have come and gone while I was in the north. In the morning it finally struck me that the queen need not have spoken directly with somebody who called me Sir Abel of the High Heart, that she might merely have gotten her information from someone who had. I called for Pauk and Duns, and learned that they had been quizzed by a well-dressed stranger while they watched the foot-races. He says, do you work for him what broke the string, Hans explained, and we says, yes, sir, sir Abel of the High Heart. I told him there ain't a knight here at match you, sir, Pauk added. So he says, Abel of the High Heart, huh? We says, Sir Abel, and off he goes. I told them I would fight with the halbert that day, and asked if they wanted to watch. Both swore that Muspell itself could not keep them away, so the three of us and Wiston set out in company, I with my green helm on my saddle-bow, and the queen's white scarf floating from it. I had expected that all of us would fight at the same time, for the first round at least, there being far fewer knights enrolled than churls for the quarterstaff, each pair fought singly. Hours passed before the Niker King of Arms called my name. Just as I had to wait, so must this letter while I write about the combats I saw. Halberts, many say, are the best weapons for defending a castle. For this reason, every castle has a good store, some rich, others plain and meant for peasants and serving men. It was with these we fought, because use in tournament requires that the points of pikehead and spike be ground away and the blade dulled. A helm is worn and mail, but no shields are used, since both hands are needed for the halberd. Like the quarterstaff, the halberd is grasped at the center and midway to the grounding iron, although other grips are possible and are favored by a few experts. The haft is Wiston's height, or thereabout. The whole weapon, point to grounding iron, is the height of the wielder, or a bit more. It is his own shield, and is a shield that does not blind the eyes. A strong man who knows how each blow can be parried cannot be struck if he is quick enough, but he must be strong indeed, and parry so the edge does not hew his haft, although this is not likely when the edge has been dulled. Most of the matches before mine were long, and the rope was not used. One might speak to one's neighbor and receive a reply at times between the blows, though at others they came fast and furious. As a knight, new to Thor Tower, I was matched against Bran of Broadflood, who had gained the victory the year before. He was a goodly knight, tall and thick-chested, but he thrust too deep. I knocked his point aside, and stepping in, struck the face of his helm with the haft of my halbert, tripping him with my left leg. He fell, and I had the win before most of the audience had given us their full attention. In the second round I was paired with one of the Queen's house knights, Lamwell of Chaus. He was smaller than I, but very quick, and got in good blows before I laid him out. For the third there remained eight knights, counting me. I was sore under my arm and had a dented helm. Those raised the storm, and I went for my man to kill him if I could, and had him down before he struck a blow. He was of noble blood like Svan, and a kinsman of his. Four remained. I fought my man as I had the third, and downed him quicker, for I broke his haft with my first blow. He was Rober of Green Glory, a good brave knight who was to fight alongside me in the river battle. That left two of us. A hannop was brought with good wine in it, in which we pledged each other. He was as big a knight as I have ever faced, wot it was no bigger. Garun was his name. He had no hall, but travelled from place to place and fought for pay. A freelance is what such knights are called. I thought it was his size that made him dangerous, because his halbert was half again the length of mine, and the haft was thicker. I quickly found out that it was his cunning I had to watch out for. There was not a knight in sky who knew more sleights of arms. The blade of his halbert shone, and he caught sunlight on the flat to dazzle me. His blows began one way and ended another, coming thick and fast. It seemed that he would never tire, because he had no need to use his full strength. He broke my halbert. I fought on like the man whose quarterstaff I had broken, and used the butt to parry, and struck with the head as if it were an axe, and stabbed with the pike point, hit him on the knee and crippled him, 
and grappling him, lifted him from his feet and threw him down. I stood aside, and he doffed helm and loudly said he hoped we never fought again, and I was cheered. But when the cheers had died away, the trumpet sounded, and he, Sir Garoon, was named Victor. He bribed them, Whiston declared. I shook my head, because I had seen his look of surprise. That night, Pauk knocked on our door. Whiston let him in, and he knuckled his forehead and said, There's two below what wants to see you, sir. I don't fancy their rig, only they gave me this. He displayed a small gold coin. If I'd tell you. Can I keep it? Certainly. Did they give their names? Just the one, sir. Belos he were. Warlike, Whiston translated, though I am not at all sure he was correct. They could be assassins, Sir Abel. I said I supposed they could be, or merchants wanting to sell us feathers, or any other thing. But I knew of nobody who wanted me dead, and two seemed pretty thin for a knight and his squire, to say nothing of Gilf, Org, Uns, and Pauk himself. They were slender men in hooded robes that carried the smell of the sea, and they seemed young. Neither pushed back his hood, and neither would meet my eyes. We serve a great lady of Thor Tower said the first. Her identity we will gladly reveal, if you will send these servants of yours away. Whiston bristled, and I had to explain that although he served a knight, a squire was not a servant. She wishes to speak with you, and it is to your own benefit. We will bring you to her, but you must go alone. You'll take me to her, I said, but I won't go alone. There are thieves. I'd have no one but you to defend me. They conferred while Whiston and Pauk grinned. At last they separated. We will protect you and take safe streets, and the distance is not great. Come, and we will see you back safe before sunrise. I must sleep before sunrise, I told them. I'm weary, and tomorrow begins the jousting. They promised I would be back before moonrise. I pointed to Gilf. May I take my dog? He'll be some protection for me. One said yes, the other no. After wrangling, the second asked, If you may take him, will you go? I nodded. With Gilf and with Whiston and Pauk, all of us now in this room. The first said, In that case we must return to her who sent us and report that you will not come. I shook my head. You must say I would have come, but you wouldn't agree to my conditions. And you've got to tell Her Highness I knew you were Elf as soon as I saw you. Remind her that I was a friend of her brother's and refused to join my friends when they fought him. They were backing away as I spoke. I added, For your safety I warn you that I'll tell her all this myself when I see her and that I told you to confess it. They had vanished before I finished. They'll be back tonight, I told Pauk. If they wake you up wanting you to take them to me again, say no. Pauk touched his forehead, and I waved him out. Whiston asked whether the dragon Vil had killed was really Princess Marcane's brother. I told him he was too clever by half, and his ears would get him into trouble. But I need to know these things. You're going to take me with you. Because it's my duty to teach you. I've done precious little teaching so far. Have I complained? I yawned and said I felt sure he had. I haven't. Probably I was thinking and frowned or something. All right. The princess is the dragon's sister. She's human, as her father was, though not wholly human, since her mother was a dragon from Muspel. Dragons take human shape better than the elf. Do I have to explain that? Please, please, Sir Abel. Okay. There are seven worlds. If you know anything, you know that. This is the fourth, the one in the middle. This middle world is the most stable. There are some here who can change more than you and I can, but only a few, and even they, can't change very much. As you go farther, there's less stability. The elf look pretty human, and can look more human. They can take the shapes of animals and people, but they can't go much past that or get bigger or smaller. Their eyes give them away. They fade in the sun and run away from sunlight. I remember from when they fought for us. Those were Uri's people. You saw her. He nodded. 
their fire elf, and were enslaved by Cedar. Cedar was the dragon. There's another brother, no doubt you realize that. We're not going to talk about him. Chapter 31 A Snack with Lord Eskin. The jousting differed from our practice at Shearwall largely in the splendor of armor and bardings, and the dress of the spectators. Our lances were supplied by the pursuivant in order that there might be no difference in their quality, and to ensure that each would be topped by a steel crown of the same design. Heavy practice armor was not worn, but many used shields stouter than they would have carried to war. Lists separated the jousters so that their mounts would not collide. One might strike the helm or the chest if one could, but our lances were aimed at our opponent's shields for the most part. Each pair engaged until one was knocked from the saddle or cast away his lance in surrender. I had but a single match that first day against Kai, the champion of the year before. There was no nonsense about breaking lances with us. Each sought to unhorse the other from the beginning, yet we shattered six before Kai's mount went down. Whiston and I would have been admitted to the sunlit stand near the throne when my match was done. I told him we would join Pauk and Duns among the commoners, I having more foresight in this instance than in most. They came in less than an hour, not best pleased to have been sent by day. The lady of whom they spoke had relented. She would overlook my earlier refusal and consent to see me. I thanked them for their kindness in bearing her message, and told Whiston to follow me and bring Pauk and Duns. Gilf had been exploring Thor Tower, for jousting held little interest for him. He joined us before we had gone far, and the sea elf offered no objection. She had a tower of her own, as his grace's lady had at Shearwall, and she received us in the great room of it, a room richly hung with black velvet in which censers, strangely shaped, hung smoldering. I did not like it, and neither did Gilf, who sniffed behind every heiress while she and I spoke. "'We are met again, Sir Abel,' she gave me her hand. I said, of course, that I was thrice honored. "'Why would you not come alone?' This with some pouting. "'Your beauty, your highness, is such that I feared for my self-restraint. "'Liar! I would be your friend, Sir Abel, if I could. You fear no magic?' That's far from true, your highness. Don't toy with me. We both know what we both know. If the dead walk at my command, what is that to you? A lot, your highness. The dead aren't always to be commanded. I fear for you. As do I. Her chair was like a throne, and the dais it stood on enhanced the impression. She rose, stepped from the dais, and stood swaying before me, a full head taller. Don't you think me a servant of the most low god, Sir Abel? I shook my head. He's no god, your highness, nor do you serve him. You're right, though I've considered it. I seek to do good by my sorcery. You need not believe it. I'll prove it as the opportunity arises. You bent the knee to me. You're royal, your highness. I deserve it. Not because I'm royal, she laughed, but because I'm good. You wish audience with my brother. I do, your highness. Can you arrange one? I could, but I won't. Riddle me this. Why is Sir Garun a champion when you are not? I shrugged. He was proclaimed so, your highness. Why, I cannot even guess. She laughed, beautiful and mirthless. My brother ordered it. You wear the queen's favor, Sir Abel. Do you suppose his queen opens to every knave in the scullery? Of course not, your highness. I would kill any man who defamed her in that fashion. Then you'll have to kill quite a lot of them. They tell my brother that, and worse, he half believes them. Will he receive a knight who wears her favor, do you think? Not often, your highness, though I try. She took my hand. Well said. There are few at court who love me, Sir Abel, and none who trust me. If I were to tell my brother he must speak to you, it would go ill with the case you come to plead. Besides, you've worn his queen's favor in his great tournament. Will the Valfather help you? I doubt it, your highness. I hope so. 
So do I. You need it. Meantime, I'll help if I can. Her voice fell. So will the Earl Marshal if he dares. Think of us as Skye's agents. It may comfort you. She spoke to Whiston. Your education proceeds apace. He knelt. It does, Your Highness. One may stab with a bodkin squire or throw it. Let's throw one. The dead walk at my command. So I told your master, and so it is. He warned me of the danger, it being a knight's business to protect the fair. She turned her head to let Whiston inspect her profile. Do you think me fair? Never have I seen a fairer lady, your highness. She laughed. In that case, Sir Abel will protect me. So saying, she turned her back, muttered something I could not hear, and mounting the dais again resumed her seat. From the floor came the sound of a great door shut hard, and she smiled. Perhaps you had news of our tournament last year, squire. I was here, your highness. I served Sir Garveon. He shot, engaged with the halbert, and jousted too. What of the melee? So redoubtable a knight would wish to take part in that, surely? He did, your highness, but we couldn't. It's forty per side, and the scroll was full. Sir Abel is more fortunate. Yes, your highness. Do you know why? Whiston's voice dropped to a whisper. Because I signed it. For him. Only I don't want him to die. I know that's what you think, but I don't. You haven't seen him fight. Morcane turned to me. This is your first tournament. I confessed that it was. There are knights, Sir Abel, who know they've no chance in the earlier events. Was this Sir Garvey on a good bowman? A very good one, Your Highness. Many are not, and do not wish to be humiliated. You knew something of humiliation when your string broke? Yes, Your Highness. Beyond Morcane, Baki peeped from behind a black velvet curtain. Her face was stricken. Suppose all three had missed the straw. Many would stand no chance against Sir Garun with poleaxes, and less against Sir Kai in jousting. Yet they would be ashamed to come and take no part. So they fight in the melee. It is the most dangerous of all, but luck plays a large part. I understand, Your Highness. As I spoke, I heard footsteps, heavy and slow, and Gilf growled. Weapons are blunted, and no mace may be used. Still a knight or two is killed each year. Perhaps you didn't know. I said I had not, but that it did not matter. Now, if I've timed their talk correctly, she laughed. Sir Lich died in the melee, but his name... Ah, here he is. A trap on the floor rose. The knight who raised it and stepped forth was plainly dead and had been dead for some time. His body stored in a dry place. There were maggots in his flesh, but they had not done great execution there. Would you fight him in defense of my fair person? Certainly, I said. There was a faint noise behind me, and Whiston tugged my sleeve. Bear in mind that you could not kill him. If he's a threat to your highness, I'll do what I can. He is none. Let's let him rest. Perhaps she murmured some further word I failed to hear. The dead knight fell, his face striking the flagstones with such force that a maggot was thrown from it. Sir Abel, servants have fled. What of you, squire? Has your education progressed sufficiently for this day? Whiston's voice shook, but he answered that it had. The boy who had run from Hold's ghost was held in check. What did you think of the messengers I sent for you and your master? Didn't they set your teeth chattering, too? No, your highness, they were elf, sea elf, my master says. We saw elf in the mountains, your highness, and they helped us against the Angerborn. He finished bravely enough. They were fine archers, your highness. You were unafraid. Not. I was at first, your highness, a little. Sir Lich's worm affrighted you. I saw it. When next you meet my messengers, recall that they were made by worms. Sir Abel, I asked you here, so we might take counsel, knowing that my brother hates you for the Queen's favor, and knowing, too, that he will love you no better than me if you come under my auspices. If you've the ear of the Valfather, will you beseech him to grant my brother issue? The change of topic discomfited me, but I said I would. 
Beseech the queen as well. You've her ear. Morcane had been bolt upright to that moment. She slumped almost as abruptly as the dead knight. Our queen's a strumpet, he thinks, and I a murderess who would slay my brother for his throne. She is not Sir Abel, nor am I. I nodded and said, I believe you, your highness. I thank you. He may kill me, fancying he defends his life. He may kill her to get a queen who'll bear him sons. She's no friend of mine. Morcane straightened up, eyes blazing. My brother is my brother, the playfellow of my childhood. I love few, but I love him. Do you understand? I do, your highness, better than you know. You mean him no hurt? I wish only to deliver the message of the one who sent me, your highness. Who is? In Aelfris, your highness. She sat in silence, her eyes upon my face. At last she said, Will you deliver it in my hearing? When his majesty and I stand face to face, I know that message will fill my mind, and I'll speak it whatever it may be. I don't believe the presence of others, even yourself, your highness, will make a particle of difference. In which case I must be present. I offer this, the only help I can give. If you wish it, I will ask a boon. I said, I wish it, your highness. She shook her head. Not that you be brought to him. Hear me out. I will ask to name one of our dinner guests tomorrow. I will do it in the Queen's presence, and if I know her, she'll ask to name a guest as well. If my brother has granted my boon, it will look ill for him to refuse hers. You wear her favor in the lists, so she'll surely name you. My brother will have to receive you and speak graciously, though he will mean no word of it. Shall I do it? I beg it, your highness. I'll be forever indebted. The odium will fall upon the queen, Morcane laughed. You realize that? I will divert it to myself if that's possible. I had three matches next day and won them all. Whiston and I awaited an invitation to King Arnthor's table after the third, but it never came. Long after sunset I sent Whiston to the Earl Marshal to beg an interview. It was granted, and I told him I had spoken with Morcane, and that Morcane had promised to intercede for me with the king. I know, the Earl Marshal made a tower of his fingers. You understand, I hope, that his sister is no favorite? I do, my lord. When first we spoke, you said you hesitated to presume upon Her Highness's friendship. I thought it prudence. He pinched his nose. Harumph! You still wish an audience? Very much, my lord. You have distinguished yourself in the tournament as I advised though apparently insufficiently. I strive to do more, my lord. I wish you well in it. I've mentioned you twice to his majesty. I believe I pledged myself to do it once. I have exceeded my pledge. He hasn't asked that you be brought. Was it for your sake her highness asked the boon? I think it likely, my lord. The Earl Marshal sighed. I'm keeping you standing, Sir Abel, and you will be tired. I had hoped to finish this in a minute or two. Sit down. Would you like a little wine? I said I would, and motioned for Whiston to sit. The Earl Marshal rang a handbell. A boon was refused, Sir Abel. Did you know it? I shook my head, feeling my heart sink. It's the talk of the court. Her Highness, lightly but politely, begged a boon of her brother. It was assumed by me, and I believe by all who witnessed this sad affair, that it was to be some trivial license. It was refused, and she left the hall. I doubt she will tell you this. She was humiliated, you understand? I do, my lord. He was shamed as well. Don't imagine, Sir Abel, that he doesn't know it. Our queen isn't really a queen now. You said so at our last meeting. I began to explain, but was interrupted by pain. Wine, the Earl Marshal told him. Not that swill, our own from Bright Hills. White or red, Sir Abel? As my lord prefers. White, then. Some hot smoked fish, I think. Sturgeon and whatever else you can find. Toast and herb butter. Your Queen Idden is a friend of Her Majesty's, Sir Abel. Did you know it? 
Girls the same age, you know, both at court, a good deal. These arms rocked Her Majesty in swaddling clothes, however much you may doubt it. The Earl Marshal's voice fell. One reason Lord Beale went, I think. The king sent him away to rob poor Gaynor of a friend, I'd say. I'd say it, but don't you repeat it. And Beale took the job in part to get hidden away from the king. It's dangerous to be a friend of our queen's these days. I should know, for I am one. Don't repeat any of this. Whiston and I swore we would not. I'm the king's as well, you understand. I'd bring them together if I could. In time I will. Never doubt it. You've thought of something, my lord? He shook his head, jowls wobbling. A passing fancy, Sir Abel, a mere fancy. He spoke to Whiston. The great fault of intelligence, young man, stupidity is at least as valuable. Intelligence causes us to overreach much too often and distracts us with rumph. Mere fanciful notions. Is Sir Abel teaching you swordsmanship? Yes, my lord. He says I have an act for it, too. That's well. That's very well. Strive to learn swordsmanship, but strive to learn stupidity in addition. The best knights are good swordsmen, but stupid men. Including this one, I declared, for I knew the Earl Marshal had hit on something, but I had no idea what it was. Exactly. Exactly. You bear a message, but do not know it. A fine example. Why did the Queen... Payne returned at that moment, bearing a big silver tray laden with a carafe, cups, plates, and covered dishes. Noble, you're putting up at an inn, Sir Abel? Yes, my lord. Good food? Whiston answered. Tolerable, my lord. We shall do something about that, I hope. Not tonight, but soon. After the tournament. Payne had set a plate, a cup, and a towel dampened with hot water in front of each of us. As his master spoke, he filled our cups. Wouldn't you like to be a guest here at the castle? It could be arranged, though you'd be just as comfortable with a friend of mine in the city. Just as comfortable and a good deal safer. I said I hoped to leave soon after speaking to the king. Then I hope it for you. It's winter just the same, and plans change. Pain, I will speak with Her Majesty and Her Highness after breakfast, if you can arrange it. Separately, you understand? You will present my humble request for an interview to each tonight. My visit will be brief. The matter is important, and that is all you know. Yes, Your Lordship, shall I go now? The Earl Marshal nodded. At once. Come back when you've spoken to both. As early as possible, but not both together understand. Now be off. Taste this wine, will you, Sir Abel? That we've had of late has been abominable to my own palate, though pain thinks it not so bad as I say. I sipped. Excellent, my lord. Have they better in Elfris? I sipped again. It would seem impossible, my lord. He laughed, his belly shaking. Not to be caught so easily as that. Well, well. Do you bear a message from a queen, Sir Abel? Ah, a hit. I think it better not to speak of that, my lord. Your face spoke for you. The other day this boy said he thought your message came from Queen Idden. I've been thinking on it, you see. What message Idden might send the king so secret that the bearer was not to know it, and so on? A bearer who had clearly been to Aelfris, and likely more than once, from what the boy tells me. These women, always sending messages and making trouble. You agree, I hope? Why, no, my lord. You will when you're my age. Her Highness is drunk much of the time. Did you know it? No, my lord, I did not. She's very good at hiding it. Seriously, now. What do you think of my wine? Whiston is a better judge than I, my lord. He said, Excellent, my lord. I've never had better. Noble, we've toast here. He uncovered a dish. And I believe this is cod, a favorite of mine. May I give you some of both? Whiston nodded eagerly. With pleasure, my lord. Your master must be served first, squire, even when the server is a peer of the realm. The Earl Marshal heaped my plate with four sorts of smoked fish and added slices of bread that had been impaled on a fork and toasted before a fire, that being the custom of Thortower. Now then, he said, when we had both been served, we must strike a bargain, you and I, Sir Abel. 
When you first came to me, I offered you good advice, for which I made no charge. In addition, I've twice mentioned you to the king, speaking of your knowledge of recent events. Incredible events, some of them, in the north. I did these things because I like you, and because I thought them my duty. I started to speak, but he stopped me with an upraised hand. You think me angling for a bribe, so I am, but not gold. You have Red Hall, one of the best manors in the north. I have four as good or better, and knights to serve me for them, and a castle. I say this not to boast, but to let you know that I am not much poorer than your Duke Martyr. I may well be richer, you understand. I nodded. Yes, my lord. It's knowledge I seek, it's information. His voice fell. I serve his majesty, Sir Abel. It's no easy service, yet I do it to the best of my ability year after year. I couldn't stand against you with the sword. I did not contract him. Or even against your squire here, if you've trained him well. It is by thought that I serve my king, by the habit of reflection and by knowledge. He sipped wine. You have knowledge I envy. I'll have it from you. Do you understand? Leave me richer, but you no poorer. I plan extraordinary steps tomorrow, steps that will bring you before the king without fail. Will you in payment for this special favor I do you at the risk of my life? Answer a few questions for me, answering truly upon your honor. He had not said that he would proffer no more help to me if I would not, yet it was in the air. I said, There are a great many questions I can't answer, my lord. Those you can, upon your honor. Yes, my lord, as much as I know. Noble. He leaned back in his chair, smiling, and ate a slice of smoked pike on a slice of toast. Taking our cue from him, Whiston and I ate as well. Both the bread and the fish were very good. My first question, Sir Abel, how many times have you visited Aelfris? I tried to recall, counting the instances on my fingers. Five, I think, my lord. No, six. His eyes had grown wide while I counted. Often enough to lose the reckoning? Yes, my lord. Time runs more slowly there. It does, my lord. Do you know the rule of it? Seeing that I had not understood him, he added, Suppose we went to Aelfris for a day. There are days there. Indeed, my lord. How many would have elapsed when we returned here? I can't say, my lord. There is no fixed rule. A week, perhaps, possibly a year. I see. He caressed his jowls. I would not run too swift for reasons, Sir Abel, but I would run. If your honor does not forbid, is his majesty's sister known there? I have no certain information, my lord, but I believe she must be. You never encountered her there. I fear I hesitated. No, my lord. You did not. No, my lord. Yet you came near it, I think. Isn't that so? I'm still a boy, my lord. Only a boy, whatever you may think. You are a man of mature years and wisdom. Tell me. I spoke then of Grengarm without mentioning Eterni. The elf you speak of were bringing her from Aelfris. So it seemed, my lord, I have no reason to doubt it. You saved her? The dragon would have devoured her? I believe so, my lord. Rumph! One fleshy hand wiped his face. If she's not your friend after that, she's a most ungrateful jade. I've no reason to think that, my lord, and some to think otherwise. Whiston added, We talked to her yesterday, my lord, and she tried to help us. She's... I'm afraid of her. I don't like to say it, my lord, but I am. A smile tugged at the Earl Marshal's lips. I believe you. Even if she's our friend, Sir Abel's friend and my friend too, because he's my master. If she were our enemy, I'd be scared to death. I can't blame you, squire. Let us retain her regard, all three of us. Our king loves and fears her, which alone would be reason enough. The Earl Marshal turned back to me. You do not know what message you bear, Sir Abel? As I have told you, my lord. So you did, and thought it unwise to reveal the sender. I ask now. That question and two more, and I'll be satisfied for the present. Have you sworn secrecy on that point? No, my lord. 
I didn't think you would believe me. You credited Grengarm. It was true, of course, all of it. You know something of the other worlds. I do. The Earl Marshal shifted his bulk in his chair and selected another piece of pike. I have never visited them, as you have, I realize. I have spoken with the elf, however, more than once. I've done small favors and received small favors in return. Did Queen Desiree send you? Chapter 32 Trial by Arms My surprise must surely have been apparent. When we met, the Earl Marshal explained, this young man suggested Queen Idun as the sender. You flinched at Queen, then relaxed. Queens are not so common as cabbages? No, my lord. I thought it likely our queen was the sender. She would not have required the dragon, however. He took a bite of toast, chewed and swallowed. The elf are of many clans, nearly all ruled by kings. The dryads or moss elf are the sole exception. Possibly you know of others? I admitted I did not. He spread his hands. In that case, your message is from Queen Desiree. You see how simple it is. I must have nodded, no doubt slowly and reluctantly. This is well. If you're asked, you can quite honestly declare that you did not reveal the identity of the sender to me. It may not be of importance, but if it is, you have it. I appreciate that, my lord. Then appreciate also, rump, that you did not answer my question. You will answer the other two, I hope. If I can, my lord, what are they? The first. Why did Queen Gaynor give you her favor to wear in the lists? I don't know, my lord. I sipped my wine. You mean that she did not confide it? You entered the archery, both events. Yes, my lord. I disappointed myself, if I may say it. You will find that toast quite passable now, I think. But not if you let it grow cold. I will not, my lord. I tore off a bit. You finished fourth, I think it was, in foot archery. You shot two golds in mounted archery. Your bowstring broke as you rode for the final shot. I was watching like nearly everyone. Afterward, Her Majesty gave you her favor. Right, my lord. I had eaten toast while he spoke. You didn't question Her Majesty. This boy might have. I wouldn't put it past him. But you? No more than I. One does not subject royalty to an interrogation. Whiston said, I didn't ask her anything, my lord. The Earl Marshal raised an eyebrow. Still you must have speculated. A dullard would not have, perhaps. You're no dullard. You have not visited Aelfris with your master. No, my lord. Thank you, my lord. I haven't, but I'd like to go, and Taug told me about it. So did Atella. I will forbear examining you as to her identity, for the present, eh? Huh? Let us return to our queen. You must have speculated. Let me have your speculations. Whiston cleared his throat, a small apologetic noise compared to the Earl Marshal's trumpetings. I thought it fairly obvious, my lord. Not to me, squire. He's good-looking, my lord, and mysterious, really mysterious to me, because I know so much about him. I've told you some of that. The Earl Marshal nodded and chewed. He'd be mysterious to her, too, because he's never been to court. You mentioned his mail. This was the other day. He smiled. So I did? You can't have been the only one to notice that. Women love mystery, my lord. I am aware of it. His string broke, like you said but he shot two golds first. A gold's any shot that cuts gold, but his were right in the center. Nobody else got two right in the center. I had not observed that, the Earl Marshal said slowly. I was remiss, squire. I'm glad that you were not. And he has the best horse, my lord, Cloud. You know about her, because we looked at her. I take care of her, my lord, and I rode her once, like I said. It's not just that she's the best horse— I... this is going to sound silly. You're of an age at which it may be condoned. Let's hear you. If everybody fought with sticks, my lord, and a knight came with a sword, they'd say he had the best stick. The Earl Marshal smiled. 
That's not silly at all. Ladies want the knight to win, my lord, when they give their favor. A good horse is a big part of that. You're fortunate in your squire, Sir Abel. Sir Garvion chose him, my lord. He was a knight of sound sense, as well as great courage. You yourself are a man of sound sense, Sir Abel. I shook my head, knowing how wrong he was. One who must have thought on the Queen's favor as your squire did, thought on it more because you are more deeply concerned. Were your conclusions the same? I came to none. It seemed to me Her Highness must have been at behind it. Since we met before I came here, she may have urged it, thinking it to my benefit, or, or she might have mentioned my name in passing. You will not say it. The Earl Marshal studied me with hooded eyes. I will. Her Majesty may have learned that Her Highness intended to bestow her favor upon you and moved to sequester you. That seems the likeliest explanation of all. Yet in strict justice I must rule that none of those your squire proposed can be wholly disregarded. They may have played a part, and may have played the whole part. I did not cross-examine you out of curiosity, as I hope you realize. I have a plan, though I shall not reveal it until it has been tried. Not then, if it falls. I'll be grateful for your assistance in either case. He smiled. I have hopes, Sir Abel. I must persuade our royal ladies. Yet I am persuasive, or I would not stand where I do. Ladies like their knights to win, as a younger head than ours tells us, and even royal ladies are fond of intrigue. Nay, royal ladies are fondest of it. Thus we may hope. My last question. How am I to visit Elfris? I was taken aback. You wish to go, my lord? It has been the dream of my life. I don't plan to take up residence, though sometimes... It is a perilous sphere. It is, my lord. Beautiful and dangerous. So is this. Well said. How may I go? I may be able to arrange it, my lord. After you have delivered your message? Yes, my lord. I must put that first. I cannot do otherwise. I mean no disrespect. She is a queen, I understand. You will be here in the morning to continue jousting? I nodded. We will, my lord. It might be well to bring a serviceable lance as well. Although I attempted to question him, I could elicit no further information. We ate and drank and talked, mostly of horses, and at last Whiston and I returned to our inn, where we found Pauk and Uns slumbering. Another page stopped us the next day, saying the Queen had urgent need of me. Whiston and I followed him, and as we made our way among the towers and strong houses, heard a roar from the crowd. I caught the page's shoulder and demanded to know what was happening. They've news from the Niker King of Arms, I think. What news? I don't know. I released him. Does this news concern me? He nodded and only just managed to prevent himself from wiping his nose on his sleeve. Out with it. I don't know, Sir Abel. Really, she'll tell you. Whiston volunteered to go back and find out. Sensing that I might learn more if he were gone, I told him to do it. I'll keep your secret, I said when he had left, but I must know before I talk to the queen. What was the news? They had a fight, the page whispered. The queen and her highness. Everybody's scared of her. Of the princess. Small wonder. But they're going to fight, only not really. Their champions will do it for them. The queen was waiting in her snowy garden. I knelt, saying I hoped I had not kept her along in the cold. Oh, I'm warmly dressed, she smiled and indicated her ermine robe. I have to do this often. I can't have a man in my apartments, not even an elderly relative. His majesty would not approve. I was about to make some commonplace remark about warm rooms and fires elsewhere, but she swept it aside by asking whether I would like to disrobe. I would not like to sully your majesty's honor at any time or in any place. She laughed merrily. You're the knight for me, or I hope you will be. I could order you to, but I won't. You need not, I told her. Make clear what you wish, and it shall be done. Except disrobing. It might have been a dove's moan. 
indeed, except that. You know, this is fun, her smile warmed me. When I told Lord Eskin I'd do it, I didn't think it was going to be. But it is for me. You may be killed. I'm an awful person. Your Majesty's the only person in Celadon who thinks so. You are our glory. She smiled again. You will be mine, Sir Abel, I know it. You'll fight Morcane's champion for me, won't you, to defend my honor? We are doing this for you, really. I'd rather do it for you. If Morcane had ten score champions, I'd fight them all for your majesty's sake. Hush, hush, the queen put a finger to her lips. She may be listening. She's terrible about that. I've said nothing to you that I wouldn't say in her hearing. Oh, you overkinds, get up, please. I didn't mean to keep you kneeling in the snow. Rise. I did, and her soft hand found mine. I feel you're my friend, that you truly are. I've forty knights, and not one real friend among them. Did the Vallfather send you? Yes, Your Majesty, or at least he let me come. She stared. You're serious? Entirely, Your Majesty. When I talk to others, I try to conceal it, but I won't lie to you or the king. I won't even tell half-truths, something I do much too often. You... I can't let you do this. You'll be killed. You have to let me do this, Your Majesty. I've worn your favor in the lists. I'm your champion. Oh, lady, dear lady of sky, it's... Ordained, I suggested. Gaynor's eyes brimmed with tears. It's for me, too. So the king will see that... that I'm not what he thinks. The Valfather will give the victory to the right, won't he? That's what people believe, I know. It may be true. And she said something awful to my face, that I'm a slut or something. We haven't decided exactly what it was, and probably we won't have to. So I challenged her, and it's at noon. And you have to die for me. She sobbed, hot tears rolling down smooth cheeks, red with cold. Only if you do, my husband will think he's right, and... and... I won't, Your Majesty. You'll be vindicated. She's going to try to kill you. The Queen looked around nervously, as if she thought more cane hiding behind a snow-covered rosebush. She likes you, and she'll try to kill you anyway. You don't know her. I said, she'll naturally choose a champion whose courage and skill won't embarrass her, Your Majesty. I needn't know her inmost thoughts to know that. In her place, I'd do the same thing. Are we to fight to the death? No. Gaynor had plucked a handkerchief nearly as large as a man's from sleeve. It never is. Then he'll yield to me when he can no longer resist, and no one will die. It's not like the melee with blunt swords and crowned lances, don't you understand? Real weapons, real fighting. That's well. I had a bad bowstring, but I've got a good sword. She rose, her lovely face no higher than the dragon on my chest. Hear me, Sir Abel. Girls aren't supposed to be serious at my age, not till they've had a child. But I may never have one. I'm still a virgin, and I'm as serious as I'll ever be. I said it was fun because it was then, but it's not now because I like you and you'll die. All men do, Your Majesty. And all women. I know. But listen. She wants him to put me away and marry again. If she wins, he may. He could say it was what the Overkinds wanted. Gaynor took a deep breath, her inhalation loud in the quiet garden. And I'd like that. But I have a duty, and I love him, and I'm not sterile. It's just that... that... She had begun to sob. I held her and comforted her as well as I could. At last she said, You'll do it? For me? Champion my virtue before the king? A hundred times over, Your Majesty. It was the truth, and the truth was that I would have done it a thousand times in order to speak to the king and claim desire. Whiston was waiting when the queen dismissed me. It's a trial by combat, Sir Abel. The princess insulted the queen, and she demands satisfaction. Nobody knows who the champions will be. He gave me a searching look. They all want to be the queens. All the knights. A lot say Sir Garoon. He waited for me to speak, but I did not. Only a lot more say it'll be you because of her scarf. Everybody knows whose scarf it is. Anz is boasting about you among the churls, and he and Pauk are laying bets. 
I suppose I grinned. They'll be rich if you win. Rich for churls, anyway. What about you, Whiston? Won't you be rich, too? I haven't bet. Is it all right if I do? Sure. Then I will. I got some gold up north, like we all did. The way Pauk and Duns are betting is they give odds you'll be her champion. Two to one. Then the other party has to give them two to one against you if you are. There are moments that remain fixed in memory, in some sense ever-present. Of all my fights, no other stays with me like that one. I can shut my eyes and see the bailey as it was then, the winter sunshine, the cold air sparkling with snow, the pennants and banners snapping in the wind, a mad dance of bears and elephants, falcons and bulls and basilisks and camelopards, red, blue, green, yellow, black, and white. I hear the thunderous cracking of the great sea-blue flag of Celadon, with the royal nicker embroidered in gold. To my right sat the court, the king and queen in high places, more came to the king's left, in a seat not quite so high. Around them clustered the peers and their ladies, proud men and gracious women in fur and velvet. To left and right, the knights, muffled in thick cloaks, with here and there the gleam of steel. Facing them, the commons, half the town of King's Doom having turned out to watch, delighted on this winter afternoon to have a real fight to entertain them, a combat in which either knight or both might die. For this I had practiced day after day in the golden halls and airy courts of the Valfather's castle. Not to fight the giants of winter and old night, nor to fight the Angerborn, sending arrow after arrow into their upturned faces as cloud cantered over their heads. The test had come at last, the deciding battle to which my life had been directed, and I knew a joy whose price had been paid in sweat and stratagem and hard blows. This was the service of the Valfather, and his service was beatitude and exultation. The lance of spiny orange I had shaped was in my hand, eternity at my side. A double-bitted axe bought in anticipation of the melee hung from my saddle, both edges ground and honed until they would split bone with a tap. Cloud knew my mind, as she always did, and arched her neck and pawed the ground. There was no barrier, as there is in jousting. This was not jousting, but war. Across the bailey stood her opponent, a stallion taller by two hands. Her opponent, but not mine. And the horse cloth the stallion wore was black. The silver device on its sides, that of no knight but more canes, Margeiger, a fanciful representation of her mother's, Cetus, and the king's. The Niker King of Arms rode to the center, and with him a pursuivant, who repeated his words, so all might hear. So all might hear, I wrote, but so still was every tongue that there was no need of him. I will give the words of the Niker King of Arms, and not trouble with repetitions. This day shall be joined in trial by arms the gallant champions of Her Most Royal Majesty Queen Gaynor, and of Her Royal Highness Princess Morcane. There was a little buzz of talk, soon stilled, as the younger man repeated what the Niker King of Arms had said. Her Most Royal Majesty Queen Gaynor is the aggrieved party. Her champion upon this field is Sir Abel of Red Hall, a knight of Shearwall. As previously, the pursuivant bellowed the same words. Her Royal Highness Princess Morcane is the aggrieving party. The Niker King of Arms paused to look toward the riderless stallion. Her champion upon this field, and he come, is to be Sir Loth of Narrowhouse. To my right I heard one knight say to another, Loth? He's dead. To which the other replied, That was Loth of Northholding. I knew then who my opponent would be. He came soon enough, his dead face hidden by his helm, the charge on his shield, a black elk on a white field. I put on my own helm at that point, with the queen's white scarf knotted about the black dragon that was its crest. At the first sounding of the clarion the champions are to make ready. At the second all save the champions and their squires must depart the field. I looked then for Sir Loth's squire and saw a lad some trifle older than Whiston. He kept his back to the barrier and seemed terrified. 
Upon the third sounding, the champions will engage. Neither their squires nor any other persons may take part in their combat. Should a champion yield, his squire may succor him. Gentle right shall be observed. When a champion shall claim gentle right, his squire may help him to his feet and rearm him. Nothing more. Champions, raise your lances to signify your agreement. We did so. Squires, your right hands. Though the distance was a good bowshot, I saw the hand of Loth's squire shake. That pursuivant who had repeated the Niker king's words lifted a clarion to his lips and blew. I settled into my saddle and tightened my grip on my lance. Should we engage right side to right, left side to left, as in jousting, or mount to mount? These questions, which for a moment filled my mind, came from cloud. I answered, left to left. The clarion sounded the second time. At my side, Whiston murmured, Thunor's blessing, Sir Abel. It may have been ill-omened, for no sooner had he spoken than so dark a cloud veiled the sun that it seemed the dead knight and I engaged by night. Loth seemed to grow larger in the gloom. His white shield and white surcoat floated spectral above a charger almost invisible. The clarion sounded a third time. I had no need to clap my heels to cloud. Loth's lance broke on my shield. Mine took him through the chest and plucked him from the saddle. I withdrew it as I rode, and it may be that most of those who watched did not realize what had happened. He should have been slow, yet he was not. He remounted as Cloud wheeled and drew sword. My point slipped from his helm, our mounts met chest to chest, and his was ridden down. Wheeling again, I charged a third time. I saw him standing like a ghost, the ichor of decay seeping from his wound, and tried to impale him again, thinking to leave my lance between his ribs to obstruct him, and to cut him down before he could free himself. It was a good plan, but none of it worked. His shield turned my point. His sword did what I would have said no sword but eternity could, hewing my lance as a woodsman fells a sapling. Then I feared for Cloud. In tourney no true knight strikes the mount, in battle it is otherwise, and seeing that fell blade poised, I knew what blow he intended. Cloud would have trampled him, and showed me so clearly I almost agreed. He will take off a forefoot, I told her, and you will be as good as dead. I slipped off her back and met him toe to toe. His sword split my shield so deeply that it was the mail on my forearm that stopped the edge. Turning as swiftly as I could, I wrenched the sword from his dead hand. My axe bit his helm, and he fell. Fallen, he moaned aloud. All death was in it. Lonely graves in winter. The wind that leaves beggars' bodies on the streets of King's Doom. And the howls of the wolves that tear the slain. I turned and walked away, and seeing the Niker King of Arms, with the Perswaven who assisted him, I told him that my foe claimed gentle right which I would accord him. Whiston came then with a new shield for me, one we had taken from Red Hall, it having still its covering of cloth, so that Roth's golden lion could not be seen. I took it, and seeing that Loth's squire would by no means leave his place to rearm him, told Whiston that he must raise him and give him some new weapon. I have none to give, Sir Abel, save my own sword. Give it, I said, and when he ran to obey, I, with the Perswoven's help, took Loth's blade from my shield, although it was tightly wedged in the layered willow. Whiston raised and rearmed Loth. White-faced and shaken he returned, and I gave him the sword that had been Loth's, a brand of watered steel. This is yours, I told him. See if your scabbard will hold it. Returning to Loth, I made ready to continue the fight. He stepped back, raised the sword that had been Whiston's, and cried out again. Long ago I had heard fishermen hallooing from boat to boat, and though this was sad and that was not, I felt the purpose was the same, that he saluted others and called them to help him. I thought little of it, or thought only that I had to close quickly and dispatch him before his help arrived. I tried to, and soon found that my axe had put out an eye, and he was hard-pressed to defend himself when I kept moving to my right. 
yet he fought as skillfully as any live man, taking blows that would have killed a living man, and fought on in the darkness and flying snow. And although he lost the arm that had held his sword, he dropped his shield and snatched the sword from his own right hand, while his arm crept over the snow to close its hand on my ankle. They came, the dead he had called, whether from the grave or tombs above ground I do not know, some new killed, some so long dead that more cane could scarcely animate them. The onlookers fled, although I paid that little mind. For I had thrown aside the axe and drawn tourney, and my own help came, galloping out of the snowy sky. The cloud passed and the sun shone again, making the new snow sparkle, and dead contended with dead for the honor of a living queen. Wiston and Pauk and Duns fought beside me, and Cloud kicked and trampled my foes and would have gored them, save that her horn was still too small, and Gilf raged among them, greater and more terrible than any lion. The sun was still high when the fight ended. I wiped Eterni's blade with such stuff as I could find, and cast the stuff away from me, for it reeked of the grave, and sheathed her at last. Arnthor sat his throne unmoved, with Gaynor fainting in his arms and Morcane smiling beside him. Five knights with swords drawn stood before them, and I took note of them, for they were the bravest Thor Tower boasted, as was proved by what they did that day. Mark, Lamwell, Garun, Rober, and Oriel. Morcane called, You have triumphed, Sir Abel, and my sister-in-law with you. I own it, and her innocence. Her lips smiled, and her eyes held a dark and terrible lust. Arnthor nodded. You will share meat with us tonight. I would speak with you. His eyes, too, were the storm-black of dragons. I dropped to one knee. Gladly, Your Majesty. Chapter 33 Under Thor Tower Uns had been stabbed. The wound sucked air until we bandaged it, and he seemed weak. Eyes all right, sir, eyes all right. That was all he said before his eyes closed. I could not heal him without betraying the Valfather, for I had pledged myself to do no such thing. Still I was sore tempted, and crouched by Uns and laid my hand on his head, and it may be that a little healing went out from me. I hope so. We carried him back to the inn and left Pauk there to nurse him while Wiston and I made ready to dine with Arnthor and Gaynor, washing ourselves in water we heated on our fire and putting on our best clothes. Wiston spent a long time examining his new sword, whose blade he wiped again and oiled, and whose jeweled pommel he held to every light, first to the declining sun and afterward to the fire and candles. When we were in the saddle, clean and sweet-smelling, he said, When I'm a knight, I'll tell my squire how I fought the dead in the great bailey. I nodded and urged Cloud to trot. And how I fought the Angerborn in Jotunland in company with Elf, and gained much wealth thereby. With more by betting, I said. Those who ran today will be back tomorrow, and you can collect your bets. He nodded absently. Pauk will collect for Uns, I suppose, as soon as Uns is well enough to leave alone for a few hours. I'll tell him about all this, and he'll think I'm the greatest liar under sky, Wiston laughed. He'll soon grow older and wiser. How old are you? Nearly eighteen. I'll be a knight soon, or hope I will. You're a knight now. It's only that no one calls you so, Sir Wiston. You said something like that to Taug. I did. Taug is a knight, though he doesn't want to be. It's not really a matter of choice. Wiston nodded, but did not speak. I didn't understand that when I was younger. I wanted to be a knight, and I became one. Not because I chose to be one, but because of the things I did and the way I thought. Good and evil are decided by thoughts and choices, too. Like the princess? I had not considered that. Unlike the princess, I said. She's chosen good, but it seems evil has chosen her. We spoke more before the bridge was lowered for us and after, but the only thing of note was said by Gilf as we were shown into the hall. Ears up. 
He was right, of course. If ever there was a time to be watchful, that was it. What was at least equally important was that he had chosen to speak in Whiston's presence. It was not that I had called Whiston a knight, or merely that they had fought side by side, but a combination of those things with something more. Gilf was a sound judge of character. I had been in Gillings Hall in Utgard. Arnthor's seemed small in comparison, but it was better furnished, with chairs and benches with backs for his guests instead of stools. The walls were hung with shields, those of proven knights having the arms colored, those of less proven knights with the arms outlined but not painted in, and those of unproven knights blank. I had followed this custom when I chose a blank green shield, although I had not been aware of it. Arnthor and Gaynor were to sit at a raised table, he with the queen to his right. I was to sit at Arnthor's left, as the page who guided us confided, with Morcane to my left. This was made clear by the quality of the chairs, Arnthor's being gilt all over and set with gems, Gaynor's smaller and delicate, and the princess's gilt only at the top, although beautifully carved and furnished with a velvet cushion. Mine was plainer than these, but by no means contemptible, being large and boasting a well-carved nicker on its back. Whiston was directed to a lower table, but Gilf sat by my chair. "'The trumpets will sound for His Majesty,' the page murmured. "'Every one stands until he says you may sit. As soon as he makes the motion, sit down.' I said I wished he could advise me as I ate. "'I will.' Everyone at this table will have a page. I'll be behind you. Crook your finger if you need to talk to me. I'll help with the food or run with a message if you want. Other guests were entering as we spoke. I suppose about a hundred in all. I asked how I ought to conduct myself. Don't speak till they speak to you, not to anybody royal. His Majesty will be served first, then Her Majesty, then Her Highness, then you. Don't eat too much and don't drink too much. Don't laugh unless His Majesty does. Then I wished that the Earl Marshal was nearer. I wanted to ask why Morcane ranked behind the Queen when she could claim the crown if the King died, although he had taken a seat at the lower table two diners separated us. The nearer of these, thinking that I was looking at him, congratulated me on my victory. I thanked him, calling him my lord, at which my page whispered urgently, "'Your Grace!' The duke in question ignored the page and my mistake, saying, I'd like to know, Sir Abel, how Her Majesty found a knight bold enough to stand against those you faced. I replied, There must be many in Celadon, Your Grace. I'm surprised she could find one. We'll have need of you when the Khan attacks. I raised my eyebrows. You expect war, Your Grace. Yes, it's how one acquires the reputation for prophecy. Look wise, predict war, and you'll always be right. You're one of martyrs? Yes, Your Grace, I have that honor. I'll ask about you when I see him. I'll be... The trumpet sounded. We rose, and those not facing the entrance turned to it. Arnthor came first, tall, erect, and walking fast, while the pursuivant who had assisted the Niker King of Arms announced his name and titles. His Most Royal Majesty King Arnthor, Defender of the West, and so on. Gaynor followed. She was, of course, much smaller, but lovely in a white velvet gown and a crown of diamonds and red gold. Two pages bore her train. Her Most Royal Majesty Queen Gaynor, Duchess of Dante, Countess of Chaus, Countess of... A place I have forgotten with a dozen baronies. After Gaynor's lush beauty, Morcane seemed mannish, as tall as her brother and richly dressed in black and scarlet, with a single page to carry her train. Her Royal Highness Princess Morcane, daughter of Uthor, Duchess of Ringwood. She smiled at me, the only one who did. I smiled in return, although I could not be sure she meant well. And all this time I searched my mind for the message I had been given. Arnthor had spoken to me in the bailey, but no message had come. Here in his hall, I saw his face and he mine, but no message filled me. I searched, but found only the loving thoughts of Cloud, who waited patiently in the stables and assured me she was royally cared for, and the object of much admiring attention from the king's grooms. 
Arnthor took his place, sitting at once. Gaynor stood on his right. I thought her nervous and anxious. To my left, redolent of brandy, Morcain came to the table, as one who owned not only Thor Tower but all Nithgarther, and stood there swaying, smiling as if she expected her brother's guests to cheer. He was indeed a king, but Morcain was of the blood of kings. That thought was soon followed by another, that if she, more than he, showed the blood of their royal parent, then the blood he showed was that of a dragon of Muspel. Garseg, the brother of both, had been royal in manner, yet a dragon still. If there was any one in Arnthor's hall who might breathe fire, it was surely Arnthor himself. For a minute and more we remained standing. At last Arnthor made a trifling gesture and we sat. Food was brought at once, so quickly that it was clear the serving men had been waiting at the lesser entrances. A chef put a great roast swan on our table, and at a signal from Arnthor split it with a knife not much smaller than a sword. Split, it could be seen that a goose had been stuffed into the swan to be roasted with it, a plover into the goose, a duck into the plover, and three lesser birds into the duck all these save the swan, having been boned. The chef indicated the two smallest, I would imagine a quail and a thrush, to Arnthor, who nodded. The chef swiftly cut a bit from each which he ate. Arnthor nodded again, and the birds were served him. Gaynor was next, the chef indicating the lesser bird in the duck. She shook her head and received the duck's breast instead. Morcain declined all. I indicated the one Gaynor had declined, wishing to see what it was, and wishing also to show that although she might fear poison, I was willing to run the risk for her sake. My bird proved to be a partridge, delicious and wholly innocent. The chef having gone, Arnthor severed a leg of the swan with his own dagger, and held it up. Here it is our custom to dine with our dogs in attendance, he said to me. You know this plainly. Since you brought your own, I nodded. I was told that I might do so without offense, Your Majesty. I hope I was not misinformed. Not at all, he smiled. You'll have seen my hounds. I did, Your Majesty. They're noble animals. They are. He whistled, and half a dozen boar hounds came to his chair, bristling and growling at Gilf. Noble not just in appearance, but in conduct. I hunt boars, Sir Abel, and greater prey when I can get it. Those who hang back are drowned at my order. I said, The chase is the noblest sport, Your Majesty. I'd have said war, and many hear the melee, but it's a topic on which each man is entitled to his opinion. Gaynor, who had looked frightened the whole time, had gone white. I would very much have liked to know whether Morcain was still smiling, but dared not turn my head. Does your dog hunger, Sir Abel? I suppose he does, Your Majesty. He's usually hungry in my experience. Again Arnthor held up the swan's leg. You would not object if I were to present him with this? Some men I know do not like for others to feed their dogs. It would be an honor for him and for me. As you say. Smiling, Arnthor tossed the swan's leg to Gilf, who caught it expertly in his mouth. The boarhounds swarmed him, snarling and snapping. He dropped it, set his forepaw on it, and roared to shake the hangings. Arnthor's boarhounds turned tail and ran. In the following silence there was no sound save the breaking of the swan's bones. I ate, and had half finished my partridge when Morcain laughed. They breed them tough in Jotunland, don't they? At her words the king's guests began to eat and talk. I said, perhaps they do, your highness. Didn't you get him there? No, your highness, in the forests of our own Celadon. He was a gift from the Bodachon. Her face became that of her brother. I cannot say how. I was not conscious of having turned, yet it was to him I spoke. You see, I bear tidings from Queen Desiree of the Moss Elf, King Yisser of the Ice Elf, and King Brunman of the Bodachon. So it was that the Bodachon gave me a companion to help me in my errand. I've heard of no message until now, Arnthor said. Still I have one, Your Majesty, one that has occupied me most of my life, 
though it has been not so many years in Mithgarther. I was to reach you, and not that alone, but to come as one to whom you would give ear. Seven worlds there are, your majesty, and so arranged that the highest, where the most high God reigns, and where no impure thing is, is larger than all the rest together. The world beneath that, what? Have you come to lecture me in metaphysic? Is less yet greater than the sum of those remaining. The winged beings there are not perfect in purity, but so near it they are permitted to serve the Most High God as the nobles of your realm serve you. Better, I hope. Below is the one we name Sky. We of Mythgarther, who think this realm spacious, think it unutterably vast, for its extent is greater than that of the four below it laid side by side. It contains many things and many peoples, but its lawful possessors are the overkinds, the Valfather and his queen, their sons and their daughters, and their families. To them our hearts are given. It is them we reverence when we reverence rightly. I had a mind to question you concerning your victory today, Arnthor told me. Beneath them is our human realm. We are its legitimate inhabitants. Beneath us is the lesser realm of Alfris, smaller than our own, yet beautiful. There dwell Queen Desiree, and the kings whom I named, the monarchs whose messenger I am. In their realm the Most High God placed a numerous folk called Kulili. As we reverence the Overkinds, so Kulili was to reverence us, and did, and was revered by the dragons of Muspel. Kulili sought nearer subjects, and patterned them after us, the objects of her reverence, that she might be loved by the image she loved. She made them and asked their gratitude. They refused it and drove her into the sea. By this time the whole royal hall had fallen silent to listen. Only Arnthor seemed of a mind to interrupt. In this way they became the folk of Eofris, holding it by right of conquest. The wisest among them revere us, knowing it to be the wish of him who made seven worlds the most high god. The foolish, seeing our vanity, our avarice, and our cruelty, have turned from us to reverence dragons, by which much harm has come, for even the best of them are insatiable of power. You bear a dragon upon your shield, Arnthor remarked. Have you forgotten that my genealogy bears another? No, your majesty, neither have I forgotten that your boyhood was spent among sea elf, nor that you took the Niker to honor them. Nor have the kings and queen I mentioned forgotten those things which embolden them to speak to you as they do, imploring you to reshape our people. Kulili formed them, your majesty. They know that you might reform us, making us strong but merciful, and though merciful just. May I speak for myself, your majesty? He nodded. After what has proceeded, I welcome it. I lived in the northern forest, your majesty, not far from Uring's mouth. It is a city of ruins. He nodded again. Outlaws calling themselves free companies rove those forests. They are as cruel and rapacious as the dragons, yet many cheer them because they rob your tax-gatherers, and try at times to protect the people from the anger-born. Let those people have companies that are truly free, your majesty, and not outlaws. Teach them to arm themselves, and choose knights from their number. Your tax-gatherers come seldom, but when they come they take all, for your people there are poor and few. Let them pay a fixed tribute instead, one not ruinous. Help and protect them and you will find them richer and more numerous each year, and strong friends to your throne. Queen Desiree and the kings who send me have no claim upon your allegiance, Arnthor said. I do. Are betrayal and sedition the reforms you would have me encourage? No, never. His eyes told me I had failed, but I made a last effort. The king of sky rules as a father, your majesty and because he does we name him the Valfather, and count it honor to serve him even when defeat is sure. The elf ask that of you. Arnthor held out his hand. Take off your sword belt, Sir Abel. Surrender belt, sword, and all to your king. I heard Gaynor gasp, but did as I had been told. Your spurs you may keep, he called two knights, and told them where they were to take me. Although they guarded me with drawn swords, they had no need of them. No royal banquet here, said the first of the knights who had escorted me to the dungeon. He sheathed his sword and offered me his hand. I'm Sir Manassan. 
the other gave me his hand as well. A jailer came up as we were talking, and Manson told him he had to put me in a cell at the king's order, but that he was not to mistreat me, adding that he would send a servant with food, blankets, and clean straw. After that I was locked in a cell with walls of living rock, reeking, narrow, and very dark, and left alone there, I suppose, for eight hours. I entertained myself during that time by repeating those parts of my message I had succeeded in delivering, considering those that I had not, and trying to imagine how I might have spoken more skillfully. Mercifully, I was interrupted by the arrival of Manasson's serving-man, with food, a great bundle of clean straw, and a jug of wine. After he delivered them, he argued with the jailer, demanding that I be given a cell with a window. This the jailer adamantly refused, insisting that such cells were reserved for prisoners of noble birth. I heard them with little attention, although with enough to resolve that I would obtain such a cell for myself as soon as I could. I had not eaten much at the king's table, and by that time was ravenous. The food Manasson had sent to me was simple, roast beef, bread, a slab of cheese, and an apple, but it was good and plentiful, and I devoured every scrap. I was gnawing the core of the apple when the serving man left and the jailer came in. He was a burly man armed with an iron key not much shorter than my shin, but I knew I could overpower him if I wanted. He sat without being invited, put his key and his lantern on the floor beside him, and asked if he could have some wine. I poured him a good round tumbler. They think pretty well of you up there. Sir Manasson and Sir Irak spoke kindly to me at least. It's good to have friends when you're down here. This was said with heavy significance. I nodded. It's good to have friends everywhere. I had many good friends in Jotunland, and a good many more in Sky. He passed over Sky without a thought. The Icelands! Was you really there? This winter, believe me, I was glad to get out. Is everything big up there? Big cows and all? No, I said. Only the people, and not all of them, because the Angerborn have human slaves. There's a dungeon under Utgard. I was never a prisoner there, but I went to look at it. I don't know how big your dungeon is here, but I'd assume it was bigger, since the prisoners were Angerborn. It was certainly worse than this has been up till now. He gulped my wine. I'd like to see it. Perhaps some day you will. It was a terrible place, as I said, but there were few prisoners in it. I was told that King Gilling had generally executed those who opposed him. The jailer shook his head. Not like that with us, only we're not full up, neither. Some of your cells have windows. I'd like one. His manner stiffened at once. We can't do that, sir, just noble prisoners. I'm a knight. I know, it ain't enough. I would be willing to pay a modest rent. We was going to talk about that soon as I'd finished this wine. He did, emptying the tumbler. I poured what remained in the jug into it. You see, some's treated one way, some another. You take my meaning, I know. Now you, you got friends. When he come with straw and what you at, I never made no objection, you'll notice. I let him in nice as could be, didn't I? Certainly, and I appreciate it. I knew you would. You're a knight and a gentleman, as anybody can see. Only I didn't have to. I could have kept him out. I could have said you get a order from the Earl Marshal and we'll see. His master might have got such in a day or two. But if he'd told his lackey to, it'd been never. I nodded. I'm a kindly man, but a poor man too. A poor man, sir, can't be kindly for free. His lantern, as I ought to have said earlier, shone out through my door, which stood open behind him, casting yellow light on the wall opposite. For an instant something large, dark, and very quiet obscured that wall and was gone. I asked how much his kindness cost. Only one sealed a month, sir. That's not much now, is it, sir? For one sealed, silver mind. At the full of the moon, you'd find me kind and helpful too, sir. Only I can't give you one with a window. Not for that, nor more, sir, it's the Earl Marshal. He won't allow it. Yes, he will. Does he come down here often? Every fortnight, sir, and make sure all's right. That should be sufficient. 
The moon is full now, isn't it? I believe I noticed a full moon the other night. The jailer licked his lips. Yes, sir, it is. Then my first month's payment must be due. Yes, sir, always, sir, or I count from the dark of it, sir, or the quarter full or whatever. I understand. I nodded. There's twenty-four seals in a scepter, I believe. Of course there are. He licked his lips again. Are you a man of your word, a man of honor? Yes, sir, I try to be, sir. That's all any of us can say? I'm Sir Abel, you know that. May I ask your own name? Fiatch, sir, at your service. I got out one of the big gold coins of Jotunland. This holds more gold than a scepter. Since I don't know how much, I'm going to call it twenty-four seals. Will you agree? Not till I see it, sir. I handed it to him. He polished it on his sleeve, held it so his lantern made the gold glow, bit it, and gave it back. Seems right enough, sir. I'll try and get him. I shook my head. I'm going to offer you a bargain. You sell kindness at a sealed a month. So this would buy two years' worth. More, but we've agreed on two years. I'll give you this for your kindness as long as I'm in here. For three years or five. But if I'm released in a week, you'll owe me nothing. The gold will be yours and we'll part as friends. He shook his head. Why not? We don't do like that. I suppose I sighed. You and the other jailers? He rose, picking up his key and his lantern. You don't understand how it is. You give me a sealed. I haven't got one. I left small payments to my squire. He'll give you one if you'll let him in to see me. He grunted, started to leave, and turned again. Give me that, and I'll fetch you the seals like I said. I shook my head. You think your friends will stand by you. I know how that is. They'll come a while. Then they won't come no more, and we'll have it all. With his big iron key, he pointed to the burse at my belt. I was tempted to say I would escape before any such thing happened. Perhaps I should have. You lick those dishes, sir, because that's the last good food you're going to see for years. I said nothing. You give me that, and I'll take it to a moneymonger. If he says it's good, you'll get twenty back, and kindness. He paused, but I did not speak, and at length he said, It'll be hours before the year's out, and I won't waste any more breath on you. The door of bars crashed shut behind him, and I watched him twist his big key in the lock. I was of half a mind to call out to Org to spare him, and of half a mind to call out that he might have him. In the end, I did neither. I heard Fiatch walk away, six steps maybe or seven, after those, the cracking of his bones. When I judged Org's meal over, I got him to unlock my door and hide the key, and went out to explore my dungeon. Chapter 34 My New Sword I slept in my cell that night and wished, if the truth be told, that I had some means of locking it from inside. I was back on the western trader. This was not the first time that dream had recurred since my return from Skye. I saw the vicious, famished faces of the Austerlings, and knew they meant to land on glass and that my mother was there. I went to the captain and ordered him to put about. He did not hear or see me, and when I knocked the hourglass from his table it returned of its own accord. I woke shivering to find myself in the dungeon. Having no wish to sleep again until the dream lost its grip, I went looking for blankets. At Shearwall it was hard to get into the dungeon without going out into the bailey. It was different at Thor Tower. Earlier I had found a stair leading to a barred door of thick oak. Now I climbed that stair again, took down the bar, and stepped into the castle kitchen, where a score of cooks and scullions snored on pallets. Clearly the prisoners' rations were prepared here and carried down. I blew out my lantern, set it on a step, and shut the door as quietly as I could. A potboy woke and stared at me. I put a finger to my lips and told him to go back to sleep. He nodded and slept, or at least pretended to. What he may have thought of a night prowling the kitchen after midnight I cannot imagine. Beyond the kitchen was a hallway, by no means cramped, 
leading into the great banqueting hall in which I had sat with Arnthor, Gaynor, and Marcain. It made me curious about the entrance they had used. I found it, and in it a mirror, the largest I saw in Mithgarther. Here, I suppose, the king, the queen, and the princess checked their appearance before making their entrances. It gave me an idea, and I filched a lump of hard soap from the kitchen, whittled a soap pencil, and wrote on the mirror, Your thoughts, our lives, first in the character of Alfris, and up and down the sides in the runes of sky. Returning to my cell with stolen blankets, I slept again, and if dreams haunted my sleep, they were the merciful sort. Underground as I was, I had no way of marking the rising of the sun, but I heard new jailers come, and heard them call and search for Fiach, and judged that it was morning. I rose and asked one for warm water and a towel. He hesitated, but at last refused. In that case I'll get them for myself, I said. He laughed and hurried off to rejoin the search. When he was well away, I went to the jailer's room, drew water from their cistern, warmed it on their fire, and carried it to one of the cells reserved for nobility. The jailer's room had yielded a clean tunic I used as a towel. I washed with these and with the soap that had served me for a pencil, returned to my old cell, and carried my clean straw to my new one. My window was small and high, yet what a difference it made. Fresh air and winter sunshine found their way in, and although it was cold, the whole dungeon was as cold if not colder. Wrapped in a blanket, I was not uncomfortable. Furthermore, I could see out by standing upon the basin. There was little to see but frozen snow-covered mud and an occasional pig, but I watched these with some interest. Aside from Manasson's servant, Uri was my first visitor. I called, and she responded at once, standing very straight and meeting my gaze with frightened eyes. You might be with Queen Desiree, Lord. Shall I guide you? I shrugged. Equally, Queen Desiree might be with me. She is a queen, Lord, and I'm just an ordinary kid from America. She looked more frightened than ever. You are a knight, Lord, a knight of Mythgarther. More than that, I am one of the Valfather's knights. I know n nothing of that, Lord, as you say. I thought that when I had delivered her message to King Arnthor, Desiree would come for me. I lay in my cell waiting for her, and I hoped to see her this morning. I washed and dressed, all in the hope she'd come. Y yes Lord. Is there unrest in Aelfris that might detain her? The rise of another like Cedar? I know of none, Lord. I embraced her when I was at Red Hall. It can't have been long in the time of Aelfris. A day or two at most. Bless, Lord. Come with me to Aelfris, and we will see. I fear the queen, but you will protect me, I know. I shook my head. We played together as children, Uri, Desiree and me. I remember now. Her voice was tender. Do you, Lord? I do. Until that moment I had not known I remembered. I thought they wiped those memories away, Uri but they only hid them under the message. She had a palace, and big trees were its towers. Her garden lay around them, a garden of wild flowers, mosses, little springs, and rivulets. I was stronger than she was, but I was careful to take no advantage of it, and she punished me when she was displeased, striking me with her little hand. I laughed at the memory. It was like being kicked by a bunny, but if I giggled, she'd threaten me with her guards, mossmen with swords who watched over us. They'd have killed me if she ordered it, but she never did. You will not ask me to carry a message to her, will you, Lord? Baki could do it. They would not harm her. I drank Baki's blood once. I re remember, l Lord. She said it would heal me, Uri, and it did. How would my life had been different if I hadn't drunk Baki's blood. I cannot say, Lord, these questions. You are wiser than I. If you called me to trouble me with questions, I must endure it. But is there no other way I can serve you? I told her then that I was concerned for Cloud and Gilf. I asked her to find them, 
to free them if they desired it and report back when she had done it. My next visitor came so soon after Uri had gone that I wondered whether Uri had not fetched her. It was Marcaine, but she did not appear from the shadows as at Red Hall. She came as any other might, save that she was accompanied by men-at-arms. These were not dead, but hard-featured axemen in brigandines and helmets, who feared her as much as the jailers feared them. She sent five to each end of the corridor, so neither they nor the jailers could hear us. This was none of my doing, Sir Abel, no revenge of mine. I said I had never supposed it was. You refused me at Red Hall? I've offered love to few men. Only two have declined. She laughed. It was beautiful and empty. Can you guess the other? Answer, clerk. No, your highness. You're a miserable liar. He was much better. Do you imagine that resentment smolders and flares within this fair bosom? She pressed her hand to her stomach. From her breath and her flushed cheeks, it was brandy that smoldered and flared there. I said, Your Highness is too good a woman for that. You've no notion, she paused. You might overpower me, ravish me, and escape in my clothes. We're of a height. I would never do such a thing, Your Highness. You'd rape a peasant girl. You all do it. What's the difference? It might save your life. No, Your Highness. I'd have to lace you up and back. But I would if the ravishing went well. I've been told that many men fantasize about lying with a woman of royal blood. As do I, Your Highness, though you are not the woman. Morkin laughed. Neither is she. You'll find out. Not wishing to contradict her, I bowed. I'll have you yet, you'll see. When I've finished with you, you'll crawl, begging me to take you back, her eyes shone. Then I'll remind you of this. I'll make you bring me the head of the man in the moon, and when you do, I'll refuse it and mock you. She took my chin in her right hand. Unless the elf try to feed me to another dragon, the little sons of worms, then I'll scream, oh, so prettily, and you'll kill him for me and die again. You're dead, you know. Although she still held my chin, I managed to nod. That Valkyrie's kiss did it. Did you know that? It's an act of mercy. They don't take you unless you're too badly hurt to live. And now, quite suddenly, she kissed me, wrapping me in her long arms, her tongue gliding through my mouth and halfway down my throat. I fell to the straw, and she said, Now you know how we feel. I managed to say that I did not think I was capable of making any woman feel the way I felt then. Stand up, she motioned imperiously for me to rise. I'm going to ask my brother to free you. That's one of the things I came to tell you. I doubt he will. He doesn't like being told what a twisted little scoundrel he is, especially by the elf. The elf were our nurses. But you know that. I was getting to my feet. She crouched beside me, surprising me again. He caught little fish and killed them in ugly ways. Sometimes I helped him. They punished us for it, and he's never forgiven them. You dead obey me, Abel. I bring you all to heal, even you difficult cases. I'm eager to obey, Your Highness. But I doubt that he'll free you even for me. She warmed my hand between her own, and seemed to want me to thrust it between her breasts, though I did not. You may have to wait till I'm queen. You'll be grateful then. Very grateful, because this is a terrible place, and I'll make you mine, and lie with you till no part of you can stand, and cast you away, and send you after the phoenix's egg. You'll bring it and beg and crawl, she belched, and crawl and beg, and in the end I'll take you back, and we'll go where nobody knows us. Young lovers forever. I said, You are kind at heart, Your Highness. I think I've always known that. She nodded solemnly. I'm a good woman, Sir Abel. Fortunately, everybody else is evil, so I get to treat them any way I want. It makes it much more fun. Help me up. I stood and helped her rise. I do not think she could have without my help. I thought you'd like to know how all this is going to work out, she said, so now you do. 
Brush off my bottom, I think I got straw on it, I pretended to. Harder and say I've been a bad girl. Shortly after that she left, walking so well I might have thought her almost sober if I had not been aware of the effort she was putting into it. One of my jailers came in, bringing a basin of warm water, soap, and a towel. I laughed and told him to take them away. He did, locking my cell door behind him. Hours passed. All the things I thought of then have filled this book, and might fill a dozen more. At last two jailers appeared. Addressing me through the bars as my lord, they asked whether I knew what had become of Fiatch, describing him. They had found boots as well as torn and bloody clothes, and although they were not sure they had been his, they were afraid they had been. Fiatch refused to let me occupy this cell, I told them. That's all you need to know. It is enough for you. Now leave me in peace and do your jobs. I had been on the point of calling for Uri when they had come to my door. They begged and flattered, and at last threatened. No doubt I should have smoothed things over, but I was half nuts with inactivity and told them what I thought of them. They left, but came back not long after with a third jailer, opened my door, and came at me with their keys. The roar of the waves filled my ears. I knocked the first one into the tube behind him before he could strike, wrenched his key away, and broke the shoulder of the second, and the head of the third with two blows. It had ended almost before it begun. They must have felt they had lost before they had begun to fight. The two who were still conscious prostrated themselves. I put my foot upon their necks and made each declare himself my slave forever. At which point Uri appeared, laughing, to remind me that she and Baki been forced to swear the same way. She wore no disguise, but was a fire-elf plainly, with floating hair like flames, fiery yellow eyes, and skin like copper in a crucible. I doubt that the jailers heard a word she said, but her appearance, with a slender sword in one hand and its jeweled scabbard in the other, reduced them to gibbering. I'm keeping this key, I told them. Since our king has seen fit to imprison me, I'll stay in this cell when I've no reason to leave it. I expect you to serve me loyally and faithfully, and I promise that your first lapse will be your last. Now pick him up. I used my key to point to their unconscious buddy, and get him out of here. It was easy for me to say that, but not easy for them to do it. He was a big heavy man, and the one whose shoulder I had broken could not help the other much. I wanted to talk to Uri, so, after watching the efforts of the one whose key I had taken for a minute, I picked up the unconscious one and carried him to the jailer's room. "'I brought you a new sword,' Uri said as we were walking back to my cell. "'And you have not even looked at it.' I explained that I was a prisoner and was not supposed to have a sword. "'You can hide it under your bed.' "'I don't have one. I sleep on straw on the floor.' "'But you could get one. Those men you beat will bring you one as soon as you tell them to.' We could sleep in it, and you would have something to sit on. I flexed the blade deeply between my hands. It sprang back straight and true. Do not cut yourself. I'm trying not to. Is this your work? Mine personally? No. How about the bed? I'll think about it, but you won't be welcome to sleep in it. I know what I'd wake up to. She giggled, and I felt a sudden yearning for Aelfris, for its crystal sea and the silent forest, in which Desiree and I had run and shouted and tamed young squirrels. There was no room to swing such a sword in my cell. I stopped outside the door, making cuts in air and thrusting between the bars. Its hilt of silver and snowy leather was simple, even chaste. Its narrow blade, written over in the character of Aelfris, with words too small and dim to read. I think it I self work, Uri said. It is old, no matter who made it, and I did not get it there. You stole it here? She looked at me sidelong. I do not have to steal everything. You have seen this, she smoked, and in a few seconds she was smaller and not quite so slender and her glowing copper skin had faded to white and peach, although her nipples stayed bright and looked too hot to touch. 
I have, I said, and resisted temptation. Are you saying you sold yourself for this? I don't believe it. All right, I stole it. She held out the jeweled scabbard. I refuse to tell from whom. You would make me take it back. If I could make you take it back, I could make you tell me where you got it. Please do not, Lord. Listen. The man who owned it will never know it has gone. Never, I promise you. He had locked it in an iron chest bound with seven chains and seven big padlocks. Do you believe that? No, I said. Then you certainly will not believe he threw the keys into the sea. But that's what my friend told me. I reached up from Aelfris, you know how we do, and pulled it down. He will think it is still in there until the day he dies. I took the scabbard from her and examined it. I had expected turquoise, amber, and that sort of thing, but there were fine rubies, and the blue stones were sapphires. Soft wood, Lord, with thin gold over it. I nodded and added, and a white gold throat. Gold and silver mixed, I suppose. It's the only part that comes near to matching the sword. I sheathed it, though it fits well enough. The scabbard is your human work, I feel sure. You have better taste than we do. I looked around at her. I've never thought so. Neither have I, Lord, but you are above us. I no longer have a sword belt, I said, largely to myself. The king took it. You can push it through that belt you are wearing now. It is not a heavy blade. I suppose so. Besides, I thought you would hide it in our bed. I mean, when you and her highness were not using it. You've been spying on me. Uri grinned. Only the tiniest bit. She is not bad-looking for such a big woman, is she? A powerful sorceress, too. There could be a dozen pleasant surprises. I went into my cell, shutting the door before Uri could follow. She slipped between the bars in her proper shape. Unpleasant ones, too. Some sorceresses have teeth down here. You stick it in, and they bite it off. Many told me. I hid the sword under my straw next to the wall. You wouldn't know anything about that. About sorceresses? Why, no, Lord. Or very little, though I talked with many about them once. I sat and motioned for her to sit. Morcane and her brothers were reared in Aelfris when their mother abandoned them. I'd think you'd know a lot. I do not. Shall I tell you what I know, Lord? I will not lie or make fun of you unless you interrupt. I nodded. Whoever told you that deceived you. I was a chimera. But I have heard things, and know what makes sense. Their mother did not abandon all three. Cedar was a dragon, so why should she? She kept him by her in Muspel, in Aelfris, and here in Mythgarther. He was her firstborn, and so the right king of this part of Mythgarther, though I do not believe he tried to claim it. I said, I suppose Morcain must be the youngest. Uri shook her head. Arnthor is, but males claim the throne first in this celadon. Now stop interrupting. She took a deep breath. Second, Morcane and Arnthor must have spent most of their childhood here, otherwise they would still be children. And third, the sea elf raised them, not my clan. We were cedar slaves, remember? Loyal slaves, because we were terribly afraid. They were allies, or at least more nearly allies than we ever were. I understand. Is there anything else? Yes. You will distrust it, but I will say it just the same. Is King Arnthor afraid of his sister? I shrugged. He doesn't confide in me. Were you watching when I fought Morcane's dead knights? No, but I would like to have seen it, Lord. Nearly everybody fled, the spectators, I mean. But King Arnthor remained, and the queen, I think because Arnthor had her arm, and Morcane herself, of course. Did he look frightened? I cast my mind back. No, resolute, if anything. Aha! Uh -huh. You probably will not know this either, Lord, but I must try. 
Is she afraid of him? Yes, she is. Very much so. I paused, remembering. It may be why she drinks. She loves him, but she's terribly frightened of him. In that case he is a sorcerer, Lord, a most dangerous one. You may trust me, though you will not. An older sister with magic at her command? She would jerk him about like a puppet if he were not. Cedar had magic, a great deal of it. I nodded agreement. So does Morcane, from what I have heard, and you confirm it. Why should you think the youngest has none? I shouldn't, I suppose. Here's another question. You stole that sword for me, a good one, made by Elf long ago. Could you have gotten my own sword, Eterni, as easily? Uri shook her head. I could not find it, Lord. The king took it. I know, Gilf told me. The king must have hidden it somewhere. She sifted straw between her fingers. You couldn't find it. No, Lord. I reached out and touched her knee. I cannot say why. That is a lie, Uri. You found it, but dared not take it. I'm glad you didn't. Arnthor's wrong, but Arnthor's my king. You've talked to Gilf. Where is he? I do not know, Lord, though I can probably find him without much trouble. They had chained him up. I freed him as you ordered? I nodded. He's gone into the wild, I suppose. What about Cloud? She is in the stable, Lord, and well seen to. I told her you might soon be free, and she will wait for you. Have they tried to ride her? Yes, Lord. Several of the grooms, without success. She may be in danger. There is a fat old nobleman who is interested in her, Lord. The grooms fear him. They dare not mistreat her. Have you seen Baki? Lately? No, Lord. I questioned her at length, but learned nothing more. If Cloud or Gilf had seen Baki, they had not mentioned it. Chapter 35 Down Time passed until there came a day of excitement outside my little window, of men shouting and cursing, and horses and mules blowing and stamping. Then silence. I spoke to my jailers, and the one called Ged told me Arnthor was to lead an army against the Austrolings. He was taking the other jailers with him to look after prisoners, and get alone would be in charge of the dungeon. I wouldn't expect you to help, my lord, but it's going to be a lot of work. You're right, I told him. I won't help you with that, but perhaps we can find help for you just the same. We began with the two barons, whose cells were in the same corridor as my own. I introduced myself, which I had not done previously, explained that no menial work would be required of them, and offered to free them from their cells to supervise other prisoners if they would pledge themselves not to escape. Both agreed. After that we enlisted ten commoners, choosing the healthiest and strongest. We promised them clean straw, blankets, and better food, but when I got better acquainted with the misery the rest suffered I gave them all those things. Their old straw, crawling with lice, we burned in the courtyard one night. One had been a barber. I stole a razor for him, scissors and other things. He cut and shaved their heads and beards, and we burned the hair, too. Whiston came, bringing my helmet and mail. I'm sorry, Sir Abel. They wouldn't let me in before. Only Lord Colley did today. Is he really a lord? I said he was, and explained. Pauk and Uns are working, or they would have come, too. They're terribly concerned about you. So was I. I... We don't really have to work. We've got some money. I asked what they were doing, and Whiston said he was helping the Earl Marshal's clerks, while Pauk and Duns were working on a wall being built around the city. Two men at arms were my next visitors, if they can be called that. They had come, they said, to take me to the Queen's, from which I assumed that Gaynor and Morcane were jointly charged with governing King's Doom. I was corrected, and told that there were frost giants in the city, huge women who frightened the good burghers. Gaynor and Idden received me in the throne room. I knelt and was allowed by both to rise. Gaynor spoke. You were my champion, Sir Abel. Are you my champion still? I said I would be if I could. 
You must think I abandoned you, so I did, because my husband ordered it. He ordered me not to free you while he was away as well. I understand, Your Majesty. Do you also understand why he gave that order? I think so, Your Majesty. That is why I am seeing you like this. She waved at her courtiers, women and old men. These are my witnesses. I believe you know Lord Eskin. I have that honor. He will speak on my behalf, my royal sister, on her own behalf. You will be under guard the entire time and will die if you try to escape. She made a small, futile gesture and cooed. I hope it won't be necessary. I really do. If my escape would displease your majesty, I shall not escape, I said. Idden rose. Come with me in that case, Lord Eskin. We spoke in the red room, a room of business that held a writing desk and a work table with a dozen or more bureaus for documents. An armchair with a footrest, prettily made, was carried in for Idden. The Earl Marshal sat in the big oak chair that had been before the writing desk and I on one of the clerk's stools. You should be free this moment, Idden declared. The way things are, it was all I could do to get my sister queen to order you brought up here. It's a... It's the worst sort of luck that you're a prisoner. For him it is, the Earl Marshal agreed. For us it is good fortune. I thank Sky for it. I've seen him fight, my lord, as you have not. I fled the sight, your majesty. Harumph! He may help us now because he's not free. If he'd never been imprisoned, he'd be with the king and we wouldn't have him. I'll free you, Hidden promised me. I'll contrive some slight. My sister queen is not unwilling. But fearful, the Earl Marshal added. At the moment, however, we require your brains, not your sword. Her present majesty has persuaded Queen Gaynor and me that we ought to consult you. She was much impressed by you in Jotunland. I said that I was honored and meant it. Are you hungry? Lord Eskin will order food for you if you wish it, I'm sure. Thanking her, I declared that I was not. He's well fed, your majesty. He's the monarch of the dungeon and gets whatever he wants. I've had to forgo my usual inspections, so I may say I saw nothing amiss. Perhaps your majesty would enjoy dainty fare while we confer? He rang, told Payne what he wanted, and turned to me. I don't know how much you know of our situation, Sir Abel. His majesty is in the east with the army. Were you aware of it? I said I knew he had marched away, but no more. We raided them this fall, slew their cons, and gained much plunder. Now the black con will have vengeance if he can. The Earl Marshal smiled. Every knight fit to ride has gone off with the king and most of the nobility. His majesty left her majesty in titular charge of his realm. I am her chief adviser. I am to supply remounts to his army and fresh troops as they can be raised, and do a dozen other things. Among them I am to fortify this city. Idden said, For centuries King's Doom has boasted that the shields of its knights were its walls. Now the East is stronger than ever and hungrier. The king sent my father to pacify the Angerborn, so he might march into Osterland with his full strength. Surprise and a crushing defeat would leave the old Khan's plans in ruins. Or so it was hoped. The Earl Marshal nodded. The surprise was achieved as planned, Idden continued. The crushing defeat inflicted, and the old Khan killed. But Celadon's triumph seems to have united the Austerlings around his last son, the Black Khan, and hastened their attack. I said, a hasty attack may fail. We hope so. They've taken the passes, and that's bad. My father's gone to join the king. So has Duke Martyr. Yet we're reinforced with a hundred daughters of anger, the Earl Marshal added. Her Majesty Queen Idden's bodyguard. I said, as long as the weather's cold, that's no small reinforcement. Lord Eskin engaged men learned in such matters to plan fortifications, Idden sighed. They've presented the plan to my dear sister queen. It's an excellent plan, I'm sure, but will take years. You're no builder, I realize that. Do you know anything about siegecraft? I shrugged. I was at the siege of Nastrond. 
The Earl Marshal leaned forward, his eyes narrowed. Where's that? I never heard of it. Iden overrode him. We must have something that can be done in a month or less. If the king triumphs, we can make merry. But battle will be joined before the next new moon, and if he returns with a beaten army, the Austerlings will be at their heels. What can you suggest? Nothing, I said, till I've seen the ground. The Earl Marshal shook his head. I have maps. They'd mean zip to me. Most likely they'd lead me wrong. I need to ride around the city, a day at least, and two'd be better. The Earl Marshal wiped his face and his bald head with his hand, but said nothing. Silence filled the room, a silence none of us seemed willing to break. I rose and examined its crimson hangings, and the bureaus of waxed wood the color of wild roses and their enameled fittings. At last Iden said, I want to tell you about Lady Linnet and her daughter. May I? We may not get another chance. I said of course that she might. Payne returned while she was speaking, carrying a tray loaded with dainties, a bottle of wine and glasses. He filled them, and we ate and drank while we talked. She has reclaimed Goldenlawn, Iden said. This was on our way south, of course, and we stayed there with her for a few days to help, all of us. She and Vil intend to rebuild it, and are wed. They, I'm sorry, you will win her. I agreed and asked Iden to continue. He's no nobleman, but what nobleman would have her now? He's Atella's father, too, or they say he is, and he loves her. When I said nothing, Iden added, Linnet's still mad, though not so mad as she was. She talks more, at least. That's good. She thinks there's another woman with her, a woman she calls Mag. I cannot say how well I controlled my face, though I strove to remain impassive. A woman no one else can see. With a smile full of pity, Iden spoke to the Earl Marshal. Her husband's blind, so he says that there is two. I asked, Are Berthold and his wife still with you, Your Majesty? I didn't see them in the throne room. No, I gave them leave to revisit their village. It's been destroyed. Iden shrugged. I didn't know that. Doubtless they'll return quickly in that case. Perhaps it's been rebuilt. I wish I could go there and see. Did bold Berthold believe in Lady Lennet's friend? Ah, I see. Iden spoke to the Earl Marshal again. Berthold is a serving man of mine. He's blind, too. I said, but did he say the woman was there? I don't know. I never asked. Perhaps my sister Queen could... could accept your parole. I'll urge it. The Earl Marshal shook his head. She will not dare... I escaped that night, although I did not think of it as escaping. Cloud's thought guided me to her, and told me long before I reached her stall that Uns was with her. I woke him, and we soon found him a sturdy cob, saddled and rode out. After circling the city by moonlight, it took a good three hours, we went to the inn, got Pauk, and ate breakfast. They went to their work after that, and I went with them. A big ditch was being dug on the land side of the city for the foundation of the wall. Pauk and Duns were diggers, and it was already ten paces wide and so deep that ladders had to be used to carry the hard red clay out. We tied Un's cob so he could return it to the stable after work, and I began the circuit of the city again, seeing by daylight what I had ridden over a few hours before. I had completed about a third of it when I met a patrol. We fled, Cloud and me. An arrow struck her neck, and she turned on them, terrible as Gilf. Two died. I was trying to control her when I was knocked from her saddle. I was taken to a guard room in Thor Tower, kept tied up there for three days, robbed, and kicked when I objected. After that I was brought before Gaynor. She was in mortal fear of Arnthor, and ordered that I be chained in a cell on the lowest level of the dungeon. Strictly speaking, her orders were not obeyed. Neither Ged nor the men-at-arms would go below the twelfth level, nor did they know how many might lie below it, for Thor Tower had been built upon the ruins of an older structure, and that twelfth level was as wide as Forseti. A smith was brought, a silent, hard-bitten man who did me no intended hurt, but would not speak to me. 
He puffed his charcoal, put jives on my wrists and ankles, and welded them shut. Then began my true imprisonment, because I swore that I would make no effort to free myself until Thor Tower fell, or Arn Thor triumphed, if triumph was the Volfather's will. As for him, not one hour passed in which I did not hope he would appear and free me from my oath. At first I felt sure he would, and I planned everything we would do before we returned to Sky, how we would set the whole world right. Days passed in which I shivered hour after hour in the cold, and burrowed in Collie's straw, and at last had Org sit with me, savage and silent in my cell, so I could warm myself from his heat. He hungered, and I gave him leave to kill any man whose name he did not know. From time to time he went out, and from time to time he returned with bloody jaws to crouch and warm me as before, until at length a day came when no one brought me food. I waited, telling myself that at the next meal they would come again, and that if they did not come, I would call Baki and have her free me. They did not. I called her, and called again, until I had called a score of times, and she did not come. And at last I realized that, chained as I was, she no longer feared me. The service she had entered on the stair of the Tower of Glass was done, and she whose love I had so often refused was free at last. She would live the life of a fire-elf now, and give no thought to me, dead in the dungeon of Thor Tower. What I would have done then I cannot say. I might have broken my oath and saved myself. I would like to think I would have come to that in the end. I might have died, as I resolved to. I was not much tormented by thirst in that cold, and hunger had ceased to trouble me. I might also have asked Org to bring me whatever meat he could find, and united myself with the Austerlings, who eat the flesh of their foes, and howled in my madness. Lights in that utter darkness, and the clank of weapons. I told Org to hide himself, but it was already too late. My cell door opened, and the glare of torches blinded me. A remembered voice. By the lady's crotch. The king's. What's that by him? I laid my hand on Org's arm. Something it were better you had not seen, your majesty. I choked, for my mouth was dry. Go back up the steps, return, and you won't see it. There was excited talk, to which I paid scant attention. They left, and I told Org I had to have water. He brought a little, warmed in his cupped hand. I drank and sent him out. The torches and the knights who bore them returned. I stood, fell, and stood again with Beal helping me. The king looked me in the face, for we were of a height. I love my queen, he said. Perhaps I smiled. And I don't. Your Majesty, I ask no leave to speak freely. Those who ask leave of you do it out of fear of your displeasure or worse. Your displeasure means nothing to me, and any torture you might inflict would be a relief. I speak for Aelfris and myself. You are a tyrant. I love her, Arntho repeated. I love Celadon more. You treat them the same. You abandoned Aelfris and taught your folk too. No doubt Queen Gaynor wishes you had abandoned her as well, and Celadon is blessed every moment you neglect her. You're of royal birth, Queen Gaynor is of noble birth, and your knights boast their gentle birth. I'm a plain American, and I'll say this if I die. Your villages are ravaged by outlaws, by Angerborn, and by Austerlings, because they've been abandoned too. The Most High God set men here as models for Aelfris. We teach it violence, treachery, and little else, and you have been our leader. He nodded, which astounded me. You say you're of low birth. Are you not a knight? I let you keep your spurs. I nodded. I am. The knight who had come with him stood silent, though I knew that if the chance came they would kill me. I smelled their torches, and saw in the hard, flat plains of Arnthor's face the cold and filthy cell where I had shivered so long, and in which I shivered still. Beale said, I had hoped to free you, Sir Abel. If Arnthor heard, he gave no sign of it. You are a knight? A knight of my kingdom? 
I am. You worked wonders in Jotunland, and only wonders will save us. Strike off these chains, I told him, and I'll try. He spoke, and my chains fell clanking to the floor. My story has almost ended. Before I end it, I want to say that had it not been for Org, whom Arnthor glimpsed in my cell, and whose terror was such that even Arnthor retreated, I do not believe he would have freed me. I was bathed, dressed, and fed. I'm to send you to his majesty as soon as you can ride, the Earl Marshal told me. Meanwhile, I'm to arm you. What would you like? For you to leave. I've my helmet and mail, which our king lets me keep. My sword he lost, trying to regain the passes, when the army was overwhelmed. Wait, the Earl Marshal told me, and hurried away. In his absence, I plotted against him, against Gaynor and Idden, too. Plotted and mocked myself for plotting, for I was too weak to stand. Days passed in which boys waited on me, pages scarce old enough to hold bows. Once they asked whether the Austerlings would conquer us, and what would become of them if they did. I told them I had no doubt they would, but if they wanted to escape, I would take them to the dungeon, where they would be devoured at once. It would be better for Celadon, I told them, if it were left to the trees. There's an isle called Glass. There the great dragon cedar put lovely women to lure seamen ashore. The women died, killed by one another, or the seamen they tricked. The last took poison, and it's a place of beauty, silence, and clear light. Have you poison? Swearing they had none, they fled. The Earl Marshal returned, bearing the sword Baki had found for me. He was as fat as ever, with fear in his shrewd eyes. It does me honor, he said, to give you this. He bowed as he held it out. I took it and belted it on. For this, I said, we'll go to Elfris. He cannot often have been surprised, but he was then, astonishment that showed plainly in his face. It won't take long, I promised him, though time runs slowly there, come with me. He would have argued for an hour. I drew the sword he had just given me and pricked him with it, and although he shouted for guards, none came. The king has taken every man fit to hold the spear, I told him, from the castle and the city too, leaving you. Someone must be in charge, he said. Why no, where's Queen Gaynor who sentenced me? The boys said she had gone, but they did not know where. She's with the king, the Earl Marshal's voice shook. There's no one left to protect her here. Besides, I urged him forward with my sword. I'm free again, and he fears I'll lie with her. Move! Where are we going? To Elfris as you wished, I said. To Elfris as I promised. It's down those stairs, and you'll go quicker than your age and weight permit or feel my point. I took him to the dungeon, discovering in the process that I was more afraid of it than he was. It seemed to close around me like the grave. If the Earl Marshal's face was white, mine was whiter. I kept him moving, so he could not see it. Dandon had gone. Collie remained, locked in his cell. I freed him, and with his help freed such other prisoners as we could find until we had cleared the twelfth level. They don't go down there, Collie said, as the Earl Marshal and I started down. There's no one there. That's not the same thing, I told him, and prodded the Earl Marshal with my sword. Please he said. I'm twice your age, and there is no railing. You're four times my age, I told him, and there's no railing. If I had known the conditions under which you were being held, I would have come to your rescue, believe me. Sure you would have. You were careful not to know. There was a fourteenth level and a fifteenth below that. After it, I did not count, but we soon stepped out onto a rocky plain where the breeze smelled of the sea. There was a draft, the Earl Marshal said. The dungeon must connect with caverns larger still. There's a wind, I told him. Didn't Lord Collie come with us? The Earl Marshal looked behind us. I thought he was coming too. 
only as far as the twelfth level. Walk that way. There are no more stairs, he sounded happy. He had been frightened as we descended and descended, and must have thought that having reached bottom, we would go up again. There must be more stairs. I was speaking mostly to myself, and I prodded him again with my point. But there aren't. This is Elfris, I explained. So there are worlds that are lower still, Muspel and Niflheim. The realms of fire and ice. He sounded awed. You wished to go to Elfris, I told him. You are here. It will soon be day. We walked on and heard the lapping of waves. Winds are rare here, I explained, but there is a breeze at dawn and at twilight near the sea. This is the air that I've longed to breathe, the Earl Marshal said. It seemed to me that he addressed me even less than I had addressed him. Night was gray as we strolled down the shingle to the water's edge. I sheathed my sword, for I had no more need to prod him. Where will the sun rise? he asked. I knew he was thinking of the Sea of Mythgarther, in which he must often have seen the sun set. It won't, I said. We are their light, you'll see. His silence told me he did not understand. The worlds get smaller as you descend. Elfris isn't as big as our world, though I think it must be bigger than Celadon. There is a geometric progression, the Earl Marshal told me, and tried to explain what a geometric progression was, a thing I could not understand and that I doubt anyone can understand. The highest world, the world of the Most High God, is infinite. The world below his is one hundredth as large. But a hundredth part of infinity is infinity still, though so much smaller. The world below that, sky. Yes, sky. There's a hundredth the size of that, and so a ten thousandth the size of Elysian. Still infinite. May I sit on this stone? Of course, my lord. Very kind of you, Sir Abel. Rump. Kindness to a prisoner, knightly. You got little yourself? I did the first time, my lord, but not the second. I'd escaped, so her majesty chose to take it. We'd been defeated, the Earl Marshal wiped his face. We have been, as I ought to say. They are less than human, those Austerlings. I fought them at sea, my lord, and they are not. The Angerborn often seem very human. King Gilling did in his love for Idden, but they aren't. The Austerlings don't look as human as King Gilling, yet they're what we may become. The air grew brighter. There is no air anywhere like the air of Alfris. That of sky is purer than the purest air we know in Mythgarther. So pure no distance can haze its crystal transparency. But the air of Alfris seems luminous, as if one breathes a great gem. Day came, and we saw before us the sea that is like no other as blue as sapphire and as sparkling, stretching to island realms unguessable. A league overhead, Mythgarther spread itself, as stars do, on a cloudless night. Jotunland lay north, wrapped in snow. Above us was Celadon, where green shoots peeped from tree and field. All around us, Aelfris, white where it was not green, rejoicing in the silver light, forests of mystery and cliffs of marble. I could stay here forever, the Earl Marshal muttered. Give up fortune, castle, horses, everything. They're all lost anyway if the Austerlings prevail. Maybe you will, I said, because I was thinking of leaving him there. But soon I said, follow me, for I had spied a crevice in the base of the cliff to our left. He did. Where are we going? To look at that, and go down farther if we can, I have... You don't understand my nature. I don't either, though I understand much more than you do. I can't use the powers my nature confers. I've given my oath. But I can't change this nature that neither of us understands. What do you smell? He sniffed the air. The sea, and I think these meadow flowers. I smell sulfur, and I wish Gilfer with us. We descended into the crevice, I eagerly, he more slowly behind me. 
Fumes spilled about us at times, so that we could scarcely breathe. At others vanished, leaving air that would have suited the desert, lifeless, dusty, and scorching. The Earl Marshal took my arm. This is dangerous. We must be nearing Muspel. We're there, I told him. I had glimpsed a dragon in the darkness. It seemed to hear the hiss of my blade and came at us, silent at first, then roaring. The Earl Marshal tried to flee and fell, rolling down the stony slope into darkness. The dragon struck at me, and I put my point into its eye. How long I searched for the Earl Marshal I cannot say. It seemed a minute or two, but may have been much longer. No matter which way I turned, the ground sloped down. It grew cooler, then cold, and air as clotted as phlegm held pitiless white light that drew the color from the gems on my scabbard and the skin of my own hands. Abel! Sir Abel! The Earl Marshal came waddling so rapidly that I knew he would have run if he could. There's a... a giant... a monster! He pointed behind him. We... go! We must! It... it... I told him I wanted to see it, thinking it might be Org. No, you don't, Sir Abel. Sir Abel, listen, I... I... I've seen it. He fell silent, gasping for breath. Yes, you've seen it, my lord. I want to see it, too. His fear had infected me, and I added, And afterward go. I'll go now. And face the dragons alone? If you won't come with me, I'll go with you and save your life if I can. We started up the slope, walking easily. After some while, I realized we were not walking up it, but down. I corrected our course. We reached a ridge, and had to descend or turn back. Great sheets of ice hung like curtains from a dark sky. The ground was hard as ice and slick with frost. This cannot be Muspel, the Earl Marshal gasped. A voice before, behind, and all about us answered him. You call this Niflheim? It was weary, yet resonated with such power as no overkind possesses, not even the Valfather. Trembling, the Earl Marshal fell to his knees. You wished to see me, Abel. You have only to look. It surrounded me. I cannot write it in a way that will make it clear if you have not seen it. I was in it, and it scrutinized me from above as from below, huge and stronger than iron, hideous in its malice. I tried to close my eyes, feeling that I walked in a nightmare. It was there still. Call me God, Abel. Pride woke in me. That pride did not still my fear, but shouldered it aside as the weak thing it was. I said, Call me Sir Abel, God. You come near the secret that lies at the heart of all things, Abel. Worship me, and I will tell it. The Earl Marshal worshipped, but I did not. Learn it, and you will have power such as men and gods scarcely dream of, easily obtained. I said, This Lord is worshipping you, tell him. You behold me as I am able. It may be the sight is too much. As it spoke, it no longer surrounded me. Instead, there sat before me upon a throne of ice a creature grossly great. Toad and dragon were in it. So was the Earl Marshal, and so was I. Worship me now. You shall know the secret. I said, I don't wish to know the secret, but to return to Muspel and from there to Elfris. Worship me. Lord Eskin is worshipping you, I repeated. If you'd tell me, why won't you tell him? It lifted the Earl Marshal before I had finished held him close, and whispered. Niflheim trembled as it whispered, and a sheet of ice, miles long, fell with a deafening crash. "'Now you know me,' it said to the Earl Marshal, but his eyes were shut tight and would not look. "'I know you too,' I told it. "'This is the seventh and lowest world, the final world, and you are the most low god.' I will tell you, and you will worship me, seeing that it is right and good that you do so. Come nearer. I did not, yet the distance between us diminished. 
Its voice fell to a whisper, and that whisper was the worst thing I have heard. The voice of Grengarm was as pure as the wind beside it. Know the great secret, which is that the last world is the first. Niflheim shook again. Its frozen earth groaned. You stand in Niflheim and Elysian. The tremors became more violent. A pillar of ice fell, and its ruin sent ice shards flying and a cloud of sparkling crystals like snow. The thing that spoke looked about it, and I glimpsed its fear. You see my face, it whispered, and seemed to hear my thought. If you could see my back, you would see the Most High God. Niflheim broke as it spoke. A crack opened between the place where it sat and the place where I stood. I helped the Earl Marshal rise. I cannot say why I did, but I did. Perhaps he could not have said why he rose. For he is me. Ice and stones rained all around the thing that spoke. A stone as big as an ox struck it. And I am he. Even as it spoke, it fled, with the frozen earth rolling under its feet like the sea, and stones, ice, and fire of muspel nearly burying it. I saw its back then and the back of its head, and they were covered with lumps and running sores. When we regained Elfris at last, we sat surrounded by its beauty, we too, and Elf came from the forest and the sea with food and gifts. We ate, and an aged Elf, whose beard was of those fall leaves that remained streaked with green, drew me aside and whispered, Our queen is waiting for you. I know, I said. Tell her that I'll come as soon as I have illustrated her message, as she and the kings wished. I returned to the Earl Marshal and sat with him and ate an apple and a wedge of cheese. You're wise, he said, and I who thought myself wise for so long am a fool. By no means. I couldn't attain this world of Aelfris. Harumph! Not in thirty years. You did it easily, and followed the worlds to the end. I nodded. I've never heard of anyone's doing that, no one but you, and I because I came with you. I said that some day I would like to go to Cleos, the world above sky, but it would be years before I tried. I wish I could sit here forever, he told me solemnly watching these waves and the sky and eating this food. I paid little heed when he said it, but when we rose to return to Mythgarther, I chanced to look behind us. There he sat with food before him, staring out over the sea, his face rapturous. I stopped to point, and he whispered, I know. There are things in Aelfris I still do not understand. Chapter 36 The Fight Before the Gate Even as time in Aelfris runs more slowly than in Mythgarther, so time in Muspel runs more slowly than time in Aelfris, and time in Niflheim slower still. We had been away half a day. When we returned, King's Doom lay in ruins. The red rag floated over Thor Tower, and the season was high summer. We found a woman begging food. We had none to give her, and our coins were worthless. There was no bread to buy. The king's dead, she told us, and Austerlings rule Celadon, eating those they don't enslave. I have a hiding place. She would not show it to us, saying there was room for one and no more. The Earl Marshal asked about his castle of seven gates, but she knew nothing of it. I'd like to go to Thor Tower, he told me. Pains, my bastard, did you guess? He knew a secret way, and I told him I would go with him, hoping to find Wiston. He said, I must have a sword. I won't see sixty again, and was never a good swordsman, but I'll try because I must. I said, That's all swordsmen do, my lord. We thanked the beggar woman, promised we would bring food when we had found some, and went to the inn. It was a grim business to walk, that fine summer day, 
and find cobbled streets choked with rubble, shops burned, and people gone. In a public square, the Austerlings had kindled a fire and dined on human flesh. Bones littered the fine paving blocks, gnawed and half-burned. I know of nothing more horrible than this, the Earl Marshal said. I'd a servant, I said, who did the same, though he didn't cook his meat. Thus I'm inured. Is it worse to kill a child or to eat it before the worms do? The inn was still standing, its window panes gone, and its doors smashed. I called for Pauk and Uns. My shouts brought Uns to a fourth-floor window, but brought a patrol of Austerlings as well. Uns threw rubble from his window, and the Earl Marshal snatched the leader's sword as soon as I dispatched him, so he fared well enough. We went up when the fight was over, meeting Uns on the stair. It was on that stair that a thought from Cloud reached me, lonely and wild, joyous at the touch of my mind, but fearful too. Uns had my shield, he said, and my bow and quiver. We followed him to the lumber room, where he had hidden them. And this are, this all hat, ya forget this. It was the helm, old as he said, and rusty again. I put it on and saw Uns sturdy and straight, the Earl Marshal older, knowing, and because he was knowing, frightened. Pauk's gone home to see his wife, Uns told me. Only he's got some o' yardings, ta. He's keepin' em for ya. I asked about Whiston, but Uns knew nothing, nor had he more news of the war than we had heard from the beggar woman. We held a council then, speaking as equals. The upshot was that the Earl Marshal and I would go to Thor Tower as planned, while Uns collected the beggar woman we had promised to help, fed her, for he had some food, and packed such possessions as we could carry. We would meet again at the inn and try to reach seven gates, which might still be holding out. That decided, I drilled the Earl Marshal with his new sword. It was a saber wetted on the inner edge. He found it unhandy at first, but soon grew fond of it. I thought it too short and too heavy at the tip, but the blade was stiff and sharp, and those are the most important qualities. We slept, woke after moonrise, and went into the broken lands east of the city. Bushes hid an iron door in a cliff little taller than a lance. The Earl Marshal produced a key, and we went in, I fearing we would find we were in Alfris. So it nearly proved. Hands snatched our clothes from the time we relocked the door behind us, and the thin voices of Elf mocked and challenged us. When the end of the long narrow tunnel was in sight, I caught one by the wrist, and when the Earl Marshal unlocked a second door and admitted us to the wine cellar, I dragged her into its lesser darkness and demanded her name. She trembled. Your slave is Bucky, Lord. Who thought she'd have fun with me in that tunnel? I drew my sword. To, to, to take you to Aelfris where you w would be safe? Who abandoned me chained in a cell? I felt no rage against her, no lust for vengeance only a cold justice that had pronounced sentence already. She did not speak. The Earl Marshal asked whether I knew this elf. She's declared herself my slave a thousand times, I told him, and I've freed her over and over, and neither of us believed the other. Would you like an elf slave? Very much. She'll swear fealty to you if I spare her, and betray you at the first opportunity, won't you, Baki? I was your s slave because Garseg wished it, Lord. I will be his if you wish it. I spoke to the Earl Marshal. We're going up, aren't we? It's obvious that neither of them are down here. Baki said, There is a stair to your left, Lord. Thanks. I could kill you here, Baki. Cut your rotten throat. I'm going to take you where I can see to make a clean thrust instead. Want to talk about the blood I drank when I was hurt? Let's hear you. Perhaps she shook her head. It was too dark to see. The stair opened into a pantry, the pantry into a wide hall hung with shields and weapons. Night had fallen while we were in the tunnel, 
but candles guttered at either end of the hall, more than enough light for a good thrust. "'May I speak, Lord? I know you will kill me, and it will be no use to defend myself. But I would like to say two things before I die, so you will understand when I am gone.' Perhaps I nodded. Doubtless I did. I was looking at her through the eyes of the old helm, a thing like a woman molded of earth, blazing coals and beast flesh. You have refused me a hundred times. I have been bold, and you have refused. I have been shy, and you have refused. I have helped you over and over, but when my back was broken you would not mend me yourself, bringing a boy to do it. I knew that if I came to your cell and freed you, you would refuse again. I hoped that if I left you there until you were nearly dead, you might feel gratitude. I would have come before you died. I would have demanded oaths before I fed and freed you. That is the first thing, the Earl Marshal said. I don't know whether I should envy you or laugh, Sir Abel. I released Baki and removed the helm. I had seen her too well, and the sight sickened me. Would it help you to know I'm just a boy playing knight, my lord? I've seen you as you are, and Baki as she is, and if you saw me the same way, you'd know. Men don't mock boys, or envy them either. Then I'm no man, the Earl Marshal told me, for I've envied a thousand. I turned to Baki. Why don't you bolt? You might save your life. Because I have more to say. We pinched and tweaked you in the tunnel. How many of us could you catch? I had heard the soft steps of scores of feet. I made no reply. Only me, because I was trying to draw you to Aelfris and safety, while the others only wished to tease you. I believe I might have stabbed her if I had been granted another second. Austerlings burst in, and there was no time. Baki snatched a sword from the wall and fought beside us, an elf, a maiden, and last a living flame. The sword Uri had stolen sifted our foes and drew me on and on, but Baki was always before me, cutting men as harvesters cut grain. When the last had fled, she confronted me, her stolen sword ready. Who carried the day, Lord? You? No. I had on the helm, but would not look at her. Will you meet me, sword to sword? No, I repeated. I'd kill you, and I don't want to. Go in peace. Her sword fell to the floor. She had vanished. We'd better not stay here, the Earl Marshal said. I agreed, and he showed me a narrow stair behind an heiress. Describing our search of Thor Tower would be weary work. Indeed, it was weary work itself. We had to stop more than once to rest and in the end I searched alone, and returned for him, hidden in his library, when I was sure that neither pain nor wisdom were to be found. They are dead, I suppose, he rose stiffly. I was trained with the sword as a boy. It had been twenty years and more since I'd handled one. He held his out, although I had seen it earlier. Do you know how many men I had slain with the sword? I shook my head and dropped into a chair, exhausted. None. But I killed four today. Four Austerling spears, with one the elf and I killed together. How long can such good fortune endure? Until we reach seven gates, I hope, my lord. East? Five days' ride? Then three or less if we hasten. I was hopeful, for I thought Cloud might rejoin me soon. We'll be hurrying into the teeth of the army the Khan will send to recover the Mountain of Fire. The Earl Marshal wiped his face and stared at the ceiling. If we take the direct route, that is, you know the North? Tolerably well. So do I. It might be better for us to turn north at first, then east, then south. This we set out to do, tramping away from King's Doom unopposed, although we had left Thor Tower in an uproar. The first night, while the Earl Marshal, Uns, and the beggar woman, Galeen, slept, I lay awake, staring up to sky. Once I believed I glimpsed Cloud among the stars, and sent urgent thoughts to tell her I was below. 
They cannot have reached her, for there was no thought from her. Next day we encountered Austerlings everywhere. Twice we fought them. We had to leave the road, and when we returned to it, to leave it again. They had striped the countryside, burning every village and farm, and devouring people and livestock. That night we finished the bread and bacon we had carried, and although we continued to feed our fire when they were gone, we would much rather have fed ourselves. "'I have dined well throughout a long life,' the Earl Marshal remarked. "'I'll die now with an empty belly. It seems a shame. Do they eat well in the lands of the dead? Queen Eden told me you spend some time there.' "'Only as a visitor. No, my lord, they do not.' Then I won't go if I can help it. Galeen looked at Uns, but he only grinned and said, Ya feed dem osherlins if in ya die sar. Your belly be empty, only not theirs no sar. May I speak openly of the last place in which we were well fed, Sir Abel? I nodded. Might we not go to Eofris again, all of us? Are you asking if I could take so many? Yes, I think I might, but food is uncertain there, and we might lose a year while we ate. Better to lose a year than to lose our lives? We might lose those too. You didn't see the dangers, my lord, but there are many. Dragons come there often, and there are many others, of which the worst may be the elf themselves. Don't you remain there? He nodded. Let that be enough. Galeen muttered, you know nothing of hardship. Hans corrected her. Sar Abel do. A night with servants? I don't think so. The Earl Marshal told her to mind her tongue. I said that if I could endure the swords and spears of our enemies, I could surely endure anything a woman might say, provided she did not say it too often. I don't know what you might have gone through, that's fact, wounds and all. Fighting's a night's trade, but the rest shouldn't act like it's just a trade like a butcher's. I've been poor my whole life, and what I had was taken cause you knights didn't fight enough. I'd a man, we'd a baby. Many of those knights paid with their lives, the Earl Marshal muttered. Hans put his arm around Galeen and held her hand in his, which seemed more sensible. Looking into the fire, I saw Baki's face. She mouthed a word I could not catch, pointed to my left, and vanished. Excusing myself, I rose. Deep in the shadows, a woman with eyes of yellow flame wrapped me in such an embrace as few men have known. I knew her by her kiss, and we kissed long and long. When at last we parted, she laughed softly. The wind is in the chimney. I agreed that it was. I had better go. Before the fire burns too bright? I stepped back, and she vanished, although her voice remained. News, or a promise? Which would you hear first? The promise, by all means. Unwise. Here is my news. Baki says you were looking for your squire and the fat man's clerk. If you still want them, they are defending a little place called Red Hall. We last met near there. I nodded, unable to speak. There are two hundred attacking it, and more coming. It is already full of women and children who fled them. You may know some of the women. I asked who they were. I paid no heed to them, and would not have known the fat man's clerk if I had not spoken to the boy. Taug? Whiston, I said. Taug's Sir Svon's squire, or he used to be. I doubt it matters. Do you care about the big women more than you care about me? I care for no one as I care for you. She laughed, delighted. I enthrall you. Wonderful. My reputation remains intact. Are you going? No, I'm going to Aelfris with you forever. She stepped into the moonlight, naked and infinitely desirable. Come, then. Her hand closed on mine. Leave the others to their deaths. They die soon in any case. Until then I had not known we stood upon a hilltop. The ground ahead fell gently. Jeweled air shimmered not far down the slope. I can't, I said. Desiree sighed. And I cannot love you as you love them. 
Will you come if I promise to try? To try very hard? I can't, I repeated. Not now. I will tire of you. I know you know. But I will come back to you, and when I come back, we will know such joy as no one in either world has ever known. She must have seen my answer in my eyes, because she vanished as she spoke. The hill vanished with her, and I stood on level ground. Uns and Glean were sleeping when I returned to the fire. Wiston and Payne are at my manor of Redhall, I told the Earl Marshal. It's besieged. I'm going to help them. The old helm stood before the fire in the place where I had been sitting before I left it. I sat beside it, put it on, and removed it at once. How do you know? the Earl Marshal asked. Desiree just told me. He said something else then, but I did not answer, and I no longer recall what it was. I tapped the old helm. I wasn't wearing this. The Earl Marshal raised an eyebrow. Of course not. I'm glad I wasn't, very glad. Are you going? To Red Hall with you? The Queen said specifically that pain was there. I nodded. Then I am? I must. I had hoped he would not, and had planned to send Uns and Glean away with him. I made it clear that I had no reason to believe Payne and Whiston were there beyond Desiree's assertion, and warned him that no elf could be trusted. I loved his mother, the Earl Marshal said. I loved her very much. I couldn't marry her. She was a commoner, one of mother's maids. I've never told anyone this. I said he need not tell me. I want to. If I die and you find pain alive, I want you to know. She became pregnant and hid in the forest, half a day's ride from Seven Gates. I gave her money and bribed my father's foresters to bring her food. Sometimes I went to see her. His face writhed. Not nearly often enough. Setting the old helm on my head once more, I beheld such suffering as I hope never to see again. She was four days in labor. She could not deliver. A forester had fetched his wife, and when she stopped breathing, Amabel opened her and took out my son. I removed the helm. You're torturing yourself. It's of the past, and not even other kinds can change what's past. They adopted pain for my sake, the forester and his wife. Their names were Hrolfer and Amabel, rough people but good-hearted. Payne was thirteen when my father ascended, and after that I was able to see that he received an education. When His Majesty raised me to office, I made him one of my clerks. I could have given him a farm, but I wanted him by me. I wanted to see him and speak to him daily, to advise him. The old helm fascinated me. When I wore it, our fire was only a fire, but the stars... My wife has borne no child, Sir Abel, and I've had no lover save Williga. You understand why, I feel sure. I've never told Payne I'm his father, but I believe he must have guessed long ago. Reaching Red Hall, we hid in the forest, weaving fruitless plans and hoping for some means of crossing the besiegers' lines and scaling the wall. While the Austerlings built catapults and a siege tower on wheels, Uns wove snares of vines and willow twigs. He caught conies and a hedgehog, and Galeen found berries which were not poisonous, though sour. Without that food we would have starved. The Austerlings were their own provisions. When they had nothing left, they attacked. Those killed or sorely wounded became food for the rest. They used scaling ladders, and it was by these that we hoped to mount the wall. Darkness and rain would favor us, the Earl Marshal said, not for the first time. It seldom rains at this season, but the moon is waning. So's us, Hans remarked dolefully. You can eat me when I die, Galeen declared quite seriously, but I won't die so you can eat me. That decided me. I had given my oath to the Valfather indeed. I would break it, only by a trifle, and take whatever punishment he imposed. I spoke to Sky when none of the rest could hear me. Clouds arrived to blind the moon at my order, 
and Autumn's chill crept south from Jotunland in servitude to me. Here you are, Galeen grasped my arm. We've been looking everywhere. This is the time. Stealthily we left the forest, the Earl Marshal behind me, Galeen behind him, and Uns behind her armed with a stout staff. Rain pierced the blind dark, delighting us. We were nearly close enough to steal a ladder when the gate of Red Hall swung wide and its defenders rushed upon their foes. Three tall women overturned the tower on wheels, sending it crashing down on the huts the Austerlings had built. The ropes of catapults were cut and axes laid to their timbers. A great golden knight, a hero out of legend, led the attackers, fearless and swift as any lion. I shouted, Desiree, as I fought, and saw the moment at which he heard my cry and understood what it portended, and his joy, and how he raged against the Austerlings then. His sword rivaled the lightning, and his shout of, Idden, its thunder. My blade rose and fell, slashed and thrust beside his, and, as in Thor Tower, it seemed to seek, tasting the blood of each who fell, and springing away dissatisfied. I fought in Ervan at first, and afterward before Ervan, for that sword drew me forward, thirsty and seeking, slew contemptuously, and sprang away. There came new thunder a black storm that raged across the field, raining blood. I knew his voice, and called Gilf to me, as tall at the shoulder as any black bull, with eyes that blazed like suns, and fangs like knives. I would have said I was weak with hunger, and that the sea Garseg had waked in me could lend me no strength. It was long coming, but came when a chieftain of the Austerlings barred my path. His armor was savage with spikes, and he wielded a mace of chains with three stars. They outreached my shield as a man reaches over a hedge, and knocked me flat in the mud. I rose as the sea rises, saw him for the horror he was, and I drove the stolen sword into his throat, as old Taug might have dispatched a hog. How many fell after that I cannot say, but the rest fled so that what had begun as a sally ended as victory, the first of Celadon in that war. Dawn came, yet the storm still blew so dark we scarcely knew it. Every knight who reads this will say we ought to have mounted and ridden in pursuit of our foe. We did not. We had few horses, those we had were thin and weak, and we staggered with fatigue. I took off the old helm, for the sweat was pouring down my face, there in the rain and the cold, and by grey light I saw the field of battle, for what it was not, mud and water before the gate of Red Hall, littered everywhere with the leaves and sticks of the fallen huts, with chips and notched timbers, and the pitiful bodies of the slain. And the rain beat upon their faces and the faces of the wounded alike, on men and women who screamed and moaned and tried to rise. Some went among the wounded Austerlings and slew them, but I did not. Instead I looked for the golden knight who had led us. He had dwindled to Svan, Svan with half a shield still on his left arm, and half a swan on it, and a swan on his helm, a swan of gilt wood that had lost a wing in the fight. We embraced, something we had never done before, and he helped me get the Earl Marshal into the manor with Gilf gambling to cheer us by his joy, and wagging his tail. Twenty or thirty people came crowding into the room, drawn by the news that a nobleman of high station had joined them. They hoped, I am sure, that he had brought substantial reinforcements, but they were gracious enough not to grumble when they learned that Gilf, Uns, and I comprised the whole. Some may even have been relieved, for they were on short rations. We made them stand back and be quiet, and finding pain among them let him attend his father. Other wounded were carried in. The many women cared for them, while Svan and I, with others, went out to search the field for more, and collect such loot as the dead might provide. Outdoors again I asked Svan who commanded. You do, Sir Abel, now that you're here. I shook my head. I saw Her Majesty among her guard. My wife will defer to you, I'm sure. This is Redhall, and Redhall is yours. Your duke is not present. 
and you are no subject of ours? I congratulated him on his marriage, and he smiled, weary though he was. It was my hope, my dream, to rise to the nobility. You remember, I'm sure. To return to it, your sire was noble. I thank you, to return. The bitter smile I had come to detest in my squire twisted his lips. I would have been overjoyed to die a baronet. Now I find I am a prince. I congratulated him again, saying, Your Highness. A fighting prince, far from his wife's realm, who finds his experience as a knight invaluable. Do you want to hear our story? I did, of course. Idnes, I knew, had taken a hundred young Skjaldmire with her when she came south. They had astonished King's doom, and had attended the nuptials of their queen. Attestation to her royal status, a status Arnthor had readily recognized, seeing an ally who might restrain Shieldstar. When he had refused to free me, they had fought the Austerlings, the most feared troops in his host, in the hope that he would grant it a boon. The first warm days had shown only too plainly that the dreaded Daughters of Anger could not continue to fight. Idden had marched north with Svan, Manny, and a few others, but was stopped short of the mountains by the Khan's northern army, which had already ravaged Uring's mouth and was scouring the countryside for food to send south. Driven back, they had joined others who fled or fought, taking refuge in manors and castles that the Austerlings had quickly overwhelmed, and so come to Redhall. Of the hundred Skjaldmeyer, twenty-eight remained before our battle, and twenty-seven after it. The unseasonable cold had made it possible for them to fight, and Svan had ordered the sally, but it was certain they would be unable to fight again until the first frost. "'Would you like to meet the leader of those who joined our retreat?' Svan asked. "'He's over there.' He gestured, the rain, warmer now, running from his mail-clad arm. I said, of course, that I would very much like to make his acquaintance. In my own defense, I add here that the day was still dark, and the man Svan had indicated was wearing a cloak with the hood up. Sir Taug, Sir Abel is eager to speak with you, and I'm surprised you're not at least as eager to speak with him. Taug managed to smile at that and gave me his hand. I asked about his shoulder, and he said it had healed. That was not the case, as I soon discovered, but it was better. I said I didn't want to be a knight, and you said I was one, that I couldn't help it, he told me, and we were both right. The Austerlings came, and there was nobody to lead our village who knew fighting except me, so I had to do it. They didn't want me at first, so I led by being in front. We beat off a couple parties, and a free company joined us. Our stock was gone and the barley stamped flat, so we went south. We got to where Atella was, but they'd only started fixing it back up. She's here, and her mother and father too. I asked whether Vil were her father, and Taug nodded. They didn't want to say it, cause they weren't married, Sir Abel, only now they are. He won't let you say my lord, though, he's still Vil. Quite right, Svan muttered. But I'm Sir Taug and Sir Svan's Prince Svan now, he knighted me. I was his squire up north, you did that. I nodded again. So he did, and Atella and I are going to get married next year if we're still alive. Gilf leaped up, putting his forepaws on Taug's chest and licking his face. It amazed and amused me like nothing else. I cannot help laughing when I think of it even now. There's somebody else here I ought to tell you about, Taug said. You always liked them. It's the old couple from Jotunland, the blind man that was a slave on some farm. A thousand things came rushing at me then, the ruin of the land, Arnthor's eyes, the drunken smile of his sister, and the empty, lovely face of his queen. Sunless days in the dungeon, cold that was the breath of death, bold Berthold's hut, wind in the treetops, Desiree's kiss, her long legs and slender arms, the green fingers longer than my hand, Gerda young, as Berthold had remembered her, with flaxen hair and merry eyes, Mag in Theazi's room of lost love. The ladies hall in the flowering meadows whose blossoms are the stars, and oh, ten thousand more, 
and I, who had been laughing only a moment past, wept. Taug clasped me as he would a child, and spoke to me as his mother must have to him. There, there, it don't matter, it don't matter at all. A rider came, the same Lamwell of Chouse, who had plated halberts with me in the tournament, so worn that he could scarcely hold the saddle, on a horse so nearly dead it fell when he dismounted. The king lived, was in the south in need of every man. We held a council, and I said I would go, that the rest might go or stay, but the king who had freed me had need of me, and I would go to him. Pauk and Dunn stood by me, and their wives by them. They must have shamed many. Idden said she could not go, the daughters of anger could not fight in summer, and could scarce march in it. They would have to march by night, and short marches too. She and Svan would go north now that the enemy in this part of Celadon had been beaten, and hope for cooler days in the hills. They had lost three quarters of their number in service to a foreign king, as she reminded us, and overturned the siege tower. We agreed, some of us reluctantly. Afterward I spoke with Idden privately. It was then that she told me of her visit from Uri and her interview with the Valfather. When we had talked over both, I asked a boon. "'You may have any in our power,' Idden said, "'and we'll stay if you ask it, but aside from our husband we shall be of scant service to you.' "'You may be of greatest service to me, Your Majesty, at little cost to yourself. I gave Berthold and Gerda to serve you in the north. Will you return them?' She did most readily. "'And did more with it.' creating pain a baron of her realm, this sworn before witnesses. When it was done, the Earl Marshal declared that if he died, Lord Payne of Jotunholm was heir to his castle and lands, and all he had. I would have left next morning, but could not. There could be little provision in the south. Two days we spent in gathering all we could. There was another matter, too. I hoped Cloud would join me. If she had, I would have left the rest and ridden straight to the king. She did not, though I called every night. She had been the Valfather's last gift, and it seemed to me that she knew I had broken the oath I had given him and was executing his mild justice. After we left Red Hall, I called to her no more. Chapter 37 Five Fates and Three Wishes we had two horses fit for war. Lamwell and I took them, but they did us little good. We could travel no faster than those we led, and must were on foot, though we had a decent palfrey for linnet, and a grey donkey colt scarcely big enough for a child for Atella. The badly wounded we left at Red Hall with pain, also the women who would consent to remain. I wanted bold Berthold's counsel, which was why I had begged him for midden. Gerda would not leave him. It was the same with Ulfa and Galeen. Pauk and Duns were going to war, and they would have followed us at a distance if we would not take them. No more would Linnet stay. I'm of a fighting family, she said, and when I looked into her eyes I felt I was her son and could deny her nothing. Where she went, Vil and Atella must go too. They did, Vil walking beside Linnet with one hand on her stirrup and a staff in the other. We went to Uring's mouth, hoping to take ship, but the town was more ruinous still, and neither gold nor the sword could produce a ship. From there we marched down the coast by rugged roads or none. We were three knights with seven men-at-arms and four archers, mine from Red Hall. We also had fifty-two armed churls, twenty of them outlaws and not to be relied upon. The rest were peasants who scarcely knew how to hold the weapons I had given them. In addition, we had the two blind men and far too many women, some of whom would fight if led. Recalling Idden and her maids, I had given bows to those who showed ability. The rest had staves or spears. Linnet, still mad at times, wore a sword, Atella said, had been her grandfather's, and nobody in Mythgarther brought a swifter blade to battle or a wilder one. I had also Pauk and Duns, although neither was expert. 
both had some knowledge of arms and could be trusted to follow or to stand their ground. Lamwell was my lieutenant, with Taug second to him. Below them, Whiston, who had followed Idden and was not much short of another knight, Pauk and Uns. There was one more with us, one some scarcely counted at all, though others stood in awe of him. It was Gilf, and I, who had seen him killing men like rats, knew he was worth a hundred spears. With us, too, at times, were Elf. Sometimes they brought food, never enough, and at others told us where we might find it or find horses. For hungry though we were, we were hungrier for them. In Oring's mouth we had been able to buy two horses and a mule. We searched for more everywhere, paying for them when we could and fighting for them when we could not. In this we lost a few of our company, as was inevitable, but as we went we gained more, ruined peasants, hungry, but hungrier for leadership and starved for vengeance. I spoke with admiration of their strength and courage, swore we would free Celadon from the Austerlings, and set Huns to teaching them the quarterstaff and pauk the knife. Near Forseti we met the first sizable body of the enemy, I would guess two hundred. Expecting us to run at the sight of the red rag, they were unprepared when we fell on them. No more than a hundred, but fighting, as if we had a thousand behind us. The air was clear, hot, and still, with scarcely a cloud in the wide blue sky, and our bows had grand shooting when they took to their heels. We lost arrows, and arrows were more than gold to us, but we picked up others, and got more bows, too, with swords crooked and straight, spears of two sorts, shields, and other plunder. Duns joined us there. Nukara had been killed by the Osterlings, who had looted and burned their farm. With us, Duns quickly learned that he could no longer boss his younger brother. We fought foraging parties and heard from their wounded what had seemed clear already. The Khan was in the south, opposed by Arnthor. Some said the mountain of fire was still in Arnthor's hands, some that it had been taken, and one that Celadon had retaken it. I asked Uri. She went and confirmed it. She also said that while they held it, the Austerlings had cast children and old people into the crater, theirs and ours, and for them three dragons of Muspel had joined their host. That was hard to credit, since it seemed Arnthor's army could not have stood against the Austerlings and three dragons. Vil suggested that the Khan had made dragons of wicker, which might be displayed on poles to frighten us. Murray insisted she could not have been deceived by such things. King's doom was deserted. We entered Thor Tower, although we had to fill the moat before the great gate, the drawbridge having burned. In the Rook's Tower we found Austerlings barricaded and devouring one of their own number. We smashed their barricade, and Lamwell and I went for them with Whiston Pau guns and cut behind. One said they had been put into Thor Tower by the Khan, a company of his guard, to hold it until he returned. When he had gone, they had been visited almost nightly by an invisible monster. It carried away one, sometimes two, on each visit. Although they had fought it, it had seized their spears and snapped the shafts. I sent the rest away, returned to the dungeon, and called Org. He had grown so huge I could not believe he had entered the Rook's Tower at all. None of its doors had appeared large enough to admit him. By a few words and many gestures he explained that he had climbed the tower and entered where a catapult had broken the wall. "'You may hold this castle for King Arnthor,' I told him. "'If you do, the Austerlings we've slain are yours, with any others who come here. Or you may come with me. There'll be battles to feed you, and it seems likely you can help us.' "'Nor?' "'No south, into the desert. Ruins.' The ort say ruins. I had forgotten that. I said, Yes, it's possible you may find more of your kind there, though I can't promise. I put Uns to his old duty again, and though he did not confide in Duns, he enlisted Galeen to assist him. When we had gone some way south, I saw her floating, as it seemed, over the plain, borne up by a shambling monster more visible to my imagination than to my sight. 
A week passed and another. If I were to write all that happened, this would never end. We fought twice. Beaten by day, we came back at night with a hundred chimerae and forty fire elf. Org took our foe in the rear. A few days later we sighted a column of black smoke on the horizon, and three more brought the snow-clad peak of the mountain of fire. We joined the king's host. He sent for me, and I found him wounded, with Beale attending him. We freed you to fight for us, he said, but you were too weak for it. I agreed. But not too weak to vanish. To vanish and to take Lord Eskin with you. What did you do with him? I saw to it that his wounds were salved and bandaged, I said, and that Lord Payne, his son, remained to attend him. They are at my manor of Red Hall. He has no son. Then it cannot be of Lord Eskin that I speak, Your Majesty, since the man of whom I speak has an unlawful son, who is a baron of Jotunholm. Doubtless I have mistaken another for your Earl Marshal. Arnthor rolled his eyes toward Beale, who said, These matters smack of gossip, interesting but unimportant. You brought reinforcements. Fewer than a hundred. How many? Sixty-seven men able to fight, with twenty-two women to bend the bow. And have they bows to bend? I nodded and added that we needed more arrows. You bent a famous bow in the north. I have told His Majesty about that. Your shooting in the tourney, though good, disappointed him. It disappointed me as well, I told them. Why don't we hold another here? Perhaps I can do better. Arnthor said, This is madness. I agree, Your Majesty, but it wasn't me who began this talk of tournaments. If you want me to command your forces, I'll take charge and do what I can. If you want me to fight as one of many knights, I'll do what I can still. We command Celadon. Do you think us unable to rise from this bed? I wish you stronger than that, Your Majesty. We will be strong enough to stand when the time comes, to stand and to sit a charger. We would make you our deputy if we could, Sir Abel. I bowed. Your Majesty does me too much honor. His smile was bitter. As you say, you're not to be trusted. We know it. You are a veil for us, however you may look and whatever you may say. So are we, and no our own kind. I believe he would have laughed as the elf laugh, but his wound would not permit it. I was born in Aelfris, my royal sister too. Do you know the story? I nodded. Your royal brother told me something of it, Your Majesty. He is dead. We have tried to call on him for aid, but he is no more. Did you kill him, Sir Abel? No, Your Majesty. Would you tell us the truth, Sir Abel, if you had? Yes, Your Majesty. The bitter smile came again. Would he, my lord, be you? I believe so, Your Majesty. Arnthor's eyes closed. I pray to Sky that the man who killed him join us and quickly. We may have need of him. I said, The Overkinds have smiled on Your Majesty. His eyes opened. He is with you? Beal said, The blind man? My son-in-law told me. I nodded. Cedar was our brother, Arnthor's voice was a whisper. We used, it does not matter now, nor will we avenge our brother upon a man who cannot see. I knelt. I speak for the Valfather and his sons, Your Majesty, having knowledge of both. It's well to triumph over foes, but it's better to deserve to triumph over them. No more than any other man can I predict whether you'll win the day. But today you've done more. Thank you. The king shut his eyes as before, then opened them wider. This man is blind, you say. We are not. Do we not know your helm? I held it out. It is your majesty's if you want it. We do not. We say only this. You are not to wear it in our presence. I swore I would not. We must hoard our strength. Tell him, Beale. He cleared his throat. I'll be brief. Duke Koth was second to his majesty until two days passed. With his death, the position falls on your liege. I've counseled his majesty to summon him and urge that he be guided by your advice. 
There would be no mention of you in the formal announcement, you understand. Would that be agreeable? I said it would, and so it was done. Martyr giving his sword to Arnthor, he, sitting in a chair draped with crimson velvet and made to serve as a throne, and receiving it back from him, this witnessed by such peers as remained. When we were alone, I asked Martyr the state of our troops, although I had seen something of it already, and little that had been good. He shrugged. You drove the Austerlings from Burning Mountain? We did. With great loss to ourselves, we fought on foot. It was like storming ten castles. If the king had taken my advice, we wouldn't have fought at all. I waited. We are crushed between millstones, Sir Abel. Our men have no food, so we must fight while they can still stand. That's one stone. The other is that we're beaten. If you'd seen us at five fates... He shrugged again. He looked old and tired. His beard was always white, but his face was tired and drawn now. When I had waited for him to say more and he had not, I asked, Is our hurry so great you can't tell me about it? I was in Jotunland. Where I had sent you. I used all my influence with the king to extricate you from his dungeon. He was immovable. The king himself extricated me. Why is the battle called Five Fates? Is it a place? Martyr shook his head. It's a tale for children. Well, suited to me in that case. As you wish. The old Khan, the present Khan's father, had no lawful issue. Bastard sons, in which he differed from our king. But no lawful sons or daughters, for his queen was barren. It became apparent to his advisers that when he died his bastards would rend his realm into twenty. I suppose I smiled. Would it had been so? He summoned a famous sorcerer and gave him a chest of gold. Perhaps he threatened him as well, a count stiffer. The sorcerer assured him the queen would bear him boys and went his way. She conceived, grew big, and dying bore not one son or two or even three. Five? I suppose I looked incredulous. Martyr shook his head. Six. In all my life I've never heard of a woman bearing six children together, yet six there were like as peas. There was no question of succession, because the midwives had marked them in order of birth, tying a red ribbon around the ankle of the first, a brown ribbon on the ankle of the second, a white ribbon on the third, a gilt ribbon on the fourth, a blue ribbon on the fifth, and a black ribbon on the sixth and last. Ribbons of the first three colors had been provided for the purpose by the wazir, the rest they tore from their raiment. And this is true? I asked. It is indeed. Our king has many ways of learning what transpires in Osterland, and all reported it. Besides, the young Tijanomirs were clothed in those colors so they might be known in their order, and so they would know their places. The eldest was called the Red Tijanomir, and so on. And the five fates? Were the fates of five Tijanomirs. As you may imagine, the appearance of six heirs in one birth occasion to comment. Seers were consulted, and one prophecy was repeated all over the realm, though the Khan forbade it. The seer had been asked, perhaps by the wazir, which would reign, and if his reign would be long. He rent the veil and foretold that all would reign, and all would die young. I said, that's very good news, if it can be credited. Martyr lifted his shoulders and let them fall. Do you wish to hear the rest? If it bears on the battle... It does, upon the name we give it, if nothing else. This seer went on to foretell how each would die. The red Tijanomir, he said, would be crushed by a stone. The brown would be trodden into the mire. The white would die at the hands of his followers. The golden was to perish in a gold fortress. The blue was to drown. And the black Tijanomir was to be run through and through with the sword the Khan wore the day the prophecy was made. What troubles you? I waved my hand and begged him to proceed. As you like. This prophecy came to be known as that of six fates, the seer having foreseen the fates of all six. The red Tijanomir succeeded his father when we killed him. 
You were in the north, but I took part in that campaign and Sir Wadet won great renown. I want to see him. How did the Tejanomirs die? As the soothsayer had foretold in every case, the Red Khan, who had been the Red Tejanomir, had removed his helm to wipe his brow. A sling stone struck and killed him, the first fate. The new Khan, the brown Tejanomir, was trampled under the hooves of our chargers, that was the second. The white Tejanomir became Khan upon his brother's death. Not an hour later a lance pierced him through. Sure to die, he tried to end his life, but found himself too weak. He begged his friends to kill him, which they did. Thus the third fate. I see. The fourth was the golden Tejanomir, as you may recall. He wore a golden helm, just as his brother's helms were red, brown, white, blue, and black. Sir Wadet's point entered the eye socket and the Golden Khan died in that fortress of gold. I rewarded Sir Wadet richly for the thrust, as you may have heard. The king rewarded him more richly still. I said, I take it the blue to Janamir drowned. Martyr nodded. The dagger of a man-at-arms pierced his lungs, so that he drowned in his own blood, the fifth fate. The sixth to Janamir, whose color was black as the present Khan, this is because the old Khan, hearing of the prophecy, gave the sword he had worn that day into his son's keeping. We are told it is locked away in a sealed vault. It appears that as long as it remains there, the black Khan is safe. I had my own thoughts, but I nodded to that. It seems the seer erred. He said all their reigns would be short. Seers err frequently, Martyr said, but suppose we defeat the Osterlings in a month or two. Might we not take their capital, open the vault, and retrieve the sword? We might, I said, if it's still there. My inspection of our troops convinced me that winning was out of the question. Our only hope was to march north, get as many more men as we could, and collect all the food we could find. If there had been any chance of terms and decent treatment— I would have told Martyr and Onthor to surrender. There was none, and although giving up Burning Mountain, won at such a high cost, shattered what little morale remained, we left it. In the time that followed, there were days when I wished I were back in my cell. We marched north. The Black Khan, who must have known what we were doing very quickly, moved to prevent us and make us fight. We backed down the coast again instead, spearing fish in the shallows and scrounging mussels and clams. When our horses died, and more and more did, they were eaten at once. I took the rear guard and had Wadet with me and Rober, Lamwell, and others. There was scarcely a day in which we found no work to do, for the Khan's skirmishers were swift, and being eager to drive us from our dead attacked boldly again and again. Like ours, their archers were hard-pressed to find or make arrows, but they had slingers in plenty, and there were stones enough to kill everyone in Mythgarther twice over. A shower of stones, a few javelins, and a charge. It was a pattern we soon came to know well. Broad shields were needed to ward off the stones. Even our lightly armed soon had them, woven of palm fronds, when there was nothing else. We knights formed the first line and took the brunt of every charge, sometimes slinging our shields so as to wield our lances with both hands, more often with shield and sword, fighting morning and night when we were light-headed with hunger. Gilf saved us, finding game where we would have found none, and killing it or driving it to us. Martyr told me when the army took six hellish days to bridge the green flood, that our rear guard looked better than the rest. I went to see the rest, and he was right. We had marched north of Burning Mountain before the Khan halted us. That night, how well I remember this, we saw its sullen glow again, light the color of old blood staining the sky. A page came for me, a frightened boy, but before I tell about that I must say that Gilf, who had fought like five score men and found food where there was none, had saved me in good earnest that day. I had fallen and would have died had he not raged over me, 
killing every Austerling who came near. Martyr heard of it and asked to speak with me. That is why I went back and Gilf with me, to see the starved faces and empty eyes of a thousand men who had been strong. Sir Abel? I had not known there were boys with Arnthor's army, save for his squires who were nearly men, but he was a lad of ten. I was wearing the old helm, having no other, though I had little wish to see the truth it revealed. Thus I may have seen his dread plainer than he showed it. Her Highness must speak with you, Sir Abel. I was angry at the condition of the men I had seen, and happy to have a target for my anger. Morcane has spoken to me before, I told him. I say to you what I said to her. She left me to rot in a dungeon from which the brother she fears so much freed me. My loyalty is to him, not her. If she wants my friendship, let her earn it. He left, but soon returned, more frightened than ever. Her Highness says you don't understand, that she doesn't want to talk to you herself. She has company. His voice had failed. He seemed to strangle, then tried again. She does, too, Sir Abel. Something. Somebody. His teeth had begun to chatter. While he struggled to control them, I said, The Queen? N no, no, sir. The King in that case. Why didn't she say so? The poor boy shook his head violently. All right, the Black Con. He collapsed in tears. I've got to bring you. She, she'll kill me this time. You will bring me, I told him. Come on, I'm tired and want to get this over. The Morcane who greeted Gilf and me was a woman to the hem of her skirt, and a snake below it, the great trailing serpent body prettily marked with runes of degeneration and destruction. Suppose you were king, she said. I told her she was speaking treason. Not at all. Someone very important is waiting to see you, she gestured toward the rear of her pavilion, where a black curtain fluttered and billowed. Still, we may have a minute to ourselves. My brother is sorely wounded. He is determined to take part in the next battle. He knows what happens to kings who don't fight. No one would regret his death more than I, but suppose he dies. Who rules? I said, Queen Gaynor, I imagine, though I knew better. With you as her sword? I shook my head. I don't blame you. She thrust you into that dungeon and left you to rot, you her champion. Nor is she of the royal line. Perhaps she betrays my brother, perhaps she doesn't. Guilty or not, my brother thinks her false and has told your liege and others. They might accept her in peace. Not now, not here. Not three lords would stand by her. You, then, I said. Better because I'm royal, bad still. I'm no warrior, and none of them trust me. Duke Martyr? He would have my sword. An old man without a son. Her laugh was weak and shaky. When I heard it, I knew something had scared her sober. Who leads this army? Who issues its orders? I said nothing. You would relish revenge. I could not speak, but I shook my head. How could you avenge yourself better than by marrying me? You could rape me twice a night or thrice. You look capable of it. You could have a dozen mistresses and throw them in my face. You could thrash me with the poker and all Celadon would call me disloyal if I said a word against you. She brought my hand to her cheek. How strong you are! How can you gain revenge if you don't marry me? Think about that. You can have Gaynor's head on a pike. I'm royal, but I'll be on the other side of the bed in easy reach. No, I drew my hand away. Listen, we haven't much time. My brother will be dead in a month. No one will want Gaynor. Many will cleave to me for my father's sake. More will want you. Wise men like his grace will fear a new war, pitting brother against brother till the Austerlings conquer both. Calling those who favor us together, we'll declare our intention to wed. She paused, unable to see my face, within the old helm, but watching my eyes. Suddenly she smiled. Curtain! It's what the jugglers say. Are you afraid to go in there? I shook my head. You should be. She tried to laugh again. I would be, and I brought him. Think over what I've said, beloved. If 
you come out sane. Perhaps I nodded or spoke, if so, I do not recall it. She or I or he pushed the curtain aside. I cannot describe the empty inferno there. There are no words. Take that off, he told me, and I could no more have disobeyed than I could have picked myself up by my belt. The old helm gone, I recognized him at once, strong, sharp-featured as any fox, and crowned with fire, not the floating hair of the fire-elf which only suggests flames, but real fire, red, yellow, and blue, snapping and crackling. You know me, he said, and I know you. You called me the youngest and worst of my father's sons not long ago, and insulted my wife. I meant no insult. I said, would I insult two people I fear so much? You boast of fearing nothing, he frowned at Gilf. You've stolen one of my father's dogs, he won't like that. No, Gilf said shortly, he knows. Then I don't like it, he smiled. But I'll overlook it, you need me, I don't need you, not at all, except for fun. You know I have a kind heart. I managed to say, I know you say you do. I'm a liar, of course. I take after both parents in that, not lying. I never lie. I offer help, for fun, because it amuses me. Still, my offer is real. I only struggled to master my fear. You people complain of us, the same things the elf say about you. We pay no attention. We don't care whether you live or die. What's the use of becoming a druid? Why pray when nobody listens? All right, here I am. Do you deny I'm an overkind? Gilf spoke for me. No, you are. Correct, nor am I the least of us. Will I hear your prayer standing here before you? I couldn't miss it if I put my fingers in my ears. Kneel. I knelt, and Gilf lay down beside me. Excellent. If I told you to touch your nose to the carpet so I could put my foot on your head, would you do it? Yes, I said. I'd have to. Then we'll dispense with it. Pray. Great Prince of Light, I began. Prince of Fire. Never mind, we don't need that. Let's just say I'll grant three wishes. I know what they're going to be, but you have to say them. What do you want? Not two and not four. Food. Enough for everyone till we fight. That's right. What else? More men. Too vague. One man, two. Ten thousand. He laughed. A terrible sound. I can't do it, and you couldn't manage them. Five hundred, that's my best offer. Then I accept it. I had recovered some part of my self-possession. And thank you most sincerely. You'll have to do more than that. The third? Cloud. Your father gave her to me, but I lost her when the queen imprisoned me. I think she's been looking for me, and I've been looking for her. You've changed, both of you, he told me. You met the most low god. Yes, I said. He grants wishes, too, but he grants them in such a way that you wish he hadn't. I never stoop to that. I said I was glad to hear it. However, you may feel that I stooped to something of the sort after I catch cloud for you. Send her away if you do. She won't cling like a curse, believe me. Still, she costs a wish. Do you want her? Yes, I said. All right, when do you want the men? Now. I can't do it. I'm going to need time to work. As soon as possible, then. Fair enough, you may stand. I rose. He had been no taller than I when I knelt, but he had grown by the time I rose— so tall that I was afraid his crown would ignite the roof of the pavilion. Payment will be simple and easy but fun. What's more, you've already done it, as we both know. Break the promise you made my father, again. I could not speak. It's letting you off far too cheaply, isn't that what you're about to say? I'll like it just the same. He trusts you, and I enjoy salting his silly dreams with reality now and then. Will you do it? Looking up at him, for he seemed farther above me now than he had when I was on my knees, I could not help but see how handsome he was and how shifty. "'I'll do it,' I said. "'But you must give me the things I've asked for first. "'What?' It was feigned anger. 
Don't you trust me? I won't argue. Do as I say or do your worst. Which would kill you and every friend you have. I scratched Gilf's ears. Do you think my father wouldn't forgive me for killing a dog? He's forgiven me far worse. Gilf licked my fingers. He'd die for you, of course he would. Would Desiree? Would you want her to? I turned to go. Wait! I won't haggle, and I want to make that clear. Here's what I'll do. I'll get you the food and the men, half a thousand tough fighting men as soon as can. Let's say it takes, he stroked his chin, ten days. When you've got them, you'll have two of your wishes. Agreed? I nodded. At that point you must break your word to my father, not just some technicality. Three times and big and showy. I said, suppose three times isn't enough. The truth, Ben, is that I had already decided before I went into that pavilion. If I could have pulled bread out of the air, I would have already. I could not. There were a lot of things I could not do, raising the dead and so on, but there were things I could do, and I had settled on them, although without Lothar, I might have changed my mind. Did he know it? Shape my payment as he did, because he did? It is possible he did, but I do not believe it. He is as clever and cruel as a den of foxes, and knows more tricks than a score of vills. But his father sees far, and very deep. Chapter 38 Dragon Soldiers Had the queen summoned me that night as well, I would not have been surprised. I knew she was Morcane's ally and that one might sift a thousand foolish women without finding even one fool enough to trust Marcaine. The queen would want my account of what had transpired that night as well as hers. I was surprised, just the same, for the queen came to me, crouching beside me as I slept, while Lamwell stood guard. She touched my shoulder. I sat up and saw him, a small figure with a great crest of white plumes and a drawn sword. Here, Sir Abel. It was as though a dove had spoken. I turned. Her robe was dark, but her golden hair glowed in the moonlight, and her pale face shone. "'You've plighted your troth to my sister-in-law,' she said. "'That is well. She has remained too long. What are you doing that for?' I had picked up the old helm and was putting it on. "'I may need to protect you from the king's men, if not from the Austerlings.' The moonlit woman shrank, her fair face younger still. We're both kids, Your Majesty, and us kids have to stick together, or the wolves will tear us apart. You must hate me. She said you did. How could I hate you when the king loves you? Prettily spoken. May I pet your dog? I could not match you in wit, Your Majesty, nor would it be fitting for me to try. She laughed softly, a delightful sound after Marcaine's laughter and Lothar's. I didn't think you'd understand that. There's more to you than meets the eye, Sir Abel. Bless your majesty. Won't you take it off, so I can see your face? Sir Lamwell's my friend, your majesty, and I've seldom known a truer knight. But if you were to order him to kill me, he would, or would try. But I won't. You can't know that, your majesty, and I surely can't. My husband knows more of sorcery than his sister, Sir Abel. Gaynor's coup, soft already, had grown softer still. I told her I was aware of it. Few are. People don't like the idea of a sorceress ruler. She shows it, shows off, and draws their displeasure. He keeps his hidden. If you really know all this, you ought to know I don't have any such power, none at all. Do you? Yes, Your Majesty. You don't know what it's been like for me. Her hand found mine and squeezed it. Husbands are... are bad enough without that. His rages are terrible, and he could spy on me any time he wanted. I was a queen. I am. A queen in a glass castle. I ran a terrible risk for you when I let you confer with Queen Idden and Lord Eskin. Do you understand that? Do you know how great a chance I took? The jailers knew and all those people, but I had to let them see there was nothing between us. Not then. She squeezed my hand again. Hers was small and so white it shone in the moonlight. You didn't take it long, Your Majesty. No, 
No, I didn't. I couldn't. You went out on your own, and you were caught. They'd tell him when he came back. They were bound to, and I couldn't stop them. Sometimes he spies, and sometimes he doesn't, but— I said, suppose he sees us now. He won't. I spoke to him before I came to see you. He— he won't. He's seen the future, Sir Abel. And he dies. We all do. Before the new moon. He kills the Khan and the Khan kills him. Can that happen? I nodded. I'll be a widow. Your queen and the first of a new dynasty. I'll need a minister, a strong man who can keep order. I'll rule wisely and well, but only if they let me rule, and you. Can you be gentle as well as strong? I've never had anyone gentle. Never had anyone but him. You know what I was tempted to say, Ben. I did not say it, merely saying that her husband was not dead yet and I needed time to consider. If I had refused, she would have told Lamwell to kill me, and I would have had to kill him. I liked him, and we could not spare a single night. Ten days, Lothar had said. Knowing they could not be hastened, I did not try to hurry our march south. We had to collect all the food we could along the way, and I had to plan the actions that would violate the oath I would break. We met them on a cliff-side road overlooking the sea, stranger warriors than I had ever seen, dark, hard-faced men with little eyes. Their armor made them look like bugs, and their shaggy ponies like peasants. They challenged us, and I found that although I understood their speech, no one else did. There were three hundred, perhaps, with a baggage train so long that it wound away down the coast. Whiston and I advanced under a flag of truce. Their prince wore gold armor. His was hardest hand I ever clasped, and he the only man I have known who smiled all the time. When we met, I thought he simply wanted to assure us we would be well treated if we yielded. Later I learned that his men called him He Who Smiles. Whiston and I settled for Smiler. He was accompanied by three ministers, middle-aged men of his own race. One carried a horned staff, one a whip, and one a sword with a blade of dragon shape. He would choose one or another of these ministers and whisper to him. The minister would confer with the other two and speak to me. It became tedious. I will abbreviate it as much as I can. You are to surrender to us, this was the minister with the sword. Give me your weapons. Whiston tugged my sleeve. Why does he talk like that? I said, because he thinks we might, I guess. Might what? What did he say? We won't surrender, I told the minister. If you'll share your food with us, we'll be your friends and lead you to a great victory. If you won't, we'll take it. The prince continued to smile, gesturing to the minister with the whip. The son of the dragon fears you misapprehend this matter. He is sworn to conquer or die. With him we are all sworn to conquer or die. We conquer or die. Then you'll die, I said. Still smiling, the prince spoke with his third minister, the one with the forked staff. You are a barbarian, this minister told me. His tone was fatherly. You do not know us nor the customs of civilized men. Do you wish to? I said I certainly did. That said, you are no longer a barbarian. We are the children of the dragon, Sir Abel, for most by adoption, for the son of the dragon by blood. The blood of the dragon is his father. He fell silent, standing with head bowed. At length he said, His sons are sons of the dragon. Dragon blood fills him each time he engenders sons in his wives. I told him I understood. Each would rule. Is he not, son of the dragon? Whiston was tugging my sleeve again. I told him to stop. A son may bow to his brother and be cut. He remains. If no, they fight with magic. Our prince chose to fight. Thinking of Arnthor and his sister, I said, We have a lot of magic. If he contends with us, he will lose again. The minister tittered. No, no, he won. The winner leaves home thrown to his brother. Do you not understand? I confessed I did not. It is his glory to extend the realm of the dragon. 
He is permitted five hundred warriors. It is honor to go. The talking table is consulted. Always the talking table says, go north, go west, or go south. This is traditional. To east there is much water. The minister with the forked staff retired, and the minister with the whip came forward. Yours is the land of the east. Obey the son of the dragon and prosper. Disobey, he tapped his own hand with his coiled whip. You are in our country, I told him, though we were well south of Celadon. You must obey our king. He is King Arnthor, a good and wise ruler. I speak for him now. The minister who bore the sword came forward once more. Will we fight here on this narrow road? Yes, I said. Will you fight me now? I knew I would have my point in him before he could poise his big blade. He shook his head. Our champions will fight in such a place it must be so, his voice fell. My son, you do not know our law. Let me make it plain. When one fights one, three victories are sufficient. Is this clear to you? I admitted it was not. The first two fight, we win. That is a victory, I nodded. The first of our champions fights your next. That also is a victory. It is two. I nodded as before. The first of our champions fights your third. That is another. It is three. You must accept the beneficent rule of the son of the dragon. I said, we will not. If you do not, every man will be put to the sword. When we left, I explained to Whiston, who looked very serious. Our fights are able, but I'm not a champion. I laughed and slapped his back. I was our first, though I had great difficulty securing the position. Arnthor wanted to negotiate further, and sent Beale with me to interpret. We learned more about the dragon soldiers and their prince, but quickly discovered there was no hope of making them allies, as our instructions required. Neither would they share their food with us, although they boasted of its quantity, or even sell to us. By Martyr's influence and my own, Wadit was our second champion. Kai was the third. We did not think we would need more than three. As for me, I was determined that neither Wadit nor Kai would have work that afternoon. They looked imposing, and that was enough. Wiston and I made nothing like so good a show, although I learned afterward that the son of the dragon had been impressed by the gold rings in my mail, and by my speaking the tongue of his nation. The Niker King of Arms went with us to see fair play, the minister with the sword serving a like function on the other side. He objected to Whiston. We explained that he was there only to bear my lance with my pennant, to carry my helm and shield, to help me from the field if I were wounded, or to guard my corpse. It was agreed that he would retire one hundred paces before I engaged. Each of us retreated ten paces. The Niker King of Arms raised the staff with which he would strike the roadway, and the minister with the sword lowered the sword he would raise. I could not see our pursuivant up on the cliff, but no doubt he raised his trumpet. At that moment Gilf howled. I had been obliged to chain him, for he had sworn that he would not stand by and see me killed. But he knew the battle was about to be joined, or so it seemed. His was the howl of no common dog, and I saw its effect on my opponent. No sooner had I put on the old helm than I saw more. I saw that for all his fanciful armor and flat face my opponent was a bold knight who would add real force to our charge when we faced the Austerlings, force that would be forever lost if I killed him. I took my lance from Whiston. My opponent, Iron Mouth, cut through it at once. I have seldom seen so good a blade. I knocked that blade from his hand with the butt of my lance, tripped him, and almost pinned him. In a moment more he had nearly pinned me, for he was a fine wrestler. As we struggled I caught sight of Lothar's inferno upon the cliff. We parted, rushed at each other, and Iron Mouth, by an unexpected slight, threw me down not a hand's breadth from a sheer drop. I regained my feet, but not quickly enough. I snatched air, caught thick, coarse, white stuff, I knew not what, and clung to it for dear life. 
A great thought, kind and warm and wonderful, filled my mind, crowding out the fear, and the thought was this. Can you not run on this as Gilf and I do? And I could have. It would have been a violation of the oath, but I intended to violate it. I did not do it then, but climbed on Cloud's back, a back no longer gray. It was spangled with ice crystals as well, for she had been far above the clouds a moment before. We are born dark, she explained. We reach our true color with age. I am nearly grown now. Like a cloud, she rose into the sky, carrying me with her. The Khan had elephants. They were nothing before her. We talked. I told her of all that had befallen me since we parted, and she told me of strange adventures in the east, of her return to sky, of what she had told the lady there, for the lady had stabled her, and what the lady had taught her. Below, the sea-blue flag of Celadon snapped in the breeze, flaunting its nicker to the dragon that was Celadon's new foe, a dragon of red and black on a wheaten field. Wadid came forth to fight and fell, and Hela bore him away. Lothar has promised us the victory, I told Cloud, so we must prevail. Given a mount and a stout lance, I would have matched Kai against a hundred. With the sword he was no match for Ironmouth. He fell and I watched him die. After which the dragon soldiers raised a great cheer, bellowing and beating their shields, and I saw the minister who bore the sword and the Niker king of arms come together, and the latter bow his head. Neither could have understood the other, but they had little need to as Cloud and I galloped down the sky. With one hand I held her mane, with the other I caught Smiler and pulled him onto her back. We're going to Sky, I told him, where time runs fast. We'll find Lothar, or if not Lothar, Angerboda, and confront her together. It did not prove necessary, for Lothar found us. As I have said, we had crossed the Green Flood on our march south. When we turned back north, we knew we must encounter it again. We had burned the bridge we built, a bridge that could not have stood another week in any event. More significantly, we had swept the sea lands of food, buying or pillaging all its fishing villages had. The minister who bore the sword, Stonebowl was his name, told us his men had found more inland. They had captured five towns, all well stocked, and had taken the coast road only after gaining food enough to carry them to next spring. Beale agreed, pointing out that Osterland's raiders frequently harried the coast, sailing as far north as Uring's mouth or farther. This stretch would see them often. Knowing that the Green Flood would be nearer its source, and unwilling to deplete our allies' stores more than we had to, we turned east as soon as we came upon a passable road, and engaged local people to guide us. Some were reliable, others less so. Too often we found ourselves marching south or southeast when we would have preferred to turn north. Before long we gained a reinforcement of one knight and six men-at-arms, and though it was so small it cheered me, for it was the night of the leopards. Sandhill had held off the Austerlings, who had failed to carry it by storm and been forced to lift a siege by thirst. Shepherds, whose flocks we had bought, had reported that the king was in the south, two days' ride below the river, and the knight of the leopards had gotten his father's permission to join us with a few men. Now I know we'll win, I told him. There's a tide in war not even over kinds can turn aside. It's making... I feel it in my blood. He was looking up at Cloud. If that grand beast obeys you, I do not matter. Nothing could stand against it. Don't you recognize her? I said. She's Cloud, the mount I rode in Jotunland. That's no horse. Why, no, she never was a horse. I doubt I ever said she was, but if I did, I lied. Wiston could keep silent no longer. We can ride her through the air. You can't know how wonderful it is, Sir Leort. She carried the son of the dragon because Sir Abel had taken him prisoner, but she didn't like it. He couldn't ride her alone like we do. Leort wanted to know who the son of the dragon was, and I explained. He's going to carve out a kingdom for himself here in the south? He'll have a hard time of it. Of course he will, I said. 
but he'll have help from Celadon. His majesty has sworn it. A strong friend down here would be the Volfather's hand. I said nothing about Arnthor's prophecy, although I could not help thinking of it, and salved my conscience by telling myself I knew nothing beyond Gaynor's report. It might be a false prophecy or an ambiguous one, for many prophecies are. It was even possible, almost probable, that there had been none. A matter you will readily guess troubled me much more. Lothar had promised allies and food on my own promise to break my oath. Cloud was to be returned to me when I had fulfilled my part of the bargain. By his generosity she had been sent ahead of time. We had received the reinforcements he had promised, and I could not complain of their quality. We had food for a season, and every prospect of gaining more in Celadon when we overcame the Black Khan. All that, and I still had not fulfilled my promise. Nor did I want to. The Valfather is the kindest and wisest ruler, and the bravest. His son Thunor is the model for warriors, as is often said. A hundred times more is the Valfather the model for kings. In that time, when I thought about him often, it came to me with a shock that he was the model for fathers, too. I had told myself I never had a father, far less than you, Ben. It was not true. He had been my father, and he had known it when I had not. I would betray him, and my honor would be forfeit. Or, if I did not, my honor would be forfeit still. Lothar is the model for thieves and murderers. He would kill us, or help the Khan do it. And all I hoped to do with the power Sky had given me would never happen. Wiston and I rode on Cloud's broad back well ahead of the advance guard. Our leisurely pace was compelled by our baggage train, and by our army too, men worn out who regained their strength through easy marches and whole days of rest. Arnthor was gaining strength as well, though his wound had been almost fatal. Once, when I was with him, someone complained of the rigors of the campaign, calling it, with some justice, the worst ever fought. Ah, said Beale, you ought to have been with Sir Abel and me in Jotunland, where our sharp-eyed bowmen were my daughter's maids, and my cook rode among my men-at-arms with a slaughtering knife. Marjorie laughed. Well said. Just don't forget that I was there before it ended, and at the forest fight. So swiftly that it came and went like the shadow of a bat, Arnthor frowned as if he might kill him. I did not understand that look and was disturbed by it. Arnthor seldom showed his dragon side, but I had seen it plainly then. What more I might have seen, had I been wearing the old helm, I can only imagine. And I am glad I was not. I sought out Wadded among the wounded that evening, telling him what had transpired and asking whether he had been at the second battle Martyr mentioned. I was, he said, and we had a bad time of it. We had gone into the wood, run there, when it seemed certain the Austerlings would crush us all. There were so many trees you couldn't swing a sword. I had never used a mace since. Never mind. I used it again, and dropped it wrestling two fellows Heimer brained for me. We had no time to look for it, and I used a sax after that. I'd not thought it more than a camp knife until that day, but I learned what it could do. I'd hold it low and rush them with my shield up. Some had male shirts, but their legs were bare. I'd put it through the thigh and cut my way out, and go to the next. I asked whether we had gained the victory, and he said we had to retreat, but we had captured their camp and burned it. The Black Khan thought to crush us and win the war, he said, but he slept on the ground that night. Atella came. Linnet was talking strangely. Atella felt I could help, so I went with her. Wiston, who had told her where she might find me, came with us. Bold Berthold was seated at Linnet's feet, with Gerda not far away. Taug stood behind her watching. As we came up, Linnet said, Your father was a fine, strong man, not tall, though he seemed tall. There must have been a hundred times when I saw him standing with another man and noticed, the way you noticed suddenly what you ought to have seen long before, that he was no taller than the other. But if you listened to them, you understood that he was much bigger. It was something you couldn't see, but it was there. 
The other man looked up to him, and when he did, he was looking high. All the men looked up to him, and all the women envied me. Do you remember Daddy's name, Berthold? I won't blame you if you've forgotten after all these years, not one bit. Black Berthold, Berthold said. That's right, his name was Berthold, and he was a fine, strong man, the strongest in our village. Once I saw him wrestle a bull. The bull threw him twice, but he jumped up each time before it could gore him. He threw it and held it down. It struggled like a puppy, but he wouldn't let it get its legs under it again. It frightened me so much I made him promise never to do it again, and he never did. I never knew him to break a promise to anybody. Atella said, I've brought Sir Abel, Mama. Linnet looked up at me and smiled. Good evening, Sir Abel. I had a son of that name once. You aren't my son, I know, but I'd like to think of you as a son. May I? I had not noticed Vil until then, because he was farther from the fire than any of the others, but he stepped forward when she said that. Blindness had let him forget to control his expression, and it was a look of mingled hope and fear such as I have seldom seen. I sensed what he wanted me to say, I believe, and said it gladly. I'd be proud to be called your son, Lady Linnet, and proud to call you mother. My name's Mag, she smiled. But you may call me mother or anything you like, Abel. You've always been my boy because I loved the boy you were before I met you. I sat at her feet beside Bold Berthold. Something's troubling me, mother. Perhaps you can explain it. Do you recall the room of lost love? She shook her head. I've never heard of such a place. What about the Isle of Glass? Ah, she said. You recall it. I looked up at her. Do you remember how I came there, how we met, and what you told me? Her smile saddened. My son Abel came to me in that beautiful, terrible place, Sir Abel, not you. I was chained there, and though I would willingly, oh, very willingly, have come away with him, I could not. Although I often have strange dreams, I have tried not to pester you over much with them, Ben. Here I am going to make an exception, not because the dream in question seems specially significant, but merely because I remember it so vividly. Go to the next section if you are impatient. I was in the forest fight with Wadet and the others. Either I had no sword or I could not use it. Perhaps I had a dagger or sword breaker. I cannot be sure. There were green bushes and spindly trees all around me. I struggled to push through, afraid that the king would leave me behind. Frantically I threw myself forward, striking the saplings that obstructed every step and making leaves fly. As I went farther, I realized that I was not on the ground, nor was I obstructed by brush. I was in the treetops, fifty feet up. If the twigs and small limbs that held me back had not been so thick, if they had not been almost impenetrable, I would have fallen. No sooner had I understood this than I reached the edge, standing high in a great tree and looking out across the open countryside. A pavilion of black silk had been pitched in a meadow. I knew that Eterni was in there. I also knew Eterni was my true sword. I bore no sword until I had her, and should have borne none until I got her back. I had taken another sword, and could never be shriven of that guilt. Beyond the black pavilion was a highway. Cars, trucks, SUVs, and minivans, all sorts of vehicles, were traveling on it, going so fast that it seemed certain they would crash. There was a school bus, a red hook and ladder, a black and white police car, and a white ambulance. Those stand out even now. The ambulance rocked from side to side as it tore along with its light bar blazing and its siren screaming. I climbed down and went to the highway. The drivers would not stop for me, and I shouted at their cars, thinking how far the ambulance was getting ahead of me. Abel, the real Abel, was in that ambulance. I knew that, and I wanted to help him. I woke up. Baki? Someone was stroking me. Guess again. I thought it a better dream than my dream of the treetop and the crowded highway. My dream of the forest fight. Chapter 39 It Thirsts 
From time to time, Whiston and I met others on the road, often people fleeing the Austerlings. We spoke kindly to them, and though the news of the enemy they had was far from dependable, we heard them gladly. That morning it was a fine young man, lean and dark, who fell to his knees. Sir, sir, can you spare a scrap of food? It's been two days and three nights. Cloud crouched, and I dismounted. Tell me something of value, and you'll get a good meal. Are you from Celadon? Reluctantly, he said, This is my country, here. Then your countrymen should feed you. Can't you work? He stood abashed. I'm a herdsman, only, only— The dry brush stirred, and I knew we were watched. Only I never saw an animal like that, sir. Nor will you ever see another. Weston pointed. How'd you get that scar? A arrow. Sometimes people steal our cattle or try. I said— you yourself never crossed the river into Celadon to steal cattle, I'm sure. Would you kill me for it, now? I shook my head. My children, sir, and my wife. They haven't had a thing to eat. Not today and not yesterday, neither. If you'll give something, sir, anything we can eat, and tell us what cattle's yours, I'd never bother one head of yours never again. He looked up at me hopefully. Who has your herd? Them from across the mountains. I won't never touch an animal of yours, nor fight your herders. By wind and grass. If I give you something now, something to eat. He fell to his knees again, hands outstretched. I doubt that he had begged before. Certainly he knew little about it. I made him rise. Tell your wife and children to come out. I won't hurt them, and I want to see them. She was tall and graceful, darker than he, her eyes were the sky at moonrise. Their boys were about four and five. I don't have food, I told him, but I can see you get plenty if you'll earn it. There's a knight behind me. Do you know what a knight is? He nodded a little hesitantly. A man like me with a painted shield. His has leopards on it. Tell him you've talked to me, to Sir Abel. The woman said, Sir Abel? Right. Make him the promise you offered me. Tell him you'll fight the men from over the mountains with us, if he'll feed you and your family and give you weapons. He grinned and rubbed his hands. They're close behind us, Sir Abel, his wife said. I promised her that she and her children would be safe with us if her husband fought for us. We met the first at noon, a small group I thought was a patrol. Cloud charged, and I made good use of a new string— while wishing I had parkas. They scattered. We topped a ridge and saw the advance guard of the host of Osterland, a hundred horsemen, a horde of famished spearmen and two elephants. Cloud impaled an elephant and tossed it, men and weapons scattering the way water scatters from a trout. The other fled, and we returned to our own advance guard and sent a man to warn Arnthor that the enemy was at hand. There was a brisk fight that afternoon. The open, arid desert is perfect for cavalry, but the Knight of the Leopards and I had few horses, and those we had were not in the best condition. The Khan's horsemen flanked us, charging our shield wall and nearly breaking it, scattering when I charged from between our ranks and reforming behind their infantry. Our bowmen made good practice, and each charge cost men and horses. When the last had been repelled, their infantry showered us with sling stones. We advanced and were met with the kind of wild attack we had come to know so well. The Knight of the Leopards and I fought on foot before the shield wall, and though the questing blade Baki had found for me was not eternity, it drank blood to its hilt, drawing me step by step in search of the life it was destined to end. I tried to keep pace with you, the Knight of Leopards said afterward, and so did the men. They could keep up with me, but not with you. I was scarcely able to keep up with my own sword. He laughed. But you were able. How's Gilf? He'll live, I'm sure, if we can keep him from fighting till he's well. Whiston's with him, and I'll sleep by him. You thought he couldn't be hurt. It was said soberly, and was not a question. Yes, I said. I suppose I did. Anyone can be hurt. Anyone. That includes you. I've learned I can be killed.
To tell the truth, and I have tried throughout this whole account to tell you the truth, Ben, as I knew it at the time, I expected an attack that night. The Austerlings, I thought, would be eager to bring us to battle. In this I was misled by my ignorance of the early stages of the war, and the battle on the wooded slopes of the mountains of the sun that came after. I had not experienced it as the Khan had. Osterland had been beaten by Celadon, decisively it no doubt seemed, at five fates, the battle that had cost him his father and brothers and made him Khan. He had regrouped, beaten Celadon at the passes, and pressed on, his army gorged on flesh and ready for battle on any terms, a battle he must have felt sure would be the last. The result had been the forest flight, over which neither he nor Arnthor had exercised control. He had won in the end, but his camp had been sacked, and the war that seemed nearly over had become a long struggle. He had outflanked Arnthor and taken King's Doom and Thor Tower, had sacked them both and butchered thousands, and so regained the prestige he had lost in the forest fight. But Arnthor had refused battle again and again. Driven south, then west, then south again, Arnthor had yielded the Mountain of Fire, retaken it, yielded it again at my urging, retreated, and now returned renewed, proving a dangerous and persevering enemy. A night attack might have become the sort of uncontrollable clash the forest fight had been, and even if Osterland prevailed, a night attack would be more apt to disperse than to destroy us. None of which I knew when I lay listening to Gilf's labored breaths and wondering whether I had cleaned his wound well enough, knowing that even if I had, he might die. Abel. Yes, I told him. I'm right here. Ears up. Are they coming? I sat up. Some strident insect was singing. Much farther away, sentries bawled the numbers of their posts to prove they were awake and in position. Cloud slapped. Her dreams were of elephants and starry meadows. Ears up, Gilf repeated. What is it? I asked him. Uns stirred in his sleep. Master, Gilf muttered. He walks. The insect had ceased buzzing, and the sentries fallen silent. No wind disturbed the dry brush or moaned among the naked rocks, and in that charmed silence I came to understand that Gilf was right. Someone far bigger than Hymer, someone far bigger than Shieldstar, had left the seat from which his single eye beheld Sky and Mythgarther. His ravens flew before him, and their all-seeing eyes were his. His wolves trotted at his heels, winding the blood that had not yet dyed the green flood. I shivered with fear and drew my cloak about me. Gilf slept, but it was hours before I did. I dreamed of the Khan's sea rovers. My mind was full of them when I woke. The brave blood runs first, we say, and mean that someone who has taken a wound never fights boldly again. No doubt there is truth in it, as in many sayings, but I have never found it a good guide. The older a man is, the more cautious he is apt to be, but that is true whether he has been wounded or not and it was slaughtering so many enemies, not wounds, that had sobered Wadded. How did it feel to be a man as large and as strong as he, and to lie with a woman half again your size, a woman who could snap pike shafts? How did it feel, for that matter, to lie with any woman? Desiree had been human, or human-like, for me so long ago. Seeking any distraction, I rose and donned the old helm. Gilf was a sleeping beast far mightier than he had appeared, but wounded still. No strength was left in the jaws that had shaken men like rats. Next day we advanced in good order, reaching the river at mid-morning. The host of Osterland was massed along the northern bank. I sent a messenger to report it, and he returned, as I expected, with a summons from Arnthor. The royal pavilion had been set up by the time I reached the rear. Beale and the three dukes were seated inside, with Stonebowl, Gaynor, Morcane, and Smiler. Arnthor himself presided, wrapped in his purple cloak. I had not expected the women, though I tried not to show it when I knelt and was invited to rise and claim a chair. Beale cleared his throat. 
We've been conferring in your absence. His Majesty and His Highness think it best to ask your opinion before you hear ours. As we see it, there are three questions. First, should we attack at once? Second, if we do not, should we await an attack or retreat? Third, if we attack, in what order and with what plan? I was collecting my thoughts and did not speak. There are many other questions granted. For example, should we parley? Should we go up or down the river and attempt a crossing at some other point? But His Majesty and His Highness, all of us in fact, concur in thinking the three I have stated central. Do you agree? I addressed Arnthor. I don't, Your Majesty. Most of the day is before us. Will Your Majesty and His Highness wait for sunset? If you'll wait, the answer to my lord's questions is that we should attack. But if you won't, we should retreat. A long silence followed this, and a whispered conference between Stoneball and Smiler. When it was over, Arnthor nodded to Beale, a nod that seemed to me to give permission to say whatever he thought best. It is only just that I make you privy to our opinions now, that is to say, to the opinions we voiced before your arrival. His Majesty reserved his. His Highness and his Minister insisted on your presence. Her Majesty thought we should retreat. Her Highness urged that we wait, and... Morcain interrupted. I said stay here, she laughed. If they attack, let them try. I think we can beat them, and I want to try sorcery, which takes time. They will be trying it too, sister, Arnthor gestured to Beale. Their grace is favored an immediate attack, so do I. It seems to us that our situation is more likely to deteriorate than improve... You disagree, and we would like to know why. Stonebowl said, The son of the blood of the sky dragon is in agreement with your worthy self, Sir Abel. He wishes you to know that he will support your decision. I thanked Smiler in his own language. Beale muttered, I'd like to know how you learned their tongue, and Morcane laughed. I have not learned it, I explained. I understand it, but I've never learned it. It's not a matter of study. Gaynor leaned forward as if to touch me. You can never forgive me for imprisoning you. But won't you forgive me for trying to avert a battle that may end my husband's life? I said, I bear no animus toward your majesty, in that or any other matter. Arnthor spoke for himself. Whatever the outcome of our council, I will have a word with you after it. I made him a seated bow. I am yours to command. Then tell me how you can promise victory. In the same way their graces and Lord Beale fear defeat. They know the Khan will have called for more troops from the north. My Lord Beale didn't say so, but that was surely in the minds of all those who urged that your majesty attack. I thought there might be contradiction, but none came. Your majesty, it would be folly to attack till we know more about the state of the river. I have two brave young men, Squire Whiston and Squire Yond, investigating it now. I gave the order before I came. We must know how deep it is and how swift the current is. If there are shallow reaches, we must find them. Waiting until twilight will give us time for it. We should also bring up our supply train and the women and wounded, and set a guard on them. Waiting for twilight will provide time for that too. I drew a deep breath, resolved to lie, and made my lie come true. Most signally, I said, I can promise you a thousand archers at twilight. The heart, the youngest of the dukes, said, Spun out of air in this wilderness. You're a wizard indeed if you can do that, Sir Abel. Martyr murmured, Wouldn't it be better to let them make camp and get some sleep? We can attack tomorrow at sunrise. Thoas added, if they're archers, their bows will avail nothing after nightfall. I nodded. I had thought their bows deadly by night, your grace. Doubtless you know more of Elfris than I. Arnthor's eyes widened. A thousand elfs are able? At least a thousand, your majesty. I hope for more. Beale coughed. We had archers from Elfris when we defeated Shield Star of Jotunland at the pass, your majesty. I believe I told you of it, to score, possibly. I nodded again. Those were Fire Elf, Salamanders. It's a weak clan, diminished by their slavery, Arnthor said. 
To one who need not be named. Your majesty is wise. These will be moss men. Wood elf, the ignorant name them, and the learned Skog Zalfar. I turned to the three dukes. Theirs is the strongest clan. We may get help from the earth elf as well, the Bodachon. They are not warlike, but their aid is not to be despised. There was a silence, broken only by the whispering of Stonebowl and Smiler. When they had finished, I spoke to them, repeating what I had told the others. You, scatter of the dragon's blood, are my ultimate ancestor, Smiler said in response. But let us have also the blessing of the fox. I thanked him for the compliment and agreed. I will endeavor to obtain it. I rose, too, when the others rose to go, but I remained in the pavilion with Arnthor. He sent his servants away, saying they were not to return until I sent them to him. Your messenger said you wished to speak with us. Do you think us cowardly, Sir Abel? I shook my head. Never, Your Majesty. Yet we are. The blind man you told us of killed our brother. Who will kill us? I hope it will be time, Your Majesty. I hope you will die when you must die, full of years and wisdom. We know better. Nor have we any wish to perish, as you suggest. A thousand lovely virgins wait upon the Valfather. I did not speak. We know who and what you are. Do not feign ignorance. We do not fear death. We fear that not one of the thousand will stoop for us, that we will be driven over the bridge called swords. If I could promise a Valkyrie, I would, I told him. I can't. Nor did we think it. He studied me. Some instinct told me it might be dangerous to meet his eyes. I did not, yet they probed deep. You did not lie with our queen. Nor have I sought to, your majesty, knowing the effort would be fruitless. Pa, you might go in to her tonight. She'd receive you with open arms and legs, will you? No, your majesty, that I will not. He was silent again, searching me. At length he said, It is not enough to die with courage, Sir Abel. One must die honorably. Since we're to die and know it, we have taken thought upon our honor. It is not unstained. Nor mine, your majesty. Although my thoughts raced, I could not imagine what he was getting at. We imprisoned you without cause, but we freed you and have raised you to honor. What more can we do? I said, I did not ask to speak with you privately to beg a favor, your majesty, but to make you a gift. I feared you'd refuse it, as I still do. Thus I hoped to give it when no one else was present. The gift of death? He threw back his cloak and spread his arms. Strike! Never, your majesty. You could not have you wished to, since we will not die by your hand. We wear no armor. You just observed it. I was more puzzled than ever. We wear a sword belt. Perhaps you observed that, too. We did not lie when we told you we had lost your sword. It was with our baggage which was captured. I cannot write down all the hope I felt at that moment, or my gratitude to the Valfather who orders such things. It was retaken in the forest fight and returned to us. A little shakily, Arnthor stood and unbuckled his sword belt. You say you bring a gift. We've none to give here, but we return what is yours and reclaim our honor. Suddenly he smiled. The scabbard is nicely decorated, and the hilt, though primitive, is beautiful. We could not judge the blade, because we were never able to draw it. Did you not wonder why no one described the spirits of men long dead fighting beside us? I could not have spoken had I wished to. He handed me Eterni, and I felt that part of me, long lost, had returned. My hands acted of themselves. Then— Oh, then, Ben, Ben, how I wish that you could hear what I heard. War cries, no live man knows, and the hoofs of chargers dust a thousand years. The whole pavilion, big as it was, was thronged with fell men in armors of antique mold, knights with shining faces and eyes to make a lion cower. They knelt to Arnthor, and one said, 
Do you learn in this hour, O king, why the span we cross is called the Bridge of Swords? We do, for an instant Arnthor, even Arnthor seemed to hesitate. You may not speak the secrets of hell, they nodded. We ask a question even so. We hope its answer will not be among them. Though we could not draw it, we too bore the blade. Is it possible we may join you? Phantom voices whispered, It may be. It may be. Sheath it, Arnthor told me. I did, and the knights faded, their deep voices still whispering, It may be, when nothing else remained. You owe us no boon, Arnthor told me, and we owe you many. We ask a boon nonetheless, for that is the privilege of kings. Centuries ago an ancestor of ours wished to honor a certain knight above all others. He had already given him nobility, broad lands, and riches, so much that he refused more. They exchanged swords, the king wearing the sword that had been that knight's forever afterward, and that knight wearing the sword that had been his king's. We have not given you our sword. It was your sword, the sword we took from you, the sword you won from a dragon, if the tales are true. Yet it's the one we've worn since the forest fight returned it, and you have it. Will you give the sword you wear now? I saw then how Parka shapes our fates, and took off my sword belt, and the sword Baki had found for me. This is the gift I intended to give your majesty. I give it gladly. Wear it tonight, and I'll be honored above all others. He took it from me and put it on. May we draw it? You may. He did, and the brand gleamed in his hand, as it never had for me, filling the pavilion with gray light. It thirsts. His voice had fallen to a whisper. We have heard of such things. We never thought them true. Most often they are not, Your Majesty. Yet it does, he said. I doubt that he had heard me. It walks in the desert and dreams of a lake of blood. Chapter 40 The River Battle Wiston and Yond had found two points at which the river could be forded, although only with difficulty. The west crossing was the better of the two. I gave it to Arnthor, as well as the best fighters, the nobles and nearly all the knights, and Smiler and his dragon soldiers. I planned to take the east crossing, charging on Cloud, who would scarcely wet her belly. Taug and Rober were to ride behind me. After them, such wounded men-at-arms as could draw sword, the peasants, the free companies, and such alphas might be. We would attack first and draw the Khan's strength. It was a sound plan. Arnthor had agreed to wait until our attack had begun before he began his, and his men would be in the rear out of sight, giving us about fifteen minutes more. I told him that under no circumstances would we fight before sunset. In point of fact, I meant to attack sooner, feeling that the more pressure I put on myself, the more likely I was to succeed. It is always good to have a plan before battle, so I have found, but once battle is joined, the plan is liable to vanish like morning mist. So it was in the river battle. Although Arnthor's force was to assemble out of sight of the river, I thought it prudent to station sentries along the bank, particularly at the fords, in case the enemy tried to cross. Sir Mark had charge of these. He was inspecting his men when a captain of the Austerlings shouted some insult. Rather than letting it pass in silence, Mark returned one of his own. The captain waded into the river, challenging Mark to meet him. Mark did. The captain's men attacked him when their captain fell. Mark's sentries ran to support him, and the fighting spread. All that I learned later. At the time I heard shouts and the clash of weapons. Atella ran to tell me the Austerlings had reached the south bank where Arnthor and his knights had met them. We'll cross the river, I told her, to take them from behind, get to safety. She did not, although it was some time before I knew it. I asked Cloud to crouch so I could mount. She looked skyward instead, pricking her ears to catch the voice that rolled upon Mithgarther. I heard it too, and when she sprang into the air, cantering up a faint breeze, 
no thought of mine came to trouble her. I could have tried to turn her back. I knew it was impossible, and did not try. I should have taken a horse. I did not, but waited out alone. Arrows struck my hauberk. More whistled past my ear. I had been holding Eterni out of the water. I drew her. They came from all directions, or so it seemed to me, faint to the eye but loud to the ear. Their blades could not yet kill. We were in full sun, although the sun was low. But it was no small thing to feel the bite of those swords, no phantom touch or tickle. I heard the screams, and saw men drop their spears to clutch wounds that did not bleed. More substantial help followed. Taug and Rober mounted, with the wounded men-at-arms behind them also mounted. After them the outlaws and peasants, running and shouting, all on foot. I had been afraid both groups would hang back, and had done all I could to support leaders who seemed eager for war. Both fought far better than I expected. Wiston and I were at their head, by no means shamed by our men. Men and women, I ought to have said, for although the women who had come with their men were not many, they fought bravely. I shall come to that later, Ben, or try to. The last of our mounted men had passed before I climbed out of the river, soaked to the waist with my boots full of water. I had meant to lead them in a wide semicircle, and to take the enemy in the rear, as I had told Atella. Now they had Taug and Rober to lead them. Both were brave, and even Taug, young as he was, had some knowledge of tactics. They might do as I had planned, but if they did not, there was nothing I could do about it. As for me, I had this ragtag band on foot, and had to do the best I could, get Celadon a victory as cheaply as might be. For us, no semicircle was possible. I decided to move left along the bank, rolling up any Austerlings we met and hitting the flank of those fording the river. We had crossed without much opposition, in a mass that was on the way to becoming a mob. I halted it, and got them to form ranks as they had been trained to. The archers had, of course, held their bows above water and kept their strings dry. I put them in a line on our flank, where they could keep off slingers and bowmen. The charge of a dozen horsemen would have scattered them like starlings, but no such charge came. The horsemen had work enough already. I put those with the best shields in front, with pikes behind them to thrust between the shields. The rest were massed behind the pikes, with Wiston to keep order, and see that someone picked up the pike or shield when a buddy fell. I stayed six paces ahead, marching boldly and turning every few steps to shout orders or encouragement. We needed flags. We needed trumpets and drums. We had none, but someone, I could guess who, got the women in back singing and shouting and clapping, and maybe that was better than trumpets and drums. Step out, I told them. Step out lively there. And step out we did. Desiree, desiree, desiree. Some Austerlings had come to know that shout, and whether they knew it or not, we were many. If we were half-trained and worse armed, it cannot have been apparent to those who fled us. We had gone a surprising way west along the river when we met a hundred or so determined to make a stand. Their captain had one of those pole maces they favor. Eterni hewed the iron chaps behind the head and left him with a stick. He flung it at me and tried to draw a sword, but I took off his arm at the elbow before I split his helm. A score of his men were at me like terriers. I remember cutting through two spears and putting my blade in the belly of one tall fellow, who looked as if he had eaten nothing but grass for the past month. I recall wondering whether Whiston had sense enough to see to it that the weapons of the men I was killing went to those who needed them. Other than that, almost nothing. It is well to strike hard, but it is better, much better, to strike quickly. Garveon had taught me, and I struck as quickly as I could, not thinking of Garveon or much of anything. Cut, 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 thrust. Get the shield in front of the eyes. Fast, fast before another comes to help. Thrust under it. Thrust hard and deep and very fast before he gets it down. His legs out. Kick the knee, fast and hard. Slash before he recovers. I caught one Austerling in his dirty fangs with bottom of my shield, and saw a pike head in his chest before I could follow up. 
They were running, and the river bank much too far to my left, and ahead a great cloud of boiling dust in which a flag and a few plumes were visible, a cloud so thunderous that the trumpeting of an elephant sounded small and lonely, like the crying of a child. We would take the cloud, the cloud that was an army, in the flank. We would damage and delay it, and that might be enough, but whether it was enough or not, it would turn and crush us. I ordered my brave, desperate, untrained, badly armed troops forward, and ran ahead of them, shouting, Desire ye! Our arrows raked the cloud. It might do some good. Better to die than not fight and know that Rober and Lamwell would have fought like the heroes they were. And then the dragon roared above us, belching flame, and wheeled in air. I had stopped to look up, and came at us so low its wind stirred the parched dust, and straight for me. Its flame washed over me, and its jaws closed on me, burning. But the sun's last rays were sapping its reality still. It could not lift me or crush me, and our arrows flew through its scales and into its vitals. It rose with a wild cry that swiftly became a cry of triumph. The sun was setting, and the blazing breath that had been weak as a candle in sunlight strengthened every second. It circled, skimming the Australian army that had made its own. The shadows that had been sharp when we crossed the river were vanishing, melting into a general darkness. And the dragon, Ben, was as real as I, as real as Cedar had been in Aelfris, a monster of jade and jet. I had failed to think of Garveon earlier, and I failed to think of him then, and of Svan, who had fought Cedar and lived. There was no time, no time for anything but to shout nonsense at the men who followed me, wave my sword above my head, and dash to meet the dragon. Knights in antique armor galloped past me. The dragon roared to shake the earth, but they shook it in cold fact. I felt it tremble under the blows of a hundred iron-shod hooves. Lances shattered on the dragon's scales, two struck home in the fiery mouth. That was when I did the thing I had hoped to do when I spoke with Arnthor, the thing Michael had done beside the pool. All that I had told Taug became true for me, and the elf, even desiree, were less than dreams, only thoughts to be created and dismissed at will. I called for them as a god, and my call compelled them. The Austerlings before me and the men behind me halted, and in the sudden silence I heard a humming overhead, as if a million bees had taken flight. I looked up, and the sky was full of arrows. Desiree had come, and two thousand with her, moss men and moss maidens, salamanders, ice elf, and the little Bodachon, who have in them no delight in war but fight when they do, because they must, asking no quarter and giving none. There are songs and tales of that battle, Ben. I know you cannot hear them, and I cannot equal them. I will outline it here, but nothing more. Taug and Rober took the Austerlings in the rear as I had hoped. We struck the flank, the Knights of the Sword, the Elf, and those who followed me. The Austerlings held longer than their Khan had any right to expect, fighting the bravest knights the world has seen in a sleet of arrows. Arnthor spoke, their dragons turned on them, and they broke and fled. Those south of the river, seeing the battle had been lost behind them, fled too. Great execution was made among them, greater still when they halted to hold the north bank. They were the best that Osterland had to show, the Spahis and the Khan's own war band, and few lived. Beyond that I can only give some incidents. When we were attacking the flank and everything had been thrown into confusion, I saw, as if in a fever, two blind men wielding staves, directed by a half-grown child and a woman with a sword. You will have guessed the identity of these four. You will not have guessed that bold Berthold took a spear in the belly before the moon was high. Once I fell, and the chief who had stunned me stood over me to strike again. He knew who I was, I think, and hoped that I would beg for my life so that he might boast of it afterward. The scarecrow who saved me had been shaped of moss and mud, of twigs and bark and fresh green leaves. I knew, and taking off the old helm, I embraced lovely Desiree there on the battlefield. 
Arnthor met the black Khan at water's edge. The black Khan fell, and, though the weight of his mail sunk his body, the current bore it away and it was never found. Arnthor lived long enough to learn that we had triumphed, but not longer. Martyr and Bahat covered his body and let no one see it. It was burned that night on a pyre of broken lances and arrows and shattered shields. If I had seen it, I might explain why Gaynor so adamantly refused him. I did not, and offer no guess. He lacked his brother's magnetism and vaulting ambition, and it was well he did. He was inclined to brutality and avarice, but kept both in check better than most such men. He was courageous, and just without mercy, or at least with little. His line had provided Celadon with wiser kings and better commanders, but none more cunning. He never unbent, and if he had many willing servants, he had no friends. There was another incident later. I will tell you that in a later place. When the battle was over, and I had sheathed Eterni, I assembled those I had led. It was only then I learned of bold Berthold's wound and realized that he would surely die. Otherwise I might not have chosen as I did. Taug and Rober were there, and old Gerda, who had helped with the wounded until she could scarcely stand. So were Lennet, Atella, and Vil. Wiston had a bandage over half his face, put there by Ulfa, and Uns attended him in a way that showed he thought Wiston might faint or die. I made them sit nearer the fire, and sent Pauk for Gilf, whom we had double-chained in the rear to save his life. I did not say much or do anything before they joined us. Friends, I said, and I tried to look past the nearest to the exhausted faces farther from the fire. I owe you a great deal. I can't reward you as you deserve, and it may be you will never be rewarded for having saved your country. What I can do is tell you the truth, and let you see what I'm going to do, what I'm going to keep doing till I'm stopped, which will be soon. They stirred, but no one spoke. First, the truth. I had thought to lead you on cloud. I had lost her. You will recall that I did not have her on our march south, not till we met the dragon soldiers. In his goodness Lothar restored her to me. He may have thought I'd break an oath I gave his father in payment. That would have been the end of me, as it will be very soon. I didn't, but at the worst possible moment his father took her back. It did us great harm, and the fault is mine. I confess it to you now. Several muttered objections. I silenced them. That was the truth, and you have it. Here is more. In Sky, the Valfather, the greatest and kindest of all kings under the Most High God, gave me power. Years later I begged to return here. He consented on the condition that I not use my power here, and I swore I wouldn't. I'm an oath-breaker, since I broke that one when the Austerlings were besieging Red Hall. Some of you were there, and will not forget the storm I raised. Tonight I'm going to break it again, openly, and for as long as I can. Exhausted though they were, that stirred them. I called to bold Berthold. He could not stand, but Pauk and Duns helped him. I tore away his bandage and healed him. Kneel, I told him, and Gerda beside you. He was exploring the spot where his wound had been, but he knelt. Ulfa brought Gerda and had her kneel too. I put a hand on each head and felt my power flow out. It took a lot to restore the thing he had left in a pond so long ago. When I opened them again, they were kneeling still. I wondered at the silence, because I expected a lot of noise, but the others were watching by firelight and could see only their bent backs. Old Berthold's hair was black once more. Gerda's was the color of ripe corn. Yet my hands were still on their heads, and even the closest could not be sure. I told bold Berthold and Gerda to rise. They did, and bold Berthold exclaimed, I can see! I can see! Gerda embraced him, and they wept. This, though she was fair and young again, with laughing eyes. Atella tugged my sleeve, weeping too. I knew what she wanted, and had Ulfa bring Linnet to me. You are not my son, Linnet said, and yet you are. Will you make me go? Never, I told her. But I cannot make you live again. That is beyond me. Kneel. I don't have much time. She knelt. 
The derangement of Linnet's mind was deep and hard, so that I felt I was picking a knot with my nails and my teeth. I loosed it at last, and I had her stand. She smiled, and I at her, and we embraced. Mag is still with me, she whispered. She came on that sea isle. You won't make her go home? No, I said. Gilf next, and swiftly and easily. And then I knew, for I saw him standing behind those farthest from the fire. I thought he would speak when I called for uns. He did not. As for me, I found I could hardly whisper. I laid my hand on Un's hump, something I had never done before. Stand straight. How slowly he rose. He thought it a dream. I saw that in his face. He thought he was dreaming, and feared at every finger's width gained that he might wake. Taug came to stand by him. Taug was crying, and so was I. Wiston was almost the last. Before I healed him, I thought of how he had fought with Taug in Utgard. That was long over, and he had served me faithfully. You were there in the beginning, I told Pauk. It is not right you should be last now. I hope I have time. I got a eye, sir. Take Vil. I had forgotten him, and had Pauk bring him forward. For a moment or two I felt I lacked the strength. He took my hand when it was over, and put something in it, a thing that buzzed and sang with many voices. I want to pay, Sir Abel. Ain't enough, but it's what I got. When I got more, you'll get that, too. My bowstring. Yes, sir, yours again. I was exhausted and very happy at that moment, Ben. I made Pauk come to me and blew into his blind eye. He said, Thank ye, sir, thank ye, and I hugged him and he me, and I knew that he too had been healed and I could heal no more. I wanted to sit, but the tall man in the wide hat was coming, and it was impossible. You have done, Drakenritter. It was not a question. I bowed my head. You are shamed. His eye gleamed in the dark. You would end your life if I asked, and will end it in any case. I will, Valfather. My hand had found my dagger. I forbid it. But I expect no obedience from you. You will die when winter and old night whelm us. So will I. So will my son Thunor, who does not believe it. Meanwhile, I thank you for mending my dog. Shall I return Cloud? No, I said. I'll give you another, younger, of the same breed. No, I said again. You thought my son Lothar kind and generous. He is neither. What you saw as his generosity was only groundwork for betrayal. If you had known him as others do, you would have seen it at once. Something kindled in me, and I raised my head. I never entreated your son for help, nor did any act of mine deserve his gratitude. He told Morcane to summon me and offer his help. We were starving and too weak to face our foes. He brought us food and men. I will make no complaint of him, never again. Others he has treated better have spoken worse. There was a smile in the Valfather's tone. Are you coming back? I said nothing. You have been asked, Sir Abel. Even once. I am not able, I whispered. You are. I'll summon Cloud, and you and I will mount. Together we will ride to sky. I could not talk, Ben. I have sometimes when I found it so hard that I wondered afterward how I did it. This time I could not. Atella took my hand. Her face was wet with tears, but she was not crying then. He's afraid she won't come with him, Atella told the Valfather. She would not, child. His voice had become remote and severe. She cannot. He turned away. Desiree had been watching and listening. She stepped out of the shadows. The Valfather gestured to Wiston. You've served your knight faithfully. You must do him one service more. Bring his helm and set it on his head. Wiston did. Lovely Desiree became a puppet of mud and leaves. That was horrible, but I had expected it. Two other things I had not expected and cannot explain. The Valfather was a bright shadow, nothing more. And bold Berthold, who had been sitting beside Gerda, vanished. 
She was the same lovely young woman, but Berthold was gone, and you, Ben, sat in his place. As I say, I cannot explain these things. You see what you are surrendering, the bright shadow told me, and know to what it is you go. What will you do? I drew my dagger, pushed up the sleeve of my hauberk, and cut my arm. Drink, I told Desiree, and she bent and drank of my blood. Not a few drops, as elf often do, but great sobbing gulps while I clenched and unclenched my fist, so that human life flowed freely, never stopping until a small green-eyed woman stood beside me. When I looked for the bright shadow again, it had gone. Soon Desiree and I went too, I leaning on her, for I had lost much blood and was weak. Here is the third incident I promised. We went slowly, and twice I fell. By the time we reached the river, fresh sunlight had dyed the clouds a thousand colors, though the sun's face was still below the eastern mountain. I stopped at the edge of the water, not sure I could make the crossing. A beautiful young woman supported the knight I saw reflected there. But that knight was not a boy, but a grim warrior whose eyes gleamed from the slits of his helm. I took it off and cast it into the river, and when the ripples had subsided, Desiree and I were just the same. We live in Aelfris, and for whole days we are children again, as we were the first time I came. Children, we run and shout among the groves and grottoes of an endless wood more beautiful than any you will ever see. Children, we go to the sea I love, to splash in the shallows and play with kelpies. She has given me a new dog, a white puppy with red ears. I call him a farvin and at night we speak to him of the play now past and the play to come, and he tells us puppy things. But we are not always children, and sometimes we lie upon our backs in fine green grass to watch the world above, where time runs swift. There we saw martyr Knight Whiston and bold Berthold slay Shieldstar. Soon time will ripen, and we will come again. Michael has found me at last, and that is why I have written this for you, Ben. He tells us of a great lord in need of a knight. I have told Michael that I will be this lord's champion, if I may bring my lady. He says it will be permitted. We go soon. You will see this, Ben, for Michael has found a way. Do not worry about me. I am fine. All best, Art. Arthur Ormsby End of the Wizard, The Wizard Knight, Book Two by Gene Wolfe, G E N E W O L F E. Read by Michael Scherer in the studios of Potomac Talking Book Services Incorporated for the Library of Congress, November 2006. Published by Tor, Tom Doherty Associates, LLC, 175 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10010. Further reproduction or distribution in other than a specialized format is prohibited. End of book.